Oh my God, we're live and on the air, Chris. This is the final bot down. Let's get the stream started right now. Good morning and welcome to beautiful downtown Norwalk, Connecticut for our final qualifying event of the 2023 NHRL season. Chris, this is the big one. Oh my goodness, it's stacked upstairs. Yeah, uh, the thing that I really love about upstairs when we were walking around the pits yesterday, uh, typically you see a lot of really fun bots, a lot of like kind of meme bots. Up there, everyone is uh, quite serious. There's quite a few killers up there in the pits. Yeah, you can cut the tension up there with a knife and yeah. the humidity. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, fi final qualifying event of the season. Now, by the end of today, we are going to, uh, we're going to crown 12 more invitations. We're going to send out 12 more invitations, and this is the one that everyone is fighting for. Let's take a look at who's qualified so far in the three-pounders. Now, there are 20 names on this list. Now, these are people who qualified earlier in the year at our four other qualifying events. Now, you can see some incredibly heavy hitters here. You see Caldera, you see Buka, Chubby Unicorn, Beetlejuice, Droopy. Uh, these are top-ranked robots that have fought all across the world. And uh, four more names we're going to add to this list. Let's take a look at the 12s. Also, an incredibly stacked field. The 12s have seen an incredible glow up this year. Absolutely. Now, one of the big things that I'm going to be watching for are the Brazilians in both the 12s and the 30s. Could we see multiple uh, Brazilian robots here on this list by the end of the day? Possibly. And finally, let's take a look at who's qualified in the 30s. Another 20 names here. 20 of the very best 30 pounders on the planet. And I've seen some very scary 30s up there spinning up in the test box. Yeah, Sombra 30, oh my goodness. Yeah, now let's uh, check in here with Lindsay in the pits. Good morning, Lindsay. Good morning, Luke. Uh, I don't know if you can see behind me. I think you can. Uh, oh, I see a chubby unicorn right there. I mean, the, the chaos, the, the energy, the excitement is palpable. It is amazing. I hope you can feel it at home. I actually am uh, here in the YouTube chat, and I've already ran a poll to see how many people think that Lynx will qualify this event. 78%, so we have a lot of expectations wow. there in Calvin Eba. If you are watching at home, join us in the YouTube live chat. We have discussions, it's very lively. We're gonna have polls running all day. So if you wanna get involved, the YouTube live chat is where to be. Send a super chat, we'll read it on air. And uh, hey, like and subscribe. All right, now let's take a look at our tournament basics. Now, uh, there are three weight classes here today. We're going to be fighting three pounders, the beetle weights, 12 pounders, and 30 pounders. Now, uh, for very early fights here in the day, between 9 a.m. and around 2 p.m. Eastern, these are going to be uh, two-round play-in uh, matches. Now, the, the purpose for these early matches is to determine your seating inside of the bracket. Now, uh, once we go into the tournament bracket around 2 p.m. Eastern, this is going to be single elimination. Win and you continue, lose and you are out. Let's take a look at our fight basics. Now, these are all three-minute fights that you can win by a knockout or forcing your opponent to tap out. For judges' decisions, you know, those are for matches that go the full three minutes. We do have house spots in here that are designed to give you one unstick. If you need it, you need to call for the unstick before it happens. Right. Now, uh, if, you, uh, if you've never seen a fight before, prepare yourselves for delight because it's happening right now in Cage 5. Uh, now, we've got obsolete spare parts facing off against Bulkhead in Cage 5. Now you can see Bulkhead here, it's this uh, green and black robot, and there is a belt on the floor. I think that that may be a belt from Obsolete Spare Parts. Bulkhead here is doing great. Oh, wow, nice pop. Now, I believe that this is actually uh, Cage Sit. Uh, is this? Oh, I... Yeah, no, here we go. Yeah, Bulkhead here in green and black, and Obsolete Spare Parts in, uh, in blue and, and white. Now, Ben from Obsolete Spare Parts. Now, this is, um, he, he's on Team Red Hawk. And uh, Team Red Hawk, they fought so many times that uh, they're able to take all of their spare parts and build additional robots from it. Chris, isn't that delightful? 
that's, hey, that's scrappy. I like it. But it does look like both of the weapons have gone down here. Now, Bulkhead here, Renata Kaplan, a really interesting robot. It's a Thagomizer-style robot. Now, the idea is that um, she attacks her opponent with uh, this big, tanky front and then whips that tail around to attack its wheels uh, from behind. It's actually a brilliant strategy. I love this bot design. If, if I could ever design one of my own, it's de definitely something I would consider. I love that, uh, that kind of drift effect that you can actually attack unconventional areas on your opponent by like whipping around that horizontal uh, to generally where you're, uh, you would find wheels or something, or something chewy on your opponent. Now, However, both... you need that belt. Yeah, yeah. Now with both belts gone here in this box, this is going to come down to control. Who is able to drive a little bit better? Who's able to land pins? Now you can uh, keep a pin for up to 10 seconds before you have to release. And I'm not seeing a whole lot of pins here. Now when both of the, uh, the weapons go down, this is really the, the time to show off your drive skills. So uh, have you been practicing in between the competitions? Do you have uh, a little place in your garage that you can drive around? And uh, can you effectively pin your opponent? Yeah, there's definitely some bot styles that are designed. You know, even if your weapon still goes down, you have a good control game. Uh, these are two uh, obviously heavily offense bots with those, with those big horizontal spinners on them. And so two-wheel design, not necessarily designed to win a ground game, more designed to deliver uh, huge hits. So when both weapons go down, it becomes kind of like a very strange slap fight. Now, 20 seconds left here in this match. It looks like this one will be going to the judges. And I hope that the judges have been paying attention. Obsolete Spare Parts did lose its weapon first, but uh, a bulkhead was shortly after that. And uh, it's really going to come down to control here. And that is your match. Wow, first match of the day, and it's going straight to the judges. And uh, in the meantime, we're going to check in with Cage 7. And it looks like queued up in Cage 7, we have Emotional Dream and Bloodfish. Now these are two kids. There's going to be kids on both sides of the box here. Uh, middle schoolers, I think. Uh, we've got Luciano uh, with Bloodfish here in pink and Emotional Dream. Uh, in the blue corner. Sorry, no, I've got it, I've got it switched. Uh, Luciano and Bloodfish are in blue and Emotional Dream is in, uh, is in pink. Right. And Ooh. they're off. Wow. Okay. Bloodfish looks like it is a, uh, an angled horizontal overhead cutter. And Emotional Dream has got these really interesting long forks here, and it is the vert. Now, Skyler here with Emotional Dream has landed a great pin. Now he can hold that for, for 10 <laughs> seconds. Now that's Luciano with Bloodfish. And look at that, Skyler has tipped his opponent onto his head, and Luciano there is dying. Let's see if Luciano's going to call for an unstick from the house bot. Two minutes and 20 seconds left here in this fight. Oh, no. Oh, big hit there. That grinding action. Emotional dream coming in here to kill. It looks like the uh, that that disc spinner on top of Bloodfish was just shattered by the vert on Emotional Dream. Now these are almost total redesigns of both of these robots. Now the first time that Bloodfish showed up here at the competition, it was running uh, almost uh, a non-existent weapon. And Emotional Dream also looks totally custom. Looks great. I think that was a tap out from Bloodfish. Your winner here is Emotional Dream. Great match. Good job, Luciano. I love to see like the drivers who are so young that they need to stand on a chair to look inside of the, uh, the cage here. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna go over to cage five here. Oh, very interesting. This is going to be a big fight. Now we've got Fireball in orange. This is Brian Boxel's brand new robot. 
facing off against Angel Vidal and Hurt Caboose. Now, Fireball, you know, uh, it was scaled up to 250 pounds, and it fought recently at BattleBots Proving Grounds in Las Vegas. Brian uh, is famous for Eruption. Now, both of his robots, though, both Eruption and Fireball, have not qualified yet for the November Finals, which is something new for him. Um, Brian is an incredibly good builder, an incredibly good driver, and he would love to qualify one, if not both, of his robots today. Angel Vidal is a BattleBots builder himself. He is the designer of Shred It Bro, uh, the 250-pound BattleBot uh, that competed in Season 7. And uh, Brian Boxel is uh, both a Team WPI member, and uh, he is on Team Bloodsport. I love the highlighter color on the uh, the printed chassis on Her Caboose. Her Caboose, uh, Her Caboose is also running this absolutely go Oh wow! Just did you see the uh, the shimmer? The shimmer on the top, Chris. It's glorious. Oh boy, we're we're off. Her Caboose running a just nasty looking hub motor drum, facing off against Fireball. Brian Boxel, also known uh, famous for his hub motors. Now that's a good pin on the front of Fireball. Weapon to weapon. Grinding action, weapon to weapon, and it looks like Fireball could be dead. Tap out. Oh, wow. wow. Fast match for Angel Vidal and Hurt Caboose. Brian was quick on that tap out. It's, it's you know, there's still a lot of day left here. There's a, there's a chance that that could have been a radio issue, uh, you know, maybe a speed controller issue, but it's better to, uh, to get upstairs, try to diagnose that issue, and uh, be ready for your second match as opposed to just sustaining the, the type of damage that Herkaboos could put out. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're gonna head over to cage six. I can see Tomato Soup there in the pink corner facing off against Newbert here in the blue corner. Newbert is run by a kid named Cole. I love Cole. And uh, Newbert's been competing here a ton. Uh, he's probably what, gone to the last five competitions in a row. Facing off against Mar. Now Mar uh, from Team Pandemonium is running an SSP kit. And uh, that is one of the very best SSP kits up there. You're gonna see great driving here from Tomato Soup and Marley. All right, here we go, pushing, uh, pushing. Uh, Newbert here into the pink corner. And you can see that little lifter here on Tomato Soup going. Now Cole and Newbert running a Fingertech beater bar would love to come here and just capitalize on this moment, oh. Cole. Seize the day. It looks like these super sharp forks on Tomato Soup may have gotten stuck under the rail here. Now let's see if this robot can come back to life. It can, let's go Marley. Now again, showing amazing control from the SSP kit. Chipping oh, Newbert wow. against the rail! Oh, oh no! It'll be interesting to see if Newbert can gyro up off of that. Oh, at, now Tomato Soup is giving Newbert a little, uh, a, a little flip action. But once again, oh, no. Marley Biagini and those super sharp forks stuck under the rail. Now Will Cole coming here to save. Good sportsmanship there, Cole. Love to see it. A minute 45 left here in this fight. Cole's returned it with a good pin. Oh, no! No! Those super sharp forks! Again, stuck under the rail, wiggling that little arm. Wow, how many saves do you think that, uh, that you're entitled to, Chris? You can see Cole there. He is Knock waiting out. for the top out. That was a knockout. Now that's one of the dangers of running super sharp forks. You can get stuck under that just absolutely minuscule space yeah. underneath the rail. And that is a challenge for anyone running forks here today. Good fight though, here uh, in cage six. You know, the forks, they only seem to get longer and they only seem to get sharper. 
Yeah, you live by the fork, you die by the fork. That's you know? true. Uh, there's lots of benefits to the forks. You really want to pull your opponent's wheels up off the ground, but um, you can shave them so sharp that you can actually hurt yourself. Now, loading here into cage seven, I can see Jack move from uh, our 10th grade English teacher from Schenectady, Drew Davis, facing off against Patient Zero, which, uh, you know, appropriately, Patient Zero builder Janati Katzman is, uh, is wearing his medical grade mask here today. That is great. Well, we're not looking to have patients one, two, and three. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Now, Janati is uh, on Team Shreddit, and uh, he's been uh, with the BattleBots team with both Pain Train and Shreddit Bro. And uh, he's facing off against one of his good friends here in Drew. Drew was on Team Pain Train on BattleBots as well. All right, it looks like the box is loaded up. We're going to get this thing started. Now, one of the big things to look for in the pink corner is the performance of Bug, the little mini bot here. Yeah. Now, Bug is driven by Drew's son. Patient Zero here oh, in no! black. Bug! This is a brand new shredded variant from Janati Katzman. Ooh, a couple of weapon to weapon exchanges there. One of the big things to look for here is weapon reliability. Ooh. The winner of this fight is probably going to be the one who can snipe his opponent's belt first. And they are going head to head, absolutely unafraid of the weapon to weapon exchange here. Patient Zero, though, is on its head. Drew Davis, good pin, a grinding wow. pin up against the rail. Two minutes, 15 seconds left here in this fight. Brett wanted nothing to do with that corner. Getting Janati back onto his feet. Janati Katzman and uh, team captain Evan Arias, they are co-workers. They're both big BattleBots fans and they bonded over combat robotics when Evan started uh, working at this company. They talked one another into coming to very early NHRL uh, competitions back in 2018 and 2019 and fielding Shredded Bro, one of the most dominant legacy robots here in the competition. Shredded Bro has multiple podium finishes here at NHRL and Janati is a big part of the uh, that robot's success. He helps build the robot, he's helped design the robots and he is an incredible builder and designer. Another couple of big exchanges there. Minute 20 here left in this fight. You can see Drew Davis pursuing his opponents. He is really showing off his drive pedigree here. Great pop there from Patient Zero. Drew Davis has qualified for the finals for the last three years in a row. And uh, he's really showing why. He's got his repetitions in the box. He always knows exactly where he is. He's a very calculating, very patient driver. Although it does look like one half of Jack Move's wet, uh, drive system is down. 35 seconds left here in this fight. Now the weapons are going, but uh, the drive seems to be hobbled on both of these robots. 20 seconds left. Another good, uh, Good Sandwich. move here from, uh, from Jack Move. You can see Bug running great. Going into this uh, last 10 seconds, they've taken it the full three minutes. This one will go to the judges. Jack Move continuing to pursue all the way down uh, as we tick down the final seconds of this match. Good three minute fight. This is a perfect example of, uh, you know, when, it, when a judge is gonna have a challenging, you know, deliberation because, you know, you had, uh, you had Jack move, demonstrating very good maneuverability in the beginning, uh, taking advantage of a, a few opportunities and exchanges with Patient Zero. Patient Zero still had great mobility at the end, uh, but you know it's, it's all gonna come down to like where that aggression fell, where that damage fell. One of the big things that I was seeing in that fight was Jack move able to get around to the back of Patient Zero. Mm. Now that typically means that uh, you weren't able to show enough control so that you can stay squared up with your opponent. 
And, uh, you know, every single time that he does that, he's also showing um, damage. You know, right. he's grinding away at that back plate. Um, I think that it may come down to really just a difference in the amount of time that these builders have had in the box. Janati is very much a person who lives up in the pits, helping repair all of the shredded robots. He's had less time in the box. Right. And uh, Drew fights here every single competition. If there's five qualifiers and a finals, he's been to all six for the last three years in a row. I think that he may have missed one over the past three years, and uh, it was a very strange competition indeed without Drew here. So, um, yeah, at this point, he has just absolutely fought a ton. Mm -hmm. All right, now we've got a couple of good judges' decisions, you know, uh, that are in the queue, and uh, making the judges work for it pretty early in the day. <laughs> now, remember, these, these early fights, these are just to, uh, to determine the seating. Right. So, um, let's, uh, let's check in here with Cage 5. Ooh, interesting. All right. Now, we've got, we've got Steel Mountain here in pink. Now, this is a bristle bot. It doesn't have any wheels, which means that it gets the weight bonus here at NHRL. Here's a good shot of Lucas's robot, Steel Mountain. Now, uh, this thing vibrates around inside of the box just using the, uh, the motion of its vertical weapon. The horizontal weapon. Oh, yeah, sorry. The, no, yeah, so it's yeah. The, the gyroscopic it's effect weapon. of that yeah. of that heavy weapon yes. spinning. As they speed it up or slow it down, it allows it to shuffle kind of forward, left and right, left and right. Uh, so it takes very, very small steps, you would say. Now, what you um, typically see from Steel Mountain is chaos. Right. <laughs> this is a... Uh, 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 not uh, an uncommon design now here at NHRL. In fact, I think one of our most explosive matches ever was a bot style like this. Here we go. Now that's that chaotic uh, motion <laughs> that, uh, that I've come to expect here from Steel Mountain. Steel Mountain typically is oh, bulletproof. No. It lasts the full three minutes, but it looks like Lucas's power is out. That weapon and that robot is dead. When the weapon dies, the robot cannot move. We'll see if perhaps it's just maybe stuck somewhere, but it doesn't look like it. And I don't think this box really could have survived three minutes. Already look at some of those deep gouges. Yeah, it looks like we may be counting out Steel Mountain here. Your winner could be Bean Buster. Now the belt looks intact. I wonder if it's something, you know, some, something from that violent shock may have uh, gotten something unplugged inside of the robot. You can see Lucas Buermeyer here taking a closer look at Steel Mountain. And the referee is uh, trying to decide here, when do I start counting? You can hear it. Now, a weapon like Four, that might be designed three, to, to deliver two, damage one. into another That's robot. A but it's not necessarily knockout. built to slam into dimensional lumber. True, yeah. Now, there's a huge amount of energy that gets dumped back into your robot every single time you make connection with anything. You can see the winner here of Bean with Bean Buster. Pretty, pretty good. Now, Bean Buster here, run by Andrew Welch from Red Hook, New York, Chris. Ah, rival town. Rival town, one town over from your, you know, what, uh, your hometown, I would say. Well, now it's your hometown, Luke. Yeah, now I live there. So they're technically your rivals. Right. I mean, I feel like I'm maybe 10 minutes from Red Hook, but you're only like 20 minutes from Red Hook, you know? Just go hang out with Andrew, talk robots. Of course. Yeah. All right, uh, let's check in upstairs with Lindsay. Hello, hello. All right, so I just ran a poll after that Jack move and patient zero match. And I believe we're still waiting on the judge's decision for that. But the crowd has been in incredibly split. Only 55% uh, think that Jack move won. So a little bit of a you know plura plurality there. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see uh, the judge's decision on that one because that was really close. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that, that was a split match, uh, very, very close, and two teammates and friends on both sides of the, uh, the box. Now, um, I've just heard from production that the judges have sent in their decision from that last match. Your winner is Janati Katzman and Patient wow. Zero. Taking down a really big name in Jack Move, that is going to be great for Patient Zero's ra um, ranking here at NHRL. Okay. 
Now, uh, we saw like a shot of the incredibly full pits up there. Now, there's several hundred people up there from all across the planet. Now, we have builders from Brazil. We have builders from Australia. Yeah. We have builders from the UK here. Ecuador. Ecuador here as well. Um, builders from all across the country. We have builders from California that have flown out. Uh, just collectively, thousands and thousands and thousands of travel miles to get here today, all in hopes of qualifying for November. Let's check in here with Cage 6. Now, Cage 6 is Count Forkula, <laughs> which is this <laughs> ominous looking black capture robot here. It looks off, like a Count Forkula. Facing off against Hive Smashing here, this, uh, this bright yellow Team Honeycracked robot. Now, Count Forkula, it's, it's almost like it's spreading its cape, Chris, you know, trying to envelop its opponent in a cape. Kind of like a, a Draculean kind of move, you know what I'm saying? Batman. Botman. Botman. Okay. All right, we got to write these down as says good, good future robot names. Now, Count Forkula here, uh, as you can probably guess, is mostly a control bot. There's probably a tiny weapon there just so they can sneak into the competition. We what? do have an active weapon rule here at NHRL. You can't just show up with a wedge. Oh my gosh, do you see the little cowboy hat there, Chris? <laughs> the cowboy hat, that is part of their, uh, their weapon safety system. You need to have a, a safe weapon here. Here we go, we're off and fighting. Count Forkula, good well, shovey zippy. start here. Wow. Really hoping to push Hive Smashing up against the rail and break that horizontal. Count Forkula, good speed from the count. I'm, I'm really in the rock, loving paper, that, that front here. wedge design on Count Forkula. It's really designed to help corral and steer your bot and, and, and capture it instead of kind of deflecting. Now, incredibly, Hive Smashing has landed a good pin here. This could be a 10 second pin for, for Hive Smashing. Count Forkula finding those super Ooh. sharp forks, getting under the rail. Every single time that these two robots make connection, Hive Smashing's uh, weapon is at risk of going down. A horizontal hates crashing into something big and solid. But look at the front of Count Forkula. You start to see that uh, it looks like TPU uh, printed wedge is starting to get a deep gouge down the center of it. Literally Hive Smashing carving away at that armor package. I am seeing black plastic in the box that looks like it's plastic from Count Forkula. And look at that. Did they get embedded in the front of Count Forkula? Now we're going to have to see this shot here. Oh, wow. We got the lift. It looks like the weapon is embedded in the front of Count Forkula. Wow. You can see it's being chewed away. That is a very soft material inside of that wedge. And just the, the size, the size of Count Forkula, it is massive. A minute left here in this fight. I just love the speed and just kind of like this, this like enveloping yeah. zippiness of that, that robot. One of the big things to really watch for is drive quality with a style of robot like this. You can see that um, you know they're they're still working on that drive quality. If they if they had more practice in the box, Count Forkula could be a really formidable opponent. They've they've seen so many opportunities here to really capitalize, but you know I just think that the perhaps the speed and the the, the steering of that robot is tough to nail. Good pin here from Count Forkula with 25 seconds left here in this fight. Now, the weapon on Hive Smashing has gone down. That's going to be some good damage scored for Count Forkula. Also, Hive Smashing's mini bot has been inverted and immobile for, for quite some time. When a mini bot goes down, I mean, in the eyes of the judges, that's seen as a significant amount of damage. Uh, that you know really can weigh against you. That is the that is the double-edged sword of having the mini bot and taking advantage of that for a weight bonus. Yep. All right, now that is the match. This one will go to the judges. Now that is a pretty tall hat there, Chris. It's like a, it's an actual 10-gallon hat. Yeah. 
right, we're going to head over to cage two next. And we've got Paul St. Armand and ER Stingray two facing off against Scrambled and Grant Frazier. Now, Scrambled here is in blue in the blue corner, helpfully. And uh, Paul St. Armand is here in the pink corner running the horizontal. You can tell that it's scrambled because there's a little egg on the top, Chris. Take it over easy, Luke. And we're off. It's a good start here out of the box from Grant and Scrambled immediately getting Paul up on an angle. One of the big things to watch for with a oh, horizontal wow. is uh, keeping that horizontal blade absolutely uh, flat with the floor. If Grant is able to land a couple more of these big pins, we're going to see ER Singer go bouncing around inside of the box. Now, one of the big things that I've seen from Scramble's performance in the past is his absolute bulletproof weapon reliability. And uh, these weapons are going great now with two minutes wow. and 20 seconds left here in this fight. Now, normally I would say in the rock, paper, scissors of combat robotics, Scrambled has the advantage taking that vertical into the horizontal of an ER Stingray, but if anything, 2023 has painted a very different portrait. Horizontals have been doing incredible this year. Yeah, and HRL really has seen a renaissance in horizontals as a, as a weapon type. We've seen multiple golden dumpsters this year from horizontals. But you can see how controlled Grant's driving is on Scrambled, really just getting around to the back of his opponent and pushing. This is a good pushing pin. Grant has been exactly where he wants to be this entire match, showing incredible control. Paul here just looks lost, Chris. A minute and a half left here in this fight. This is one of the marks of a really good driver staying so close to your opponent. Now you can see Grant has been no more than six to 10 inches away from his opponent this entire match. And this allows him to come in and capitalize on these moments. Also, I believe that ER Stingray was just inverted for like that last 40 seconds, which can make it a lot more difficult to, to drive when, you're, uh, when your entire drive system is now has to be inverted. Now it looks like the left side drive on Scrambled is locked up, but the weapon on ER Stingray is down. And you can see Grant continuing to crab walk his way over. He wants to land one more big hit with 30 seconds left in this fight. Grant has improved so much as a builder here at NHRL. I remember the first time that we saw Scrambled, we said, ah, it's a really good robot, but the drive is still, you know, improving. And here, good robot, good drive, 15 seconds left. Now, as we tick down into the final 10 seconds, they will, go, they will take this to the judges. Uh, and the judges are going to be deciding here who's winning, but I think that this may be a win for Grant Frazier and Scrambled. Wow. Incredible. Good fight. All right, You've got to be yelking me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There you go. Uh, how many more egg jokes do you think we can come up with today? How many egg puns do you think you have, Chris? I don't know. If I have one more, it'd be egg static. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That's mm -hmm. pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as soon as uh, I think of them, you say them, so I can't say it again. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's the worst when uh, you're in a pun off. It's not hard. It's over easy. Oh, my God. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Now, uh, we, we opened up the doors here at 9 o'clock Eastern, and we can already see people loading in, you know, like lots of fans coming in. Uh, I, I anticipate we're going to have more than 1,000 people come through the building here today. Um, if you want to experience this live, if you're watching this on YouTube and you're like, I've got to come and see this myself, we are in suburban Connecticut, you know, fly into New York City, take the Metro North here. Yeah. And uh, it is a really, really fun day out. It's, I mean, there's food trucks, there's activities, you know, we get a, we get a thousand people like in here and the energy and the enthusiasm, yeah. it is a blast. It is an all day blast. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and if you're watching us, you know, on YouTube, like, comment, share, subscribe. 
Are there any other actions that they can take to uh, help us out? Oh, TikTok, Instagram, We're everywhere. Facebook. And uh, also, you know, we have this uh, this new Havoc Academy that's uh, that's coming out this fall, where you, if you're interested in learning about how to build combat robotics, how to get involved in the sport, it's going to be a great opportunity for you to, uh, to to get that early experience, to dive right in and join us. Check out details on the Havoc Academy on NHRL's website, NHRL.io. I hear that we're going to be going to Cage Six. Now, Cage Six is Money Shot here in uh, the, the green robot in the pink corner, facing off against Nightlight in the blue corner. These are two custom robots, absolutely gorgeous in green and purple. Wow. Nightlight's running a mini bot. And we're off. There we go. Now, Money Shot here is just an absolutely massive vert. Wow, look Night at the size of that undercutter. vert. Holy cow. Wow, good weapon to weapon exchanges here. And Nightlight just really staying on top of Money Shot. Money Shot run by Craig LeBlanc here. Entering this competition with a four and five record across the past four events. Nightlight here run by team Valkyrie team member. And look, do you know why do you know why Nightlight is actually not afraid of Money Shots Vert? Wow, I saw a big key piece coming off of one of these robots. It's because it's only afraid of the dark. <laughs> that looks like perhaps part of the the weapon assembly from Nightlight that is uh, that is on the floor there, I can't tell. It also could be, I guess, part of the, the weapon assembly from Money Shot, but both of these weapons look like they're down now. I love to see a gorgeous custom robot. You can see those little dollar signs cut into the blade of Money Shot. <laughs> I didn't see that. It makes sense, though. Bansing Santa here with Team Valkyrie is a BattleBots pit crew member competing uh, in season seven with Lucy Dew, the new captain of Valkyrie. And appropriately, it's an undercutter, Chris. Mm. They love undercutters on that team. 80 seconds left here in this fight, and it looks like Nightlight could be dead. Craig has somehow survived this fight. Yeah, you Hobbled, see those but victorious. The wheels are twitching, but they are, uh, they're not grabbing. They are not mobile. You can see Nightlight uh, there inverted and uh, now going up against the mini bot. I hear the count out now. Knockout. There it is. That is a knockout. Your winner is Craig LeBlanc and Money Shot. Craig LeBlanc from, from New Bedford, Massachusetts. He works as a welder and a machinist. And uh, his interests include playing darts, RC cars, and 3D printing, which is pretty in line with the NHRL kind of ethos, you know? Yeah. You gotta like line up your shot, kind of your dart skills, you know? RC cars, you gotta be able to drive a remote controlled vehicle. Precision and welding, sometimes yeah. uh, they do go hand in hand in the sport. Now here in cage eight, we've got Red Hawk. This is a good overhead shot of Red Hawk, the, uh, the horizontal, facing off against Yolk. Chris, you've got to be yolking me. I did that one already, Luke. Yolk. Oh, really? Ah, dang it. Yolk is a, uh, you know, egg-themed robot. Now appropriately, oh, this is, I think, our first look at our very first combat robot from Chico State out in California. This is very cool. Now, Red Hawk is one of those bonds that is qualified for the World Championships. Now, uh, Yolk here run by Tyler Gomez from Chico, California. Now, very cool. Uh, Chico's engineering department uh, was one of the uh, recipients of the $10,000 NHRL College Grant program here uh, this year. And they used that $10,000 to build about half a dozen combat robots there. That is so cool. And building out a um, combat robotics division of their existing robotics team. 
and uh, they are here, you know, being spearheaded by Jason Vasquez from Team Whiplash on BattleBots. You can see Jason here uh, standing cage side with his team members. This is that, per that team member's very first fight ever. He introduced combat robotics to them as, as, a, as, a, as a concept, which is very, very cool. Uh, I, I got to talk to the Vasquez's last night, and they have some very cool robots up there. Now, um, the, the big one, the one that I'm really excited about is Sidewalk Slammer. Did you get a chance to see this? It's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so it starts off in the match as a vert, conventional vert. And there's this little pin, almost like a, a grenade. grenade pin, yeah. yeah, that's in the back of this weapon. And uh, there's, there's this little servo where um, if Jason wants to, he can pull the pin and the weapon falls down and it becomes a, a horizontal. horizontal spinner. It's a gorgeous bot, and it's just such a radical design. I've yeah. never seen anything like it, and it's its debut fight here today at NHRL. Yeah. Again, because of that NHRL grant that helped build that program. Right. It's NHRL dollars that contributed directly to that robot, and that is why he brought it here to debut. Yeah, yeah. That is going to be one of those robots really uh, it's interesting to watch. Now, um, this is its very first time being run anywhere in the country. Uh, Jason is intrigued by this concept. Jason's been in this sport since he's like five or six. You know, the Vasquez family is big in the Southern California combat robotics scene. Um, Jason was telling me that he was inspired by an ant weight run by Kronos Captain Jerry Serafin from Smashbots there in Southern California um, that had this kind of similar actuating horizontal or vertical. Um, he's done some really interesting stuff, though, with the idea um, up there with this kind of grenade pin. Um, and that's allowed uh, kind of the simplicity of that, that motion mm. has allowed him to put a ton of weight into the drive and into the weapon. I mean, it's a nasty looking blade on that, on that thing. It is. Yeah, it's a massive blade. Yeah. The... Now, um, now, very interestingly, we had interviews last night with a bunch of top builders, and our friend Kyle spoke to Anthony D'Ambrosio. Let's check out that right now. I'm standing by here with Anthony D'Ambrosio, who has come with the new and upgraded version of Dark Star. Anthony, how you doing, bud? I'm doing fantastic, Kyle. Good to see you, as it's, always. It's so good to see you. Listen, yes. I want to talk about this. You were showing me earlier. I want to show it to our friends back home. Sure, sure. What have you upgraded on Dark Star for this event, for the future? What, like, the thing that I'm most fascinated by, obviously, what sticks out the most is these wheels. What is this? All right, so uh, Dark Star as a whole started uh, with a little bit of a collab with uh, the Honeycrack team with Zoe. Um, Zoe built an inspired 12 pounder that was based on Blackbird the 12. So then I worked with Zoe to kind of scale this up along with Angel Vidal. A lot of people you guys know Angel, um, great designer for Shredded and uh, builder of great three pound robots as well. Um, we were able to develop a couple of things coming out of the last event and some great improvements with this robot. So we, we knew the frame was robust, it could take some hits. So we knew that was rock solid. Electronics worked. Uh, the wheels were one problem. We had a major traction issue. We tried everything last time from skateboard grip tape to epoxy to you name it. So we just Decided we would use an off-the-shelf wheel, so it's a standard Bainbots wheel. Angel developed this kind of awesome little kit here where we have some inserts that go inside and then some TPU uh, inserts that it's get screwed into on either side by these titanium cleats. So basically, it's a serviceable titanium wheel, uh, cleated wheel, uh, although it's 100% traction. So um, it's going to dig. Sorry about your floors, guys. I'm going to do the rebuilding. Sorry about your floor. Uh, but it's going to give us plenty of traction. This is what the wheel actually looks like on the inside. So you just screw right in. Yeah. And then we screw on either side, and it basically locks the wheel together. So it's uh, ingenious. We worked on this together for uh, a couple weeks to, to get what we wanted, and uh, this is what we finally came up with. It's 100% serviceable. So we got the shelf parts and put it all together. So beyond that, some really awesome upgrades. Last time around, we had just our vertical armor. Um, it's all TPU, uh, very, very thick infill. Uh, this time we developed a horizontal variant. So I was researching a lot of like real life tanks and how they deflect and how their armor plating is done. So we hope, the hope is, this is gonna be able to deflect horizontal hits, a lot of infill on it. Um, and then it has this lip on the top right here that maybe you guys can see. And the hope is that if a horizontal rides up, it'll deflect off before they get to the wheel. 
Um, additionally, the back is scooped, so it kind of deflects out. There's nothing to catch on the bottom or the back of the robot. Um, it's funny, we do the stealth fighter theme, and we call this the Sea Shadow because it looks just like the stealth boat that Lockheed Martin made. So it's almost exactly the same in terms of profile. Um, beyond that, we have kind of an upgraded bar system. It's almost identical to Blackbird, just scaled up yep. uh, from the three pound to the 12. Uh, and our, our plate. So we have an adjustable ring system inside the top plate to raise and lower it, depending on the size of the battery that we have, or for compression reasons, we have a TPU ring inside. So if we do get hit, it will compress down and actually absorb the hit, rather than the chassis taking the actual hit. This is so impressive. You put so much work into the, the design, the structure of this machine. Go ahead yep. and take the top plate if off. If you want to see the inside, though, it looks like just like everybody else's bought here. It looks like a hurley packed uh, luggage if you're going on a trip really quick. Uh, but we have a lot of really big, beefy internals here. Like our weapon ESC is massive, our drive ESC is massive, our battery is massive. It's a big, big battery. We, we had a lot of battery issues last time. We knew we had to go bigger. Um, but yeah, we're very, very happy with it. Our testing has been great. And uh, we hope that we can uh, get some wins, maybe qualify, uh, maybe make it to finals. Then we'll have two robots in finals. So. I absolutely love this. It's a fantastic robot. I think you're going to do extremely well. Thank you. Uh, I'm so excited to see it perform. Yep. Good luck at the event, sir. Thank you very much. And again, I want to thank Angel, my, my right-hand man since day one when we, when we do this stuff. And he, he really is great at taking my vision and translating it to make a beautiful death machine. And he's very good at it. <laughs> um, additionally, I've got one more thing. Almost the trademark of Blackbird has been this little mini bot right here, but we made a much bigger version called Aurora that's mostly TPU. Um, again, designed to deflect, everything's kind of cutting away. So um, we're very happy with it. We're very excited to, to drive them and uh, hopefully we can get some wins. It'd be great. Thank you very much. All right, so we're going to go to cage two. Oh here. my goodness, Luke. Chris, get ready for cat uh, uh, action here with Positively Hysterical which uh, is bringing back the squeaky hammer, Chris. The deadliest weapon ever seen in combat robotics history. It's certainly one of the loudest. <laughs> we just heard positively hysterical trounce across the box, getting into the pink corner, and uh, Paws is up against Cha-Cha Taken in the blue. That uh, big stomping motion on Positively Hysterical, you have to love. Now look at this, he's running a mini bot and they both have squeaky hammers. Oh, wow. That big, <laughs> heavy sound is that huge robot from Tom Farkas oh, and no! Positively Hysterical. Brutal! Oh, the humanity! Hammering the top of Cha-Cha taken from both sides. Cha-Cha has oh, no, no idea what's happening. <laughs> the speed on Positively Hysterical is shocking, Chris. I, it was just a blur. Wow. Cha-Cha taking, uh, taking some serious punishment to its top armor. <laughs> oh, no! Wow, they're competing squeaky hammers here. Just fighting to, to, to hammer away at the top of Cha-Cha taking. Incredible cha-cha take, it looks hobbled here. And positively hysterical pursuing! The sound of the stomping is so loud, I cannot even tell you, Chris. Oh, delightful, joy, delight. The combo from Positively Hysterical descending on Cha-Cha Taken like a pride of lions. The squeaking, I can't. <laughs> oh, no! no! Pause! Yes! Yes! <laughs> An amazing self riot from Tom Ferguson and Positively Hysterical. They say a cat always lands on its feet. Wow. Now Cha Cha Taken has failed to land even a single lift here. This is total dominance here from Positively Hysterical and Tom Farkas. These competing squeaking hammers. I cannot, Chris, I cannot. Oh my goodness. With 45 seconds left, I think Tom Farkas has picked up every single point on the judges card. Uh.
Wow. Cha Cha taken, unable to even get out of this uh, this center octagon here to try and reset itself. It's yet to land a single pin, yet to land a single lift, and Paz looming over its prey, brutally hammering it to death. As we enter the last 10 seconds of this very delightful match, this one will go to the judges. And if it's anything other than a win for Positively Hysterical, we're burning down the building, Chris. Unbelievable. Let's go, Tom. If I had nine lives, I'd just used eight of them. <laughs> Tom Farkas, uh, our last year's Rookie of the Year. Yeah. For introducing the world to Positively Hysterical. Look at that. Look at I can with the replay. I love it. If you have children, put them away. <laughs> this is just, this is brutal. This is not sped up. Now that hammer is that fast, Chris. Wow. Delightful. <laughs> Delightful. All right, we're going to head over to cage three here. I see the Davis boys back standing cage side here with... Purple Pain facing off against Chad New and Yippee. Now Chad is on Team Copperhead on BattleBots and uh, he's part of the brand new BattleBots team, Magnitude. Now Yippee is uh, essentially his three pound introduction. He's really hoping to get Yippee qualified. His, uh, his 30 pounder Yahoo is qualified for the world championships later this year. And so he really wants to have a second bot there. Chad, our giant pumpkin farmer and pet store owner from Colorado. And like all Coloradans, what he really loves is drum spinners. I can hear the counting on Purple Pain. Purple Pain is stuck up against the rail. Chad New just popping bug in the air. Knockout. That is a knockout. Your wow. winner is. Chad New and Yippee. That is a substantial drum on a beetle weight. Now, Chris, I know there's been a lot of speculation about Team Magnitude. Who do you think they're going to announce as their next team member? Well, let's see. Uh, so far, it is uh, Chad New, Colorado. Yep. And Chris DeSico, New York. What? So we'll see what comes next. Chris, you're on Team Magnitude. There's, that's what I've heard. Wow, okay. Or so I've been told. I know that we're going to be announcing uh, you know, the rest of the team members in a slow information drip ahead of Proving Grounds. Yes, as we go up to battle Redacted. Right, yes. Yeah, Redacted, very, uh, very, um, very interesting. Um, Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I would double check with that control. I've just heard something disturbing over the radio. We're going to check before I just put it out there in public. All right. Now, uh, magnitude, interesting robot facing off against Redacted in early December. Is that right? Yeah, I think it's the weekend of December 10th in Las Vegas. Yeah, a lot of speculation about both of these uh, these teams. Redacted, very little information known about it. It's pretty interesting. We know that it's a flipper, though, right? We do know now that it is a flipper. Built by a famous BattleBots captain. Ah, yes, Captain Redacted. Right, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, Chad New, you know, first time captaining a BattleBots team, but uh, if someone can do it, it's Chad. Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, an incredible uh, drum design, and who better to bring a, a new drum design to uh, BattleBots than Chad New? Yeah, exactly. Now, I can see that we're locking up cage two here. And uh, cage two, Drumblebee versus Tie-Dye. Now Ooh. we're fighting uh, six cages, six Beetlebait cages simultaneously, so I don't know if we're going to go to cage two just yet. Oh, we are. Oh, this is great. Okay, Drumblebee here in white, uh, over in the pink corner, facing off against Tie-Dye here in the blue corner. Who may or may not have heard of you stuck getting oh, its unstick uh, before the start of the match. That's uh, not a great start here little uh, ominous foreshadowing, perhaps, Chris.
Now, uh, your winner in that last fight was Tom Farkas and Positively Hysterical. Round of applause for the Catbot. Meow! And, uh, the first of seven wins here today, and he is going to take it all the way to the end and win a golden dumpster. I, that, with that, I have certainty. Yeah. Never been more certain about anything in my life, Chris. All right, cage two is locked and loaded. All bots have gotten their own stick. <laughs> And here's our count in. Two, one, light robot, light. Now, Jumbo B here in white is run by Vincent Kaia Bogan from Team Dicey. Now, this is a Brandeis University robot here in white, facing off against tie dye, which I'm assuming has an awful lot of titanium, Chris. Oh, that makes sense. Now, I was expecting a more colorful paint scheme, I think, on tie dye. But that is just uh, absolutely gorgeous. Like, I could see that shimmering uh, purple and black on tie-dye, which is just great. Yeah, that really is. The way it catches the light and everything, it's gorgeous. I love I love a well-designed bot, not just in functionality, but in your appearance. It's all part of building a brand, and that is a, that is a huge component of being a successful team in combat robotics. And it looks a little lost inside of the box. It's run into the rail a couple times. It's been inverted more than it's been on its feet. And it's trying to violently self right itself, but it likes to be on its head, Chris. Oh, no! Now, typically, one of the challenges when you see a really tall design like this is that the, uh, the weight is, is pretty high up on the robot, so it wants to flip itself over. Yeah, it does gyro itself onto its head very easily, so tie-dye has to be very careful with taking any turns, trying to reorient itself and square up against Drumblebee. Yeah, it's kind of this Deep Six-esque, Division-esque, uh, large, large vert on tie-dye. And, uh, you know, the physics of that can make it difficult to drive. Although I will say Ooh. it gets bonus points in my book for the googly eyes on those uh, supports, those upright supports. 65 seconds left here in this fight. Drumblebee has been incredibly consistent here from Team Dicey. Staying on its opponent. Tide Eye really kind of doing its own thing here in this. Unable to capitalize. Drives a little slow. Drives on its head a lot. Crashing into the rail a lot. Wow. It is a very ambitious custom build. And uh, I think that some of the, the geometry in that, uh, that robot needs a second look. 20 seconds left here in this fight. Now, Drumblebee here managed to uh, extricate itself as we enter the last 10 seconds. Tie dye on its head. Will it be able to use the last few seconds to land it? A good hit? I don't know. What a good pop. Nice. All right, good round of applause there. For Vincent and Team Dicey. And you can see uh, Team Captain Tim Hebert over there. He typically runs Chubby Unicorn, one of our top ranked Beatles globally here at NHRL. Tim has already qualified for the November finals, but we will be seeing Chubby Unicorn in the fields. So I'm going to dial in a couple more things before next month's finals. All right. All right, now we're looking at cage five. Now we can see Erebus there uh, in the blue corner facing off against Reptile Dysfunction in the pink corner. All right, we're restarting on five due to a false start. We can see Bloodsport team member right. Nick Buckholtz here working as a referee today, five, getting this match started. Three. Now, Erebus here is this big, wide, black lifter here in the blue corner, facing off against Reptile Dysfunction, a horizontal. 
Now, Erebus is this custom 3D printed, very tough little tanky robot running mechanism wheels, Chris. Oh, wow. That's so cool. You can see that drifting motion. Now, with mechanism wheels, it's just as easy for them to drive oh, no. sideways as they are forward. What just got sheared off? I can't even, I can't even tell. Something got sheared off and the weapon died on Erebus. Oh, no. But that lifter is still lifting. That's the benefit of running a uh, two-part weapon system, Chris. You can lose your, uh, your vert and continue to lift, which is great. Now, one of the big challenges for a mechanism wheel is that it doesn't have the same pushing power as a, a robot with conventional wheels. But I don't think it really matters because reptile dysfunction has looked a little lost in the box here. Looks like they're just getting reoriented now and starting to go in for some attacks. Erebus is not gonna really try to give them an opportunity though to start racking up some of those damage points. Now, Reptile Dysfunction is run by Ben from the University of Cincinnati. Now, uh, one of the, the big factors yesterday was that the entire University of Cincinnati team was flying in and their, uh, wow. their flight was supposed to land at 11 a.m. Friday, but they had uh, rain delays and uh, they got in at 2 a.m. today. Oh my goodness. They flew into Hartford and then took Ubers, I'm guessing, for the hour from Hartford to Norwalk. So stumbling into their hotel room at 3, 3.30 in the morning. And here they are fighting at 9 a.m. That is going to be a factor in the team's performance today. 55 seconds left here in this fight. Erebus with Mark Kansberg. Now, uh, do you want to know a fun fact about Mark, Chris? Of course. Now, uh, he works as a packaging engineer at Ferrero, makers of Nutella and Ferrero Rocher. Ooh. So uh, that is pretty cool. That's weird. I work in unpackaging <laughs> Ferrero Rocher. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you can see, you know, that's those engineering skills, those totally meticulous engineering skills on display with Erebus. It is this very cool, menacing, black, multi-robot, mechanism wheel thing. And it is doing great. As we enter the last 10 seconds, this one will go to the judges, but I think that this is very clearly, well, I don't know. I don't know. No, I don't actually, know. Maybe We're seeing drive issues on one bot and weapon yeah, issues weapons, on the other. Yeah, this, this, is, this is actually a closer match. You know, it's, it's true, though, that, you know, one out of three bots do suffer from reptile dysfunction. <laughs> wow. Okay. We'll see if, the, we'll see if uh, the doctors and judges agree. We're going to take this to the judges. And I just want to apologize in advance. <laughs> All right. Very exciting. I just saw Red Sawyer walking into the building. We're gonna go upstairs and we're gonna we're gonna touch him with Sam. Yeah, let's see who he's with. Oh hello, I'm here with Tom Farkas off of his big win with Positively Hysterical. Tom, can you tell us about the key to your victory there? Um just hitting him as many times as I could with a squeaky hammer. Um the minibot driving was great with the extra squeaky hammer, and we just, I swung the hammer as many times as I could. And you're not gonna run out of gas swinging that hammer. You can swing all day five, as long as the fight goes four, on. As, three, as long as they need me two, to. One, and you had some five, clutch self rights four, in there as well. Is that, three, was that planned? Did you two, practice those? One, I fight, did not even think it was going fight. to self right. I, was, I just gave it a shot and with the, with the slightly stronger servo, it actually was able to self right. So as long as I don't get tipped on my back, we're okay. All right, well, thank you so much. Congratulations and good luck in the rest of the tournament. Thank you very much. All right, we're jumping right into cage one where we have Swagmore and Darkstar. Darkstar, we got a close look at with Anthony uh, with our interview with Kyle just earlier. Huge weapon on weapon exchanges for this fight in progress. We see massive showers of sparks as these weapons go head to head. 
Anthony with Darkstar in black, facing off against Swagmore in green. And Tony just has been doing great with these cleaning wheels. Tipping Swagmore up against the rail. Oh, big shower of sparks there. You can see the power in these two egg beater drums. Big punt across the uh, the box here. Two minutes left in this fight. Somebody and Tony is, is stuck down. up against the, the rail. Now, Tony may be getting an unstick here from tap Fluffy. Out. Oh, no. no! It's a tap out. Your winner is Swagmore. Wow. I'm curious to see what happened. They might have pulled the plug on it early just to try to diagnose some issues, bring it back up to the pits. Because it's not necessarily the end of the day, but when you have uh, so many kind of prototypes and new designs all being tested at the same time, you want to make sure that they are, uh, that they're dialed in and that they're not just getting torn asunder, right? Now, for you to call for an unstick, you have to press a button, and that button happens to be next to the tap out button. I wonder if that is what happened. Tony typically waits for, you know, the save, and I can see them negotiating their cage side. Uh, now, remember this first fight of the day, you know, it just determines your seating. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be seeing Tony at least one more time. Let's check in upstairs with Kyle. Hello, Kyle. Gotcha. Hello, how are you? Doing great, Kyle. What do you have for us? So I am standing by with Ben. Ben has uh, brought something very strange for this event. It is the first ever Melty Brain Vertical Spinner. Ben, how are you doing? Is this your first NHRL or have you joined us before? I know, this is my first NHRL. It's a long way for me to get here, so. Yeah, it's a bit of a hike. You can tell by the accent. He's been, it took a bit of a travel to get here. Can you show us your robot? Uh, yeah, sure. So what does this thing do? It's absurd. Uh, so it does two things, maybe poorly. Uh, it has two vertical spinners, one on either edge, and then the whole thing is a melty brain. So much like Project Liftoff, it spins the entire robot at high speed. Uh, so that's why I need two vertical spinners, because they both generate gyroscopic forces, but with both of them running, they cancel each other out, and it lets the melty brain spin up as it should, basically. And what is the purpose of this googly-eyed armor on top? Uh, so the googly eye is interesting interesting, when the melty brain is up to full speed properly, the googly eye gets forced to the edge and it, you, you kind of get a little dot in the middle where the googly eye kind of sits correctly. But if the melty brain is like vibrating or not moving correctly, then the googly eye starts shifting rapidly and then I know the need to like spin the weapons down, spin the back up again, get the thing kind of working a little bit better. Uh, so it's kind of a functional googly eye, kind of. I love that. And who are you facing first today? I am versing staying alive, a vert. So there's going to be a lot of vert going on in the arena uh, when we're both in there. That's absolutely fantastic, Ben. Thank you for showing us this mad creation. I can't wait to see it in the box. <laughs> oh, I can't wait either. It's going to be chaos, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Back to you guys. Now, Ben joining us all the way here from Australia. Now, this is one of our, I, th I think this is our furthest, you know, that a competitor has ever traveled to I don't know if you can get further. No, I don't think so. And uh, so joining us from Australia and joining us here at the desk, Jake Hoffman from Maximizer. Hello, Jake. Great to be here. We got some cool robots here. Um, I'm so excited to watch the 12-pound class. Uh, I just watched my, my team fight, uh, Reptile Dysfunction. They did great. Um, can't wait to see more fights throughout the day. It's such an interesting field. Uh, it's the deepest 12-pound field ever. Yeah, yeah um, definitely. Which is, I mean, NHRL keeps getting bigger and bigger. It's great. Yeah. So it's good to see it. All right. Going over to cage three here. Let's check Aaron out. Hill. Yeah. Now we've got Sad Octopus facing Five, off against Doc. Four, three, two, one. Fight, robots fight. Now, Sad Octopus in the pink corner, and this big, wide, white, and red and black robot is Doc from Aaron Hill. Tantrum Captain Aaron Hill. Seems reasonable, Captain Aaron Hill. Now, uh, this is really interesting. I think that this is Swerve 
drive or some other kind of omni drive on dock. You can see that drifting motion across the box. Oh, wow! A good hit. Massive hit. What a perfect weapon design for sniping belts. <laughs> oh, no, and the eyeball has been sniped as well. Let's see if that affects the performance. You know, they say it's all fun and games until someone loses an eye. <laughs> <laughs> wow, going head over heels with Doc. That is a very cool little trick. Now, Aaron Hill back on his feet, drifting around inside of the box. This is one of the most interesting Beatles that I have seen this year. The reliability on that arm is so impressive, being able to take those massive impacts. Now, Brett coming over to uh, see if he can help out Aaron Hill. A minute 45 left in this fight. But has Doc been sent back to 1985, Luke? <laughs> Wow. Now they're just trying to force that arm back into place, and he's done it! Aaron Hill back on his feet with a minute 20 left here in this fight. Now I wonder if that arm is going to, uh, is going to come back or if it's broken for the rest of this fight. I feel like I can see that spinner running on it, but the articulation on the arm is not going. Now, Jake, do you know how to get a sad octopus to laugh? How? Ten tickles. It's an octopus joke. Ten tickles. Ten tickles. Oh, wow, that's... Jake was looking at you like, you're not going to tickle me on the stream, are you, Chris? Not until the weird part of the night. Though. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's, that's subscription content, Jake. All right? <laughs> 35 seconds left here in this fight. The weapon is down on Doc. The drive is still working great. Sad Octopus. That doing weapon is still best. chugging away on Doc. Wow. The articulation is down, but it's yeah. still lethal. Yeah, I, saw, I, see, I see that Doc's weapon is back up. They have taken it the full three minutes. This one will go to the judges here. Interesting, ambitious robot from the builder of Tantrum and Blip. Get out of here, really. The builder of Twins, the builder of Shifty. Aaron Hill here, fantastic combat robot builder, and he loves to bring something interesting and weird. Sam, uh, sad, sad Octopus here run by Cameron Guerin from Milford, New Hampshire. Entering this competition with a two and three record across the past two events. High school students there with Sad Octopus in blue. Aaron Hill, engineer extraordinaire from Silicon Valley. And he's just built some of the most interesting robots that we've ever seen in this sport. He is interested in stretching the meta, exploring the meta, playing with the meta, not, uh, you know, like in hopes of breaking the meta from just a strange angle. Right. I um, Doc took some serious hits, but was mostly intact at the end of that match. I'm really, really surprised for, for being such a, an odd shape, yeah. so lanky and long. It held I, together. I liked that somersaulting motion that Doc was able to do. That's pretty interesting. Um, and, you know, also really working with Omni Drive, you know, I think that, that may have been Swerve Drive, either that or, or Mechanum Wheels. Mm. But um, it's, it's an interesting concept, like a control bot with Omni Drive. Kind of uh, unusual. I can, I can see the thinking, like I'm trying to pin my opponent, really kind of get them in, in the Five, right spot and then four, land my, uh, my hammer. Three, Let's see if he, two, can, if he can execute. One. Fight, robot, hear the voice of God uh, calling us into a fight. Uh, and here we are, we're in cage one. Cage Minus one. Brett five and Milk Tank. Oh boy. Now you can see Milk Tank here is this big white robot. Minor Threat five is this very uh, deadly conventional vert. Now Minor oh. Threat five run by Luke Grell from Team Jackpot on BattleBots. And Milk Tank from Tamara Doherty. Our favorite milk-themed, cow-themed, bovine-themed wow. robot. Big hit there from Minor Threat 5. Out. Quick yeah. tap out from Tamra. Luke is your winner. That was devastating. 
Now, uh, fun fact for, about Minor Threat 5. Now, Minor Threat 5, Jake, remind me, they just won a big competition, yes, didn't they? Yes, they just came in first at Moto. So yeah. Very impressive. Um, Minor Threat 5 almost didn't make it. I read yesterday in the chat that Luke almost missed, or, or their plane flight got canceled because yeah. of the uh, rain. And let me tell you, not having that bot here would have blown a hole through the bracket for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so having him there here ready to qualify, it's 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 a tough bot to fight. Um, we'll see how he does. Minor Threat 5 is one of the top-ranked robots in this uh, this weight class that has yeah. not qualified yet. Yeah. He is hoping to get his invitation very late in the year, and uh, I think that he's got a pretty good shot. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna head over to Cage 5. I can see the, uh, the, the Five, Davis boys four, again here in the pink three. corner. Two, with a one. young Fight. yellow Robots facing off against Fight. Death Muffin. Now, Death Muffin, pretty goth name. You can see it in black. It looks like that is an SSP lifter kit. Young yellow, uh, designed by the Davis boys, and uh, you can see both of them. One is uh, one is driving the main bot, the other is driving the mini bot bug. The Minibot they share with their father across their line of robots. Oh, and a good pin from Death Muffin. There we go. Let's see if Bug can come in and uh, try and work on this. And look at that. It is Katie Farkas on the other side of the box running Death Muffin. Tom Farkas' wife, this is her very first competition ever. Running a main bot, she's driven the mini bot before from Positively Acerico, her first drink of the day. Very cool to see Katie getting involved in the sport with an SSP kit, very cool. And an SSP kit might be like the perfect way to start uh, with the sport, obviously. Seth Schaefer, uh, the designer of the SSP kit, built it to be really, really uh, resilient. It can handle a lot of hits. It, it, it is a, a very uh, great control bot. And where better to learn how to how to drive, how to navigate a fight than with like a really solid built control bot? Yeah, drive quality and drive skill is probably 60% of, uh, of your ability to win a match. Jake, you know all about that. You're pretty big on uh, on drive practice. <laughs> it's tough. I mean, you can design a really great robot, but if you can't get that robot where it needs to be, I mean, you're you're kind of treading water as far as the uh, competitive side. Uh, so, control bot, you know, it's resilient. It's gonna take a lot of hits and be able to uh, dish out some. One, one of the really big challenges when you're running a, uh, a kinetic weapon robot is that you need to build a test box to really safely practice with it because you need to spin up your weapon so you can understand the physics of right. driving while your weapon is running. That is a challenge for the average rookie builder who may not have the resources or the time or even the ability to build a full test box. But with an SSP kit, you know, with a um, with a lifter, you can drive all or, all around your house, and uh, you know you're not uh, in danger of ripping off a finger or a toe. Just watch the forks. <laughs> Just watch the forks. Yeah, you can scratch the uh, <laughs> you can scratch the wood, I guess. Five seconds left here in this fight. We're gonna take this one to the judges. Katie Farkas making her NHRL debut in uh, you know the big the big spot. That's pretty cool. Love it. All right, now the Davises did great. Their weapon ran the full three minutes. Let's see what the judges think about that fight. You can see their dad, Drew Davis, our favorite 10th grade English teacher from Schenectady. Now these are upstate New Yorkers on both sides of the box. The Farkases are from Cooperstown. Check in with a big box fight here in cage four. Hooligan facing off against Fluffy. Oh, wow. Hooligan's got a really interesting drive. He's doing the tangent drive thing, which is kind of the simplest way to, uh, to drive wheels. It's just a motor and a wheel, and the motor shaft rotates uh, that. You get a really good reduction. Um, it's more common in the Brazilian bots, but uh, 
Hooligan bringing it over to Florida. Jack Sapotnik here is a University of Florida mechanical engineering student there in the pink corner. Tangential drive, yeah, it's a very interesting concept. I saw in the roster there are actually a lot of tangential drive robots. The builders here in the U.S. are always looking about ways to improve their drive while cutting weight. And if tangential drive is one of those ways, I mean, we could be seeing a whole lot more of it here at this competition. Now, Hooligan's pretty unique because it's got four-wheel tangential drive. Right. There's a shaft in between all four of those uh, in order to, to power it. Usually, you see just a two-wheel tangential drive. So it's a cool twist. Yeah. Jake, do you see any disadvantages to that drive style? If your wheels wear down, you lose all your traction. That's the balance. So getting it in a position where you can both like have good pushing power and not wear out your wheels is, is uh, it's a balancing act, and it's taken a lot of time and, and effort to get Hooligan in the shape that it needs to be in. So mm. it's. I'm big really going, going to be looking at the drive performance of Hooligan in this fight. I mean, um, tangential drive at a 12 pound class or a 30 pound class. You've got to wonder, can it scale up? Like, is this is this a, a an actual meta kind of stretcher, or is this a fad that? Um, you know, people are going to find the uh, the uh, the flaws in. If there is a flaw in your design, NHRL competitors will find it. Um, and really, it's just the best of the best. You know that uh, that that survive as design concepts. I am also hearing from the judges that Sad Octopus took that match. Okay. Wow. Right. All right, we're going to check in with Kyle up in the pits, who is uh, standing cage side, oh, sorry, standing uh, desk side with uh, Tony D'Ambrosio. Hello, Kyle. Hey, how's it going, guys? So I'm standing here with Tony. Tony, you just had one heck of a match. Sure uh, there was some magic smoke that was supposed to stay in the robot that yeah. came out. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So obviously with a new robot, you got to work on some kinks. I drive it kind of like I drive Blackbird. So the problem is when I got upside down, I flipped my weapon switch to go in reverse. And then when he flipped me back over, I flipped it again before it spooled down. And that resulted in me completely exploding my Weapon ESC, so that is gone. It's supposed to look like this. Yeah, I was gonna say, show them what it's supposed That's to look what it's like. supposed to look Five, like. Um, four, so we got a little bit of work three. to do, but luckily the drive is still good, battery's fine. Magic smoke luckily was from this part, not from the battery. Um, that's the worst magic smoke you can get, but we'll rebuild it, and whoever we're gonna fight, we're gonna fight. So that's the name of the game. They break sometimes, that's Ooh. all. Well, good luck in the pits, and good luck in the box today, Thanks, Tony. Guys. Thank you. Wow. All right, now I can see that we've loaded, uh, that we're starting this fight here in cage four with Hooligan. And uh, I can just give you a preview. Now, Hooligan right now sitting and Hooligan dead is in the just water. Dead, dead yeah. in the water. I think that Hooligan is, 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 uh, is losing this match. Now, uh, we are loading into cage one. Oh boy. Alvin and the chip, Chipmunks from NHRL founder Austin McCord. This and is uh, this is one I'm of the most anticipated robots here. And we can see that there are no robots in Cage One, but they're coming. Now, uh, Chris, do you want to give us a little preview of Alvin and the Chipmunks? Uh, all I know is uh, they from were a cartoon from the 70s, is that right? I think they probably were born in the 80s. Yeah. 80s. Yeah. Okay. You know. Well, that's cartoon a, from the 80s. That's Alvin, Simon, and Theodore. Wow, okay, good. Nice. I always, I would get them confused with the Rescue Rangers, Chip and Dale. How could you do that? Chip and Dale, they have clothes. Wait, uh, I'm sorry, Alvin and the Chipmunks didn't have clothes? I mean, I guess. They oh, had, okay. they had sure. shirts oh, with they, their they initials their, on them. The initials. I wasn't right. there for the 80s, so. Right, I don't know, like what, what naked chipmunks am I thinking of from the 80s? I don't know. Luke, I know that you had a very strange upbringing in the 80s, and that's that's all I know. Yeah, okay. All right, good. Alvin and the Chipmunks, uh, let's see, they're a singing group. Is that right? And uh, Wait, hold on. Do uh -huh. I see marshmallows in cage one? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Alvin and the Chipmunks facing off against Craig. Now, uh, Craig here run by Ethan Shipley. 
Now, uh, Jake, you, you shared the car with uh, Ethan for what, 10, 11, 12 hours I had yesterday? the distinct honor of sitting next to Craig the entire time. Wow. And Craig looked more and more scared by this first matchup as the ride continued. Now, did Craig, uh, was, was Craig clad in this golden uh, fire safety, I guess? Uh, this is a new improvement. Metal? So this okay. Is, this, when you're going up against a flamethrower bot and you're mostly plastic, it's, yeah, uh, it's a problem. It's a good idea to take some additional protection. And there I think we that's see the goal here. NHRL founder Austin McCord with evil henchman Sam. Yep, they are running Alvin and the Chipmunks. Now, uh, I feel like we've teased it enough. These are two jet bots. Is that right, Chris? We are going to be seeing some pretty hefty RPMs. Now, uh, Craig is going to, uh, <laughs> to make its way into the corner, and we're going to open up this box again, and we are going to load in the jet bots. Now, this is a uh, jet bot multi bot. I don't know if it's one jet or if it's two jets. Are they both jets, Chris? I think it's. I think there's one jet. I might be mistaken, but one you know, jet, we've seen wedge this, or something. We've seen this exact jet before on a 30 pounder, but now in this multi bot configuration, it's on a it's on a much lighter bot. I'm curious to see what the physics uh, that play out inside Cage One are going to be. It's it should be at least some kind of aerial spectacle without there being a drone. I can see cage side, uh, the city of Norwalk fire marshals here, and they are very interested in seeing Alvin and the Chipmunks. Now, Austin is just obsessed with jet bots as a concept. He thinks that this is a meta breaker, and uh, we're gonna have to see if he can torch Craig. We can see Ricky Willems there, who is our, our safety officer at NHRL, and uh, a lot of it's just firefighters standing cage side, Chris. Now it's like, I, you wouldn't call it a, like a flamethrower bot. There's not necessarily a, a, a flame coming out of this jet engine, but the air that goes through this motor uh, at, I think it's 50,000 RPMs, yeah. gets generated so hot yeah. that it can combust things. It is so hot that if you were to run it outside on the pavement, it would remelt the asphalt, <laughs> which is pretty incredible, especially because we have wooden floors here, Chris. There Look, it is. There it is. And wow. so the jet. So this is a jet that wow. you would see on like an Iron Man suit. And yeah. it is currently just belted in to what looks like a <laughs> beetle weight pot. Yeah. I think it's a five pounder or something like that, but I mean, it's... One of the big things to look for with a jet is, is it able to consume all of the, uh, the oxygen inside of this box? Right. There's a huge volume of oxygen inside of, the, uh, inside of cage one. Look at, that, look at the tank of, I think it's diesel fuel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that powers, the, it just, this thing glugs in that fuel. It's, yeah. it's incredible how jet much it'll consume. Fuel. Yeah. One of the big things uh, you really to watch for is, are we going to see ignition from Craig? And uh, how long will Ethan wait before pulling that robot out? Because it is going to be white hot as it's coming out of the box. Now, I believe that the jet engine, uh, per the rule set, is allowed to get up to idling speed before oh, the match starts. Oh, here we go. Starts. You can see that, uh, that afterburn coming out of the jet. Incredible. Oh, wow. You can hear it spooling up now. Oh, wow. <laughs> Now this match has started. You can hear that jet. It looks like it's... Oh, oh OK, it's OK. It sounds like a jet engine. I love that Alvin and the Chipmunks are literally five, Alvin and the Chipmunk four, color schemed. Three, two, Here we go. Here's the one, count in. Fight. Robots and we're off. Fight. Totally spooled up wow. now. Wow. Now, the power wow. of this jet engine will be naturally pushing that robot backwards. And Austin here spinning up this jet, hoping to catch one of his opponents on fire. You can see Crash Fest there running as one of the mini bots for Craig. And Craig and the jet bot have found each other in the box. Oh, wow. And you might not be able to hear this out there on the live stream, Craig but that. That hiss that is coming from Cage One right now is insane. Craig landing a great pin, pushing the jet bot into the air. 
Now just the thrust on the Jetbot wants to push it up against the rail and push it into the ground. Here we go. Austin driving over, trying to get into a better position before turning up that jet once again. And it is... Oh, oh no. no! It could just be, you know, th that thruster engine gets so hot that uh, any kind of, uh, or you know, material that is... Uh, that is around it might smoke up a little bit, but it actually could be something wrong with the thruster itself. I'm curious to see if it is going to fire back up. I saw a puff of smoke there. A minute 40 left in this fight. There are so many bots in this arena right now. It's almost like a rumble, Jake. And that's a great pin from Craig on one of the mini bots, both of the mini bots. And Crash Fest landing a good pin on Alvin. Alvin the blue one. Alvin here is the big uh, jet box. Yeah. It's Alvin and the chipmunks. What are the what are the names of the chipmunks? I, I, uh, I can't. Uh, Theodore and uh, <laughs> Alvin, Simon and Theodore. Simon Sorry. and Simon. There you go. Okay. Facing off against Craig. A lot of human names inside <laughs> of the box. It's always nice and confusing. I want to see that jet power back up. Now, this is the first fight of the day. Now, these just determine the, sh the seating, and I'm hoping that Austin can take this jet ba uh, bot back into the, uh, the pits and fix it for its second fight, if there's going to be a second fight. 35 seconds left in this fight. Chris, I feel like we, uh, we promised the viewers an explosive fight, and we haven't really seen it. Well, as you know, the... Uh the diesel thruster uh, afterburner is a relatively new concept in combat robotics and probably needs a little bit more time to reach meta status. Naturally. But they've taken it the full three minutes. They're going to take this one to the judges. And uh, we'll have to see what the judges say about this. We never got to see weapon motion out of Craig, so I think that's going to factor into this decision. But there's so many bots. How do you judge who's showing aggression and who's not? I mean, it's like you said, it's a rumble. Yeah, it's almost a rumble. Yeah. Oh, and I can see Ashley Beckman there driving one of the mini bots for, uh, for Craig. That's fun. That jet started, but just did not maintain through the fight, unfortunately. Now, it seemed like uh, Hot Shot it... is the, the bigger version of this, right? The, right. the yes. huge, huge jet. Yes. Same size jet. Oh, really? Yeah. No way, really? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, that's why this was just like, this is mind-blowing to me that they, <laughs> that they managed to put this onto what I believe was like a five or six pound bot. Yeah. And that thing didn't just take off like a sail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, jets, they, they want to generate enough lift that they're able to go sailing across the box. Uh, which is a problem. Now I can see that we are loading into cage five. Rick Roller facing off against Stratos. Now these are two egg beater spinners, I believe. Now in the pink corner here, we can see Rick Roller. And uh, Rick Roller has these super sharp teeth on its egg beater, which is another one of these innovations that we're seeing at NHRL, adding knuckles, adding teeth, adding a blade to the edge of your, your egg beater in five, hopes of getting a bit more four, bite. Three, two, it's so cool that you can one, buy a kit bot and five, you can really just make it yours. Robots fight. Yeah, it's absolutely. such a great entry point. Let's see how these do. So these are two Fingertech beater bar uh, robots here in the box. The first out of, well, I don't know, about 40 matches so far today with oh, egg wow. beater on egg wow. beater. Good pop in the air there from Rick Roller on Stratos. Now Rick Roller is running this greenish uh, egg beater. But uh, yeah, you gotta kind of keep them straight in your mind because they do look similar, both running orange wheels. Good spin up here from Stratos. Stratos' weapon is still oh. running. Oh, peeling away part of that that uh, wheel, wheel guard. guard there. Yeah, it looks like it's cracked right along the back and front. Rick Roller, it's getting intermittent weapon, which typically means that uh, perhaps the belt is too tight. 
because you're, you're getting power to the belt, but it's slipping. Stratos landing a good pin, pushing Rick Roller into the corner. Rick Roller is starting to look a little haggard. And one of his wheels is exposed. like a very good egg beater sound from Stratos. What you're listening for is that totally symmetrical sound and it looks like Rick Roller is stuck. It could be high centered on that broken yeah. wheel guard, but the wheels are not spinning, which is concerning. Here comes Sparks to see if he can save Rick Roller. Oh, they, they got one wheel spinning. It's trying, but it can't oh, contact the ground there. Yeah. Yeah, this is, oh, it almost looks like one of those wheels is caught on like a, on, I want to say oh, it yeah. like a oh, nail. It's the, you know what it is? It's the bolt oh that yeah. that actually uh, connects that, that wheel guard to the chassis. <laughs> you can see like that rubber being peeled, like pulled away like a fish with a fish hook. And for, for those of you at home trying to follow along, Rick Roller is the egg beater with the orange wheels and Stratos is the egg beater with the orange wheels. <laughs> no <doubt. laughs> All right, wow, so your winner is KO Stratos from... and uh, yeah, Rick Roller. Unfortunately in that match, did give you up. Oh. It's, I'm trying, Chris. I'm not very good at Do you at feel this. let down, Luke? Aww. No, of course not. It's <laughs> great to see robot fighting. Are you kidding me? All right. Uh, now, as we, uh, we have a tiny little... Oh, we're seeing we're, we're loading in. This is one of the titanium boxes. Look at that crowd of people out there. Oh, I see. They just, they just opened up this box from that last fight, Stratos and Rick Roller. Now, uh, Jake, I have to ask, you're not running Maximizer, you're not I'm running not. a bot, but you still are driving the 24 hours round trip to get here? Why, Jake, why? The FOMO is real. It's yeah. so, ah, I just love coming and watching robots fight. I mean, it's, there's nowhere else like it. Uh, being able to, you know, see all the cool people and all the cool robots and, get some really cool fights in. It's just, there's nothing else like it. Maybe also a chance to uh, take a close look at some of the potential competition in the World Championship coming up later this year. That's there are true. a lot of bots in the 12 pound class that upon qualification could drastically change what that field looks like going into the November finals. It's a big deal. Now I've just heard from production that we have big news. Kimberly, tell me. Okay, we have a winner in that last fight. Craig winning against Alvin and the Chipmunks. Uh, Craig, you know, you're gonna be driving back with it and it has one win under its belt so, so far. I have a piece of trivia. This is Ethan Shipley's first win at NHRL oh, and wow. I am so wow. glad that I could be on the desk for it. That is great. So congratulations to Ethan. Now, this is a big deal because he's brought about 12 robots to NHRL, exactly. and this is his first win. And no one has brought more robots and lost. More times. More times. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. this, is, this is exciting. Okay. So, this is great. Hats off to Craig. Ethan with the a books. dead congratulations. robot. Congratulations. Uh, you know, uh, attacking his opponent with marshmallows. Viciously. Viciously, and winning his first match ever. Absolutely. Wow, oh, first That's win, but probably his 20th to put match. Your hat. <laughs> wow. If he's going to win, yeah. he's going to be like that. You know, he's, That's the type of guy that he is. So. Going up against <laughs> uh, the billionaire founder of NHRL, that's pretty great. And destroying him with marshmallows. Yeah. I mean, it's... I destroy myself with marshmallows every <laughs> summer, so I, I know how that goes. <laughs> wow. All right. Good job. Good job, Ethan. Um, why, why did he give it a human name? That's so hey, unsettling, Jake. There's a song that it's named after. Oh. That, yeah. There's lore. Someone, there's, there's a someone whole has back a Craig story. song? There's a Craig song, yeah. yeah. That seems so specific. It's, it's, it's quite, I, I was played it a couple times on the oh. drive up and-, okay. and you just listen it's, to it's it unique. on loop. It's a unique for a song. Hour drive. I'll say that much. Interesting. Uh, yeah. You're gonna have to send me the Spotify <laughs> link, Jake. I will. I will. 
a, a song about Craig. About Craig. It sounds yeah. personal, like I don't, oh, you know, like almost, almost like the songwriter has a problem with somebody named with, Craig. You know. I don't want to give too much away. You okay. know, you can't give too much of the backstory, but but you know, Craig's song. Uh, now, very exciting. Loading into oh, boy. page six, we Whoa. see Noob Tube. Uh, I see two of them. You know why, Luke? Because because this is a loop tube. Really? It's a loop tube. Yes, we have one Noob Tube that is a walker, and one Noob Tube that is a roller. Now, wow. uh, very uh, you know, also also interestingly, it's two twin brothers that are running these two Noob Tubes. <laughs> So we've got twins, twins on twins on twins. I'm surprised they're painted the same color. I don't know how I'd keep track of which one's mine and which one's uh, not. Well, Noob Tube 1 is the yellow and white and blue and white one. And you, <laughs> and Noob Tube 2 is the yellow and white and blue and white one. I got it. Now, uh, Noob Tube run by Andrew Nolan from Seattle. Now, uh, he's a graphics programmer there in the Northwest. His interests include RC cars, 3D printing, and uh, his twin brother there uh, was the one who came up with the original new tube concept as an ant weight. And if we zoom in, we're going to see they look exactly identical, Chris. Noob Tube is one of those bots where you think it's kind of like a joke, and then you see it in real life, and it's like one of the most well-built yeah. three yeah. pounders. It's I, really cool. Yeah. Now, the way that Noob Tube works is that that whole body spins. Mm -hmm. Now, there's motors inside of this long tube, and that protects the motors. There's no belts. It, as long as those motors are spinning, this thing is deadly. All you can do, really, is try and attack the wheels, but it is very wide. It can just pivot in place. This is a sleeper competitive yeah, absolutely. Uh, design. Yeah. It's, it's got that clown car exterior, but when you look Five, inside, yeah. it is Four, gorgeous. Three, it looks like a freaking two, lightsaber right. inside. <laughs> yeah. Fight, robots fight. Now here, here go. goes the noob tube. Whoa. They're spinning up and the walker noob tube is doing great. Facing off against kind of average, which I just love the honesty, Chris. <laughs> That's, that's what I would name my robot, you know? Now these long tubes, what do they remind you of, Chris? Uh, wrapping paper. Wrapping paper, <laughs> deadly wrapping paper. Now kinda average, you know, the, the play here with these two three pound robots is to kill one of them first, score massive damage. But if the Nolans have work on the reliability, that is not going to happen. Whoa! Oh, big hit, I think that was a roofing. Wow. These deadly wrapping paper rolls are going in for the kill. There's so much kinetic energy behind that massive roller. That was a massive connection. Incredible. Now, now there are titanium teeth on the uh, on the tube down the full length of the body, and every single time they're making uh, contact, they are hitting something. They're eating away at something on kind of average. This is really a war of attrition. If they can keep those those hub motors spinning, this oh wow now they're attacking one another. <laughs> I love the uh, the paint paint scheme on this. The color scheme is gorgeous. Pushing kind of average, and look at that. The power is out on kind of average. Oh boy. Tap out. Wow. Tap out. Your winner is two noob tubes. Incredible robots to watch today. No sure. No no doubt about that. That's when your you loop tube. <laughs> Loop tube, yeah, you know, the Nolans here <laughs> looking very happy about their performance. When you talk about combat robots, you think about like the danger zone, which is the available area you have that's covered by weapon. Right. Noob tube is one of those robots where it is all danger zone. Anywhere they hit you is gonna be a massive hit. It's yeah. cool. There's really like, oh, I'll just attack them from the side. That doesn't necessarily exist. <laughs> Five. You're threading four, the needle at that point. Three. 
Now, Two, interestingly here, one, I can see Angie Kasmer facing uh, with Flip and Cut 12 here in the pink corner. Now, this is a Melty Brain Flipper bot because uh, it is running two wedges along the edges of this uh, this Melty Brain. And these are designed to pop Honey Shock in the air. However, it looks like one of those wedges may have been momentarily caught under the rail. Honey Shock has brought an upgraded anti-horizontal wedge to this event, that big AR plate in front. He hopes to uh, better protect that TPU chassis. Seems to be working out great against Flip and Cut here. One of the factors that I'm going to be looking for in this competition from Team Honeycracked and all of their robots is um, the impact of their new test box in Maryland. Now, they purchased a 12 slash 30 pound test box, and they are now able to test their own robots there in Maryland. This could be a big game changer for that team and their reliability. Now, a Melty Brain, it spins up the entire body of the robot because these, these wheels are spinning the entire robot in one direction. And um, the Kazmers are the kings of Melty Brains. They have been spending years here at this competition, really dialing in this, this design type. Honey Shock successfully tipping, flip and cut up against the rail. Good move there, Honey, honey Shock. You can see Andrew Kazmer there. Um, good overhead shots. Good pin from Honey Shock. Taking full advantage of that new plow. Seems to be working out great for them. 70 seconds left here in this fight. Now we're seeing so-so reliability from Flip and Cut. One of the challenges with this design is that it works great at the three pound level, it works great at the ant weight level, but the physics begin to change at 12 and 30. They are pushing a whole lot more weight and your, your motors do not scale at the same weight that they do with the lighter weight classes. 40 seconds left here. You need to be pushing a massive motor to get something this heavy, spinning as quickly as the Casmers would like. So you're kind of seeing this slow spinning performance from Flip and Cut 12. Now, Jake, very sad that we have 20 seconds left with you on the, uh, the, the box. I really like appreciate you coming to call fights with us here, but I know that you're super busy for the rest of the day. And, um, but I, I wanna thank you for, for calling fights with us for this last hour, this has been great. All right, they've taken it the full three minutes. This one will go to the judges. As we bid a fond farewell to Jake Hoffman. Thanks, Jake. Thanks for having me. This was great fun. All right. Hello. Oh, my God. It's man with Captain Ricky Willems. Hello, Ricky. Hello. Hard to follow up Jake Hoffman. Always a good guest. But, uh... Nice to see you too, Luke. Oh my God, Ricky, this is the best. I, I love this. It's a refreshing morning anytime we sit down here together. Now I we are seeing some wild action over here in cage four. We've seen some massive concussive hits. Toro Feather facing off against what I believe is Synthesis 30. Yeah, Toro Feather is a massive hitting robot. It just really a frightening, frightening disc on that thing. Now, Toro Feather is from the Brazilians, from Team Riobots. And uh, the Brazilians and their many entries are um, really one of the big storylines to watch here today. This is a fight in progress. There are 75 seconds left here on the clock. You can see Synthesis 30 there, this big black robot sitting, dying here in the, uh, the center of the box. Riobots is victorious in this fight. Riobots and Toro Feather running this big silver robot. Man, look. Knockout. That is a knockout for Corey Nason and Synthesis 30. The Brazilians are victorious. Their first win of the day.
Now, there's been a massive uh, just contingency of Brazilians that have traveled north <laughs> from Brazil to Connecticut. They're bringing a ton of 12s. They're bringing a ton of 30s. They even have some three-pounders in the competition, it, and they'd like to take all 12 invitation spots. We have could. a, yeah, it's a huge influx of people. They're clearly taking that last chance they have, the battle for, for the November Invitational Championship. Yeah. Uh, they're working hard for it, and honestly, looking through the pits, a lot of them really brought their A game. I mean, these are incredible competitors to start with, but clearly they are serious, they are hungry, they are trying their best because this is the last shot they've got. Uh, speaking of uh, Oh my gosh, it's Ratto! It is Ratto who is running Chibata here today. Now, Chibata has already qualified for the finals in November. And Ratto is here with Chibata trying to dial that robot in just a bit more before the finals. And uh, we have multiple Brazilian teams up there. We have Riobots, we have Team Warrior uh, with Black Dragon on BattleBots. Riobots, of course, with Team Minotaur on BattleBots. And, um, and here's Ratto, and he is going to be really bringing us through the Brazilian journey here today. And um, Ratto just absolutely loves NHRL. Yeah, it's incredible the, the passion and the excitement that he brings, not only himself, but uh, what an interesting group of people he's got uh, following and getting their first introduction to, to NHRL and some of them first introduction to combat robotics in general. Combat robotics as a sport is alive and well in Brazil. There are hundreds of teams, probably more than a thousand robots fighting down in Brazil. We see them come up for the biggest competitions in North America, mm -hmm. but they fight all over the planet. They fight in Asia, they fight in the UK, and their competitions in Brazil are massive. 400 teams, 500 teams, yep. showing up for multi-day combat robot festivals down there. And these are the best of the best Brazilian teams. Riobots was really the grandfather of Brazilian combat robotics with Marco Antonio Maggiolaro really just birthing this as a sport in Brazil. Yeah, it's it's amazing to see how much just a, a couple of teams have have stoked the spirits and yeah. the excitement for this sport because it really has branched out. And once you have a few teams like that that make a name for themselves on on big television shows in in rotating traveling competitions, uh, it brings that that spirit of competition that's so big in Brazil in general. I mean, yeah. you see that across sporting events, and you really see it just coming into its own in combat robotics. And and just the passion that that brings to the table is fantastic. Like here in the US, the Brazilian combat robotic scene is really anchored in engineering schools. There are a lot of colleges where it is an incredibly competitive process to mm -hmm. get into their combat robotics program. And there are teams with 50, 60 members, um, really great engineers, putting on their own competitions at their school and traveling around the country to fight other college teams. Yeah, it's, it's no exaggeration to, to think of that the same way that some some schools here think about their uh, their basketball championships, right. their football championships. Uh, I don't know how scholarships and things work, but like you said, it's very competitive to get into. And and once you're there, it is a, a bedrock foundational experience, not just for your college career, not just for your future professional career, uh, but the the social lives and the the um, kind of competitive outlet that these people have. It becomes a, a mainstay of their um, yeah. of their lives. Team AGVS, uh, they were really kind of, they, they formed the beachhead. They came, they, they were the first Brazilian team to really show up here and compete. And uh, Team AGVS is fielding a 30 pounder, Sombra 30 up there. Yeah. And I stood cage side when they spun up for their safety test and it sounded like a heavyweight. It just, uh, that kind of like um, lizard's part of your brain that yeah. feels fear when you hear like a deadly sound. It just like, I could feel electricity just running through me listening to Sombra 30. That uh, same kind of thing, like the moment before lightning strikes, kind right. of. Right. Yes. The static yeah. in the air. There's, there's danger here, you know? Like, it's it's incredible. Luke, I, I actually, I went up to him. I was so flustered yesterday going through the safety process. With yeah. everything, and I was looking at the robot. Uh, and I was, I expected the robot next to it. I looked at it and I was like, wait, and which robot is this again? And the guy just was like, Sombra? Right. And I was like, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and, and, but it's, it's one of the few robots here that I think 
most people have a very good reason to feel silly if they don't know that robot. I mean, it is such a, uh, an institution both in, in the Brazilian teams, but in general in terms of the, the impression that it's made in NHRL uh, competitions, people, uh, people sit up and notice. Yeah. Sombra is uh, striking and notable for its uh, three parts egg beater. It's got like, you know, three, three, uh, three, uh, tined. Like, three, three tined. Three tined, yeah, yes. exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, m most egg beaters are just kind of like a, a hollow rectangle, but yeah, this is like a three dimensional. Yeah, it's object. a lot of fancy machining. Frankly, I'm not sure what the logic, I've never sat down to talk to them. Um, More hits are better. It's interesting because it's, it's it, that is, is a de defensive strategy. Yeah. If you have more hits, then you have yeah. smaller hits, and your your parts tend to last longer. Some teams do the exact opposite. They only have one actual contact point, right. and it's a huge hit, and for better or for worse. But uh, so far, it seems to be working out for them. I mean, they they have a pretty excellent record. Um, obviously, a great um, set of people behind the bot, uh, clearly they're doing something right. Oh boy, uh, I see now cage heard... three loading up, uh, but we're gonna go to Lindsay first. I am really eager though. Hi, all right, so if I didn't know any better, I would think the entire country of Brazil <laughs> is in the YouTube live chat right now. It is going a mile a minute. We have so many fans for Rato, uh, and it's just incredible. Their enthusiasm is is just, you know, it's infectious. I love it. Um, he's clearly, you know, the favorite of, I mean, it seems like of all the, the Brazilian fans that we have, or Brazilian teams that we have here today, I want to see some love for, you know, AGVS, for Rio Boss, for Warrior. Rato's getting all the attention right now. So uh, that's on you, Brazil. Let's, let's cheer for everyone, right? Yeah. No, 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 Lindsay. All right, Rato is so popular because he's an incredibly popular streamer in Brazil. Mm -hmm. He has hundreds of thousands of subscribers and followers. He's a great YouTuber. Like, his content's amazing. He actually does our job down with yeah. street bots in Brazil. He's also an incredible play-by-play -play announcer, which is pretty cool. Yeah, he's, um... He is the better version of us, Ricky. Oh, boy. There's something to keep you up at night. I have a like large six subscribers on my YouTube channel. Mouse. Okay. <laughs> and I'm barely, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm barely able to uh, complete a sentence up here as an announcer. It's, uh, he's, he's superior. Yeah, yeah, no, he's got a certain uh, Jean sais quoi. All right, we're going to check in here with Cage 5. Now, this is oh one of boy. the biggest storylines to watch today. In the blue corner, we have Booty Brigade. Now, we have a miniature droopy. Now, that is a 3.1 pound droopy, so scaled down droopy. And his partner, his multi bot, is Lynx. Now, these are from the last three championships. Two Golden Bretts have gone to Lynx. One has gone to Droopy. You cannot get better caliber in this box. Facing off against Minimum Viable Product and Brandon Unger from Team Shreddit. Now this is a loophole style robot from Booty Brigade. You're Five, running a 3.1 pound robot on one three, side and a 2.9 pound robot one, on the other fight, side, exploiting robots, the fight. weight bonuses here at NHRL. Now Brandon oh has his work cut out for him. He's essentially fighting two beetle weights on one. Two championship level beetle weights. On there are one. probably a half a dozen golden dumpsters here between Droopy and Link. Ooh, look at that. Big hit there from Calvin Eba and Lynx on minimum viable products. And Lynx is doing serious work here. These are big hits. Minimum viable product has not had a moment to get a breather. It is no longer... Oh, well, there you are. It's, it's kind of stabilized now, but it's so quick to get destabilized. Big Lynx hit, hit, and there is wood all over this box. Lynx is chewing up the rails. There's a Ooh. huge amount of power in that egg beater. Wow, these are intense hits. A lot of these are hitting the roof of the arena. Calvin Eva pushing, like just punting his opponent across the, uh, the box. Huge hit there, roofing his opponent. Brandon running this hub motor, just trying to stay alive here in this box, but there is a ton of wood in the box. 
One of the really interesting things to watch for with Booty Brigade is that they have essentially cut off part of the box because Brandon doesn't want to drive near Droopy. Yeah. Droopy that... is a huge, huge hazard. Well, and there you are. You've got minimum viable product up against the rails. You are going to have an unstick attempt from the house robot. All right, so that unstick was successful. You can see that Brandon came in to uh, land a hit on Droopy. I'm going to give it to Brandon. He's managed to stay alive for the first two minutes of this fight. Facing off against two champions, both in Tommy Wong and Calvin Eba. But this is a oh. tough mountain to climb when you're facing off against Lynx. Left side drive issues now on minimum viable product. Not surprising to see some damage really adding up here. It looks like the weapon on minimum viable products may have gone down. It does appear to be not working. Wow, that is quite a tush. Luke. 30 seconds left. Yeah, Lynx has got cake. Ricky? Is that what they're saying now? I don't know. I don't know what the kids say. You could have just made that up. I don't know. 15 seconds left. Yeah, they are YouTube spinning down. YouTube live chat. The kids in the YouTube live chat tell me, are they still saying cake? Knockout. Or is this ancient slang from the 90s? Booty Brigade, I believe here is your winner. Brandon Unger stuck up against the rail. First, first of many wins, no doubt, for Booty Brigade. We're gonna go and check in here with Cage One with Chibata. Cage One with Ratto. Facing off against Kevin Milchewski, the captain of Claw Viper on BattleBots. Now, Kevin Milchewski is running Red Storm and facing off against a formidable opponent in the horizontal of Chibata. Chibata is a, another one of these stunning robots. There is so much power in that robot. And it is, uh, I mean, they really all, he, he all in on this. Uh, he wants something that's just going to obliterate on that first hit. Uh, very much the opposite of what we were talking about earlier, the conservativeness of having three times on your spinners so that the hits yeah. are a little more like, nope, this is uh, do the best you possibly can in one hit or less. Shibata really is hoping to score a knockout in its very first hit because the longer that this match goes, the, uh, the greater the chance of Kevin Milchewski finding an opening here. Um, Kevin Milchewski is an incredibly good control bot driver, and this is essentially a miniature claw viper at, uh, at the 12 pound scale. And Kevin is really rapidly getting the hang of this. Again, he's coming from the West Coast. They do things a little differently out there with combat robotics. It's taken him a little bit of time to get used to the fact we have wooden floors, Five, the type of robots four, that tend to compete, three, uh, and the two, learning curve we've seen one, from him is very right, rapid. So I'm excited to see how he does today. Good speed and a good box rush from Red Storm, making connection with Chibata. You can see Chibata starting with those forks pointing toward its opponents, hoping to whip around with that horizontal. Now these forks just getting tangled here as Redstorm tries to push Chibata into the uh, into the rail, hoping to break that horizontal. But Ratto's driving is so good here. Oh, good there's lift the pin here. Let's the go, Kevin! Oh man, no, but that was effective. The uh, any time that Kevin and Redstorm can get Chibata's weapon to contact. Oh, and I see a belt. I see a belt, Luke. I think that is the weapon now down on Chibata. One of yes. the big things to look for in Red Storm is this skirt that runs around the front of it. This is a totally um, optimized for horizontals. Chibata, if that weapon was still running, would love to eat away at the sides of Red Storm. It is not going to happen, Luke. Luke, that. Uh that is exactly the design intent of something like Red Storm. Get your opponent to break their own weapon. From now on, it is exactly where Kevin wants this to be. 
It is uh, a plaything for him to show off his, uh, his dexterity. One of the big things that Kevin was telling me going into this competition are, uh, you know, the cleats on his wheels. He typically runs his robot on steel floors, and you can see those tiny little cleats. He's been practicing with them. There's so much uh, power in those cleats that when he drives them on uh, plywood, the plywood just goes rocketing off in the opposite direction, which is a good sign. You're seeing great traction and mobility from Red Storm in this fight. 60 seconds left here. Kevin Milczewski pushing Chibata up against the rail, trying to get Chibata high centered on that wood. More control and aggression from Red Storm, taking Chibata on a, a trip across the box. Chibata, I believe, is a two-wheel drive robot. Is that right? Are there two wheels? Yes, sir. Which is tough, you know? If you've got two wheels and uh, your weapon is down, probably going to get shoved around by the four-wheel drive robot. Yeah, it's, by the captain who has multiple years of experience. It is, uh, it is a tough thing when you uh, have a robot that is so heavily leaned into aggression and your weapon goes down. You've already made your best. You know, you have a robot that was never intended to rely on this system for control or anything like that. Uh, you're going to do the best you can. And certainly, um, uh, Chibata here has... has put up a, a reasonable fight to the end of the match. Made it to the end of the match. Made it to the end, made it full three minutes. But uh, there's only so much you can do. I mean, it's the rock, paper, scissors is not in your favor at that point. When, when you kill the belt, it's just very difficult to come back from that. I mean, you've essentially landed in a very deep hole. I think that this is going to be a win for Kevin Milczewski coming over to uh, give him a good fist bump here. And Kevin really showing off his skill as a control bot driver in this match. Indeed. This one will go to the judges, but I think that this is very clearly a win for Kevin. Now, very exciting. In cage three, I see Dutch Oven, our flamethrower capture robot. Yeah, I am this incredibly is, uh, excited here. Like a flaming bear trap, Ricky. Yeah, that's not a bad way to put it. It's a flaming bear trap that instead of just shooting um, you know, a uh, blast of unburnt fuel. Five, it has a full four, combustion chamber, three, a little turbine two, in there to blow it one, at you. This five, is the hottest burning fight. robot that we have in the competition, uh, barring the jet robots. And Dutch, uh, Dutch Oven is hoping to whoo. land this big bear trap uh, jaws on top of temporal terror and just go blasting uh, its opponents with fire. This is one of those designs that uh, would be outlawed oh, by the Geneva Convention. Is. Here we go! Huge flame from Dutch Oven! That is so oh, much fire! Oh my god, Ricky! Luke, I don't know about you, but that's why I'm here. So much fire! That's a good capture. Let's see if he can turn on All the right. gas. All Pushing Temporal Terror up and against the rail. It's so close, Luke. Oh, this is the problem so often with these fire robots. They struggle just to get a good ignition. Now, these beetle weights, they can run up to six ounces of Six ounces butane. of fuel, that is, that is correct, right? yes. Here Ooh. we go, big flames. That looks like that could be uncontained fire. Oh, oh that is very much on purpose. Wow, part Look of that bear that. trap is, uh, is now impaired. Looks like the drive side, oh, both drive sides are working on Dutch Oven just very poorly right now. It is so bright and you can smell it in here. You can, you can. Oh man, it is painful watching this thing try to... The fire marshals from the city of Norwalk are standing around, and uh, I know they're doing their job, but they are enjoying it, Ricky. Oh, they they live for this. I think this is the most entertainment they get on the job, and that's saying a lot for people that blow things up for a living. Wow, I can taste that in the air. Yeah, it's a good barbecue. 
It is uh, difficult to talk through these these fumes. It's really something else. Tap out. It looks like that is a tap out. Your winner here is Temporal Terror, defeating a Dutch Oven, really just taking down a big name in this competition. Yeah, I, I got to say I'm a little disappointed. Anything that means a lower chance of seeing more Dutch Oven madness later, um, but but man, look at that flame. Look at that. That is just so perfectly executed. I had a conversation with a few of the builders earlier. We have seen so much design, so much design evolution in the last couple of years in almost every form of robots. And uh, on fire, in the, in the realm of fire robots, there is still so much room for optimization. My, my eyes are watering and like, I, it's, it's incredible the fumes that are coming out of this I, box. I'm gonna worry, if you visit my house, I'm gonna be a little worried. Cause this is, <laughs> you know, you get like is potpourri the in the bathroom. At uh, Willem's Manor, is that right? Right, right. It's I got just, it, got it. You know, it's either this or, you know, burning metal, um, you know, powder. Yeah, you know, I got it. yeah. The thing that I really like about builders of flamethrowers is like, um, I was thinking, oh, maybe I'm gonna buy one of the, you know, the boring companies like uh, sure. Elon Musk flamethrowers. Things that aren't a flamethrower. Yeah, uh, not a, not technically a flamethrower, mm -hmm. but uh, these builders, they can just build new one. Yeah, oh, no, yeah. absolutely. There's, I have been seeing more and more too robots that have not yet competed here that are very clearly getting their feet wet or whatever yeah. the inverse of getting your feet wet is for fire right uh in terms of testing out new designs and again there is just so much room for improvement that is one of the few robots dutch oven's one of the few robots we see with a fan assisted flame right and that makes such a tremendous difference he's pushing over 2,000 degrees right on that flame front yeah um compared to you know shooting liquid butane fuel or liquid propane fuel Puts on a nice show, right? But it's much harder to do sustained damage, right? You can do incredible damage in in just a couple of moments with something like Dutch oven. The oxygen intake and it's your ability to expel the oxygen that really is the de de deciding factor in the effectiveness of your flamethrower. Essentially, yes. The more air that you have, uh, the faster that you can burn your fuel, which means the higher you can get your temperature, which means the more damage you can do. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, speaking of damage, look at that. Incredible, yeah. We can see just a bunch of debris inside of the box. And uh, Dutch Oven, one of the most exciting and electrifying, just visually stunning robots here at the competition. And uh, I have no doubt in their ability to melt their opponents if uh, they get the right type of pen. But it looked here like there was just a ton of fire coming out of this robot. You know, like, mm -hmm. uh, when you're running a flamethrower, you are running the risk that the flamethrower damages yourself because you are the closest robot to that flame. It, yeah, it, you have to design really carefully. Interestingly, with, um, with Dutch Oven, as you expel these gases, right, your, your gas tanks, your fuel tanks cool down. And what I thought was really interesting is at the end of a match, if Dutch Oven was working properly, it's covered in ice inside. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, a, you know, the DeLorean, the moment it comes back from the future. Yeah. Uh, the opposite of what you would expect. And in fact, sometimes some of these robots are having to run heating systems or, or other approaches because the fuel stops boiling, it stops squirting out because it freezes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's just a whole new set of problems. And the engineer in me is sitting over here just uh, salivating at these people who are either solving them now or about yeah. to solve them later. It's just so much talent. So. Now we're gonna head over to cage four. And uh, we were talking about this before. This is Sombra 30 from Team AGVS. Sombra is in the pink corner, facing off against Warlock from the University of Maryland. Ricky? It's right down the street. Right down the street. Now in my head cannon, I've never been to Maryland, but oh, I, I assume you have about a dozen people who live there, so you must know the Warlock kids, uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I would say, uh, I mean, the whole the whole Leatherback team, the UMD um, uh, team has created a, a bit of a, a hub, shall we say. Now, uh, Sombra 30 just uh, had an absolutely terrifying sound in the box. I cannot wait to, uh, to hear this robot spin up. Ooh.
Now here at uh, the House of Havoc here at NHRL, we have eight cages and we're running fights simultaneously. If you're here live in the audience, you get to see most of these fights. Also, check out the Brett Zone on NHRL.io. You get to see a live look inside of all of these cages. There are oftentimes two, three, four fights going on at the same time. We currently have a fight in progress in cage one, but we are waiting for cage four. Sombra 30 is just an absolutely terrifying robot. We want to make sure that we capture that entire fight. We're going to take a check up with Lindsay. Lindsay, how are you doing upstairs? Hello, Ricky. It's so nice to see you behind the desk. Um, I was just chatting with a builder who literally flew here from Australia. Uh, I asked him if there was any other reason that he found himself in, you know, the tri-state area. But no, he flew here exactly for NHRL. And I think that is so incredible uh, just how international this competition is, uh, especially today is amazing. And uh, uh, man, I love to see it. <laughs> Very excited to see that robot Five, fight too. Hopefully four, it uh, ends up three, putting on a good show. Two. One, All right, now uh, over here in cage four, fight. we are spinning up Sombra. This match has started. We are off. Well, Warlock's Huge off to a hit tough there. Start. Big concussive hit on the back of Warlock. Wow! Now these are 30 pound robots. Look at and Warlock got flying. air time there. Oh, that may be a tap out. I don't know. Now I can see one of those wheel guards from Warlock is gone. Sombra here, waiting for its prey. Man. Now, what is that on the... <laughs> is that the weapon on Warlock here that's sitting on I, the ground? I see the motors are sitting on the ground. One wow. Whole drive size the mobility on Sombra 30 is incredible. That is such a potent, potent robot. Just lining up for that perfect next hit. And the wheel If it's not a count out, it's gonna be a tap out here. Oh, Sombra 30 just showing incredible restraint. I'm getting strong bite you the kneecap vibes from Warlock right now. Warlock crab walking its way across the box, appropriate for a Marylander, Ricky. Oh yeah, it's uh, going home to a lovely bath of Old Bay as soon as it gets back to Maryland. Now, Sombra, one of the big things that you're looking for here is your ability to stay away from the rails. Sombra is so ahead on the points, you don't want to get high centered. No, that is just a victory dance right now from Sombra. They've got nothing left to prove. Oh, wow. big hits! Just refusing to allow this uh, tap out, this, this count out to happen here. Big concussive hits from Sombra. Warlock is still just barely twitching. They are doing their best. Oh! Big amount of wood from off of the rail there. Luke, do we have a termite problem? There are huge amounts of wood coming off today. <laughs> but look at that. Sombra, high centered on the detritus inside of the box that it created. Knockout. That nice. is a knockout. Your winner is Sombra 30. We're gonna go right to a replay. Look at the destruction suffered by World of the Wheel just falling off dramatically. Incredible. Sombra 30 is so well piloted. That is a robot that was in control from the very first second of this match. Being able to, uh, to make these wide, arcing, drifting motions, and it was incredibly merciful in this match. It could have been in its opponent's face and sending home this college team's robot in a bag. But uh, it is still roughly robot shaped because Sombra was able to hang back, drive a little bit, come in for a hit. Yeah, they, uh, they hung back just enough, but every single bit of contact there was a, just one hit after another. I, I'm very, I'm actually, I'm kind of stunned because I don't think we've seen that level of impact when Sombra isn't, when Sombra 30 isn't pushing it. You know what I mean? Right. They right. are, they're coming and even the glancing hits seem to be haymakers. It seems like a cat playing with a mouse just a little bit, you know? Yeah, especially the second half of that match. Right, right. 
one, one of the huge things, if you're able to come here and watch this live, the sound that a really big egg beater like that mm -hmm. makes in the box is incredible. The sound of the impact, the sound of the, the vibration, just it sitting there idling yes. is enough. Um, it's intimidating. Yeah, and it's, it's addicting. <laughs> yes. It is. Like, that is the thing that got me coming back. Yeah. I'd been to I don't know how many events with three-pound robots, and I liked them. I kept going. Yeah. But once I went to my first 12 and 30 pound event, yeah. I was like, I cannot stay away. Yeah. Uh, it, it is truly something else. I don't know if we need like 12.1 surround sound to get this across to the viewers yeah. at home. Yeah. Uh, but I wish there was a way that you could experience this everywhere because you would be at every event that you could possibly go to for the rest of time. I, I, I was standing there uh, next to the, the test box when Sombra 30 mm -hmm. spun up and I could feel joy. Yeah. Like, I could feel, like, I felt like, I, I was like a little low energy last night, and I could just feel it. Like, this is joy. This is happiness. Just from that sound, it's, it's a very complicated kind of feeling. I want that on a shirt, you know, Sparky, and it's NHRL on top, and it's like, this is happiness. In the yeah. Bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, it, it's kind of indescribable how that works. And it doesn't feel like, it doesn't seem like it's gonna be the case, and then yeah. it's just this kind of like happy glaze over you. Like, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. Everything like, is this right. This is the coolest sport ever. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. We're just fanboying <laughs> at this point, <laughs> Luke. All right, uh, cage four there. They're inspecting the damage from D Sombra 30. They're trying to determine if they can glue that wood back on, Ricky. I, uh... Yeah, I'm not exactly worried about the safety of that arena, but that is certainly a mess. The problem is that that is the uh, that's the rail that faces the audience, right? Like we you have know, to uh, make sure that the audience facing uh, they did pick the part of the cage is the safest possible, and that is a massive, massive chunk taken out of the box. Looks like they're trying to remove a little extra here. Um, right, right. Yeah, it's hard to see, but I think that's what they're doing. Yeah, they're trying to make that as uniform as possible. You don't want more robots getting hung up. I mean, there is a little bit of an intentional ledge there, but at the same time, you don't want it to be, you know, a bonus hazard that wasn't intended. Yeah. So. For all of the mouth breathers online who wanted to see a rounded edge, you finally got it here, that okay? One, one somber at a time. Yeah. We're making right. the journey to a rounded yeah. edge. Yeah. Somber's probably got maybe five fights in it today. Like yeah. maybe it There's could totally There's only four round edges the whole, in that arena. Yeah, there you go. Problem solved. Yeah, we got to bring out maybe the belt sander, really just get like a nice smooth I, edge, I you would, know? I feel like there's got to be someone who's into artisanal woodworking in the yeah. pits. Yeah. You know, I've, I get some like Baroque engraving. Yeah. Yeah. Like church style. The, uh, yeah, one, one of the big things uh, to plan for here is that the cage will change throughout the day. Yes. Your, uh, your experience, like, on the, the surface is going to change. Your experience with the rails is going to change. Mm -hmm. And now this is a new hazard for people who are going to be going into cage four. Are they going to intentionally push their opponent up against this damaged part of the rail, or are they going to try and avoid it? Yeah. That is something to plan for as a builder. And it's, it's something that I think ends up leading to a lot of... Uh, better designs in the long term. If right. you have a knowledge ahead of time that your robot is going to have to face an uneven build surface, that it might get caught in a weird position, that it might get stuck in an arena wall because it drove too fast into it, those are all things that you plan out. They change the nature of your design a little bit, um, but it makes it more versatile in the long run, better able to stand up to the kind of odd situations that you can never Five, predict, but you four, find yourself in three, inevitably two, when you're fighting combat one. robots. Fight, are, robots, I can hear fight. that we are starting a fight yeah. here in cage one. Wow. Oh boy. Holy Chunk smokes, three. these are two uh, shell spinners here. Now, Chonky is this uh, Ooh, wow, big hit such there. Such a huge hit. Now, Chonky is uh, the robot with this big flag on uh, the top of it, and Darth Bot has the Silver Godzilla on top. Silver Surfer Godzilla. And a party hat. Whoa. Now, Chonky is a 45-pound walker robot. Darth Bot also, I believe, is a walker, Ricky. I do 45-pound shell spinners in the box. You know, speaking of things that you don't just, you can't get at home, 
These arenas weigh thousands of pounds, and they are moving when these robots hit the walls. Yeah. Wow. Now, Chonky here is uh, from Georgia Tech, and uh, they are running a massive combat robotics team as part of their Robo Jackets robotics program. And uh, Chonky just looking absolutely menacing here in this box. Knockout. This is a knockout. Your winner is Chonky. Yeah, them uh, Georgia boys and girls bringing something that really, really hits. Um, now, Chonky's been to a couple of events before. This might be the best we've seen it operate, though. I think uh, certainly uh, shell spinners, uh, are, full body spinners, are really tough to get ready, uh, get, get reliable in the first place. And then when you start adding... Uh, you know, things like walking mechanisms, things like self-writing mechanisms, uh, it gets even harder really fast. So there's, it's, it's understandable that it's a learning curve, but I really love the power that we're getting out of this robot and the fact that it's, it's, it's winning fights. Now, uh, we're gonna go to a fight in progress here in Cage 7. This is Dum Drum facing off against Newbert's. Newbert, there's a robot that I don't recall seeing in uh, quite a while. Have they taken a little bit of a break? Cole Wilson here is running Newberg. I think that, yeah, he's taking maybe the last one or two competitions off. But uh, Cole is an absolute super fan of NHRL. I, uh, I just see him talking about Newberg in all of the different corners of the internet where Combat Robotics lives. He's incredibly uh, proud of this robot. Cole is a middle school student, student maybe a high school student. Um, he is just starting out in his career, and he is incredibly enthusiastic about this sport. Now, Dum Drum here is the white and green egg beater. Newbert here is the black, red, and yellow egg beater. Newbert landing a good pin on Drum Dum. A minute 15 left here in this fight. Dum Drum shows up with a pretty respectable record. Coming into this event, they were sitting at 11 and five. Yes. Which is nothing to scoff at for a, let's frankly, it's a relatively generic uh, egg beater spinner. Uh, and usually that's a sign of some excellent driving, uh, some excellent common Tap sense, out. and um, you know preparedness, both in the pits and in your preparations ahead of an event. Um, now this was a, uh, this, this was a knockout, and your winner here is Dumb Drum. Yeah, I, uh, another, <laughs> another one to the list. Uh, I, I think that really does come down to driving skill in large part. Uh, and you saw a lot of it there. It wasn't exactly the most destructive match, uh, but that was targeted, uh, kept the weapon to its opponent. Um, he had a couple of short pins. Doing what you need to do, not taking a lot of damage in the process. I think they're going to make it uh, you know, reasonably far today. Now, very exciting. We're going to head over to Cage 2. We've got Chris Caps here in the box with Power Surge 2 facing off against Zack Knight and Promfrida. Now, these are two incredibly good beaterweights on both sides of this box. Neither have qualified yet for the November finals, and they are hungry for their invitation. Zach Knight uh, runs Prom Hedda, which is a dominant 12 pounder here, one of our Five, longest running 12 four, pounders. Three, and Chris Caps, two, a rising one, star in combat fight, robotics. Robots, he is hungry here to, uh, to qualify. Chris Caps here in green, Prom Frida in pink. Zach Knight just staying on top of his opponent. And it looks like the power could be out on Power Surge 2. Oh, that is a big hit. And the wheel guards are done. That is a that tap, tap out, out, fast tap out. Very the aggressive. winner is Zach Knight and Prom Frida. That was an extremely aggressive tap out. I do not think that was a pleasant surprise. Something went uh, wrong in a very unexpected way there. Luke. Chris Caps is so incredibly serious about this sport. Every single competition that he he brings his robot to, he is working on the reliability. He is uh, really hoping to build an incredibly competitive robot. He wants to win the entire thing. And if he sticks with it, I absolutely see golden dumpsters in his future. Without a doubt. And there's such, 
such an unyielding consistency to his ability to come back here yeah. and iterate and, yeah. and continue and, and, and pay those uh, close minds that you need to to the details. Um, it's not always an immediate process, but uh, it is a very reliable one. You bring that kind of dedication and, and, and fervor, and it will pay off eventually. Chris Caps has heart. He's also a very young builder. I think he's 17, maybe 18 years old. So he also has a very long runway in this sport. And um, yeah, you're going to look back fondly on these, these moments when you're like, you know what? I was learning my way and I was really kind of coming up through the ranks mm -hmm. as a builder. Now, Zach Knight uh, there with the pink robot, he is uh, hoping to qualify Prom 3 to and um, really kind of stretching down into the Beatles. He started off at the 15 pound weight class as a student, came and dominated here with uh, his 12 pounders and his friends 12 pounders, and really kind of stretching down into the Beatles. The Beatles are an incredibly competitive weight class. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of diversity inside of the Beatles. There is just a ton of them. There's like 140 Beatles. We hit the cap on the Beatles the yeah. last two competitions in a row. And uh, it is, it's a challenge to, to make your way to the end. Yeah, it's amazing to see how that has evolved and changed in, uh, you know, what becomes the entry level point uh, for a lot of these builders at NHRL and at other events as well. Uh, in the meantime, we're gonna go over where, in fact, we are already in cage three. Um, Crash Fest, of course, a uh, uh, eternal favorite. Going up against Count Forkula. I, I really enjoy Count Forkula. I haven't seen them in a while. What, how, how many events has it been? Do we know? Count Forkula, uh, I think that this may be their second or, uh, or, or third competition here. They are, yeah, they are entering with a four and two record across two events. Crash Five, Fest, one of our most four, dominant robots three, uh, two, in the competition one, here today. Five, Crash Fest is five. ranked number nine of all time with an incredible 25 and 11 record. Now, Robert Rund, the captain of Crash Fest here in uh, yellow and red, has not qualified for November yet. This is his last chance. He has come to every single competition. A little bit of aggressive padding there, Ricky. Yep, yeah, that's a paddling. Now, this Look is a go. good pin. Now, he can hold this pin for 10 seconds. One of the big things that I was looking for in the very first um, Count Forkula fight of the day was so-so driving. And Robert has none of those drive challenges at all. This is an incredibly popular, uh, dominant RC car driver who has been in this sport here at NHRL for uh, the last year and a half. Yeah, Robert is careful, cautious, and skilled. And he has a conservatively designed robot as well without a spinning weapon. Uh, he can just focus on driving, focus on doing the best job he possibly can, um, and it pays dividends almost every time. Robert is one of the best combat robotics drivers in the sport, and you can really see that here on display. Getting under Count Forkula, pushing it up against the house spot. Robert is very much in control. He likes to go up against a fellow control bot because it is a pretty pure test of skill and really an ability for him to show off his drive drive quality. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Luke. The idea that this is uh, dramatically less luck. This is all about you, your opponent, and figuring out which one of you can outdrive the other. It is intimidating to look across the box and see Crash Fest because you know that you are going to be uh, taking a tour of the box, uh, you know? And uh, he is going to push you up against the rail in ways that uh, you can't even imagine yet, Ricky. I mean, he's landed easily 10 pins here in at this fight. At least it's, uh, there you are. And the mobility on that robot too, it doesn't seem like a wow. design. Look at that. I mean, because he's not running belts and a huge spinner, he's able to put a lot of the power into his drive. He is running a really powerful drive system. He's able to shove around basically anything that's uh, in this box. 
Heck, we've seen that robot push around 12 pounders on occasion as a mini bot. It is a lot of force behind those tires. If we ran a sumo competition here at NHRL, Robert would be winning basically every single time. He is one of the best control bot drivers that I've ever seen. And uh, he stays right on top of his opponent and just landing pin after pin after pin. He's taking in the full three minutes, as he is wont to do, <laughs> when he's not uh, scoring knockouts. And I think this is very clearly a win for Robert Rund and Crash Fest. Round of applause, Robert. Absolutely. I uh, always amazed. There's like a, a sliver of a moment, just an absolutely vanishingly small, vanishingly small point in time when Robert has like a little bit of a smile, just a, like, just a moment, and then it's yeah. back to like, I have to fight. The funny thing about Roberts is that he is like our little um, rain cloud in the uh, the pits. Like a little he's, bit. He's sometimes. our little Eeyore in the pits. Yeah, you and know, yet he's everything to be happy about. Yeah, he's an incredible and it's driver. In there. The yeah. happiness is in there. Oh, but it's deep down. It's, it's like deep, it's, it's, it's like similar. Eeyore. You know, like uh, he uh, he just expects the worst right. uh, in every single fight, and he is happy when it uh, goes better than he expected. So he's like, he goes in thinking, oh, I'm going to get knocked out in the first 10 seconds. Okay. It went three minutes. Okay. Well, that's what well, uh, I yeah. expected. I, I didn't win, but oh, wait, I won. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's... Right. Yeah. It, it, Pessimism you set your is a. Uh, it's, 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 it's running. It's an undercurrent that runs through, uh, you know, his life. And so, you know, when he's when he's surprised and delighted, you can I, see a little glimmer. I don't know if I can speak to his entire life, but certainly in the boxes. It, I talk it, to Robert every single day, Ricky. Wow. We text you're, each you're like other this. every single day. Look, he's looking at me over there, and he knows that it's true. Yeah, our little Eeyore in the pits. Oh, that's that, right. But look, there was a nice big smile there. Oh, that's a big smile. Okay, I like that. That's yeah. Good. Yeah. That's Feel joy, moments. Robert. He just dominated in this fight. It just, he's yeah. waiting to hear the judge's decision before he goes up As into the pits. As if there's any chance he Which lost. is insane to me, Robert. You won. You probably picked up every single point. Okay? He's waiting. He's waiting. We're going to get you and, a little crown. We're yeah. Gonna get, Luke and I are going to give you a We're crown get every like time you win a fight, onesie. very obviously. Okay, an Eeyore onesie, I'm sure that they're available. Please okay? don't. No more, no, more, no more Eeyore onesies. Yeah. What, what, I can work with the onesies, just like animal onesies. It's, it's, yeah. Well, Eeyore is an animal. Exactly. Okay. Oh, oh, you're pro-animal or you're anti-animal I'm anti-animal onesie, I think. What other types of onesies are there, Ricky? I don't know, like comfortable ones? Oh, okay. Just, you, you do know, you have any onesies? You can just, I don't, I don't think I own any onesies. Wherever you find your shirts I, from Ricky, I'm sure they also supply onesies. I have jumpsuits. Oh, okay. That's jump kind suits. of a onesie. It's like a work onesie. It's a work onesie. <laughs> you should go and tell your mechanic that, like, oh, where'd you get your work onesie from, you know? <laughs> yeah. They love that. They, I'm sure they do, yeah. Yeah. I could, I could wear a, an animal print onesie and be like, oh, we're wearing the same thing. Today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, yeah. Uh, so you don't own any onesies. You do have some jumpsuits. Yeah. yeah. You've got to get a onesie. One or two, you know? Oh, just. What, okay. what, what is the theme of this shirt? Is this like a comic book shirt? I, you know, I, there, I saw X's and O or, and, and, and skulls and right. Norwalk colors. I thought yeah. it just fit and it was nice and colorful. And yeah. there's no deep seated meaning to this particular. One. All right. I like that. Wow. A good shot here of our crowd. And I can see Jake Hoffman there sitting uh, just at the center of our screen. Refusing to crack a smile, I love that for yeah, you, Yeah, now you fixed it for a moment, <laughs> for just a, a shimmer of a moment. Wow, there we go. The slow zoom. I'm so sorry, Jake. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, this is, this is great. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the big thing that I, I'm watching for today in the competition is just total seriousness up there. There are very few meme bots. There's very few fun bots. They're saving those for January, and uh, people are hungry to qualify. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. The, uh, the amount winner, people have buckled up. Uh, of that last match was Robert Rund and Crash Fest. And uh, our little, little Eeyore, he gets to feel a little more joy today. This is great. For 10 to 12 seconds. <laughs> All right, now, uh, here in Cage 4, we've got Minin and Plusle. This is the multi-bot in red and blue facing oh. off against 
Baby Grimm. Now, Baby Grimm has, for some strange reason, captured the attention and the love of the combat robotics community. This is a robot built by an Indian builder. Now, Baby Grimm from Goa, India. Five, Very four, exciting. Three, Cannot wait to see two, Baby Grimm's performance. One. Fight, robots, fight. Now, Minin and Bustle, we can see one half of Minin and Bustle coming out of the box, taking it weapon to weapon against Baby Grimm. Minin and Bustle has designed that uh, the Honeycrack team have been. Uh, Really dialing in best that they can. Uh, wow. Oh, look at those. Minin and Plusle named after a Pokemon and one half of Minin and Plusle on their head. Yeah, they're a little sleepy. That's okay. Uh, a lot of drive issues still seem to be plaguing uh, Minin and Plusle right now. I'm trying to recall. Do you recall which one is? I think Minin is blue and Plusle is red. I think that, that 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 would make sense, you know, Plusle. It's, it's uh, funny that plus feels red and minus feels blue. Yeah, I could see like maybe a yellow and a blue, you know, like yeah. uh, they're they're both electric Pokemon if I'm remembering correctly. Well, we still have no uh, blue. I'm gonna assume Plusle. No Plusle. Oh, there it is. Just a little. Just a little. It's not asleep. It's just groggy, and they're trying to help each other. Now, Baby Grimm is looking very mobile, and uh, yeah, Minin and Plusle trying to help out one another. I'm it not, is heartbreaking, Ricky. I'm not hearing any weapons in this box, and I think perhaps uh, Minin and Plusle have just turned off for the moment so that they can get to their self writing situation. But uh, you know what I would do? I would fire up that weapon and see if I could pop my, uh, my, my partner back onto their feet. Oh, oh, I'm, he I'm hearing like a little a wailing sound. There we go. There well done, Mine and Bustle. 75 oh. seconds left here in this fight, and they're going to see if they kill Baby Grimm. Yeah, that horrible noise was the Baby Grimm weapon spinning back up. So now we have two working, we three working weapons, three working robots. Really anyone's game. I'm. I think this is going to come down to the fact Baby Grimm is not moving very well. It is having drive side issues, I believe, on its left side. And uh, despite the problems that Mine and Bustle are facing, when you have uh, drive side issues, you don't tend to last very long. Big hit, and I can hear the weapon on Baby Grimm spinning up. Oh, look at that, Luke. front of Plusle is bent up and impacting its own weapon. Now I can hear the count out. I think the count out is on Baby knockout. Grimm. This is a knockout. Your winner is Minin and Plusle from Team Honeycracks. Ricky, more pride for Maryland. I know. It's uh, and not only that, more pride for Team Mammoth. This yeah. is uh, that's uh, course, true. Zoe uh, piloting half of mine and Plusle there is a Team Mammoth member. Uh, some of our best additions, gotta say. Yeah. Wonderful teammates and builders. I saw, uh, I saw Zoe Speaking with of you in the pits. wonderful teammates, yeah. Oh, good, yes. It's Lindsay. Hello, Lindsay. Hello. Uh, I am back with our first hit of Super Chats today. So we have a few lined up uh, that we've received uh, throughout the morning, and I'm here to share them with you. Awesome. Camera sticking up. It's creepy little head and eyeballs. Oh, this is a Garfunkel, I've been told. Oh. Uh, <laughs> he's been here for two years' worth of events, and uh, now he's with me, uh, keeping me company. That we is truly disturbing. Yeah, if we could just put that right back off camera, Lindsay. It's, it's lunchtime, and I am not hungry anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Lindsay, what, what are these super chats? Yes, uh, let's get to that, because Garfunkel, uh, he is, he's a little temperamental. Uh, okay, um, the first one that we have here is from none other than Eel Monkey Art. Good morning, all my favorite peeps. Miss you today. Uh, Eel Monkey Art is the duo behind the Brett plushies that you'll actually see in our store downstairs. So if you're here in person, go check them out. They're all handmade and they're gorgeous and they're so cool. Uh, so uh, shout out Eel Monkey Art. 
the next one from Okami Fan. I don't think the Brazilians are loud enough. Uh, I sent a little sarcasm, uh, Okami Fan, because uh, we know that that YouTube chat is uh, going crazy for the Brazilians. Uh, we have uh, another thing in that vein from Mateus Mendez. Go Brazil! Loving all the Brazilian teams present. And hey, so am I. Uh, this next one here is from Force of Will Gaming. Ethan, a menace in the Midwest and East Coast. I heard a rumor that uh, Ethan won with Craig. Is that true? I think that's his first win here at NHRL. So uh, yeah, go uh, go be a menace in the Midwest <laughs> after this event. And finally, um, from Nico Id, uh, the fight with Booty Brigade and MVP truly shows how NHRL's rules have no flaws. Uh, this is a, a big topic of discussion, whether this loophole rule is um, you know, valid. I, it, it definitely is within our rule set right now, but it's something that people are hotly debating. So I don't know if you have any thoughts, if we have time to share, but uh, something that the people are talking about for sure. You know, I your, your rule set is designed to be stretched and exploited, uh, and I'm glad that they're finding the edges of what's acceptable. I mean, that's that's the idea here. We are trying to get this uh, this sport to grow best we can. Five, and four, uh, if three, we don't prove that out now, two, they're going to prove it out five, later when you've got, uh, fight. you know, even a higher stake. We're going to evolve uh, and, and figure out what makes the best show and experience in competition the whole nine yards now here in cage two we've got tim hebert and chubby unicorn in white facing off against remy de guzman in gold and green remy de guzman running wicked wedge tim hebert running chubby unicorn chubby unicorn is our number three ranked beetleweight of all time entering this competition with an incredible 26 and 10 record across the past 10 events Tim Hebert has already qualified for the uh, for the November Championship. He's here just hoping to get a little bit of drive practice in and hopefully going home with another golden dumpster. Wow, both of these robots are just fantastic designs. It is so impressive to see Wicked Wedge self right itself, bully its opponent around, but when Chubby Unicorn hits, it hits. Chubby Unicorn is the most dominant robot from the team, uh, from Team Brandeis University, Dicey Robotics. And uh, Tim is one of their instructors there and uh, the de facto leader of their ragtag band of roboticists. Uh, we're going to see a lot of Team Dicey robots here in the competition today. Chubby Unicorn is, uh, is at the top of their roster. Now, Wicked Wedge is a giraffe themed robot from Remy de Guzman, who was on Team Shred It uh, at BattleBots this season. Remy de Guzman, very, very cool engineer. He is an engineer at Toyota, and mm -hmm. um, he helps design cars there. And that's a belt. Is oh that boy. a belt from Chubby Unicorn? I don't know, Luke. I really uh, am eager to find out. You can hear the weapons running very slowly. Yeah, I think you are correct. That may well be a, a belt from Chubby Unicorn, in which case that is a huge game changer for Wicked Wedge. 60 seconds left here in this fight. Remy de Guzman just with a suffocating drive style. Chubby Unicorn on its head. Tim tipped up against oh, himself, boy. making three points of contact. One of the dangers of running a super long uh, robot like Chubby Unicorn. Yeah, it has had its one Can on Can Wicked stick. Wedge do it again? He's trying to. And I Remy, think he may have. Remy, you've done it. Wow. Oh, we may get a little bit of extra sportsmanship here in terms of freeing Chubby Unicorn. No. no Remy de Guzman backing dance. off, killing Tim Ebert and Chubby Unicorn. This is Wicked Wedge. That, Knock what out. a way to rocket your way up the rankings. Wow. Kicking that Chubby is Unicorn a right huge the feather in your cap. Ricky, as you were saying, this is great for Wicked Wedge's rankings. Uh, taking taking uh, out a top competitor is going to uh, just be great for your standings. Yeah, you know, Luke, we, we look for a ratio in terms of like wins to losses, maybe three to one, four to one with these top tier robots. 
Uh, Wicked Wedge was on the other side of that. They're yeah. sitting with a one and two record. They have twice as many losses. Um, this is, is incredibly valuable. It really can't be overstated um, how much taking out not just a, a, a solid victory, but a solid victory against someone ranked as well uh, and with as good a ratio as Chubby Unicorn early in the competition. Incredible. It's just huge for them. Yeah. All right, we're going to head over to cage one. We've got Amphisbina here facing off against the Yoblins. Now, uh, the Yoblins here are a new multi-box. And uh, from three, team... Two, one. Fight, robots, fight. Here we go. Yeah, the team from uh, Chris Rummel here running Yoblins. The team behind Yobnall. Facing off against Amphis Vina here in the pink corner. Amphis Vina is this black robot that is uh, here at the uh, center of your screen. The Yoblins here are in green and black. Wow! Big hit what from Amphis Vina on one of the Yoblins. Amphis Vina run by Alexander Richmond entering this competition with a rank of 88. This could be Amphis Vina's first win ever at NHRL. They entered this competition with a record of 0 and 2 with just one event. Alexander here celebrating the Yablins are dead. Now we can see Fluffy trying to save one of the Yablins, but the referee is calling for motion. Amphispina taking a victory Tap lap out. here. Amphispina winning its first fight as a robot here at NHRL. Well done, Alexander. Yep. They have clearly started to hammer out some of the problems with that robot, and, and that was able to dish out some sizable hits in the process. Yeah. Uh, granted, going up against the multibot, your level of difficulty goes down a little bit, but still, that's uh, nothing to scoff at. You can see Chris Rummel there and uh, really trying to figure out what happened with that multi-bot. Now, this is a conventional multi-bot running wheels. I feel like that's an important thing to say for this competition because we're seeing a lot of loophole-type robots here. I mean, as long as that is there, that on paper anyway is such a dominant strategy. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's hard not to take advantage of it. I As believe that there are something note. like five loophole type teams up there today, that which is, is notable. Now, uh, loading here into the box, we've got Eruption facing off against Scrambled. Now, Eruption, another top ranked Beetle that has not yet qualified, run by Brian Boxel from Team Bloodsport on BattleBots, facing off against Scramble with Grant Frazier here, this uh, egg adorned robot in the blue corner. You see that kind of uh, sunny side up egg on the top, Ricky? More than a little cute, I gotta say. Five, four, three, two, one. Fight, robots fight. That's the way we go. Oh, good hit there from Eruption, oh, staying absolutely planted to the floor, sending Scrambled into the lights. Another big roofing. Scrambled is not moving. Eruption very mobile in the box. That is a tap out from Scrambled. Tap Your out. winner is Brian Boxel and Eruption. My goodness, that is such a series of hits with so much force behind them. You know, I like to talk about the big robots and the feeling you get when they impact, but. Some of these small ones, especially when they hit the, the lid of the box with another robot that hard, the force is incredible. The feeling that you get uh, when, they, when they make contact is just a gut punch. This was an incredibly efficient, efficient killing from uh, Brian Boxel and Eruption. Coming in here, picking his moments, staying very conservative with the driving, sending the scrambled into the lights, and... Uh, there was not one wasted motion inside of the box. Not waited not until a one. it died and just was Chill. just lurking, ready yep. to to make its next hit. Yeah, that's it. 
it is really interesting. You see some robots really pull back. They dance, they victory dance. Some of them will stay just like that far away, waiting, yeah. waiting. The second that you move, the second you say, I'm going to keep fighting, they hit you again. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see that it's kind of two uh, paradigms that people have come up with, two um, ways of thought. I feel like people bring their personality to their drive style as Certainly. well. You know, Certainly. like there are very gracious builders in the box where it's like, it doesn't matter what happens. If you get high centered, I'm going to, I'm going to help you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue to keep the fight going. There are others where it's like, oh, you know what? Um, I am going to allow you to die 15 seconds into this fight because I am here to advance. I right. have a job here today. My job is to get my invitation. My job is to win a golden dumpster. And um, like I have somehow through luck or through skill achieved some kind of uh, advantage in the box and I'm going to take this advantage here uh, because uh, I earned it. And to go even farther, some of them are, are taking the mindset of it. It would be wrong for me to deprive you of this, right? You know, right? Uh, of this full experience. I keep getting distracted. Literal shiny objects um, that really? are getting swept up from the the arena right now. Yeah, there were so many big just chunks, big peelings of um, of metal that had been pulled off in that last match. Yeah, uh, I. I, I love to see robots with weapons that cut in that deep and just remove material as if it's a machining operation. Yeah. Know? Now, we're still in our seeding rounds here. So sure. Sure. Scrambled has won one and lost one, so they're going to be seated somewhere in the middle of the bracket. Eruption winning their their uh, their seeding round, so they're going to be seated pretty high up near Lynx. Absolutely. And Fest and Caldera and Chubby Unicorn. Um, really great performance. You want to see that out of your top-ranked robots in your very first fight of the day. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing some of that, um, the, those conservative but brutal uh, really drive style from Brian. He knows he has one shot left to, uh, to qualify Eruption, and he's here zeroed in on taking that, that opportunity. He is, he is. So I, I'm eager to see how it works out for him. I know he's gonna get, bring his best. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, in about two hours from now, we're going to uh, build our brackets and go into our single elimination format. But uh, here, you're going to be seeing, in some cases, uh, lots of robots fighting at least two, twice. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this really like kind of early seeding part of the day is incredible because we get to see all of the robots. We get to see the most unusual robots. By 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, it's mostly just killers that are left in the box um, because the fun robots or the unusual robots have already been eliminated for the day. Uh, let, let's just clarify, though. Uh, the murder robots, the absolute top of the yeah. pack, no less fun. Um, they, they are... They're serious, They're Ricky. very serious. We, yeah. But that's what so, so magic here is there are some incredibly... Um, powerful robots that still have such personality and so much fun. I just heard in Cage 4 we're that gonna... uh, we ha we're having some trouble powering on one of these robots here. I wonder which robot it is. I can see a Brazilian robot. Yeah, with our rules here and our safety procedure, you are allowed to power cycle a robot if it fails to start, uh, but we don't generally allow, you know, cage side repairs. Uh, but sometimes, in fact, an alarming amount of the time, Combat robot problems can be solved with the, uh, you know, the venerable solution of turn it off and turn it back on again. Wow, I can see Alex Grant from uh, Team Tantrum, the captain of Team Tantrum, standing cage side. And I can see a Brazilian team on the other side. I think that this could be Team Warrior there with, uh, let's see, we've got Chupacabra on one edge of the corner uh, facing off against Unreasonable. It's actually kind of uh, interesting here. Uh, with Unreasonable as the opponent, five, uh, Alex four, Grant, of course, is from three, C's Reasonable two, uh, Designs. One. Fight, robots, fight. Uh, going up against uh, Unreasonable Expectations. I, reasonable versus Unreasonable, and uh, Chaos versus, well, more Chaos, frankly. 
right, folks, I am joined here by Kyle. We'll introduce him a little more properly, but if you hear a disembodied voice that doesn't match Mr. Luke Stangle, that is why. Yeah, I, uh, I don't even look like Luke Stangle. I like him, though. He's a good fella. Yeah. All right, so we decided the pronunciation of this spot. Is it Zupacabra or is it Chupacabra? Uh, I like Zupacabra myself, but, you know, really, that's a question I should have asked. Right <laughs> I was at their pit table earlier today, and I meant to ask this question, but I completely forgot. Hopefully we get an answer on that later on. But at the same time, they are currently upside down and unhappy. Oh, you know, it seems like we both, might both be wrong. There's a, there's a certain uh, accent, Portuguese accent that's coming through here. A shoop, like a chupacabra. Ooh, I like that. I, I don't know how an X is pronounced in Portuguese, but apparently, it, in this case anyway, it's a, it's a shoop. Chupacabra. Rato is, is hato also. I mean, we knew that about him. Yeah, <laughs> I think that might just be him bragging about himself. I don't know. <laughs> no bragging necessary. The man's just speaking the truth. And the count out looks like it is happening now. All right, so it does sound like we now have knockout. a knockout. Yep. Not exactly. Uh, Action packed there. It's still always nice to get a knockout in. We're uh, we're gonna see, of course, a win following up for unreasonable expectations, and uh, we will <laughs> we're gonna have to immediately then turn around and, and have those Brazilians fighting cage one, um, doing their best up against. Oh, who do we have over there? I can't quite see. No, but uh, yeah, they have a lot of robots fielded today. And in the uh, wise words of Paul Ventimiglia, "Mo robots equals mo problems." So yeah, no no rest for them after that defeat. They've got to go immediately fight at the other cage. Mo mo, mo robots, less money. Mo robots, less money. Mo problems, mo stress. You know, it's really a bad habit. It's a, it's quite a flow chart that we're talking about here. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, now that we're on camera, welcome more formally to the desk, Kyle. Glad to be here. I'm uh, sporting my new Maximizer merch. I see that is. Tell me about the cows, though. The cows? Oh, well, this was uh, this was actually a gift from Team Utter Destruction. Uh, they wanted me to support the team with mm -hmm. cows, and they know that I have a penchant for uh, Hawaiian-style shirts. So, sure, sure. Uh, they hooked me up with this cow Hawaiian shirt. Sounds like a double win. It's, uh, yeah. I, mean, I, I will note that I've got nothing against animal print um, anything. If it's not a onesie, we were talking about that earlier. Yeah. That's, you know, completely acceptable in my book. Yep, nope, it's uh, it's just cows and Hawaiian shirts, and, I, and you know, I figured it, it juxtaposes the cyber sigilism that is the Maximizer shirt. Sure, um, sure. Which I, I just learned that term, like, last week, but I like it, cyber sigilism. Yeah, sigil it on its own is a fun word. I mean, you, you build from there, and it <laughs> becomes, becomes really interesting. I, uh, I've seen this. I'm going to go back and look at it later in, in probably in a haunting reality. But, you know, these, uh, this type of text is... Incredibly hard to read if you don't squint just right. That is correct, but yes. But then, if you invert the colors, sometimes it becomes blatantly obvious. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so I'm really interested to see if this is, uh, you know... My, my eight-year-old son actually read it no problem. I was like, what does my shirt say? And he was like, Maximizer. And I said, interesting, because I can't read that on this shirt, but it, it, really it does say it. Really into Doom Metal. Yeah, I, he might be. He might be. I, he's um, He does have very varied music tastes. You know, mm -hmm. it goes from, uh, like, whatever the weird YouTube music is to uh, to metal. So, yeah, he's got he's got Could a wide be. variety. Yeah. All right, we are coming back on camera in cage one. As we mentioned, the uh, uh, our friends over there had a very rapid turnaround time that they had to make. Oh, I see the Vasquez is our cage side. This could be an eager fight. Yeah, this is a uh, little bit of a BattleBots parallel. Vasquez versus, um, versus Brazil. So this is, I believe, Sidewalk Slammer versus Pancada.
Sidewalk Slammer, very interesting design from the Jason Vasquez. This is the first ever convertible horizontal to vertical robot, and it can do this Five, live in the four, box. Three, yeah, it's, it's not two, unusual to see this one, as a configuration fight, change, robots but fight. it's tough to see it as something that happens mid-fight, uh, depending on the situation you find yourself in. Ooh, and it hits like a brick. Look at that shot. Pankata just getting launched across the box from that. Yeah, it's show do. It is. Look at that. Pinned up against the corner. And it sounds like that drum of Pankata is just grinding across the floor, and then they get hit directly in the back. Look at that. And you can see there is just the, the tiniest offset right now on Sidewalk Slammer. It is not 100% vertical. And I wonder if that's intentional. Uh, it could give some really interesting impact dynamics uh, during a hit. I think that has something to do with how it actually converts. So there's just a servo mechanism holding a bolt in place that's what's keeping that weapon upright right now. Once they activate that servo and withdraw it, they're able to turn it into a horizontal weapon live. Um, I don't think they're going to do that for this particular fight because there's a big front plow on this robot on Pachata that they don't want to fight. Yeah, barring some sort of, Oh, and look, it, it's, it's now, it now appears to be at like a 45 degree angle, I'd say. Yeah, that's not good. Now they're going to get their one unstick. Let's see if that is effective. They're going to try their best. There does seem to be a lot of places where this robot could potentially do the thing. Pankata doing a great job just holding back, waiting. waiting and wait. Prepared to come in and attack if necessary. Our house bot doing the best job they can to be gentle in getting Sidewalk Slammer off of the, the side rail. Yeah, there's a little bit of nuzzling going on in that corner and... Eating a lot of time on the clock right now, I'll say that. Yeah, so far, if this match were to end and it wasn't a count out, Pankata would still be ahead by a good margin, I think. Yeah, I'd say so. Interesting design. First time we've ever seen this type of a design here at NHRL. First time we've ever seen this kind of a design in combat robotics period at the end. I, I, it has certainly been tried in the past. I just don't know if anyone has actually made it into the ring with this sort of thing. Right. Uh, yeah, we are calling a, a regular countdown here. Knockout. That is a knockout. Sidewalk Slammer is not going to come back from that. No. Yeah, this is, uh, this is what happens. If you get stuck up against the side rail and you are unable to be dislodged by the house spot, you will get counted out. Now, interestingly... Um, you know, both uh, designs, both Vasquez designs uh, have have had some trouble with this before, had some getting pinned up against the wall issues. Some of the uh, the competitions out West Coast wise uh, don't have as much of a lip around the arena. They aren't used to having to worry about getting stuck up on a guardrail uh, quite as much. All right, we're going to head over to cage three now. Link's, Link's going full force against Money Shot. Money, Money Shot, one of the best branded nuts. robots here, period, the end in the pits. It's an absolutely gorgeous machine, but Link's is Link's. It is the reigning and defending world champion. Money Shot slowing down there, no longer driving properly. Lynx yet to qualify this year for the finals. That's their job today. They are here to qualify for the finals so they can defend their title oh as world champion. I, uh, I think they are going to get one step closer at the end of this fight. We are seeing huge sparks, huge impacts, and uh, not much anything from Money Shot at this point. Calvin said his, his idea and strategy was to drive more conservatively today to avoid some of the pitfalls he had at the last competition. I've seen no evidence of that so far. Yeah, I can certainly say that I can, I can detect a little more care, but that's not the same as conservatism when no, it comes to driving. No, there, there was nothing conservative about that. He no. took every shot he possibly could in that matchup. He is clearly being careful, but he is still bringing it as hard as he possibly can. Early in the match, I will say this, Kyle. There was a, a point in time in that match, Link spun down its weapon. Interesting. They, uh, I, I assumed it was unintentional, but we don't know. Um, that could have been holding back. That, that could have been part of that strategy. Yeah. 
Um, every moment your weapon is not spinning is a weapon that your moment your weapon will not break. Yeah, true. All right, so we are now hanging out here in cage two. Where you can see down there in the blue corner, we have Frustration. And up there in the pink corner, we have Chainsaw Kitty. Two fan favorites out here today. We love these robots. Yeah, Chainsaw Kitty has uh, kind of rocketed to stardom here. It's, it's such an interesting robot. It's competitive. It's got a lovely theme to it. You have wonderful builders behind it. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a what's not to love situation. Absolutely. Yeah, the team's growing as well. They've got a new mini bot that they're fielding out there. The bot hits hard. It drives incredibly Five, well. And it's four, gotten so close to qualifying three, in its last few two, competitions. One. Fight. Robot fight. Meanwhile. Frustration, captained by Miss Garnache, is a Peter Bar kit. And it is stuck in the corner right now. Yeah, there's a lot of struggling movement right now. Ooh, and there's... Oh, oh no! Oh, look at those parts flying That's a wheel! Kyle. That's some side armor! There is no mercy being shown by Chainsaw Kitty and Keziah Sky right now. The back wheel's oh. gone. Both back wheels are gone on Frustration. Oh my gosh. Is that a bad yeah, that is a battery sitting there. That is not good. The countdown has started. There is no battery. Most of the wheels are gone. Frustration is a durable robot. We've seen this robot go the full three minutes in many matches. Not it went less than a minute in this fight with Keziah Sky and Chainsaw Kitty. I mean, that's some highlight reel stuff right there. That was phenomenal. Yeah, I am solidly impressed. Just the destruction alone. Wow, look at this shot. She's a little, at least she's stuck in the corner there on the mini bot. Keziah taking full advantage of it. Maybe the mini bot's what Chainsaw Kitty needed, you know? Maybe that's the, the new X Factor. It, it very well could be. I mean, Chainsaw, what is it? What was just flying around the arena there? What was that string or? It was some sort of wire or just something getting unspooled. But yeah, it looked like spaghetti. And there's the battery. It really did. It was like there was a can of Silly Spring that got, you know, impacted halfway through there. And Alicia is all smiles. She loves the destruction, even when it's her own bot. Those are my favorite kind of competitors, Kyle. When you can really lean into the uh, the destruction, whether or not it happens to hit your pocketbook. <laughs> well, yeah. The sadness can come later, but for that moment, <laughs> for that moment, yeah. it's just fine. For about ten seconds or less. <laughs> Yeah, it, that's so cr Five, I mean, we've seen that bot. Four, we've three, seen frustration in so two, many fights. It's one, crazy. It's never fight, been shredded like that. Robots fight. Not in that short number of hits. All right, so we've got Doc, Doug versus Doppelgator. Ooh, nasty. Duck is uh, the new entry from the, uh, from the Brazilian team. Uh, Arthur Leonel. Excuse my pronunciation there, but uh, Arthur, anyhow, has brought Duck. I'm, I'm excited to see, of course, the um, the Warrior team and the Brazilians love love their ducks or their geese or their their mascots. I, I have to assume that that's a big part of the uh, the naming convention here. Doppelgator is from Brooke Silver. It is a dual egg beater robot running a four wheel drive tangential drive system. Pretty familiar to a lot of the builders here today. Tap out. Oh, there is your oh. match. And yeah. now it is tapped out. Yeah, there was a. Uh, that was some pretty classic Brazilian driving and aggression right there. Yeah, not the most thrilled, but uh, you know, doing the best they possibly can. We'll do a quick replay here in cage four. You can see there there was some good engagement. I mean, that is that is a massive hit. Not yeah. quite a roof shot, but 
But Duck was sent substantially up in the air a couple of times. Um, but in the end, it's just durability. I mean, Duck was able to hold it together. Um, and um, but, but there's only so much you can do. Yeah. All right, we've got uh, Cage One coming at you in just a few minutes. We're not quite loaded yet. Yet seems like we are, are getting robots into the arena. This is going to be Side Apple versus Concord. Really excited about that matchup. Kyle, I'm unaware. Is there an interesting story behind the name of Side Apple? Uh, you know what? I was not able to speak to that builder. So I don't know if they have an interesting story. We might be able to get an interview with them later, assuming they're bots and enough pieces that they can talk to us later or on today. A low enough number of pieces. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, exactly. I um, mean, there, there are several apples here. Interesting. Yeah, um, we do. We have quite a few apple competitors this time around. Yeah. So we've got, let's see, uh, Happy Apple. Yep. Uh, poison Apple. Right. Side Apple, of course. And These are not all on the same team, either. No, no. I mean, I think uh, certainly Happy Apple and um, uh, Side Apple are from the same area. I think they are both on the same. I think they're both Leatherback Robot. Oh, um, gotcha. But uh, Poison Apple's just in there throwing, throwing our whole... The whole Apple naming theme off. Yeah, that's yeah. Christine, right, from outside the box. Right, yeah. right. Podcast host turned robot competitor. Uh, as is so often the case. <laughs> uh, you know, it's one way or the other. It's Yeah, you're right. You're if right. you're not one, you'll become the other eventually. Very soon. Very soon. There we can see some members of Team Honeycracked. Zoe gets this kind of look on her face sometimes where um, she's waiting, she's waiting, Five, she looks unhappy, four, and then smile and three, happiness and everything's two, good. One. Fight, robots, fight. And away we go. Concord has got, uh, you know, kind of this interesting multi-bot approach um, with a, a Smee-like uh, forked plow robot. It's uh, incredibly flexible, too. I, was, I got to play with it a little bit upstairs. You can just bend the whole thing in multiple directions. Oh, stuck into the top there. Side Apple's overhead attack worked really well in that. Yeah, existence. wow. They, uh, they've done a, a wonderful job. Ripping that top plate right there off of Concord. That is such an interesting um, design decision to have that sort of hammer saw with that sort of length on the arm. Uh, and you can see there, it's a very sharp weapon tip. Yeah, extremely. On, on Side Apple. I mean, that, that would get tremendous bite. If it was me, I'd be very concerned about getting that lodged in an opponent's top plate, uh, which I assume is kind of the intent. It looks like the arm is no longer actuating at this point. Yeah, it's kind of um, pulling itself along a little bit. Um, and of course, these motors are gonna have a hard time spinning up when the, the weapon is being pushed directly into the floor. Even if it does still function, the position is not ideal for it to start. little bit of a, a pin. I think that's a pin on side apple. It, it may well just be it's not functioning, but it's trying. Yeah, I think this, this may be the end for side apple. Yeah, that's unfortunate. They got one really massive hit in. Yeah. And now they're just getting cornered by Matt Luther and Concord, and uh, they're just not able. Yeah, Concord is doing everything it needs to do here, staying uh, on its opponent, but then still occasionally giving... Oh! Oh, it's... We got some movement. It's just barely back, Kyle. That's enough. That's enough to keep it in. It is, at least for the moment. Um, it is certainly not going to win at any um, judges' decisions. But, uh, you know, you can keep limping. Miracles can happen. Um, yeah, maybe every single bot in their ZSC will just die right now. You say it jokingly, but it does happen. It happens all the time. Not even uncommon. All right, that is going to be the end by knockout. Your winner is Concord Side Apple taking home uh, a frustrating loss knockout. there. Yeah.
they had one really beautiful hit. The weapon no longer really functioned after that, and the drive barely functioned after that. A lot of potential in that robot that just wasn't actualized in that fight. Cool weapon design, though. Yeah, I'm really interested to see them work, work the kinks out there. I think you're going to see a lot of very unhappy top plates if that robot starts yeah. working as intended. In the near Absolutely. Future. This is the last chance for so many bots to qualify. That means you are going to get the random, just new design thrown in at the last minute, ready to go. Trying desperately to get it qualified. Now, I was talking to a lot of builders up in the pits, and they're suspecting that the winner of the World Championships in November is going to be one of the top four from today. That the robots that you're going to see today with the level of competition that you're seeing today are going to be so dialed in, they will be the ones best situated to win. It makes perfect sense. In the meantime, uh, we are going to head up to Lindsay in the pits. I think we've got some more updates. Lindsay! How are you doing? Hi, you guys. Oh. Uh, coming to you from the fog of war. What um, happened up there? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so <laughs> this all just happened in the last 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Uh, I casually turn around, and I see a big plume of smoke. Uh, you know, n no fire or anything. Um, oh, but wow. But clearly something happened. You can see it here on screen. Uh, and, uh, you know, our safety crew, they were able to get it into the rollaway bin. It was handled quickly, efficiently, safely. Uh, what no does one... it smell like up there right now? I, Ricky, uh, or Kyle, I can't even think straight because it smells so bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if need be, let's get, get folks out of there. If, yes, if, we've uh... got fans coming in. Um, it is uh, put your masks on, you know. Yeah, if you weren't already wearing one, you, you, you should, should be. probably get one on now. Yeah, for sure, Lindsay. We'll let you get back to that mask. Wow. Aye. Aye, That's aye, uh, aye, not aye, where aye. you want to be, Kyle. No, I mean, the, there's a lot of things that are combustible in a combat robot. Most notably, the battery systems are extremely combustible, and yep. when they catch on fire, they just don't stop burning until they're done burning. That's generally the case, yeah. So uh, I, maybe that's what happened up there. I don't know, but either Could way. Be. I'm getting a little bit of the, the wafting smell down here, even. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'm not smelling anything myself. You must have more uh, sensory uh, <laughs> sensitivity to those Well, it's all that smells. time I spend in the deprivation tanks. Oh, nope. Now I'm getting it, too. So there you go. Uh, it does smell a little bit lipo-ish. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I encourage people to uh, make room up there. Anyone who's not involved in the cleanup process, let's let's get you out until that smoke is clear. Everybody's passing masks out there. You can see, yes, please take care of your lungs. You don't want to be breathing too much of that stuff in. It's not great for you. Yeah. Oof. Well, I'm sure our, our safety folks up there will, uh, will take care of it. Uh, and, and get things evacuated. We do uh, have a wonderful and very intense ventilation system here at NHRL. That is correct. Uh, both for fire safety, for COVID safety, for all sorts of things. The, the air in this building is turned over, I think it's like every 30 seconds or something nutty. Yeah. It, it's um, and filtered in the whole nine yards. So. Um, uh, we will be back in action relatively soon. And, yeah, we did. Uh, we upgraded the, the uh, air handling system during COVID. So we kept that, keeping the air constantly moving and cleaned out in mind while we were putting that system together, right. which is, I mean, really great for what we do anyway. Um, right. <laughs> whether or not there is a viral pandemic going on. Right. So, um, no, it's good. But it, that's a stressful situation on, up there. And that only happens when there's an accident uh, or a We've only had a couple or, of these. Yeah. Ever. Um, in the meantime... Uh, speaking of fire safety and that sort of thing, we have more fire safety bots, uh, sorry, more fire robots in this event than we've had uh, in any previous event, at least in recent memory. And we're going to go over and do a little bit of an interview now and uh, hear a little bit about that fire safety process. Awesome. Uh, let's, let's cut the camera over. Keeping the earth constantly moving and cleaned out in mind while we were putting that system together, which is, I mean, really great. flamethrowing robot. Alex, what are some of the folks out there that want to build a flamethrower of their own? What are some of the considerations that they have to take? What are some of the safety protocols that you've had to go through here at NHRL to make sure that you can do this safely and reliably? Yeah, it's pretty important to focus on safety first and foremost before you even think about starting a flamethrower robot. The uh, inherent dangers that come with fire are pretty evident. Don't try this at home, kids. But you can do it safely through the 
rules that NHRL has imposed. So once you get through the safety process and make sure that everything is working appropriately, you can feel some level of confidence that everything will go well once you are here. But back to the beginning, before you even start one, think about, hey, do I really want to burn my house down? You know, is that risk worth it? And the answer should be no, but you might still want to do this. And so think about how you're going to have fire extinguishers handy, how you're going to have uh, well-ventilated areas, you're burning fuel, you're burning uh, plastics, you, you know, just everything that you're doing in testing is a risk. And so, of, yeah, I don't know. Of, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm really curious now, looking at Dutch Oven, tell us a little bit about what makes it different than some of the other flamethrowers that we've seen that have been very successful here, like, like a mixtape, for example. Oh boy, the gas is coming out. I'm not supposed to have something. So frequently you have, uh, so traditionally Dutch Oven version one and mixtape other robots will use a commercial butane tank. Um, what I went ahead and did this year is make a custom tank. So what goes in the eight ounce can of butane is now in this uh, custom aluminum housing. And uh, that allows me to package around my shuffler pod and other stuff. So this tank right here is actually filled with butane gas. Not currently. But Not currently, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. before a fight, before you load fight, this. I load this. Wow, that's so interesting. How, uh, how do you know your exact weight and measurement of the butane fuel that you have in here? So in the design process, you can go ahead and uh, figure out the volume that happens inside of the tank. So the tank is designed to fit a specific volume of fuel which it coincides with eight ounces is the allowed limit. Then once you weigh your robot without fuel, you fill it and then weigh it again with the full fuel. You, you weigh it again with the full fill tank and then make sure that you're at the eight ounces. You might be a little over, so you might have to vent some gas, but that allows you to make sure you're back at the eight ounces. That's, and so now that will actually uh, dump the gas, the butane, into where the, uh, the actual combustion and air mixing happens. And this is also 3D printed aluminum, right? Yeah, so the tank is, uh, yeah, so the tank is billet aluminum. So that's machined aluminum and then anodized. But the actual combustion chamber on Dutch oven uh, is a 3D printed aluminum housing. And so the, the Rube Goldberg of how this works is you fill from the port, which then goes through a manifold and a straw going into the tank here. Then once it's in the tank, you can come back out through the fill port in the fight to have a long flame, or you can use the second solenoid to go through the combustion chamber and fire in the hot flame, as I call it. So instead of shooting a really far flame, it's gonna shoot a close flame that is a much higher temperature. I'm curious if you actually, you know, if you borrowed any ideas from something else out there that exists, because this is this is wildly imaginative for how you can produce a, a flamethrower, was there is there another device, something some kind of component out there or a tool that that has some kind of assembly that's like this that you kind of you know borrowed that as a uh, as an inspiration? Yeah, so uh, rocket engines, jet engines often have uh, regenerative cooling is what they call it, and so in the future, not at this event. Uh, this version of Dutch oven will get hot enough to potentially melt or at least weaken the aluminum housing. And so you run the cold gas through internal channels on the housing to allow the gas to take the heat out and then burn somewhere else so the chamber does not melt and go into like a meltdown. This is, uh, this is all very fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit about the insight uh, that it took to build Dutch Oven. Good luck in the competition, Alex. Oh, thank you very much. It should be a fun one. We'll see. This is more of a tech demo at this event. So next year should be really uh, hitting on all cylinders. But this one, we're getting everything. You know, we're soldering boards as we speak to get this together for tomorrow. Firing on all cylinders. Firing on all cylinders. All right. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Fantastic. Yes. I, I've seen a lot of engineering, and I was, I was speaking earlier uh, about my excitement level as people are really leaning into the fact that we have these fire robots, that we allow that here, yeah. um, and taking it from something of where it's like, I'm just going to slap a lighter on something, 
to an incredible, you know, cutting edge of 2023, what engineering uh, facilities, methods, approaches uh, can we put into a, a robot, a three pound, three pound nominal robot uh, to make things melt faster. It's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, it's absolutely true. You put people with, especially with that team's brains behind something like a flamethrower, you're going to get something absolutely incredible out yeah. of it. Speaking of brains, you can see here we've got uh, a tremendous number of uh, incredibly talented people upstairs uh, doing their best. Uh, we still have a little bit of a cleared out pit from, from earlier, but uh, we've cleared out the smoke. We are ready again to have people get back to work. I was hearing from Lindsay earlier, apparently they had leaf blowers going on up there to actually help move the air a little bit faster and get some of the air forced out towards the windows. Um, love that idea. You know, whatever you could do to get that lipo smoke out of there as quickly as possible. Once you deal with the flame, you gotta deal with the smoke. And uh, I'm glad that we kept everybody's safety in mind. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, uh, the reason, a big part of the reason we're able to have these flamethrower bots is the work that you've been putting in, Ricky. It has been a lot, Kyle. Yeah, we have been, um, we've, we've had flamethrower robots for a long time. Uh, we've always had a dedication to making sure that they're safe. Yeah. Um, we've also been working now uh, as we look towards the future of trying to expand out uh, into other locations and have more events over the course of the year. We want to make sure that what we're doing is not just safe, but it's, um, it appears to be safe because some of the things, you know, we, we want excitement. You want a sense of danger. Right. But you, you don't want things that are you know, actually scaring um, men, women, children, and, and uh, more importantly, maybe the authorities uh, locally who, who raise an eyebrow. It's, right. it's uh, not a thing where we, we are trying to ask for forgiveness. We want to make sure we check in with all the authorities, make sure that what we're doing is something that they're comfortable with, that they understand well. And that's the biggest thing here. This is a new, um, this is a relatively new sport, all things considered. Yeah. And it's even newer to have widespread use of flame-based and fuel-based robots. That's brand new. I mean, yeah. we're, we're talking with fire marshals and, um, you know, explosive experts and, and pyrotechnics experts uh, who have never worked with stuff like this, and we're just getting them up to speed on the vocabulary, on the relative risks, yep. uh, and they're getting us up to speed on the legalese, on the local protocols. Um, you know, as, as our crowds grow here, we take extra precaution. Um, it's it's a, a huge learning curve for everyone, and it's, it's already paying dividends. We're, we got a little more information we'll actually put up here uh, on flamethrowers, uh, of course, Mixtape is a, a great example here yeah, it uh, is. as a weapon type. Uh, these, these robots have been around a long time. They can do a lot of damage in a lot of good ways. They have some strength. They look amazing. It's really easy to show off and just like spew aggression, literally and figuratively, at all your opponents. Uh, you can melt things. Uh, you, can, you can burn through things. Um, on the flip side, Fire doesn't all, especially when it's not working well, it's really hard to damage robots that are made out of steel. It's really yeah. hard to damage things that are made out of aluminum. We have had robots that are capable of melting steel and aluminum in the most ideal circumstances, um, but it's very rare. Um, you can see here some of these robots in the past that we've had uh, <laughs> put in some great work in terms of uh, being a flamethrower and, and burning their opponents uh, to the ground. Dragon Princess, we haven't seen, we, we have Dragon Queen today. Dragon Queen is uh, Dragon Princess with new owners, new operators. Right. Um, should be a fully flammable, a flammable bot when it's here and operating, but we will see them when the 30 pound competition kicks back into place. Flaming Fart, one of everybody's favorite flame bots. Just a ridiculous, over-the-top flamethrower. Not particularly hot, but explosive. No, it, it is really interesting, actually, to see. Of course, there's Dutch oven in previous competitions. It's really interesting to see. The more you see that kind of orange color, yeah. uh, the less hot the flame is. Yeah, it looks cooler, though. It, it does really look just cooler. Look, and there's, this and, is one of our most iconic flame moments right yeah, here. Yeah, and mixtape is, is the exception to that rule when I talk about... Uh, talk about uh, hotness, they make up for the fact that flame isn't that hot by just having a lot of it. Yeah, if so you much. you can completely smother your opponent in a flame that's only a thousand degrees, 
That, that may well be better than a directed tiny jet of two or 2,500 degrees. Absolutely, like especially when your opponent is made out of mostly 3D printed, unprotected material. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons we see such success, right now anyway, in the three pound class of robots with flamethrowers. So many of those robots lean on plastic parts, lean yeah. on 3D printed parts. Um, it's the most weight effective material to use. Right, you don't see that so much in the 12 pound class and you don't see it, you see it even less in the 30 pound class. Yeah. Those um, robots are made out of metal. Right. As, as flamethrower tech progresses, as builders come up with things that are progressively more um, uh, powerful, we are going to have more and more flame bots in those classes. They're just going to take a little extra work to get yeah. to where they need to be. And those flamethrowers are so much less interesting to watch when you're facing a metal bot. You might melt some the internal components, some belts. Something might break because of the flamethrower, but it doesn't have that same charred melty bot goodness that you get down in the three pound Yeah, that class. gooey nougat. Oh, that gooey nougat. That's what All we right, want. We're we want to see pieces of the bot just dripping off as it gets out of the box. All right, so it looks like we're loading now into cage four. It's going to be Raptor X-22. First time back in a while for them, and great times. Raptor X-22 up there in the pink corner. This is their first time back in a while. They have a very powerful drum spinner with really sharp teeth on it, really cool robot. They've made quite a few improvements on this bot since last time they were here. There you can see it right there, nice and tall. Sharp teeth on the front of that sucker. Five, four, three, two, one. Fight, robots, oh, fight. Very interesting. Whoa! I, speaking of flame. Yeah. Um, Joshua is uh, one of our biggest flame aficionados here, and, and great times as a robot. He's been struggling to get to work correctly, uh, and boy, does it do a wonderful job. He is. Flies up in the air while on fire. Um, this is a tremendous amount of flame from this robot. Uh, really interesting design internally. Yeah, it's running a total of six 130 millimeter butane tanks, each um, that each feed their own flamethrower nozzle. Right. Joshua's goal is to create the biggest flame possible in the 12 pound division. He ain't far off from that goal right now. No, I uh, fully support this endeavor. This is this is what we work for when we're trying to get flamethrowers. Um, more, more popular and uh, more popularized. And you can see now whenever he does flame on, a lot of that flame is lingering inside of his own bot. That's not necessarily what you want to happen with your flamethrower. No, it is far from ideal, but it is also, you know, not the worst thing in the world. Yeah, somewhat planned for, somewhat, th uh, somewhat pre-thought out. Oh, nasty hit there from Raptor X-22. One thing I will say about those uh, 130 millimeter tanks is uh, those nozzles are small, have to be a little bit small, mm -hmm. and that makes them a little bit fragile. So some of the, the nice clear streams of flame that we saw at the beginning of the fight are now getting a little bit less clear, a little bit more muddled, a little bit more of a flame vomit than it was a flame stream. Precisely, and those nozzles, especially when used in design like this, they melt. Yeah, you know, even makes if, sense. If, even if they're, um, uh, untouched uh, by, by another robot, uh, they very well can just melt themselves shut, melt themselves over, and end up with all sorts of wacky flame thrunts and, uh, you know, wonky dynamics. And this is an attempted unstick for great times. Now the count out has happened. Flo unable to unstick them. Yeah, I think this is going to be a knockout for Raptor X-22. Interesting, Raptor X-22 was um, accidentally uh, on the knockout. hazard robot list. We thought they were showing up with some super dangerous uh, design, and, and certainly it's, it's potent in the box, but it's really kind of a bog standard vertical 
uh, egg yeah, beater. Yeah, that's, it's, uh, it's a custom egg beater. It's a really nice bot. The team's put a lot of work into it and a lot of improvements oh, before yeah, this event. Oh, not, yeah, not to say that it is anything less than uh, formidable. But, but I would not call it a danger to uh, humans and other living things in the area. Right, right. Um, the Some bot wasn't very mobile last time it was here. We see this particular fight. It's pretty mobile now. It's moving really well. Yeah, it's I Wow, Ouch. what a hit. And ball on fire. What? That is fantastic. All right. Nice work by Patrick Murphy and Raptor X22. All right. Pulled that fight out very handily. That was a really great matchup. That flame flying through the air and tumbling through I, the air like that. I love it. That's, that is the kind of flame uh, situation that I want to see. That, yeah. That's the extra work. That's the extra time that goes into getting flames uh, approved is so that you can, you know, just have a tumbling flamethrower fly through the air yeah. uh, a few feet in front of you. In the 12-pound weight class, that's what you want to see. Uh, mm -hmm. More 12-pound flamethrowers, bring it on. That's a really cool piece. I can't wait to see him improve that and uh, improve that design to keep that flame going the entire time period. Yeah, and, and you know with Joshua, he's going to do that. Yeah. I mean, uh, he's got a commitment and a real passion for making flame robots not just competitive, but popular. Yeah. Yeah, and that's uh, part of the joy of flame robots. We found out they can be competitive, especially in the yeah. three-pound weight class. And, and it's worth noting, that is not something that was well-known a few years ago. No, not there, at all. There was kind of this, you know, underlying fear that flame robots, yeah, they look cool, but there's only so much you can do with them. Right, um, right. We've That has been disproven, Completely. like, handedly. You can have a very powerful flame robot, at least with the current NHRL rule set. Yep. Um, and now it's just a question of how do you make it reliable, um, and, and who wants to do it? All right, we're heading over now into cage six. You can see over there in the pink corner, that is Steel Mountain going up against Cha Cha Taken. Imposing name, Steel Mountain. Steel Mountain is a very uh, imposing robot. It is um, it is a five, shuffler four, bot, or not a shuffler three, bot, but it is a two, kinetic walker bot. One, it has uh, fight, it robots moves fight. by the unbalanced motion of its weapon, and also its mini bot in the back is what kind of pushes it around. Steel Mountain, I, I feel like that's a uh, it's a railroad worker name. Oh yeah. We drove 20 miles iron yesterday, Steel Mountain did. And uh, Cha Cha Taken is a, looks like it's an SSP lifter kit. Mm -hmm. I believe so. Cool some, forks Maybe some, too. yeah, mild modifications there. I love the way Steel Mountain has gone about this. The magnetic uh, attachment for the mini bot is just, uh, it's the kind of passion for weird that I really, Fully appreciate it. I agree. Oh, I agree. huge chunk has been taken out of Cha Cha Taken. Yeah, one whole front fork assembly is gone. Steel Mountain has. To oh! Now, with the unconventional weight bonus, uh, unconventional locomotion weight bonus, and the minibot weight bonus, Steel Mountain is a beefy machine that is almost all that weight is put into the weapon. Yeah, it is. Impressively min max. I don't see any movement right now from Cha Cha Taken. Just the slightest wiggle. Uh, it appears to be stuck in the wall. I imagine we're going to get an unstick, at least an unstick attempt. There we go. It's shaking itself loose. Perfect. Nice job there. That was a really great unstick. Now, are they able oh, to get and then behind? back again? Yeah. Uh, it should oh, be no. able to free itself. I, I can sense it, it coming loose. It'll yeah, just take they're a able to wiggle free. themselves out there. Uh, I, yeah, I was about to say, Steel Mountain, this is a great opportunity for that mini bot to get, wow! Wow, really great driving, and we're used to that weapon with Cha-Cha taken. They were able to get underneath the entire weapon assembly of Steel Mountain and lift them up without damaging themselves. Impressive. That is a very, uh, that is an absolutely surgical uh, execution there. And you can see Steel Mountain mobile without the mini bot, but not particularly controlled without the mini bot. Those bristles basically go in one direction. Allegedly, if you slow down, it'll start to turn in the other direction. We have not seen much of an indication that that is true with Steel Mountain. We 
We've seen that with other Bristol Bobs, but not with Steel Mountains. Wow, look at the uh, the chunks that have been taken out of Steel Mountain's superstructure on the top there. That is, yeah. Uh, that robot has been through a lot. And a lot of that is its own damage to itself by slamming itself around the arena and into other bots. I, I would not be surprised, yeah. Yeah, I, I think Steel Mountain is trying to do the right thing here with Cha-Cha taken barely limping. Um, they want to take this, this time period to... Oh! A wheel has fallen off of the minibot of Steel Mountain. That is your match. We have gone to the judges. Um, I think that's going to be pretty decisive, Kyle. Yeah. Tend to oh. agree, tend to agree. Oh my, I, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, uh, but we are about to head to cage four, and I see something that uh, pleases me deeply. Something <laughs> that brings me that kind of uh, unbridled joy, uh, and that is a junk robot. It is a uh, wonderful, wonderful pile of spare parts, aptly named spare parts, uh, going up against Dragon Queen. We were just talking about Dragon Queen. Dragon Queen, one of the original Flamebot Supreme, uh, Supremacy Lords here at this competition. Yes. Originally called Dragon Princess. It has now been purchased by another team. It has new owners. Um, and I got to tell you, they're going up against fan favorites in Spare Parts. Spare Parts team showed up here last night at 3 o'clock. They rolled into the building. I saw some parts and um, no robots. Now I see... A lot of parts and a lot of a robot. Their pit desk always looks like a mess. It always looks like a jumble of just weird stuff. And then eventually they show up with something that passes safety yeah. and can get through the competition. Sometimes they're up all night doing it. Sometimes they take these pieces and parts back to their hotel so they can keep working on it. Uh, but this time it seems like they had a, a few more things kind of ready to go. They had their uh, com opponent or components a little bit more planned out. So we shall see. Looks like Dragon Princess is having a little trouble getting started, so they did a quick power cycle. Uh, we're going to close the door, make sure that it functions, uh, and then call it good. Oh, so there's some, some beaver-themed hoodies over there, I think? I do believe that is what they're wearing. They're going with the full-on beaver onesie this time. To me, they look a little bit like that uh, the the mammals music video. Do you remember that music video back in the day? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know that I wanted to, but uh, <laughs> I'm here now. Did you ever watch the old, I want to say 1970s adaptation of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Yes, as a matter it, of fact. It reminds me of the beaver suits. Yes. Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. Now you can see the weapon on spare parts is literally five, a lawnmower blade four, mounted to a drill three, sticking out the two, front of the microwave one, body. Fight. Yeah, that's Robots how I mow my lawn. Fight. Oh, it's spinning up. That is a minibot heading over there to try to stop their progression. If they are progressing, they uh, do look like they're moving a little bad. I see fuel coming out of Dragon Queen, but I don't see any ignition quite yet. Yeah, those. Uh, it's the. Oh, no. The tungsten ignition in front wasn't all the way heated up when they were, when Rachel was trying to spill some gas out. Rachel de Guzman is the operator of uh, Dragon Queen. Yeah, it, I, I can see it. It is clearly hot. It is trying. Um, not exactly sure what the hold up is. I would love to see that microwave catch fire like someone filled it to the brim with forks. Now, you can see the balloon on the side of spare parts. Potentially, that was a self-writing mechanism of some fort, uh, part, like filled with helium <laughs> to lift over side of, the, uh, side of the box as it tipped over. But it is not functional right now. You know, I'm going to go ahead and say right now that they might win a judge's decision. They might win a count out. But if Dragon Queen doesn't pop that balloon, I think they lose in my heart. You know what? I think you might be right about that. And there you go. Dragon Queen just decided, OK. Let's go full on aggression here. Smash, smash, smash. Crash, crash, crash. You would do a great job popping that balloon. Flame Dragon thrower. Queen only has one weapon, really, which is the flamethrower. And then the, their forks. Yeah, I, I don't think those are actuated forks, to my knowledge. No, so, not at all. Um, they, are, they are just forks. They are just wedges, wedgelets.
knockout. Well, we're going to call that a knockout. I'm. It's funny, the, the flame on Dragon Queen is pretty fantastic. Yeah, when it's functioning, um, it's amazing. So, so you I'm, can see Matthew Yurako's robot falling over onto the weapon. They were never able to recover after that, despite meticulous engineering of hmm. this microwave robot. Yeah. It's not yeah. even a microwave-themed robot. It's a microwave-bodied robot. Yes. Yeah, I think... I, I don't know what else to say about that. It's, it is a microwave on a tiny kitty car. Yes. With a lawnmower blade and some googly eyes and some balloons. And it, was that a banana? That top? was, yes. And I, I think actually the wheels were from a, uh, a child's like um, shopping cart. Yeah, yeah. A pink and purple shopping cart. Beautiful. I, you know, ironically, I've built robots out of child's pink and purple shopping carts before. Have you? Yeah, they... they I, I found some by the side of the road. Okay. Uh, and they had really, like, gummy, chewy wheels on them. I was like, these will be perfect for robots. They weren't. They were terrible. Right. Um, now they know, too. Yeah, now they know, too. They, gonna, there was no self We're going to hop things. over. Uh, as much as we love spare parts, I'd much rather hear from them about the robot than try to talk about it myself. Okay. I think Sam had an interview yesterday. We're going to go to that footage. Uh, please enjoy. All right, we are here with Matt and Bennett from Spare Parts, and it looks like you guys are, uh, you I don't know, a tornado went through a thrift store here. What is going on? We are working on the third version of Spare Parts. We first had a microwave, then we tried a computer tower, now we're back at the microwave. So we have all kinds of random stuff that we're throwing together. We've got a lifter arm, made out of Lego with a squirrel. Got some interesting drive going on. And so so what is the idea behind this? You guys don't start until when? So we start once we get here. So like 32 hours or so before the competition is when we start the bot. We picked up the microwave and the drive motors, which are Harbor Freight drills, earlier today. And we're kind of just making it work as we go along. That's excellent. Uh, well, thank you for doing this and keeping it fun, and uh, all the best. Thanks. All right. I love that. The, I, the idea that they do not begin their competition, any prep, any whatsoever, other than, than uh, Grabbing acquiring stuff. items yeah. until they get here, um, it's fantastic. Their, their, their methodology of acquiring the items as well apparently is very haphazard. They'll just see stuff on the side of the road sometimes. Sometimes they'll just clear out the garage. It's just whatever they find. Mm -hmm. And they think, oh, that looks vaguely robot-ish, robot-esque. Yeah. And they'll gather it all up and bring it all in. When you see them rolling into the pits, it's literally just a dolly cart full of just junk. Junk, yeah. As they're rolling through. And you don't know if they're going to use 100% of that junk, maybe 40% of that junk. It stays on their pit table the entire weekend, so if they need to upgrade, modify yeah. the bot... Infinite spare parts available. Yeah, they're, they're all ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, and they're able to loan that out. So if you ever need to, you know, uh, cook your hot dogs while you're upstairs, you can. Yeah. And away we go. Wow. All right. Death Muffin off like a shot. Great name, Death Muffin. Yeah. Makes me hungry. All right. Death Muffin by Katie Farkas. It is uh, an SSP lifter box kit from YouTube sensation Seth Schaefer. Liberation, uh, also a kit, I believe. Yeah, Peter Bar kit. Um, yeah, it's, sometimes it's tough because you can have things that are very close to a Peter Bar kit, not quite a Peter Bar kit, but. Right. Um, but this one looks like it very well may be a Peter Bar kit. Yes, yes. Uh, and it seems like it's doing quite well. I mean, that was several hits in a row. A um, lot of control, able to get Death Muffin up on the wall relatively early. I mean, that's a great pin for the first 45 seconds. Yeah, or a great. Uh, this particular oh! Liberation uh, Captain by Aiden Hill. The idea behind the Peter Bar kit is it's like a, a kit for more experienced builders and drivers. Right. 
Right. It's not an entry level kit. It's not something that you're going to get for your first robot. This is going to be maybe your second, maybe your third robot, something you want to get that's it's a little bit more competitive. And it tends to do pretty well. I mean, it really comes down to the, the way I think of these Peter Bark kits, the way I think of Liberation is uh, this is your driving trial by fire. Yeah. Uh, that robot will perform very well if you know how to use it. It's just a question of, you know, can you bring the skill to the box in addition to, to the hardware? Oh, and there we go. Death Muffin is up on the rails again. It has used its one on stick. Uh, I think this is going to be a countdown and the end for Death Muffin. Yes, yeah. with just under a minute remaining, your winner by knockout is going to be Liberation. Knockout. Everybody's granted one unstick from the house robot, one unstick from Breath the Brick. After that, you are donezo. And that one unstick may not be successful. We've seen several matches end that way today. Yeah, there's only so much the house robot can do. Uh, they will try their best, but uh, varying levels of success there, and that's just the nature um, of the unstick and, and of the competition itself. And that's what we want it to be. We don't want these unsticks to be like a, a fully articulated surgical robot coming in there and lifting you up with a beautiful little robotic arm and putting you back down. No, if you're barely stuck on the side of the wall, we want to be able to just knock you off real quick, get you back into the fight. Yeah, this if is not do that, This is not the out. little cloud fishing robot from Mario Kart. Uh, Ooh, this is good reference. Yeah, yeah. A uh, lot, Latko, Latko. Wait, you know the name of the cloud fishing robot? Yeah. I don't know exactly how to pronounce it, but. But but you know the actual yes. robot's name. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not a robot. It's, well, it's, it's like, a little it's a guy. turtle guy, it's like inside of a cloud, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Interesting. I really wanted a little cloud that I could fly around in. Yeah. And I still haven't got it. <laughs> oh, one of my favorites, Yamato. Three has made its way into cage four. This is um, the turret style flamethrower robot. Um, really interesting design with uh, one of my favorite uh, design features also, which is brushy armor. Uh, so you can see all those those pokey sticks coming out. That's just keep uh, away, right? Like that's the whole idea is, behind that. It is keep away, but it is also compliant and um, um, uh, impact absorb. So when they smash into that, it's not like it's going to throw Yamato around. It's right. just you're going to kind of squish into that and maybe bounce off a little bit. Right, right. You'll, you might bounce apart a little bit. The the uh, the brushiness might bounce out of the way a little bit, uh, but Yamato isn't going to go flying. They're not going to take any permanent damage, which is just... Uh, I, I really love the design approach. I hope we see more of it. Now, Yamato is technically a shuffler robot. Yes. Um, that's not really a strategy to be super mobile in the box. It's not trying to run everywhere. No, that is that is the reason for this turret approach is uh, it can aim very quickly, even if it can't move all that quickly. So if we're talking about min-maxing as you were before, this is like barely any mobility, barely any agility. This is... This is hyper-defense and moderate offense. Yeah, hyper-defense uh, and moderate offense. I like that. Yamato it, 3 Tokyo Drift is the full name of this robot. Oh, Alex is Of course this. it is. Of course it is. No, I love that. Um, yeah, it's so cool to me to see a robot that, that has attacks coming at it and they just kind of bounce off. Um, and not to say that's always going to happen with Yamato, but so far they've had a pretty good success rate of just being able to shrug off um, hits. Now, speaking of that uh, min-maxing, you can see that is... About as low on the mobility train as you can expect to see and still call your robot fully mobile. Um, but hey, it does the job. All right, One. it is facing off against Cueo by Her Henrique Oliveira. It's a vert with a bunch of different wedge attachments inspired by Duck, the Brazilian Duck. Uh, and it was originally designed back in 2018. So this is a robot that has seen a lot of combat, a lot of uh, a lot of different competitions. It's uh, first time here at NHRL. Yamato taking longer to get to its corner than the Brazilians took to get to Norwalk, Connecticut. Yeah, they they had to fly all the way to New York. It's amazing. It's getting there though. It is. It is. That's. 
It is most assuredly moving in the direction that they want it to move. Yeah, it, you know, I'll say that too. So often we see um, mobility limited robots. It's hard to say that they really have directionality, and that is yeah. not the case here. This this robot is certainly um, certainly it's controlled. directional. Yeah, it's controlled. You you know which direction you're putting it when you're putting it in that direction. Yeah. There's bristly bots that you're not quite sure all the time. This thing, you know where it's going. It looks five, really cool too. Four, I love three, the, how fast that two, turret actually is able to spin one. around. Yeah, fight. the red and white paint job fight. is also starting to pop a little more than it had previously. Well, okay. They are making a statement early on. Hey, that's how far our flamethrower goes. Wow. This, I love this robot so much, Kyle. It brings me so much joy. It is just charring the paint. Poyo has no idea what to do here. Um, no, it's it's completely bamboozled. It, it's getting shot with flames in every direction. There we go, coming oh, in for a hit. Spot. And they've done the thing. They, now they're getting their wheel melted on. This is a great moment for Yamato to just torch their opponent if they can uh, spin around without causing problems. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, you see those, those keep away sticks are prime um, targets for entanglements. Uh, and that may well be something we're seeing right now. Uh, we're going to see if the house robot can free them. Wow. Oh, yeah, there we go. They are. Yeah, those two robots are stuck together. Oh, I don't know if Fluffy is going to like a flamethrower to the face, but. And this is an attempted unstick slash moving them, I believe, closer to the door to try to get them apart. Actually, that's the sidewall that they're moving towards. You can see the uh, the monitor right there with their information on them. Yeah, I think this is probably a good time for uh, a referee to step in and try and pull these two robots apart. When you have a spinning weapon like that go up against these kind of fuzzy, furry defensive measures, this is a risk you run. Right, it's not like we allow entanglement devices, but unintentional entanglement does happen. Yes. With different material choices that you make. And it's, it, it is a judgment call uh, as to what gets to be too much. But clearly these, uh, in Yamato's case, these are not intended primarily as an entanglement device. It's, no, it's, they're, they're definitely meant to be keep away stick. You know what Yamato 3 kind of reminds me of is playing pickup sticks as a kid. I see. We, uh, we have the hands off the controllers moment for the two robots to go in and get freed. I think we may end up with an open door in a moment or two. Interestingly, the timer is still going strong. I assume someone noted the match being paused earlier. Wow, look at all of that gunk just wow. twisted up inside. Yeah, that is going to take a little time with a crowbar, I think, to get these two unstuck. Maybe some scissors. I, you know, it might be hard with steel wire. I don't know. Hmm, yes. Wire cutters. C9s. Yeah. <laughs> Bolt cutters is, is where we're at, I think, at this point. And there we see our ref stepping in with the safety crowbar, attempting to remove these two robots from each other. When this happens, they have to first ensure that the controllers are powered down and that their hands are off of them. We don't want any accidental weapon misfirings while there's a human being touching them. Nice job. They are fully separated now. It looks like this match can continue, and that took much less time than I thought it would. Very well done. Yep. Now you can see that uh, that bit of keeping the hands behind the head is just a very evident way yeah. for, uh, for keeping your hands off your controller. Normally we ask people to put their controllers down, but you can see these, these folks have lanyards on, so that's another uh, approach, as long as it's incredibly evident. I love it. You want that ref to know that they are safe inside the box, messing with your machine, making sure that they're yep. not going to arm themselves. We're back now. Looks like the flamethrower is spitting gas, but it's not quite igniting. I want to see that thing ignite. Yeah, come on now. And once again, Quayo not able to get in there to do any sort of real damage. Yeah, Quayo trying his best, but... Uh, this is a bot that has spent years in the Brazilian circuit with other very powerful 
mostly vertical spinning robots. Oh, I see smoke coming from Quayo right now. You're right, you're uh, right. Gotta, the timer is not on screen, folks, but we've got about one minute remaining in this match. Uh, yeah, at the moment, this is, this is an interesting one to call. I mean, Yamato not doing a whole lot of uh, anything right now, and, and at least Quayo is showing aggression. Uh, but at the same time, Quayo unable to do anything for the first half of that match. No, not a whole lot. I mean, the, the defensive capabilities of Yamato 3 is, are very impressive. Yes, yeah. Now we're coming down on 30 seconds left. I imagine this is going to go to the judges. Uh, I don't really see either of these robots fully knocking out its opponent in the remaining time. Uh, if I could just see that fire pick up just once more, though. I'm rooting for him. And you can hear the final countdown has begun. About eight seconds left. Five, four, three, two, one, and your match. This is going to go to the judges, Kyle. Um, I have my thoughts, but uh, I will I will save them and see see how our judging panel comes back. Yeah, that was a. Uh, I know that was probably a stressful fight for Alex and his team. Yeah, they really wanting his robot to be fully functional. They put a tremendous amount of passion into that robot. Uh, and he's so knowledgeable with, with flame systems. Uh, speaking of which, I think we're going to see a replay of those fails, uh, flame systems. Uh, fail systems, that's a little rough. The flame systems any moment. Now, here we go. What a nice, like, that is a nice jet of fuel. Very targeted. Uh, you can see the kind of So the blue. much distance with it. Yes, yeah. You can see that kind of blue color. Um, to the flame early in the flame, and that uh, indicates there is a good bit of temperature there as well. And then something about that separation happening re removed their capability to fire flames after that. They were still able to fire gas, but they were not able to ignite it at any point after that. Yeah, I, I don't know. It could also be a thing where they just, uh, those igniters are temperamental, yeah. you know? Uh, and, and some of them take quite a lot of power to run. Any number of things could have happened. Um, in any case, I'm sure we'll see them back. Um, yeah. If they don't make it, and if they do make it, then I'm sure they'll get it fixed in no time at all. I hope to see them back. It's a really cool machine um, going up against a top-notch competitor in Quayo. Uh, that one's going to the judges. It's going to be a rough one for the judges to call to a certain degree, but... Um, one robot was still fully functional at the end, and the other one wasn't. Yeah. So. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I didn't actually look. Uh, was there a spin-up test on the weapon of Quayo? Uh, you know, now that you mention it, the last minute of the, or 30 seconds of the fight, they were not spinning that weapon up. Yeah, so I, it may be equal functionality. Maybe, maybe. Uh, but we'll see. That's what the judges are there for. We're going to head over to another match now, I believe. Not sure which cage. Let's see here. Cage one. Oh, yeah. All right. Sake going up against uh, Guccio. Sake Guccio? actually has a uh, uh, quite a long name that I'm unsure of the pronunciation. Oh, that's because uh, I spoke to this builder actually as he was oh, getting Oh, you have the dirt, please. Yeah, so um, it's Sake Strofodon, and he literally was like, I need a name and just started typing random letters into the to the, uh, to the to the bar when he was filling out the robot name when he was submitting this design. So Sake, he got one good word out of it. Yeah, and Strovan is, Stroven is the end of it, so it's Sake Stroven, uh, but th that's not a real word Stro in any language. It sounds like it should be a German musical instrument company. Yeah, or something Transylvanian, maybe, you know? Maybe. Like, yeah, Transylvanian I getting brought up a lot. It's not quite October yet. Interesting. Um, I didn't know that it got bought, uh, brought up uh, Yeah, before. I think it's like the fourth time I've heard someone mention Transylvania today. Um, but there's a lot about this bot that, uh, that is like left to the last minute. Um, for instance, uh, so the name left to the last minute. Um, armor, top armor especially, left to the last minute, just didn't finish it. So he just threw some Kydex up there mm -hmm. and that's, that's what's covering the top, keep the dust out. Sure, sure. Um, but it is a, a hammer overhead attack bot of some type, but it has no front wedge or keep away of any sort. It's, well, it does have a cool tracked driving system, though. It does, it does. 
Uh, and then you've got this kind of uh, hazard-esque, uh, uh, you know, overhead bar spinner. Yeah, this is Guccio. Look at that. Look at this thing. Look at this. So look at the offset tracks. Yeah, that is that is that cool? beyond belief, but it's really neat. And you can see just the really thin plastic material on top. That's the that's the top armor. So, you know, we're hoping they don't go up against any other overhead attack bots because there's nothing there. Sure. Protecting the batteries, the motors, the speed controllers. It's all just out in the open. Protecting the robot. Yeah, no, it's just all there. It's all out in the open. I love their shirts, by the way. Merca World Order. <laughs> if you're a fan of 90s wrestling, that's like uh, right up Five, your alley. But. Mm -hmm. Four, you think three, there would be a big overlap two, between 90s one, wrestling and fight. Robot robots builders. fight. Wow, Sake moves pretty quick. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty quick. Spun up as well. Um, I uh, don't see anything from Guccio's weapon other than some reactionary force. Yeah, uh, they're just slapping away at the top of Guccio's top plate here. Yeah, I mean, so far, so good. I haven't seen their arm actuate much, but I got to tell you, when I watched uh, Sake in the test box, I didn't see the arm actuate much, so... I mean, quite frankly, it doesn't need to. Um, it is totally sufficient just to use that as a... Wow, these are actually some pretty good little hits here. Yeah, I mean, you can see the back plate on Guccio's already being torn up. Um... I'm not seeing any movement from Guccio. No, I think they might be done. I think that is a tap, tap out. out. Yeah. Your winner is, uh, is Sake. Luke Moreno, eight-wheeled asymmetrical overhead saw is what he calls this thing. This can be swapped out with a lifter if he finished the lifter. That is that a little bit of a mouthful, though. <laughs> Yes. The whole robot's a bit of a mouthful, yeah. like in general. Uh, first win, though. Nice job. Congratulations. Congratulations. And I mean, a, a win's you know, a win. Not, I mean, not only that, that's a reasonable competitor to have a nice win against. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're um, not sitting here with, uh, you know, uh, little Johnny's first time robot uh, as a competitor. No, it's, so. it's a Robert Herman is the one who brought uh, Guccio. It's yeah. a two-wheel drive horizontal. It's uh, very low to the ground. It has those bolts that come down, so it's able to hit those lower-to-the-ground competitors. Yeah, it's, it's neat, too. They, they add a little bit of stability. I bet they do, um, like a balance factor. Yeah, there's a balance factor, and there's a, um, uh, a wobble factor. So if it does get hung up in a weird position, those are now able to clear when it's kind of uh, oh, cocked. Yeah, it's, it's a really... Uh, unusual way to do it. You don't see that very often in horizontal spinners where you're putting stability augmentations on the bar. Yeah. But it's, it's kind of neat. Um, but we weren't able to see that thing spin up. It got damaged pretty much right off the bat because as it turns out, Sake can drive real fast and yeah. uh, got across the box almost immediately. Well, we are going to head across the box or across the building into another box here. You can see the doors are closing in cage six right now. Let's see, who do we have? Cage six, we have Slingbot versus Spectur. Mm. Um, Slingbot is one of my very favorite bots. So you can see it's this purple bot here on the left. Slingbot is a, uh, well, it shoots, it's one of the few projectile bots that we've ever seen here at the competition. It actually shoots a steel spike yep. at very high speeds. Uh, using the power of imagination, dreams, and rubber bands. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of hopes and dreams in there, and uh, even more rubber bands. I really enjoy this robot uh, at safety every time, because it doesn't, on paper, that bolt isn't supposed to be all that terrifying. And then you see it, and you're like, I really would not want to be hit by that if I was another robot. Um, now, I will say, I spoke with the, uh, the owner-operator of Slingbot earlier today, and he said that his bot is very good at shooting walls. Yes. Not very good at shooting other bots as of yet. So that's really the goal for this competition, is to shoot the barb actually at another bot. It's, it's one of these things you sit back and you wonder how, how best a judge judges these things. Uh, if it does go to a judge's decision, uh, that hit from the Slingbot, it's a one-time shot deal. Correct. I mean, this, this is a single uh, operation robot. Um, so a lot of the judging criteria in terms of how they accomplish what they set out to do comes down to their aim. Uh, timing, luck, the whole, the whole deal. Uh, so Slingbot brought to us by Alex Pick from NU Robotics, and they're going up against Spectre 
It's a mid cutter with a one pound weapon. That's a whole lot of weapon for the three pound weight class. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the upper end of a, a, what we consider a normal weight allocation. Usually you're, you're putting something like a third of your weight into your weapon system is, is kind of the rule of thumb, but that's your weapon system. That's the motor, that's the, uh, the wiring, the speed controller, the batteries. When you put a third of your weight into just the weapon blade itself, that is a very different um, can of worms. Yeah, you're gonna have a hard time driving that. All right, so it sounds like we're holding off on six. Knock oh out. We have just missed a uh, Pickle Rick uh, situation, I think. Uh, knockout occurred, we, we just, just missed it, which is a shame. Pickle Rick, uh, of course, a Rick and Morty reference, is uh, a really fun robot uh, and a really fun team. They show up each time with uh, party favors, shall we say, right? So you can see the pits have now cleared out of uh, smoke and filled back up with humans. There's Kokoto Mane right there. Just say hi to Kokoto. Hi, Kokoto. Um, and everybody's just uh, chilling out, trying to get their bots fixed and uh, make up for all that lost time they had when they were trying to dodge the, um, the lipo smoke. Yeah. Um, you know, lipo smoke is not only bad for you, but it smells very unpleasant. So you don't really want to be in the same room with it. I, I'll remember that when selecting my next cologne. <laughs> Going to cage one right now. You can see we are loading up. I believe, is it Super Scope? Or, or the Super Scope-esque? I think that's Cthulhu. Ah, Cthulhu. Yeah, Cthulhu and Super Scope share... Super Excuse me. Cthulhu and Super Scope uh, share quite a lot of... Uh, quite a lot of their design. Yeah, they have similar wheels, and they also have similar weapon blades. Um, body style and shape is a little bit different. The components inside are quite different. Uh, this is the Coakley brothers who put these two robots together. They've actually uh, ended up being first and second and a Golden Dumpster winner at an earlier competition this year. Bringing about, I would say, the, uh, the era of horizontal supremacy. That has defined a whole lot of this year, 2023. Yeah, it's... It is stunning the upsets we are seeing. There's so many uh, design archetypes and uh, design features that it kind of got pushed to the side, frankly, uh, yeah. in the last five to 10 years. And when you have this much time uh, to experiment in the box and this many creative, motivated individuals, suddenly you start to realize that some of these things weren't uh, unviable. They just were never done quite right. That is correct. That is correct. And then we have Buzzkill right there next to him. He's from Team Honey Cracked. Uh, Liam King. He's a first robotics competitor and a mechanical engineering student, super smart guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. With, I'd say, I would say Buzzkill is a, is a standard bearer of this weight class now. It's been at a bunch Tell of competitions. It's been, it's been at a bunch of competitions. It's done well at all of its competitions. Yep. It's like, it's a gatekeeper style robot, it, you know? It, it is a staple of the weight class. Yeah. Uh, by, by any means. Um, I think it's, it's a robot that tends to have uh, a little bit of trouble keeping itself together in terms of uh, consistency. Right? Yeah. Five, you know, it sure. comes out Four, swinging every time three, they get it together. Two, the hard part is making it one, through the match without fight, the game. Robots fight. So we'll see if they have that trouble this time. Ooh. Ooh, hit there. Buzzkill doing a great job kind of controlling where it wants to hit on Cthulhu. Yeah, that front plow wedge, whatever you want to call it, on the front of Buzzkill is almost perfectly suited uh, to Cthulhu's weapon in terms of defensive uh, strategy. And you can see Buzzkill's kind of aiming its shot at the wheels of Cthulhu. It's yeah. really reflecting the shots from Cthulhu's weapon and hitting, and trying to aim for those wheels as best as possible. And so far, it's working out excellently. The left, ooh, big hit there. Both robots went flying. Uh, Cthulhu having right side drive issues right now. Excuse me, left side drive issues. Uh, so Buzzkill's going to do his best to get to the right side. Finish. There's the hit. That's it. Nice. Oh, okay. The belt is gone off of Cthulhu. They are down one drive side and a belt. 
This is entirely Buzzkill's game now. And you can see there is a uh, really unique wheel design on Cthulhu. The Coakleys have been developing this. It's got kind of a, an ablative front armor on the outside, covering yeah, up the like spiked wheel on the inside. Riverboat paddle kind of thing. That's exactly right. Yeah, it does look like their bots could kind of make their way through the water pretty well if they wanted to. So we are down to the last 90 seconds of this matchup, and it does sound like the weapon on Buzzkill has either been spun down or has been disabled in some way. Oh, nice. Might have spoken too soon there. There was a nice shot with a minibot across the arena. And could this be a count out happening? No, nope. there is still some movement out of Cthulhu. This would be quite an upset if Liam's able to pull out a win here. Yeah, this this could be one of the most decisive wins that we've had from Buzzkill in a long time. I mean, Buzzkill's weapon is down right now. I don't know if that is um, by choice or not. Right, might but have been overheating. We never know. You don't want to make those judgments on these teams before we get to the end of the fight. But It does also seem like... I can't tell. Maybe there are two belts in the arena. You see really that large one yeah. at the bottom left of the screen, but I thought I might have seen another in the edge of the arena. Of course, it's also, there's a lot of tire tracks in there, Kyle. Right. Could be a belt left over from a previous fight that just fell off the wall. You never know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, this, uh, this very well... And there we go. Go. we go. We have a fire up of the weapon. Yep. A buzzkill right there at the end. Just wanted to show the judges that their weapon did work. That is perfect timing. Well executed. Don't know if it's on purpose or not, but, you know. Uh, I'll bet if they weren't getting that thing to work, he was flipping that switch up and down to try and, uh, trying to get that thing to yeah. fire up just before the end Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Absolutely. You got to be able to show the judges you have weapon functionality, but if their drive was working, their weapon was working. That's a great way to end the fight for them. All right, All right, let's go ahead and check in with our friend Lindsay while we wait for the judge's decision on this. Lindsay, how you doing? She's, she's doing quietly, Kyle. Incredibly. Oh, she's having quiet time. All right, now let's see. Lindsay, are you there? Can you help us? Uh, hello, Ricky. Hello, Kyle. Uh, hi. Yeah, um, okay, so basically the main story today in the chat is all about the Brazilian teams. There are so many competing here today. We have the four overarching Brazilian teams, uh, and their fans are in full force, sticking around all day with us in the YouTube chat. It is really cool to see. Uh, there's a lot of um, interesting conversations going around about what uh, you know entails uh, the idea of um, entanglement. I know that some of the you know uh, ways that NHRL interprets entanglement is different than how maybe other leagues interpret entanglement. So yes. there's been a good discussion going on there, especially with what happened with Yamato. Um, so, yeah, I think it's like a really good way for these two different, um, you know, bot cultures to come together and share and learn from each other and just hopefully root for each other. Because at the end of the day, you know, it's just so exciting to have everyone here under one roof. Absolutely. Now, there, you said there are four Brazilian teams. How many bots did they bring? Oh, Kyle, don't put me on the spot like that. <laughs> oh, I know the answer. How many, Kyle? Tell a, us. A Brazilian. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I thought Chris was the pun guy. Uh, no, that was a... I, I, I think I might have stolen that one from Chris earlier today, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Lindsay, so much for keeping us abreast of everything going on up in the pits. Does it smell better up there now, at least? You know what? I have taken my mask off. It smells fresh and clean like I'm out in the forest. Good. So, I'm so glad. Uh, our ventilation system is awesome. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you, Lindsay. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. You got to have a nice working environment up there for everybody. Yeah, I, I, as soon as I'm off the desk, I'm going to head up there, check around, make sure. But it does seem like things were uh, were handled as they should be. Good. So. Glad to hear it. All right, we're checking in right now in cage four. Oh, boy. I'm seeing some interesting costuming uh, by cage yeah. four right now. I did not see that earlier. So, uh, yeah, this is interesting. So we have... Uh, Can we get a shot of the cage side, um, you know? So this looks like Jubilee versus Dark Chaos. Look at the pants on this man. 
I, this Brazilian team, you've got Rado, you've got, you've got a, an alien wearing a person on its shoulders. Yeah. You've got capes. Uh, we've got multiple capes. It's not even just one cape. Uh, there's a lot of uh, national pride. Yeah. For the country of Brazil. I think the alien that's holding up the guy is going to be the one fail in the robot right now. Good. Yeah, that's what I like to see. We want that alien technology of combined with the Brazilian technology put into combat robotics. So we have Jubilu, I believe is how you pronounce that. Everybody will correct me in the chat, though, if that's wrong. They say that's the easiest way to get the uh, right answer on the internet is supply the wrong issue. I see. And we're having some power issues, it seems like, in the bot. Jubilu is brought, uh, brought to us by Arthur Leon from Team Warrior. This bot has competed in Brazil, India, and the U.S. The robot was originally built back in 2009. That, that is a lifetime and a half in robot years. Yeah, it's the oldest operating robot on the team's roster at the moment. It's probably the oldest operating robot here today. I would imagine so, yeah. I bet Chad's like robot is close in age to yeah, that. Yeah, we, we have a few uh, old timers, so to speak, um, but not... Uh, not quite, not quite that long, I don't think. No, that's impressive. Still a viable design that this long after. You know, speaking of cultural differences, I, I've got it, it reminds me. I had a conversation um, with a, a German-speaking person. Uh, and and in, in German languages, old-timer is what they would call like a jalopy, like a, like a you know, a beat-up car, uh, a clunker. Uh, and I, I told this person, I was like, you know, that's what we call people. They could not stop laughing when they heard old people were called old timers. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, it, I kind of want to do the reverse, you know, in not a mean way, but like, you, you know, if your, your grandmother's a little mean to you, you're like, ah, you old jalopy. <laughs> it, it's very colorful. So if I'm not, if I'm not incorrect, the man wearing the, or riding the shoulders of the alien right. is Topino. He's from UFO Combat out of Brazil. That would make sense. And uh, his bot, Dark Chaos, is a four-wheel drive hub motor spinner. Yeah, I, uh, I had a bit of a conversation with him yesterday. Um, I appreciate you looking up his first name. It was escaping me. But um, that is a formidable robot. There's a lot of power in that drum. We've seen yeah. extreme reliability. Uh, not everyone can pull it off, but the, the Brazilian team seemed to have this hub motor uh, weapon system architecture down pretty well. I mean, we've seen it before in the three-pound weight class with tin, uh, Twin Beasts. Right. Tamake's robot was amazing when we saw it compete here just a few years, or a few months ago. Um, but the this thing, beast looks incredible. Yeah. The other thing that's... Is he holding the tools in the head of the... Wow. Okay. Sorry. It just... He reached yeah, well, into I mean, that it's alien's a dual purpose brain. alien. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's got tools and brains. Yeah. So, and then tangential drive, we talk about that a lot, especially with the Brazilian teams. There's a lot of American teams now trying this particular drive method. Mm -hmm. How would you describe tangential drive to the, uh, the uninitiated, as it were? You know, I, I don't know, Kyle. What do you think the right, the right way to approach this is? So, the drive is actually... The wheels are directly driven by a spinning mount that sticks out from the side of the robot and directly applies pressure to the wheel itself and spins the wheel. So there's nothing yeah, spinning it, inside of the wheel. It's the, the exterior of the wheel is being driven by. Yeah, and it's, it's um, it is something that we see a lot with the Brazilians. It's something that used to happen, not commonly, but you know, for here and there in the United States teams, uh, American teams. Um, it's made a comeback a bit with the Beatles. There's probably, what, uh, Probably a, a dozen Beatles here today um, using that kind of approach. 
it's a little bit fraught, but if you design with the limitations in mind, it, it cuts down on parts, it cuts down on belts, it lets you use motors that are less uh, apt to overheat. Oh, that makes sense. Um, basically, you get that, we're getting a little bit of a close-up here. You can see there's a little circle in between the two wheels, right? Yep. That's, that's the tangential um, uh, contact point. It's, it's a very small piece. Um, and normally and that, like, sti sticking out of a motor would be what you would connect a, a like, a pulley system to or something right. to drive a belt. Instead, that's just directly spinning on the wheel and driving the wheel itself. But think about if you had a pulley on there and then a pulley on your wheel. The pulley on the, on the shaft is going to be, I'd say it's an inch in diameter, and yep. then two inches on the wheel. That means the biggest ratio you'll ever get there is two to one. Right. In this case, that, that peg that's sticking out, that little shaft is, is what, maybe one-tenth of the diameter of the wheel? That is correct. That means that you can spin that peg really fast, um, and the faster you spin a motor, the less it tends to heat up. Um, Makes sense. It's able to dissipate its own heat that way. Right. Yeah. And, and so suddenly you have a motor that can spin very fast, doesn't need a lot of gear reduction, doesn't need complicated belts, doesn't need complicated pulleys or gears or chains. Um, as long as you're able to do it in a way that's effective and doesn't introduce more problems, that's a powerful design choice at your disposal. And one of the, I'd say, drawbacks of this is as wheels tend to wear down throughout the fight, the contact between the motor point and the wheel itself starts to degrade and you start getting a little bit more slippage than you probably want, but yep. that's why you bring extra wheels. That's why you swap them out between the fights. Well, and there's, just, there's other interesting ways you can get around this too. Some robots will have that, uh, that shaft be spring-loaded. Uh, and I don't know if this particular one does, I can't recall seeing inside of it, but you know, let's say you've got two wheels that are like a, a quarter inch apart and you have a half inch shaft, right? Um, that, uh, that can push down into the little crevice between the two wheels. And even if the, even if the wheels, um, you know, start to get worn down and, uh, uh, farther apart, it just kind of push, pushes farther and farther down and has, has lots of, uh, room to, yeah. you know, take up that, that extra clearance. That makes a lot of sense. That's really smart. But yeah, we're going to see a lot of those types of drives today, so it's good to explain to everybody what we're looking at and what that, that will entail. Looks like we're heading over into cage one right now. And in cage one, we're going to see Timber Viper taking on Honey Shock. Timber Viper expertly driven by Kevin Milcheski. We're so glad to see him back. Timber Viper is an extremely fast lifter-style robot. It hits hard, it moves quickly. And Honey Shock is a Hyper Shock esque vertical spinner from Team Honey Cracked. Five, four, three, two, one. Fight, robots, fight. And they are just hitting that right off the bat. Beautiful hits here from Hyper Shock, or Honey Shock. Honey Shot coming in with a three and five record across three events, and they are now up in the air and being slammed. Beautiful uh, suplex slam onto the ground there. They're now spinning on their just two, uh, back two wheels, trying to get themselves up against the wall to self right. That is how a robot like this does self right. And once again, pinned up against the wall by Timber Viper, and joining me at the desk right now, Welcome to the game, buddy. You've been Hello. out for a minute. What's up, Kyle? It's good to see you. It's good to see you. So you joined us for a really interesting fight. It's Temper Viper doing exactly what it's designed to do, throwing Honey Shock up against the wall. Popped up like that. That is perfect for Timber Viper. And now he's trying to stop the house bot there. So you can see the jaws wide open on Timber Viper, trying to get underneath. Honey Shock to give them another pick up and slam. Maybe just to put them back on the wheels to keep the fight going, but probably just to show the judges that they're still being aggressive. So, Sam, you've been busy today. You've been competing. You've been 
doing interviews, you've been doing pit tours. <laughs> yeah. And now you're back up here at the desk with me. I'm so glad to have you. Yeah, I'm glad to be up here. It's, it's exciting to be able to watch some fights. I've only seen one so far, and I was getting beat in it. <laughs> Oh, a nice pick again there from Timber Viper. You can see they're just applying a lot of control and aggression in this fight. They do not have a weapon that can do a whole lot of damage. All right, Honey Shock is up against the wall. They've already had wow. their one unstick. They are not liable for another one at this point. Timber Viper already doing a victory dance. Will they pull this one out? The countdown has happened. So much power in the drive on Timber Viper. Oh, the thing's a beast. I mean, the drive is the weapon. Yes, it does have the no, quad lifter no. mechanism, but that drive is really what's doing the damage from that robot. Ah, beautiful win there. They have taken out Team Honeycracked. Zach Stack. That was textbook. Textbook. Absolutely phenomenal. He's coming in to give him a handshake on that. Kevin Milcheski, he's not here very often, but when he does, we just love seeing his robots. He's a phenomenal driver. You have to be with that control style of robot. Like, your driving ability is the only way you're going to succeed. A control bot alone is, is hard to drive, and he's doing it with so much speed. So much speed, absolutely. Yes, the, the lightning fast pace that this thing moves across the box is just mind-boggling compared to a lot of these other bots. So, Kyle, I've, I've missed so many fights today. What, what's been good? Uh, we've had uh, we've had some weird stuff today, man. We've had some weird stuff. We've had a few things like uh, Yamato Three Tokyo Drift showing up as a pivoting flamethrower, and uh, they they actually have an entanglement controversy. Oh, okay. Ooh. So here we go. I'm sorry. We're gonna go to a live situation. So this is Team UFO right here trying to get their bot together. They have literally one more minute left to get their bot working. They're having some power up issues with it. Um, if they are not able to get it up and running, they will forfeit this fight. This is a, a bit of a stressful experience when you're cage side trying to do last minute repairs. You've got a ton of people <laughs> huddled around your robot. Yeah, this is dark chaos. You can see members of several Brazilian teams have jumped down there to try to help them get this bot up and functioning. It's a really cool robot with a hub motor weapon design. They're just uh, not able to get the power working. And look at all of these people. There's what, one, two, three, three, four sets of hands in there on that robot right now. Imagine doing this while riding an alien. I mean, the alien so far has been helping him hold some tools. So it seems like more of a help than a hindrance, but yeah, that would add a little stress factor. So it's really coming down to the wire. And this is not a simple robot by any means. I mean, it's a hub motor spinner, which means that the weapon motor is inside of the weapon itself, which adds all kinds of complications and issues. It's a tangential drive, not something we see very commonly here in the United States, very common in its native Brazil. And you can see Tofino, uh, Tofino has a lot of help from fellow Brazilians. Look at all of these people, hands moving so fast you can barely see them. It looks like they've taped up all their connectors, so they're pulling the tape off the connectors to check the connection. This goes here, that goes there. This is the, uh, the literal definition of I need five more minutes on your robot right here. Are they able to get this thing together in time to get it into the box? Who knows? Where? I know that they're going up against another Brazilian robot. Was that Jubilu? Yeah, Jubilu. Um, so they very well may give them a little bit more grace, but it's at a certain point, this is up to our production team. So we have, we have Brazilians apparently running through the pits with parts and pieces to try to bring down to help them get this robot up and running. This robot, they tested it before this match, right? So it was working oh, yeah. before the match. Something went wrong literally between the test box five, and four, three, this ground. And we got a two, countdown happening right one. now. Fight, robots fight. All right, so cage seven is what just uh, launched right now. We'll peek in there in a minute. Let's see what's going on there. Okay, this looks like Jack move and to bungle or not to. Jack move in white. To bungle is the wide one with that golden beater bar, purple on the sides. It's just a tiny little beater bar. And it looks like Two Bungle is a shuffler and is not shuffling out of that corner there. 
No, there's not a lot of shuffle happening. Look at how like disproportionately small that beater bar is on this wide boy. I love it. <laughs> you could probably fit two on there. Absolutely. Jack Move, of course, one of the fleet of robots, the captain by Drew Davis of Team Shred It. Uh, this is just one of his more powerful vertical spinners, extremely fast, well-driven. And it looks like he does have some mini-bot help from one of his sons. Today, every time Drew comes out, he tries to make it a family affair. He brings both the boys out. His wife comes out to help. He's been bringing students out as well from That's the school correct, of connectivity. Yeah. By the way, is Drew a robot teacher at Schenectady High School? No, I don't no, think he so. is an English teacher, actually. So they go over Shakespeare and speed control ethics. That's uh, <laughs> this is what they handle in his class. <sighs> to BL Heli or not to BL Heli? And he teaches tenth grade. So a lot of his tenth grade students come out and uh, compete in competitions with him at some of the events, which is cool. Knockout. There we go. That is a win for Drew Davis and Jack Move. A little bit of mobility issues there at the, in the middle of the fight, but it seems like it worked itself out as they were going through. A little percussive therapy. Yeah, it looks like he's taking that extra time at the end to make sure everything's moving just right for his next fight. When you've got time in the test box, you might as well. All right, it looks like those repairs are still happening over here on the floor next to cage four. That's a lot more than one minute. And look, we're getting a full recording in live of happening. How meta is this? A recording of the recording of the repairs happening on Dark Chaos. Notice that bandage on the index finger there. That could be a uh, wire stripping injury. That could be a soldering injury. That could be, there's all kinds of finger issues that you yeah. get when you're doing this sport. There's definitely robot building hands that you get. Yeah, just little scars, little, little moments that you see on your fingers. Stuff that you don't find until you're cutting lemons. Yeah. And I, my favorite are the burns that you don't really realize are that bad until later on when oh, you man. go to grab a spicy piece of something to eat and you're like, what happened to my hand? Don't get me started on the splinters, Kyle. Mm, all kinds of splinters. You get steel splinters, aluminum splinters. All right, it looks like components are being jammed back in wire <laughs> with the utmost care. Now, this is a dangerous moment right here, right? They're doing this as quickly as humanly possible, but they could very easily put this top plate on and cut a wire. They could very easily push something too hard into something else and jam it up and break the connection point. This kind of thing happens all the time. This last second where you're just trying to rush everything back in and get that top plate on is where you could potentially re-damage your robot and really forfeit the event for yourself. And for the most part, you don't even know if you made a mistake until you go to turn your robot on. There's Rato offering help and support and advice over there, uh, looking over top of the team. It's good to see so many teams helping each other out, trying to get this bot in and working. That's a big part of the community here in just combat robotics in general. Everybody yeah. really wants to see everybody else succeed. Uh, but this is a tough one. Down to the wire for this team. I hope that they're able to get everything together. Whew. If you were in their position, Sam, would you call more people from the pits or less? I don't think so. I think I would just want my hands in the robot doing the repairs. Um, it, if I'm the one that built it, I, I know it best. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to know what needs where to be done goes. or where it most likely broke because I knew that that was weak going in. Oh, or yeah. I didn't hot glue this. I didn't heat shrink that. So I better check this part first. That, that reliability and durability on the internal components is such a, an aspect of building that we don't talk about, but it really shows in the box um, how well you manage your wires, how well you hot glued down all of those components, how well you hot glued just your connections of the solder points. And it's tough because when you're reinforcing your electrical connections, you're adding tape, you're adding glue, all that stuff has to come out if you need to do repairs. And yeah. so you're making a mess. It just gets harder and harder as the tournament progresses where you're a little sloppier with the hot glue gun. And there we see Rato, of course, YouTube star live streaming and filming everything as it's happening. We got to love that. All right. 
So, so last night we had Chris. He did an interview with Jason Vasquez and his new very odd robot sidewalk slammer yeah. with some very interesting design components. Let's go talk to Chris now. Chris, what do you got for us? Hey, folks, I'm here with Jason Vasquez and Sidewalk Slammer, one of the coolest bots I've ever seen here at the competition. Uh, Jason, maybe you can hold your bot up. I want to introduce this bot just as bad as I want to introduce Jason. Sidewalk Slammer is maybe the first time I've ever seen this. It is a vertical uh, spinner that can actually pull a pin and it changes into a horizontal spinner on command. Uh, Jason, uh, you know, the Vasquez family, obviously, uh, combat robotics royalty. Uh, this is Sidewalk Slammer's first ever competition. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the bot? Yeah, totally. So I grew up in this sport, just like my older brother, Matthew Vasquez. And this is my newest robot, Sidewalk Slammer. I uh, was getting bored with my uh, traditional designs, and I wanted to do something different. And um, I actually got the idea from uh, Jerry, uh, who runs the competition Smashbots. He built an Anway version like this a while back, but um, I had some things that I knew I wanted to do differently, and I wanted to scale it up to the 12-pound class. So um, pretty much, I, I think people have considered this design before, but they usually think of having like a really beefy mechanism to switch it like back and forth. But I figured I wanted to devote as much weight as possible to the weapon system and to the drive system and really just have something very minimal that just allowed for it to switch. So I'm really just pulling this pin out, which uh, disengages from the weapon assembly. And then I'll spin in a circle in the gyro and just gravity will just knock it over. And then I can just re-engage this pin and then it'll lock back in place. So um, I only get to do it once a fight, but I figure the weight is where it should be. Just from a conceptual standpoint, in, in, a, in a competition format, it's so interesting that you get to go into a fight with a vertical spinner, and then whether things are going your way or not, or you want to change the dynamic, you can actually change the weapon configuration on a dime. Uh, how do you plan on exploiting that in, in, your, in your foray into combat robotics with this design? Yeah, so um, I think one of the greatest advantages of the... All right, we're hopping right to cage four where that UFO Jubilee fight is underway. We've had some big hits so far. Oh my gosh, they have chunked up huge sections before. We will be showing you guys a re uh, replay of some of these hits. Um, Dark Chaos, Jubilee. Dark Chaos is, of course, the small uh, hub motor vertical spinner. And then Jubilee is the big horizontal spinner that is barely moving now. You can see that it's got one side of its drive completely down. Well, it looks like both are crab walking now. Yeah, the, one of them's upside down. Hopefully when Dark Chaos gets backside up, it's going to be... Oh, no, the weapon's still fully functional on Jubilee, as you can see there. That was a massive hit onto the side of Dark Chaos, and they have not been driving since wow. then. That very well could end up being a countdown. You can see there is wood and destruction and mini-bots all over this floor. I cannot wait to show you the replay of this fight. No, one no. working motor, one working drive at the end, one side. Wow. That fight was cool. That was amazing. So that was a knockout. Your winner is Jubilee. Dark Chaos struggled to get it together. They got a fully functional robot into the box. Props to the team for pulling that off. That, that was not an easy feat. And to get into the arena and, and take those hits right after that, impressive. Absolutely impressive. So Jubilee brought to you by Arthur Lionel. It's competed in Brazil, India, the U.S., and it was originally built back in 2009. This is the oldest wow. robot in our current competition. It has been through the ringer, and it is still dishing out massive hits. Awesome. You can see the Dark Chaos team and Rato, Team UFO, checking out the damage, marveling at the just chaos and destruction all over this arena pointing out the high section of the wall where they launched Dark Chaos. Wow. And huge section of the floor got chunked up during that fight, too. I can't wait to show you the, the replay of that. That was so much destruction. I mean, a little piece of Brazil brought to us here today. We are so happy to see it. That was absolutely incredible. What a cool team. Um, yeah, we'll be showing you a replay of this shortly, but wow. Ooh, it's got to be tough, though, to, to fly all the way from Brazil 
with some more Brazilians and lose to Brazilians in the States? Well, they, they had to drive to fly, you know, like 2,000 miles so they could uh, fight each other here. That's all. Yeah, yeah. That's all. They were even, I think they were even on the same flight. But when there's so many in the tournament, you're bound to face your friends eventually? Yeah, exactly. Four teams of dozens of robots, literally, that they brought here. Yeah. Um, the, all of them trying to qualify. There's no way they can all qualify, but all of them are trying to qualify. Right now, the only Brazilian qualified in any weight class is uh, Rato and Chibata. So they got to get some more in yeah. there. Yeah. Let's see what's going on in cage seven, five, where we have five, War Machine four, and three, the Racho. Two, one. Uh, fight, robots, fight. It's like War Machine's coming out of the blue corner, instantly spit out a wheel. Getting teed up for an easy hit from Garecho. And not a lot coming out of the War Machine side. Looks like cogging on the weapon. All right, here's the drive functioning now. Even with a wheel missing, they're still pretty zippy. Sounds like Derecho still up to speed, still able to deliver hits. Even when War Machine's in black mode. Oh. <laughs> black mode's kind of a last ditch effort to do something when your weapon's down. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's choosing chaos when you have no other options, really. Uh-oh, looks like they're upside down on their face. They might need an unstick here. Brett coming in to do what needs to be done. Brett sporting a, the pumpkin colorway right now. Orange mouth, green eyes. I wouldn't be surprised if we started to hear a count out soon. Yeah, there's not a, any movement coming out of Derecho at this point. Kyle, was I wrong? Was that was Derecho the, the single robot and War Machine was the double? Oh, no, you had it correctly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you were correct. You were correct. We were all good. Um, all right, so that fight was pretty decisive, I'd say. Yeah. Um, hopefully we were able to get you some footage of that Brazilian fight that we just had a little while ago, because that was intense, that and I nice. really enjoyed it. Um, but as of right now, we are uh, waiting for several bots to be ready to come into the arena. Uh, looks like we are loading something over there into cage one, so hopefully we'll have some action for you soon. Ooh. Um, but we shall like... see. In the meantime, what's been your favorite part of the day so far? I gave a really nice tour. Aww. Yeah, it was lovely. The the my tour group was inquisitive and curious, and um, they seemed to have fun. And we got to see some behind the scenes stuff. The tours are really cool. You get to go up into the pits. Uh, you get to see the workshops. Yeah, a little behind the scenes stuff. A lot of behind the scenes stuff. Um, yeah, my tour had questions that I thought were completely like out of like nowhere. Um, like, they were asking me questions about BattleBots fights from 2016, because apparently oh. two people on the tour were, are now re-watching the whole BattleBots series. Um, and then they had questions about, like, where do builders go when they have, uh, they need to, like, decompress from just the stress of being in the, in the box? And I was like, oh, we actually have several places for we them do. to do that. Um, so, yeah, it's cool. I mean, thoughtful people with, uh, with great questions, and, uh, you know, our, our fans are absolutely incredible at this event. So, looks like we got another Brazilian team up in cage one. This is Toro Jr. Uh, they'll be facing off against Fluffy. Fluffy's one of my very favorite competitors here. We've got two Fluffies in this cage, Kyle. Two Fluffies? Fluffy the house bot with an F. Ah, and then Fluffy the robot with a PH. You gotta love that PH Fluffy. It's just such a fascinating design. 
I'm trying to figure it out. Is that a drum of some sort? What are they? No, no, no. On? So they have what do they call counter rotating spinning hammers. So each of those hammers spins in opposite directions. Okay. The center of that robot is actually the, that center piece is actually wood. It's a very hard uh, African wood that they call steel wood. And it is basically what's taking the brunt of the impact while they're able to slam into you and pivot those two hammers into either side of your robot. Um, this is a very cool design by Rob Vitolans. And it is just the most glorious, handmade, proprietary robot that you have ever seen. He's brought several of them to this competition. He's just an old school DIY, make it work kind of fella. You know what I mean? You don't see CAD work from him. You don't see any like really intense computer work from him. He's an old school kind of builder and he builds these very powerful old school kind of robots. And I love his designs. I think they're so cool. Look at that. Oh, wow. Look at that. Come on. And what are they like spinning on the face? Yeah. Very and cool. they're hammers. So like Rob's, Rob's amazing. I had a long conversation with him yesterday. His design philosophy is: I want to try something new. I want to make it work, and I want to make my grandkids really excited. That's awesome. Um, and I love that he uses wood in the robot. Yeah, he uses wood robot. in almost all of his designs, actually, which is really cool. Wood has a place. It does absolutely. I'm not sure where that place is, but it's somewhere. Well, he was telling me this particular type of wood is so dense, you can actually tap threads into it. So he has threaded wow. inserts on this wood plate in front that he's actually put the piece into. You have to treat it like oh steel. Oh, my goodness. It's All lighter right. than steel, but you, you have to treat it like steel. So I've, I've made a plywood robot before, and you cannot tap into plywood. No, absolutely <laughs> not. No, plywoods are just scraps of wood and glue and dreams and then of course we have Toro now I saw these folks in the the workshop um, a good bit of yesterday and today just grinding away on Toro Jr. here uh, had to drop 0.2 of a pound which is 100 grams roughly it's a lot for a, a robot this weight class actually I mean, it's a lot to try to figure out how to get it out of the robot and still have a functioning armored piece. It took a lot of angle grinding. I'll bet. I don't think that there was too much shaping on their outer armor, and, and now there is. It's yeah. nice and smooth and curved. And they did that all by hand. They were in the grinding uh, booth quite a bit trying to get this robot worked on. So Toro Jr. is, of course, the uh, by Junior Souza. It is the... Ooh, there she is. It is the 12-pound version of um, Minotaur, essentially. I believe this actually came first. You know, Junior's usually coming first. <laughs> <laughs> but his name is Junior, so it, it still makes sense. It does. It works perfectly. Five, four, three, two, one. Toro fight. Junior from Rio Bots. Fight. Riobot's well known for their powerful drum spinners. A little slow out of the pink corner with Toro Jr. Absolutely, and actually quite a bit of mobility out of Fluffy there. Two very different design philosophies between these two teams. Ooh. Wow, great sparks, weapon to weapon impact there. Rob doing a really great job kind of controlling the pace of this fight. And now he's up against the wall, though. Wow, beautiful series of hits there from Toro Jr. Can he get out of this position, or is he doing the thing? Will Fluffy need to help Fluffy? A beautiful unstick from Fluffy. We were training this morning with the house bots. And man, that paid off. Wow, beautiful side impact hit there from Toro Jr. Junior Zuza able to really get that side stick and recombobulate, get himself back in the direction with his weapon facing at Fluffy. I gotta give it to Rob with Fluffy though. He's driving much better this event than he was at the last one. I think he's, he's been getting his some own. practice in there. Driving against any Brazilian team is difficult. Driving against the Rio Bots team is incredibly difficult. They are just well known for training up amazing drivers. And 
solid robots. That's a tough combination. Dead, to small, yeah, solid robots. That weapon sounds weird, though. Yeah, There's something funky's going on in there. There's some resistance that's not supposed to be resisting. Ooh, that just flew off. This is into the last minute of this fight now, and they're both these robots are functioning, going the distance. I gotta tell you, that is not what I was expecting no. of this fight at this point. I thought this would be a pretty one-sided matchup, but both these bots doing a phenomenal job. Absolutely. And at this point, it still could go either way, depending on these last 30 seconds. Oh no, Toro has uh, gyroed itself up against the wall plate. They are stuck. They do have one unstick left, but there's not a lot of time. And Fluffy coming in to help unstick them, showing a little bit of... Uh... Here we go, I'll spot Fluffy coming in. Oh no, Fluffy's blocking Fluffy from coming in to help. And we are down to the last four seconds. This is not how you want to end the matchup with this. You go know, to a judge's decision yeah. is stuck up against the wall. Granted, they did it to themselves, but that's not the last images you want to see. Wow. We're going to have to wait to hear back from the judges on that one because we're going straight to cage three with tomato soup and Dutch oven. Two fan favorites here at this competition. Tomato soup is a lifter kit bot and also a literal can of soup. I can't wait to see what these two cook up. Um, and they are going to go, going to put that tomato four, soup directly three, into a Dutch two, oven. One fight, robots fight. What's up, the spinner on this tomato soup is just a lifter. Okay, just so a that's, lifter, yeah. That's so what hearing is see, probably Dutch oven does, or, uh, tomato soup normally has a beautiful paint job on it. Immolating. That paint job completely covered by heat tape. Oh Dutch oven is one of the most powerful flamethrowers that we have, and they have made it even more powerful for this event. You'll notice Dutch oven is shuffling around. That's given them a weight bonus that they're able to put into yet a more powerful flame system. And you'll also hear the flame coming off a of Dutch oven this go around. And that's because they shifted up their solenoid system. So the valve that's letting gas out, they have two different options, like a fat blast. Look at that. And they just stream. kicked up the heat there. The whole point behind Dutch oven is that lifter or that mechanism crashes down on top of the opponent and holds them in place while they can just bake those internal components and cook it Oof, right up against the wall. The SSP kit, which is what Tomato Soup is, is a very well-built machine, but now it is all the way on fire! Oh my goodness, Ooh. look at all those components. That heat tape has been stripped away and burnt down. They are melting before our very eyes. Look at how well-built this machine is. It is still driving. I'm not sure if it can still lift. I bet they lost a belt on that one side, and that's why they're crab walking here. Yeah, they, I'll bet a belt completely melted off on that. But it wow. looks like we got crab walking out of Dutch Oven as well. And Dutch Oven's own fork is also on fire. You can see it burning right there. Wow. I just love the sound on that new flamethrower for it's Dutch Oven. It's gorgeous. Dutch Oven was one of the more powerful flamethrowers in this weight class anyway, and it is up at a notch for this competition. They are trying to qualify today with one of the most, I'd say, technologically advanced flamethrowers we have ever seen Absolutely. in any combat robotics competition. It's got a metal 3D printed valve system. It's got custom electronics to control those valves. It's just so amazing. Metal 3D printed valve system. Wow. But not a lot of movement from Dutch Oven right now. Just the crab walk. And it looks like the lifter on tomato soup has melted through. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, good for them. Mar is an incredibly talented driver, especially for a middle schooler. Comes here with their parents every competition and brings tomato soup. Um, really relies on their driving abilities, but man, now they're up on top of that minibot. Not a great place to be.
Looks like that was it. Alex Grant, of course, he's uh, from Seems Reasonable Robotics. Brought us Dutch Oven, this newest version of it. They brought some cool robots this go around. I mean, Shuffler, Bear Trap, Flamethrower. How would you, like, what a weird design for robot. What an effective matchup that was for them. I that goes to the judges, but I, I'd say that's a pretty clear victory in my mind. Yeah, I really like Dutch Oven. I want to borrow some design elements from it, for sure. Maybe swap out a custom valved flamethrower for some sort of jet turbine. Gotta love it. Got to love it. And it's still cooking. It's still got a fork on fire in there. All right, looks like we are checking in on cage four. A little double screen action there. You can see Mar and Kevin. From the, oh, right, in cage four, we've got Son, Son of Cram versus Minor Threat 5. Both of these bots have won championships in oh, other competitions. Wow. Both of these bots are heavily favored for today's competition. Five, two of the highest ranked four, bots that have yet to three, qualify. Two, one. Fight, robots fight. I'm looking for a roof shot in this one. Would not be surprised. Uh, Minor Threat 5 did win the Motorama competition earlier this year. Has not been able to replicate that same success here at NHRL. Ooh. They are up against a top-notch drum spinner in Son of Cram. And quite frankly, one of the best drum drivers that we have at this competition. And this is a competition full of Brazilian robots, so that's saying a lot. You can see that self-writing me self mechanism on Minor Threat 5 working flawlessly. Almost seamlessly, they landed on their backs and are immediately back on the wheels. But there does seem to be some drive side yeah, issues on the right them? side of Minor Threat 5. Something to keep an eye on there. Struggling to go forward with it. Son of Cram not able to capitalize there. They do seem to have drive side issues on their left side of their drive. Wow, bouncing Whoa. all over the place. Minor Threat 5 now using the... Oh my goodness. I can't keep track. Both bots reeling from that last exchange, trying to find their footing and square up again. Looks like the weapon has significantly slowed down on Minor Threat 5. Minor Threat 5 has a really unique system. It does not use gearboxes at all like most robots. Instead, it uses a multi-belt system to save on weight and cost. Luke Grell, very talented designer and amazing driver. But David Small was, with Son of Cram, is one of the best to ever do it. Right now, both of these bots are really struggling with functionality, though. Looks like the weapon is down on Minor Threat 5. The self-writing mechanism is gone. Yeah, where'd that go? Son of Cram, barely mobile. Pin is happening now. They're allowed to hold that pin for 10 seconds where they have to disengage and allow their opponent to leave. You can see Son of Cram trying to back out, but it does seem like that drive, right side drive, is really struggling. Which means when he backs up, he's going right into the wall. So, tough position to be in. Yeah, not ideal for David Small and Son of Cram. We did see a small spin up of that drum earlier. It looks like he might be saving that now, or it's just not functional. There it is. Use, got so, the drum firing up now, maybe to help him gyroscopically remove himself from that position. David looks stressed. Look at his face. He knew this would be a tough fight going in, but now he's down a drive side, and he's got weapon. It seems like the weapon is intermittently working for some reason. That could be intentional. It could not. He knows he has to get a hit in, but it doesn't look like Minor Threat's moving at all. Is that the No, we're end all of this done. One? That's the end of the matchup. David looks a little bit disappointed, to be honest. All right, hopping straight to cage one, where we've got Polyester, the multibot, going up against Red Storm, the scaled-up Timber Viper. Red Storm brought to you by Kevin Milcheski. It is just fast, it is powerful, but right now it's got to deal with a very confusing situation of dealing with two incredibly powerful. 
And it looks like he's handling it all right. He's got his wedge armor on to definitely take oh, the horizontals. Nasty. Now, polyester is a multi-bot in the 30-pound weight class. Essentially, that means that this is the only competition where these bots can compete. They are specific to the NHRL rule set. They're not allowed to be used anywhere else in the country or even the world. Yeah, what are they, like 19 pounds each, 19 I think? pounds each, yes, using the full weight bonus. And they are copies of two of the most powerful beetle weight robots that we have here. Who are they? <laughs> So Polly Wog, okay. which is a multi-time champion, driven by David Jin. And then Esther is a, uh... oh, look out. This looks like it might be a count out here. Count out for Red Storm? Red Storm's not moving. Oh, and Kevin is it. giving the applause. Polly Esther team. They have the one competitions in the 30 pound weight class before really phenomenal team. They're both real fast. They both hit hard, even yeah. at 19 pounds. Team Ribot, they just, two really good drivers, Christian and David Jin, bringing out top-notch robots. 10 pounds lighter than the competition, or 11 pounds lighter than the competition, but still hit hard. Really mastering that multi-bot technique for the 30-pound weight class. The only time you see them really struggle is when they're going up against powerful horizontals, when they can just get thwacked around and into each other, and the chaos factor right. really seems to str make them struggle. but. That was a perfect matchup for them in a lot of regards, up against Kevin Milcheski and a control bot. What are you going to control when you have two different opponents running around you? Both of them have really powerful weapons. You can't defend against both of them at the same time. Yeah. And it's hard because one is a horizontal and one's a vertical, so your configuration is generally based on whether you're fighting a horizontal or a vertical. Yeah, and so your, when you have to your fight horizontal both. configuration is not going to be great against a ground scraping vertical and vice versa. They're they're really just an un, it's an unfortunate way to try to design your robot for that situation. It was worked out beautifully for that team. Polyester has done yeah. incredible well in this weight class. I'm so glad to see them here. Um, great chance they will qualify for today, but then again, that 30-pound weight class is... So polyester, they got they got second in the last tournament. That is correct. Yeah, so they've already they've already like qualified, but they are they they are up against a stacked competition here at this event. Oh yeah, that last chance, you know. Everyone's trying to get qualified for the finals in November, and so everyone's here. And this is the first time we've ever completely filled the 30 pound weight class. The the limit for bots has been hit. Um, we knew that that would start happening eventually, but now we're there. It is a really stacked field. Used to be we'd show up at these competitions, there'd be what, like six? Six yeah, 30 pound bots would show up. Really you know, easy to qualify when there's only six 30 pounds. Yeah, and the 30 pound competition was like, you know, it happened once a year before. It was like at Motorama once uh, here on the East Coast. You didn't really see 30 pound weight class anywhere else. Once we made it a thing, those bots got built, developed, iterated upon, and now we just have vicious bots in that weight class. Absolutely. It, it made me want to build a 30 pounder again. Um, I, w I was one of those Motorama competitors, and once a year, it, it's tough. But when you, when you can compete every other month, it's less pressure to be done for one tournament because yeah. you know two months later you can compete again. And so I think that allows folks to really uh, perfect their bots to the extent that they want to. So you can throw it in as soon as it's done and just hope for the best, or you can really refine and make it perfect, yeah. tuned up. Yep. Um, by the way, how do you like being a meme now? I've noticed that on the, uh, on the Instagram. Uh, I'm just trying not to let it go to my head. Yeah, you you make a good meme. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you you're talking about? I wish I even knew which one you were referring oh, to. Oh, uh, hello, felder, fellow builders. Oh, yeah. With uh, you on the Steve Buscemi body, pretending to be a, a fellow builder. I, I loved it. That was me. <laughs> that was me on my shoulder. That's yeah, I didn't me. have a skateboard. <laughs> not a skateboard. Actually, All right. it's me. So let's check in with Lindsay upstairs in the pits, and she's got some super chats for us. Awesome. Sam, I have to say that that meme uh, did kind of give me nightmares a little bit because somehow you and Steve Buscemi, although you don't look alike, <laughs> when in that meme, it kind of, I saw it. I kind of saw it. Similar energy, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have eight super chats here for you, so let's get to them. Uh, the first one is really questionable. It's from Loaf Around. What do I have to do to fight one of these robots with my bare hands? I'll sign anything. Loaf Around, I don't think that you want to sign up for that because uh, uh, I don't know if there is a, a waiver form that exists for... <laughs> 
for, for this level of destruction. But no. we're going to do one more super chat. Um, we're going to save the rest for later. The next one here um, is from Eel Monkey Art. Once again, way to go, Katie Five, and Death Muffin. Four. Deliciously terrifying. We love it. Bet. Absolutely. All right, we are going to go right away over into Cage 3, where we have Absolute Zero flaming uh, going up against Flaming Wedgie. Do you think Flaming Wedgie is the uh, flamethrower bot? Flaming Wedgie is most definitely a flamethrower bot, actually named by a grandmother of one of the team members. Well, it's living up to its namesake, at least the first half of it. That is a really impressive amount of flame coming off of Flaming yeah. Wedgie. Wow. Absolute zero is just it's smothered in flame. It's hard to see it in there. That's a tap out. Wow. All right. Beautiful cool. job there. So uh, Flaming Wedgie, one of the bots brought by Chico AIME. It is a custom flamethrower running titanium armor by Hunter Daughtery, who was the original designer of this. Hunter's grandmother oh. actually named the bot. Um, this is one of the teams. Look at the flames just still lingering on Absolute yeah. Zero. The wheel's on fire. That front plate is on fire. It looks like a belt is on fire. Amazing performance by Flaming Wedgie. Uh, this is one of the teams that got, a, got grant money from NHRL. Oh, awesome and was able to put together a slew of just student-built bots for this event. So this is a lot of people's first event from that team. That's and so this awesome. is a, a brand new build from Hunter, a brand new design from Hunter, but the whole team worked on it. Um, and it's a really cool bot. That was their first win. <laughs> yeah. Like, nice work, guys. That was ideal. So awesome. It's hard to get a first-time new bot to work perfectly and get a, just like a crucial knockout. There's Heather and Hunter from that team. That Very awesome. proud of themselves, as they should be. Phenomenal performance. You got to love that the STEM money that we are generating as an organization is now going right back out into the universe and yeah. developing teams and new bots to come back here and fight Honestly, it is one of the reasons why I'm like, oh, Austin McCord actually is a genius, <laughs> yeah. right? He's like, oh, what am I going to do with my grant money? I'm going to put it into these STEM programs that will then return value by bringing more powerful bots to this competition, better teams to this competition. <laughs> We're seeing it already. It hasn't live. even been a year. No, live. Literally, it's several months after that money was given out and distributed, and we were seeing these bots here. They're competing. They're doing well, clearly. Like, that was amazing. And it's it's only going to get better. Like, the, the Honeycrack team has their own 30-pound arena now that they they yeah, with STEM money. I, th you can watch footage on their their Instagram of them testing bots, fighting bots, doing like all of that training in there that they used with the STEM money they got from here. That is gonna step up the caliber of those robots significantly. Already has, already yeah, has. Definitely. Like the plus and minus from that team that's, that's gonna be competing here today is a phenomenal robot. I cannot wait to see them go. So cool. But yeah, oh, speaking of incredible teams that have won some STEM money from here, this is STF, AKA Save the Frogs. Wow. It is one of the biggest horizontals we have ever seen in this competition. That thing is a beast, and it is a shuffler-style horizontal spinner. So it walks on those little teeny tiny red feet on the top and bottom. And next to them is Chonky out of the Georgia Tech team, I think. Yes, and it is one of it is a crowd favorite. So this is a little college team action to a certain degree. So the all of the guys from Team Robot are originally from WPI. And it looks like Chonky shuffles as well. So this is a lot of weight in the box. Yeah, tons of weight in the box. Now, traditionally, a shell spinner is not a great matchup for a horizontal spinner. The physics of this don't typically work out very well. But that there is a big power differential here in a lot of ways. That Save the Frogs by STF hits so hard. It's got Five, like a heavyweight four, size motor spin in the weapon. Three, it does, yeah. Two. But Chunky is dialed. Fight. This Robots is Chunky with three eyes, which means it's the third version. And third iteration, yeah. That is their, their naming practice for the, uh, these robots on this team. This first impact is going to tell the tale. Oh, wow. All right. Chunky is able to take those hits. So are the mini bots. Those wow. things are and pretty so tough. You can see, watch. Every time STF hits it, their, their bar goes up into the air a little bit. And that's a big, dangerous place for them to be because they lose a lot of control when they're up in the air like that. Chonky could potentially come in there and take full advantage of it. I think one of the things Chonky's trying to do is be a little bit more careful so they don't lose that self-writing bar. Absolutely. And they're, they're going to be more stable than STF, just being surrounded by their spinning mass. Wedges are the bane of the horizontal bars. It's just, what if you make your wedge a huge spinning mass? 
That is why it is such a bad matchup for these spinning bars. Oh, the bar is gone. The self running mechanism is gone. Uh -oh. Dangerous place for Chalky to be, but they are still controlling this fight, keeping STF in the corner. self writing is off the table for Chalky now. Yeah, impossible task. And those uh, mini bots, which could potentially help them self right, were gone long ago. Barely functioning, just scrapped up against the corners of this box. Entered for some marginal weight bonus that doesn't matter anymore. Looks like STF is playing it very conservatively in the middle of the arena, just trying to keep the spinner pointed at Chonky, leaving it up to Chonky to try and find that in to get their spinner into the soft side of STF. Nice, there's a lot of control we're seeing right there from Chonky. Beautiful job really getting STF back up on their weapon and out of control and just shoving them back towards the wall. Now Chonky stuck up against the wall, not where they want to be. Now they're back out, able to get back up to full speed. But it's harder for them to tell where their front end is now that they're self-riding. Oh, yeah, gone. I didn't even think about that part of it. Uh-oh. Oh, no, Chonky's weapon is spun down. The weapon's still fully functional on STF. Obviously, the armor package on Chonky is not ideal for them, but what has happened to the weapon on Chonky? At least it's still able to deflect STF's blade upward, destabilizing them in the process. Not gonna bode well if the judges, for the judges if this goes the full distance, though. Last 25 seconds left of this matchup. Whoa, Ooh, nice deflection hit. there for Chonky. And they're getting a little bit more control, getting up underneath STF, especially while they're being gyroed up into the air. Yeah. They're trying to get him slammed into the wall. This one's gonna go to the judges, but we are ending the fight with a fully functional STF and a Chalky that's down a weapon and down a self-writing bar. All right, that's... This is gonna be tough to judge. Yeah, that's gonna be a tough one to judge. I I honestly think this might end up being a situation where the rules favor the bot that didn't necessarily win the fight, if we're talking about who won the fight. Yeah, so let's talk about it a little bit. The mini bots are gonna play a role. For sure, yeah, and lots of damage to the bots They were both fight. on STF side. Yep. Um, I think aggression probably went Whoa, to... Whoa, that's a weapon spin up there, by oh, the way, at okay. the end. Doing their functionality test for the judges. That bodes incredibly well for Chomp. Yeah, that will change the scoring rubric. Um, weapon damage and drive damage matter a lot. Yeah. Uh, mini bot damage, a little less so, but it but all it still matters, up. yeah, quite a bit. Um, so uh, that looks good for Chonky moving forward, which Definitely. would be great for them. That would be actually a little bit of an upset as far as the rankings go. So good for Chonky. Let's see how that comes out with the judges. Really impressive. Uh, at that same time, by the way, we had another fight going on over in Cage 4. Yeah. Um, so we'll give but you the results. But I think results. we're going we're gonna to go upstairs, Kyle. Chris is there with Alex Grant and Dutch Oven. Oh, cool. All right, let's go to Chris. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, I am here with Alex Grant and Dutch Oven. Uh, Alex, obviously the bot looks like it's working, this flamethrower mechanism that we went into a little bit more detail last night, but if you can walk us through here, those that are attending the uh, the live event today or watching online, tell us a little bit about the bot and the design and, and what's been working so well for you today. Yeah, so I spent a lot of time on the combustion chamber system. Uh, so probably 80 or 90% of my time went into the flame system and 10, 20% went into the rest of the robot. So the flame system's working great. Uh, I had a little bit of issues in my first match uh, getting the ignition started because you have to, it's a fine balance. You have to either go fuel rich or fuel lean and if you don't hit the right balance it doesn't ignite uh, so the robot works by having a flame system that internally combusts uh, within a chamber and it has a fan that blows air through it yeah, so, let's take a close look at this, Alex. This is incredible. Now, you explained to me last night, this is actually 3D printed aluminum, right? That is correct. So the 3D printed aluminum uh, tank over here, there's a little straw that comes over here, and then through the solenoid valve, the fuel wraps around like a rocket engine, so it cools the chamber as the fuel it burns coming on the outlet. On the back side, we have a fan 
And so as it's blowing the air, the fuel cools the chamber and then burns either internally or just right at the right zone externally to the robot. And I so see. it creates a really hot flame as a result. I see that you've also marshmallowed yourself a little bit too. That's all by but that's all by design though, right? Oh, of course. You never want to, you know, go in with an untested robot and what you see here is an untested robot made out of plastic that has a intense flamethrower. So, we're going in and replacing parts that are melting itself. You know, next event we should be able to replace those with something that's more durable, but for now we get a good show of uh, the the robot dripping you know, in the in the arena. Alex, do you know who your next match is, and do you have a strategy going into that? Not yet. Not yet. Not well. It's it. That's that's how it rolls here at NHRL. Good luck, and it's really been entertaining to watch you fight so far. I'm, I'm super happy with the robot. Couldn't be happier with the flame system. Just gotta get the rest of it dialed in, and we should be good. All right. Back to you guys at the desk. Thank you. Wow, what a cool design. I mean, watching it in the box is amazing. Listening to Alex describe it is even cooler. There is so many smart people in this sport. Just absolutely incredible. Uh, your microphone's up, by the way. Thank you so much. No problem. I knew you were about to talk. I didn't want you to just uh, yeah. speak out to the, to the ether. Um, it, it's pretty simple to make a flamethrower, you know? It's yeah. just a little flame, and you push a butane tank. Sure. But you don't have to do it the simple way. And when you don't, you can you can experiment with your flow rates and with uh, your ratio of air to gas, and and that's what Dutch Oven's doing, and they're they're pushing the flamethrower envelope. That the amount of just force of heat coming out of that thing, like forget just the amount of heat, but the force of heat, it's actually blowing into the robot, which is adding a whole different aspect, right? Those components now that are receiving heat and flame that weren't getting it before because it's actually forced air pushing those flames into those little crevices, those little areas that were not designed to be melted. Yeah, you, you can't use oxidizers with your flamethrowers here at NHRL, <clears throat> which means like no, uh, like, um, a something like okay. when you're welding. Acetylene, yeah, yeah. acetylene. Um, but you can use ambient air and, and push it through. So with that fan that they have inside, that's, that's how they're really increasing the power of that flame, and it's, it's awesome. Yeah, the, that's a safety reason, right? We don't want to make the flame so hot that they can melt through the polycarbonate. We don't want to make them so hot that they will just set the plywood directly on fire, right? I mean, we, I guess. We, we, <laughs> Safety is a concern for humans and other living things, um, but there is like a little bit of wiggle room there. If you get that fan going behind the flame, obviously, you know, everybody who's worked on a campfire before knows if you fan that stuff, it's going to get really hot really fast. Um, really cool to see that. And like the right team to do it, right? The seems reasonable guy, Kyle. Reasonable guys are so smart. Oh, what's up? Uh, I, I have to fight in cage four. This guy has too many hats. Okay, yeah, go fight in cage four. We'll call your fight. That means Alvin and the Chipmunks are up next. Awesome, great. Uh, there goes. There he goes. He's off. <laughs> They're gonna hand this guy a controller so he can fight with a jet robot. Listen, his life's just far more interesting than mine. Okay, he's just there's Austin McCord. He's the founder of the league, and also one of the designers and builders behind Alvin and the Chipmunks. They're going up against Flip and Cut 12, which is a 12-pound melty brain spinner from the Casmer family. You can see they're doing a little pre-game strategizing there, getting everything together and ready to go. Uh, that's Ryan Zaslow, I believe, in between the two of them. Ryan is like Austin's right-hand man, helps him get a lot of the uh, a lot of the different parts of this competition together, and also helps him build these really weird robot designs. Lately, I guess this entire team has been obsessed with jet engines, and specifically using jet engines as a weapon. Which, by the way, at every competition they brought it to, it's become more and more effective as a weapon. This time as a multi-bot configuration. So there you can see Alvin and the chipmunks getting loaded in. Yep. And uh, Flip and Cut 12, I believe, is not a multi-bot configuration. It's just one robot, so it'll take a little bit longer to get these guys all in. Plugged in, turned on, fail-safed, and all of the things you need to do to make your robot functional and ready to go. So let's see. Today, Sam has done pit interviews. He's been up here at the desk with us. 
He's been out to fight, I think, at once already today. And he's also been a part of our safety team. It's just a lot of hats. By the way, it's not like we're short-staffed here or anything. He just, he likes taking on a lot of tasks, you know? Oh, uh, meanwhile, it looks like we're going up to Lindsay. They're in the pits. Hey, Lindsay. Oh, hello. How's it going? Uh, uh, quite good. I'm sorry. I was lost in the bracket of it all. <laughs> you were lost in the bracket of it all. I think I just lost my co-host up here because he has to go fight a robot, so they wanted me to hang out with somebody. So. Hey, I'm always available to hang out, for, especially with you, Kyle. Aw, thanks, Lindsay. <laughs> um, so it sounds like there's going to be a little Alvin and the Chipmunks versus Flip and Cut 12 action coming up. I watched Flip and Cut 12 spin up in the test box earlier today. Yeah. Really exciting to have that big test box up there in the pits that we're able to test bots like Flip and Cut 12. It just feels good to have the Kazmers back. Um, I mean, no one does melty brains like them and no no one builds bots like them. So, uh, you know, I feel like it's been a couple events and this whole year has been a little light on the Kazmers, if I, if I dare say. So it's Agreed. nice to see them back. Yeah, how dare they have a life outside of combat robotics? We need this melty brain goodness. It's really not acceptable if you ask me. <laughs> So what are they, what, what, oh, this is Alvin and the Chipmunks. Yes, yeah, so this is Alvin wow. and the Chipmunks. So normally these jet robots are a single robot with maybe one little <laughs> uh, multi-bot, or like mini bot with it. These are two kind of capture robots. You can see those uh, those forks with the spikes on them. They're, they're meant to get underneath the bot and kind of hold them in place. While Alvin, the big bot with the jet on it, which is the same size jet that has been going on their normal size 12 pound robots, I think it's now on a five pound robot, comes in and just blows direct jet engine heat inside of your robot. So uh, we'll see how that works against the Melty Brain. Yeah, that jet engine heat is not a joke. <laughs> Even if you can't necessarily see it or it's not the biggest, flashiest flame, that doesn't mean it is not doing serious damage to the internals of your robot. No, and what's interesting about this jet engine is it does create enough force that it will actually blow the opponent robot back and away like a good four feet when it's up in full, uh, full force and kind of backed up against the wall. This bot used to have a wedge shape so it could back itself into a corner to kind of get the maximum amount of jet output without launching itself. This one has no such wedge. And from what I understand, the strategy is not to go up against the corner. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I imagine so. Uh, one of the really cool things, though, about this robot is uh, in order to generate as much Five, force as it needs, four, it's also so three, loud. Two, oh, yeah. By one, the way, if you're not five, wearing earplugs, you might want to turn them on or put them on right now. Here we go. Flip and Cut 12 trying to get up to speed. Alvin driving across the box, waiting till things are safe. Look at all of that exposed liquid. Yeah, not a great place to put your jet fuel. And it looks like Flipping Quad 12 really struggling in the corner over here, not able to get up to any kind of speed at all whatsoever. Oh, it, I mean, I, I, is it already uh, blowing things around? It's hard to tell exactly, but uh, it, it looks like almost like an, an invisible tornado is in the box. Yeah, both, all these minibots just kind of like flailing in the wind created by this thing. And Flip and Cut 12 stuck in the corner, not able to get out right now. Not wow. a great place for them to be because that jet engine's coming right in at them. Oh, yeah, check that out. The minibot just got launched across with the jet engine on, uh, on Alvin. This is wild. Kyle, what does it sound like down there? Uh, it's loud. It's loud. I feel like I'm screaming at you right now. <laughs> I don't think it's even reached full power yet, though. I'm hoping that Brett can come by and get Flip and Cut out of the corner. Oh. oh, all right. So apparently Brett was not able to, or Fluffy was not able to come by and get them out of the corner. So they, I know that this bot was functional earlier today, but there did seem to be some mobility and yeah. spin-up issues with Flip and Cut 12. Unfortunate, because it's such a cool robot. I wanted to see it function in this fight, but... Nonetheless, at least it didn't get melted by a powerful jet engine. So we got that going for you. I know that Austin, when he enters a bot, he says his main goal is not to win, that it'd be silly for the founder to win a tournament. But uh, 
seems like he's doing pretty well so far. So I, I don't know. Is his plan kind of backfiring? Well, I think he's just kind of obsessed with this idea. I yeah. want to make a jet engine weapon work, and I want to see it function. Well, that means that he's going to get better at it every single time. He's going to win fights now. I don't know if the guy's going to win a tournament or not with it, <laughs> but it's becoming more effective. All right, joining me back at the desk, a man with many hats is Sam Hansen, driver of Alvin. Oh, no, I'm uh, I'm Simon. Oh, you're Simon. Yeah, 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 Not Simon. Theodore. No, 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 Saz is Theodore. Saz is Theodore, Austin's you're Alvin. Simon, and Austin is Alvin. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it really works out. That Actually, way. yeah, that makes a lot of it sense. Has. Who's the, the dad screaming Alvin? Uh, that would probably be Kelly. Yeah, probably <laughs> Kelly, CEO yeah. of, of NHRL. All right, yeah, that makes sense. We've got all the characters lined up now. That yeah. makes perfect sense. How'd that fight go for you guys? Well, the jet worked as it's supposed to. Yeah, blowing mini bots um, all over the place. That was great. Yeah, um, my, my role was to block their mini bot, so it was like a, a blue on blue sort of thing. And then Saz on Theodore was to high center flip and cut itself. Um, it didn't look like they came out of the corner at all. No, they had a hard time spinning up, and then they got, it got jammed up underneath the yeah. wood. So, yeah, they weren't really able to function, but at least they didn't melt. No, no. Uh, Austin's turbine robots are, are really good when the uh, opponent never leaves the, the starting corner. <laughs> That's how we get our wins. Yeah, no, that, that does work. Uh, we were just talking about kind of the goal behind these turbine, these jet engine robots, and how yeah. it's not necessarily to win tournaments. It's just to make this this like design work and make it be more effective as time goes on. Yeah, so so this is like the third iteration of, a, of our turbine robots. Yep. The first one you remember was triangular. It just yeah, sat back in the, into corner the corner the whole yep. time. Uh, then we did Hot Shot and it was a little more mobile, four wheel drive. Yeah, cool design. Kind of looked like a Batmobile yeah. with a jet engine facing the wrong way. And so now we were just trying to see how far down we could scale it. Um, so Alvin itself is around six pounds. Wow. Which, as you know, if you run two robots in the three pound class and one of them shuffles, then you get about six pounds. So I think, I think it's feasible. So you're talking about getting like a shuffler version of this at like five pounds and putting a mini bot yeah. in there at three pounds. Yeah, I, th I think it's definitely possible. So wait a minute, we're gonna try to get a jet engine into the three pound division? Yeah, well, I mean, why Maybe? not? Maybe. Why not? This is what, like, people complain about the loopholes here, you know, the, the loopholes and the rules, and they don't understand that that's what we're doing here, guys. <laughs> that's, like, half the joy is, like, hey, did you really read the rules? I mean, did you really read the rules? Because there's some fun stuff in there. There's some things you can play with. There's some, some things you can test. There's probably stuff none of us have even thought of that's, that's possible. Well, that's and half the fun. Yeah, yeah. when it's stuff so that goes, cool. shows up that we're like, oh, we probably should have thought of that. Oh, no. Okay, well, maybe next time, but they're here now. Nothing we can do about it. Yeah, yeah we love it when that kind of stuff happens. It's the best. Um, and I love that the founder himself is like, so the rules? What are we doing here, you know? Like, He's pretty familiar with, with the rules. He knows what we can and can't do. And yep. yep. And specifically designed it for a little bit of a little bit of lawyering. Yeah. You know. And and I mean, Alvin and the Chipmunks, it's it's not gonna go all the way. But it might. It just beat a top notch competitor there. That's fair. Thanks. Put it on the resume, I suppose. Yeah, I mean that was pretty good. That was pretty good. You guys just beat a top notch competitor in the Casmers. Yeah. Uh, Flipping Cut 12 is no joke. It's a it's a legit <laughs> robot that hits real hard when it's working. So, yeah, nice work. All right. Well, uh, I think we're going to check up with Chris in the pits. Okay. Let's check up with Chris yeah. in the pits. Hey, guys. I'm here with Chad New and Yahoo, who just got out of a slugfest with Toro. Chad, I'm happy to deliver the news to you right now. The judges came back. Yahoo was the victor in that match. Tell us about the match uh, for those that didn't get to see it on the live stream, and what are you going to have to do to get ready for your next fight? Well, in my 20-plus years of doing this, that was one of the best fights that I've ever had. So make sure you go to the Bread Zone or wherever they fight. you got to find that fight and watch it. You're doing yourself a favor. As far as damage goes, uh, in the opponent, Toro, is an amazing team, amazing robot, great fight. Um, they ripped off one of my sides. That's fairly low damage. Uh, some dulling of the drum teeth, 
they ripped off a front armor panel, but that's easy to replace. And I blew up a brand new $120 battery, but it's okay, I've got extras. And uh, give me 15 minutes, we'll be ready to rock and roll again. So this this is, uh, your side armor is UHNW, right? It's a 3D TPU. printed TPU. TPU? Yep. So take a look at this gouge right here, right? So Toro obviously bit into that, hit like probably one of where your reinforcement bolts are, but now look at the chassis under here, literally carved into the side of that, yeah. insane. I won't be getting that bolt out. And then if you look at the axle on the back, you know, it's doing a smiley face now. That should be straight, but uh, not anymore. It's it's angry. Any other noteworthy damage that you recognize other than the battery and the armor? Uh, you know, we're trying a new material on the drum, and they took a significant, you know, few chunks out of that. Um, the new material works really good. The magnitude of that information cannot be understated. We'll use that later. Um, the new drum design went well. That was, again, that was one of the best fights that I've ever had, ever. Awesome. Chad, uh, we can't wait to see the fight. I, I can't wait to see the fight. And good luck in the rest of the competition. I really hope that uh, things work out for you because there is no better deserving uh, bot to go to the World Championships than Chad New and Yahoo. Thanks so much, Chris. Hi, Max. Hi, Charlotte. Hi, Emily. Aww. Give that family shout out in. All right, so we are going to head right over into Cage 4 where you can see Darkstar and Yob Trolls. Getting ready to go in. Yobtros, of course, is short boy backwards. I, I don't know why. We have the long boy here normally. Now we have the short boy. Not related, actually. Two totally separate teams have nothing to do with each other, but it's a nice little homage, I guess. Yeah, a new trend. Um, Darkstar is, of course, the scaled-up version of Blackbird, a three-pound robot. Darkstar, I believe, is the name for the SR-71 jet before it became the SR-71, back when it was just a... Uh, experimental machine. That's good trivia. Um, yeah. It was, it, it is. They, most of the bots on this team are actually named after uh, jets, military jets of some kind or another. I was actually having a long conversation uh, with Anthony D'Ambrosio earlier today and a little bit yesterday. Oh, look at that. There's a little cow action going on there. That's Milk Tank. Hey, Milk Tank. What's Milk Tank doing? Milk Tank's going to be going up against Side Apple here in Cage 1. There you see Side Apple. Oh, uh, getting pushed into your starting corner. That's good. That's a good sign, right? Is, it? Is, Is it? that That's what you want. Don't expend the energy to get into the corner true. yourself. You save battery. You're saving a little bit of uh, stress and battery by getting pushed into your corner. Depth Charge is one of the ones that often gets pushed into Five, their starting corner. Yeah, four, they have a lot of energy. Three, we can t go check two, out our museum. You can one, see how much energy fight. they have. Robots fight. Okay, so Side Apple is the overhead attack bot over here in the corner that is just kind of flailing about. And Miltech is Miltech. Miltech is the fan favorite horizontal spinner. It hits hard, it's full of glitter, and it loves you, and it's kind of a cow. Looks like it's got an undercutter spinner, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, that was a good miss there from Side Apple. They tried, they tried and they missed. So Side Apple we saw earlier get stuck in a top plate, uh, but they were mobile. Now they're not mobile, and they missed the top plate. I don't know what's going on with them. I mean, they're mobile in the sense that their arm flails. Oh, the weapon's kind of out of there now. What is that? Is that an ESC hanging Ooh. out of there? It's something hanging out of there yeah, that's it's got not supposed to. Three wires, it looks like. Yeah, it's not good. You want that inside the robot. Generally, your electronics are best inside the robot. You could, I mean, electronics armor is, uh, it's a thing that happens. It's just not usually intentional. Milk Tank taking the time to spin up and dish out a hit, spin up, dish out a hit. Milk Tank is, sh uh, I, I talked to, t to the Milk Tank team earlier today, and uh, they said that they're definitely not qualifying today. Oh, yeah. how do they know? That's what I said. I was like, how do you know? You don't know how this bracket's gonna shake out. You can, could definitely qualify today. And look. They won this one. They're winning this one, they're doing great. Dish out the hits. Knockout. All right. KO for Milk Tank. Classic See? opponent doesn't leave the corner. Much easier to win. Would we have said that like a, a year ago, two years ago? KO for Milk Tank. Come on. 
they were winning judges' decisions last year. We were like, good for them. We would say KO and Milk Tank in the, in the same, same sentence. Yeah, all the time. Because the Milk Tank would be in several pieces across the box. But, like, they're getting more legit every single year. Yeah, the 30-pound the version? Scary. It's, it's, serious. it's actually serious. It's yeah. got big brushless motors for their weapon and a, a gnarly heavy weapon. Uh, like, just a few more rounds of refinement. I think, I think they could... Could maybe qualify in the right month. I I agree. I definitely agree. They could qualify in the right month. Uh, maybe not this event because it's the most stacked event of the yeah. entire year after a year of many stacked events. But it's um, it's a possibility. They're winning fight. I mean, they just got a knockout. That was amazing. Yeah. Good for them. Their record improves every year. I can't wait to see what they're able to come up with in the future. Um, cool bot all the way around. All the way around. All right, so it looks like we might be preparing to go into cage two here in a moment. We've got some fights lined up in there. It's been a great day of fights so far. We've got more craziness coming your way. Oh, here we are in cage two. There you see Brett the Brick, our original house bot. What's up, Brett? You know much about dark matter? Uh, yes, I do know quite a bit about dark matter. What's Dark Matter's deal? I'm not super familiar. Okay, so Dark Matter, well, first of all, let's talk about this real quick. This is, this is a catastrophe of a robot. This is, <laughs> this um, is a cartoon. <laughs> this is a cartoon. So you can see these two uh, very vicious squeaky hammers are the main weapons. This is a robot that stomps around the box. This is Tom Farkas. And that's Ben from Team Panic on the and minibot as well. Yes, Ben Pretty exciting from Team Panic all the way from there. Australia. Five, four, the the three, longest distance any two, competitor has come to one, NHRL. Yeah. Fight. Today. Robots fight. Oh. Just hearing it stomp. It's awesome. He's going to get him. He's going to get him. Dark Matter is zipping all over the arena. So Dark Matter is a uh, four-wheel drive hub motor vert. Uh, hub motor means that the weapon motor is actually inside of the weapon. Very difficult to pull off, but you get oh, some yeah. direct power when you do that. Really powerful hits from it. Um, tiny little robot, dense, compact, kind of modeled after a witch doctor style. You see that. Um, and that's brought to uh -oh. us by Gabriel Bertozzi. One squeaky hammer down in the positively hysterical fight. I like gotta the, tell you, whoa. positively has been move, like moving great around the box. It's kind of on its back right now. You can see that uh, turntable is how it actually turns. Yeah, and it looks like some linkage has got a little mangled. Yeah, it's not great. Ooh, the minibot's not in a great place right now. <gasps> One half of the squeaky hammer left, um, but hanging on. The minibot, by the way, that is a custom squeaky hammer that uh, they designed and built specifically for the minibot, which is cool. That's not an easy thing to do, by the way, making a custom squeaky hammer all yourself. No, I don't even know where you'd be dead. You know what happens is sometimes these robot builders like um, go down rabbit holes they probably shouldn't go down, and they went down a really weird squeaky hammer rabbit hole that <laughs> brought them to, maybe we should just design and build our own, and they did. Granted, there are plenty feet. of squeaky hammers readily available on the market. That's not as fun. No, of course as not. It's taking 18 hours to design a squeaky hammer. <laughs> <laughs> and it does look like Dark Matter is going to win this fight by knockout. Really impressive work from Gabriel Verdozzi taking out one of the fan yeah. favorites and positively knockout. hysterical. Positively hysterical got some great hits in with the squeaky hammer. The problem with the squeaky hammer is it doesn't do any damage. Unfortunately. <laughs> it, it does psychological damage, though. If you're getting beaten by something that squeaks every time it hits you, there is there is some psychological warfare happening there. So perhaps the judging rubric will be updated for next season? Uh, oh, for, for emotional and psychological damage to your opponent? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, that sounds like a horrible thing to encourage our bot builders to do, but why, why not? No, you're right. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, so this is a fight that a lot of people have been looking forward to here today in Cage One. Five, this is Hooligan four, 
versus Three, Baby two, Grimm. One, We've been looking forward Robots to Baby Grimm fight. fighting in this box for little years at this point. Well, we get with a touch of uh, chartreuse on its TPU outer ring. Oh, great use of chartreuse, buddy. Baby Grimm in the purple. Getting the better of that exchange, almost turning Hooligan into a Brett hat. <laughs> so Yash from Baby Grimm, this is her first time competing at NHRL, but he has competed in India before with other versions of this robot. Baby Grimm has been threatening to compete here for quite a few competitions. This is the first time they've actually been able to make it. There have been a lot of people excited about Baby Grimm coming here, and it's looking phenomenal in this fight. Hooligan, of course, brought by Jack Zapotnik. They took second place back in the January Newbot event from the University of Florida. Really cool robot. I feel like I've seen some Hooligan stuff on YouTube. I think they might have a presence there. Looks like there's some mobility issues happening now with Baby Grimm. They're yeah. not as zippy as they were when this thing first started. The hooligan's pretty much stuck on its head. Yeah, they spent almost this entire fight on their head. Not a great place for them to be. And I can't tell if any of the weapons are still working in this cage, but they're locking horns now right outside of the pink corner. Wow, nice pin in the corner there from Baby Grimm. Yash is an amazing driver, does seem to be down a weapon right now. Yeah, when that weapon goes, you don't have many options, but pinning is certainly one of them. You're allowed to hold a pin for 10 seconds before you have to back off and give your opponent an opportunity to move again, but it does look like Hooligan's able to move around the box. Ooh, maybe not with that much control while they're upside Yeah. Down. Baby Grimm is just a beautifully designed robot. There is no wasted space inside of it. Where were you seeing Baby Grimm, Kyle? Were you, was that in our Discord? Was that a Facebook thing? Uh, so there, yes, it was in the Discord quite a bit, but also they were talking about it quite a bit on their own Instagram channel. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, and so uh, I've seen this team compete before in India quite a bit. Like, if you follow any of the Indian Blanca Bots events or whatnot, this team has competed there quite a, uh, quite a bit. But now that they're in the U.S., this is their first venture into, like, real U.S. competitions, so it's cool to see them here doing this. They're actually a part of the ASML uh, kind of conglomerate. Oh, okay. That, Yash that network ASML, for ASML conglomerate is growing quite a bit. They're competition. taking over quite a bit of our pit tables out there. Yeah. So there you see Jack and there's Yash powering down their weapons, getting everything over to the door. Great first showing for Baby Grimm. So that one's going to go to the judges. All right. So that one, yeah, going to the judges. Listen, this is a tough competition to, br uh, to bring yourself into, even if you have a ton of experience like Yash does. Yeah. Um, really excited to see him pull out that first win, especially against an experienced competitor, somebody that's gotten second place at a competition here already this oh, year. Wow. Uh, granted, it was a second place at the New Bots event. I feel like you always have to put that caveat on there when it's a New Bots second place or first place. Some of the ones that come out of that New Bots event are serious robots right out the gate. Some of them are, yes, but but uh, there is a, a differential there, right? They have to be new bots. They have to be a new design. They have to be something different. They have to be new to NHRL. Correct, yes, they so do. So these bots could have existed for a decade. Outside of our system, yes, absolutely. Uh, but let's face it, the level of play here is so much higher than literally anywhere else. You know, you yeah. get some bots from other ecosystems that come in and kind of shake things up. But there's nobody iterating and doing as many competitions a year as we do and improving the designs and the driving as much as we do. It's a whole different game when you come here to play with these people. True. And our unique rule set, some people aren't used to fighting on wooden floors. So many people aren't used to fighting on wooden floors, yeah. That's very unique to kind of the East Coast of combat robotics anyway. Most of the rest of the world even uses metal floors. Uh, we like the wood floors, though. It's cool. The competition changes throughout the day as the floors kind of degrade and change. It's... it's it adds a whole new layer of complexity to things. Yeah. Plus, we get to watch our cage manager sweep. Um, yeah, and eventually you get that beautiful Bondo smell just oh, covering yeah. the entire yeah. arena. 
and fan favorite floor sander guy will come out on occasion. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, it gives the 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 arena bot something to do. Oh, by the way, something to do. We're coming right into the middle of a knife fight right here. This is Temporal <laughs> Terror versus Knife Fight. Knife Fight, the overhead attack bot. Temporal Terror in blue. Temporal Terror just dishing out some big old hits here too. Wow, look at these shots. Not much life left in the spinner on uh, Knife Fight. It sounds a little loose. Probably not getting too much engagement. And Temporal Terror just keeps giving hit after hit. Finding any angle on Knife Fight. Their forks really doing a number, getting under Knife Fight. Scraps are flying all over the place. But still managing to get back onto its feet every time it's tipped over. It's one of the benefits of an overhead attack bot. You've got that arm actuating. Uh-oh. Looks like the TPU was briefly jammed up in Temporal Terror. Now they're resting in Brett's pouch. Oh. Just having a little bit of trouble with the, uh, the drive system there. So as it stands, it looks like it's Temporal Terror's fight to lose. They're winning pretty much every exchange. And now the arm on Knife Fight is getting looser and looser. It looks like it's only held on by the wires from the brushless motor. And that's that. It's off. Three wires and it's done. And now, looks like they're stuck on their head. Oh, using the wall to get back on their feet. Nice fight needs a vacation. Everyone's high centered. Knockout. And it's a KO. Hello, hello, Luke. Hello, Sam. How are you doing? Sam, I am uh, I'm fed, I'm watered, I'm feeling uh, oh, great. Nice. Excellent. Uh, how, was, uh, how was the food? It was great. We had chicken fingers oh. for lunch. Did you get any of those? I missed those, but uh, maybe, maybe in a little They're bit. They're the exact kind of chicken fingers that you want, you know? They've got some good heft. They hold and, the sauce uh, well. Hold sauce well, yeah, they're fantastic. They kind of remind you of like uh, school lunch chicken fingers. Oh, you're really selling me on them. Yeah, yeah, you know. You ever think like, oh, I wish I could go back, have square slices of pizza and chicken fingers? Yeah, maybe chocolate milk in a yeah, little the box. Yeah, a little like, yeah, exactly. All right, I'm convinced. Yeah. I'll eat those go. chicken fingers <laughs> when they're nice and cold later on. Now, that was a great fight, a uh, knife fight, you know? I was I was taking a look, Temporal Terror here, run by uh, Team Gator Robotics from Melbourne, Florida, and uh, Adam Smith, so... There's a lot of Gator Robotics bots up there in the pits here today. Yeah, that, that crew is growing. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's very cool. You know, they are a dominant college team in Florida. They come up here to test themselves because uh, they have a tendency to win lots of competitions, lots of fights, and they want to test themselves against the best. Yeah, well, this is the place to do it, certainly, and this is the competition to do it. Yeah, I feel like um, if this is your first competition of the year, you know, like you just like to cut it close. Like you like to have no room for error. So, yes. so yeah. people thought that this one was going to be a, a bit of a more chill competition really? for some reason. Um, I think they maybe planned on coming to this one well in advance. Right. Uh, before the writing was on the wall, before we hit all our caps. Right. Right. But, uh, the the vibe is not chill. All no. right. You know, I was I was talking to Ed back in the green room, and I was saying, you know, like kind of ironically, the finals are chill. You know, like everyone's yeah. already qualified. It's all the best of the best, and it's almost like a celebration of the sport. It's a celebration of the year. Like we're giving out, you know, uh, best builder of the year awards. It's like kind of fun and lighthearted. And like, yeah, of course, someone's going to win a ton of money and go home with the golden brett. But like. 
the vibe here is just desperate, like cutthroat. Yeah. It's like, you know, there are 50 robots up there that are top tier robots and only four of them are going to get in from each weight class. And um, if you're one of those 50, you are not unsticking your opponent. You might be attacking the house spot. You might be allowing your opponent to die. Like there are a lot of moves that I'm seeing here in this, this competition where it's like, these are yeah. people who want to advance. Absolutely. So we're going to go ahead and check up in the pits with Good. Chris. He's with Jason Vasquez up there. How you doing, Chris? Hey guys. Yeah, I'm here with Jason Vasquez and sidewalk slammer. Jason, I got the aim team behind me. Love it when students are coming out. Uh, now, Jason, this bot, Sidewalk Slammer, was actually part of a uh, an NHRL grant for the school, and that's the reason why you were able to build this, and this is its very first competition ever. Can you tell us a little bit about the grant, the bot, and AIM? Yeah, absolutely. So AIM is the American Institute of Mechatronics Engineers Club. So um, we're all mechatronics students for the most part, and this robot is more of an experiment. It's something I wanted to learn from and try something new. And um, when you have grant money and you're a student, it makes sense to try these new designs and really just try and push the envelope and uh, try something new. Now, for those of you out there who don't really see what's going on here, take a close look at this robot. This robot enters the match as a vertical spinner. Then on a servo motor, pulls a pin out like a grenade, allowing the entire weapon mechanism to drop into a horizontal configuration. This is such a bizarre and awesome concept. I want to know, what was your inspiration for this? Thank you so much. So um, there's actually a builder, uh, Jerry from Smashbots, who uh, did this in an ant weight, but um, he actuated it. So he had a big mechanism making the weapon rotate. And um, I didn't like that. So I wanted to make it where I prioritized all the weight to the weapon and the drive, like I usually would. And then just had something small that switched it from one to the other, taking advantage of gyro and gravity. Now, it, again, it's so awesome having you and the folks from AIM uh, out here to compete. We hope that you guys keep coming, and it's been a pleasure having you, and good luck today in the competition. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be here. All right. Thank All right. you, Chris. We're going to head over to Cage One and one of our most terrifying 30-pounders in the competition, Corey Nason and Synthesis 30. Now, you can see Corey there in the blue corner and running Crash Fest as his minibot facing off against Warlock from the University of Maryland over there in the pink corner. Now, Warlock was five, violently disassembled four, in its first three, fight of the day. We're gonna see if two, Synthesis can violently one, disassemble fight, this opponent once fight. again. I'm excited. Now, you can hear that Ooh. death hum from Synthesis. It is vibrating inside of the, uh, the box. And is that little crash vest pushing on the back of Warlock? Good box rush from Crash Fest, <laughs> crossing just an absolute ocean of space here at this uh, this large box, and uh, actually doing pretty decent. It's a tough place to be for Crash Fest between two big vertical spinners. One of the big things I'm looking for from Synthesis 30 is roofing. This is the amount of power on this single tooth uh, disc is it's, it's huge. I hope he can get the bite he needs. It looks like his drive is a little off. But it looks like the weapon on Warlock is just down. There is no weapon. And they have successfully pinned uh, this, this robot here into a little ice cream sandwich. Pinning for both edges. And I just don't know if the geometry is correct for Synthesis to get a big, big hit here. Grinding That's action something. there. Yeah, the weapon on Warlock is Come dead. On. Warlock, it looks like everything's dead on Warlock. We're seeing some aggressive tapping there on the back of Warlock from Crash Fest. Wow, 90 seconds left here in this fight. Warlock is dead. Now, as long as they continue to engage, the uh, referee cannot start the count out because it's just technically a pin. All right, looks like they got an unstick, in air quotes. Yes. But I don't know if it's going to do anything for them. The power is out on, uh, on Warlock, and Crash Fest is coming in, patting its opponent to death. Here's that count out. 
All right. Now this may be the last fight Knock of the out. day of the season for Warlock. Warlock uh, run by the University of Maryland Leatherbacks team. And uh, it is going to have to come back in 2024, hopefully improved. They've improved a lot so far. I, I remember them fighting in 2021. Yeah. And they barely got it together. And they, they have potential, I think. Now on over to cage two, we've got Polly Whip here in the pink corner facing off against Purple Pain. Now these are upstate New Yorkers on both sides of the box. Polly Whip is from the Hudson Valley and Drew Davis and his sons are from Schenectady. Awesome. Now we see this overhead shot of Polly Five, Whip in the pink corner four, three, and Purple Pain two, is appropriately one, the purple five, robot, robot in the pink five. corner. Good box rush from the minibot of Bug. Purple Pain getting under Polly Whip, landing a good pin and a good pop. Polly Whip trying to find the sides of Purple Pain. Now the Davis boys are incredibly good at remaining squared up with their opponent. They've had a lot of drive practice with their dad. P tipping Polly Whip up against the rail. It Can is only. incredible to see that much control out of a vert, Sam. Yeah, if, I mean, if your forks are on point, then, then you can really control the fight. That ground game is so crucial for being in control. Now, this is the last chance for both of these robots to qualify. I know that Polly Whip was on the wait list. Um, they, they didn't make the, uh, the initial run of the uh, Beetleweight cap, and they were so happy when they got into the, uh, into the field. You know, for them, they are desperate to qualify. They've been grinding at this competition, and Hollywood is just a big old sledgehammer. Now they're struggling with that left side drive, it looks like. Weapons still spinning on both robots, though. We got some hums going. Now, yeah, I'm seeing movement from, from both sides of Purple Pain. Ooh, another good pop. But that aggressive driving that you typically see from the Davis family just isn't here in this match. Hollywood, although it is impaired, it is making connection with its opponent. 70 seconds left in this fight. Purple Pain trying uh -oh. to gyro itself back onto its feet. That sounds like an upright issue on the spinner of Polly Whip. Yeah, you can hear that spinner bumping along the floor. That means that something is in balance there, and that spinner really doesn't want to be touching the floor at all. There. Good head. It looks like Drew Davis is only filming. His, both his sons are driving this to go around. Yeah, Purple Pain is, uh, is built by the Davis boys, and um, Cameron and Julian here, you know, they are uh, they are designing this robot, building it with their dad. It's a very cool family project. 30 seconds left here in this fight. Holly Whip's weapon is down. That collision with the house bot killed the weapon. But they will take it the full three minutes. This one will go to the judges. Well done there. Oh, Not yeah. a knockout. It's going to be a judge's decision, but I think this may be a win for Purple Pain. I think I'm gonna be with you on that one. Good fight there. Now, DJ with Polly Whip, you're not gonna believe this, but uh, last night I bought a jar of pickles from the Polly Whip team. They had uh, them all set up there and you could purchase them in uh, Eight ounces or sixteen ounces. Okay. So I've got. What'd you some, end up uh, getting? I've got like uh, the the like the the butter butter chips, you know, like those. Like bread and butter pickles. Bread, bread and butter bread and butter pickles. Oh, yeah. Nice. I haven't cracked it open yet. I haven't tried them, but they looked amazing through the glass. All right. <laughs> How do you feel about pickles on a breakfast sandwich? Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Like a uh, bacon, egg, and cheese and pickles, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just curious. Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, pickles and chicken nuggets. Okay. I'm right, going to have to try that. We're going to take a peek into cage <laughs> three. 
Where is that? Wow. Lynx? This is Calvin, Eba, and Lynx facing off against minimum viable products. Now, Lynx has not yet qualified for the finals, but to do so, he's going to have to go through Brandon Unger and his hub motor spinner, minimum viable products. Now, Calvin Eba is hungry to qualify here, and he's now entered the single elimination portion of the competition. If he loses, he is out. How the light's looking in this one. Yeah, they are, they are looking uh, attached, Sam. You and I, we were uh, calling the Catastrophe 2 Lynx fight uh, when the lights came down, and, uh, and we, we found ourselves caught in the controversy. Yeah. Um, I'm so glad that Calvin was able to make it back out here, though. Uh, yeah. And give it another go. I want to see him at final, or at championship this November. Yeah. yeah. It would really shake the field if he wasn't able to qualify here today because, you know, the, the Beatle finals would be really, really different. Calvin has taken home first place in the last two NHRL finals, and he took home second place in uh, that third one uh, way back in 2020. This is the top-ranked Beatle on the planet. And so he lost to Droopy back in the first one? 2020, he lost to Droopy. Exactly. So, you know, when you take a look at his loophole-esque robot, you have all three NHRL champions in the Beatles for that, for that robot, which is intimidating. It is intimidating, but yeah. who knows? Maybe they'll lose to an, a kit bot. Oh, yeah, exactly. Maybe a cam lifter. Maybe that. <laughs> All right, we're, uh, we're here, we're, we're waiting for this match to start. I just love the anticipation, you know? Like, we're about to see an incredible fight here. Now, these are BattleBots uh, builders on both sides of the box. Calvin Eba, of course, is the driver of Mad Catter. Brandon Unger has competed on BattleBots with Pain Train and with Shredded Bro. Brandon is a Norwalk native. He lives and works here in Norwalk. Uh, works as an engineer. Calvin is an engineer from Southern California. Works five, on the satellite four, program. Three, um, good to be an engineer and fighting two, robots. One, yeah. Five, it helps. Robots fight. Oh, good fast startup. But uh, Calvin is finding those seams in the floor. Popping minimum viable products here onto its, uh, onto its head. Calvin is not afraid of going weapon to weapon in this match. He's intent on breaking that hub motor spinner, which is a very difficult thing to do. That is a good pin. Tipping minimum viable oh, nice product up against the rail. Brandon doesn't need the save. He was able to gyro himself off. So that purple mini bot is on the minimum viable product team. Ooh, and that is a good pin from minimum viable products mini bot. Now they can hold that pin for 10 seconds. You can hear that absolutely gorgeous sound. That is from Lynx. The weapon on minimum viable product is down. And I don't see Lynx spinning either, Luke. The thing that I've been watching for here today is conservative driving and conservative competing from Calvin Eba. Now, uh, one of the challenges of running your weapon at super high speeds for the entire three minutes is that you could burn it out, and that is going to count as damage against you. Now, that's another good pin here from Brandon. Calvin Eba is being outdriven by Brandon Unger in this fight. Incredible. 90 seconds left here. Halfway through. Now, Calvin would love to knock out the drive on minimum viable product. Now, that's going to be difficult to do with this armored skirt around those wheels. Another good yeah. pin. Sam! I'm used to such a different driving style from Calvin. The real zippy forward and backwards, flopping turns, and I'm not seeing any of that. I, I don't think that it's a problem with the robot. I think that it, well, oh, I don't know. It's He's going like backwards, Struggling to go forwards. Wow. You can see a weapon blade there on the floor. Now, that is from off of the mini bots from Minimum Viable Products. But it does look like the drive on Lynx is impaired. He can really only go backwards here. 
This must be why Minimum Viable Product is able to land so many long pins. Wow. Lynx is hobbled here in this fight as we enter the last 30 seconds. It looks like they might be taking it to the judges with pin after pin after pin wow. from Minimum Viable Product. He's still able to turn a little bit. Yeah, he's getting a tiny bit of forward translation. I wonder if that is maybe just vibration from the weapon itself. Oh, good point, good point. But they've taken it the full three minutes. It's going to go to the judges. Calvin, I'm sure, is sweating here. We've I got bet. drive that's uh, been impaired on one side, and we've got a dead weapon or two weapons on the other side. This is a do or die moment here for Calvin Eba. The judges are going to be deciding who advances. It looks like they called for a functionality test so the judges can see at the end of the match who's mobile, whose weapon works. Uh, it looks like they're doing that now. Now we can see Calvin Eba there standing cage side with Matt Vasquez, the captain of Whiplash on BattleBots. These are two Southern California builders. They flew in here together. They're good friends. They fight a lot uh, together uh, down in Southern California with Scar. And uh, if you're based in Southern California, go out and check out one of these competitions. They put on a really, really good uh, show. Yeah. Down there. Yeah. And they do really well at NHRL tournaments as well. That, that West Coast contingency is a, a tough crowd to beat. So it looks like the functionality tests have ended. The judges saw everything they need to see. And we're just going to be waiting for them to deliberate. It is tough when it comes down to damage because um, losing a weapon is a little worse than losing your drive. But we saw incredible control from Brandon Unger. Now, um, if he takes it on control, I don't think you can be mad about that outcome. I mean, like, we saw lots of long pins there on links. Yeah. It's, it's, whew. But it's close. It's I'm not nervous. going to be like a just fully stacked card one way or the other. Comes down, maybe it could come down to aggression. Like if control goes to minimum viable product and damage goes to, well, maybe it's split. Maybe it's split, but how I feel like aggressive I'm talking can you be when you're into, only running backwards? I feel like I'm talking myself into a Lynx loss here, which is wild. I mean, it's, it happened last time. It could be the final match of the season for Lynx. That is crazy if that happens here. Yeah. Wow, okay. Now the judges are deliberating. They're going to tell us here shortly who is advancing. But uh, if this happens, this absolutely shakes up the structure of the Beetleweights in the finals in November. Wow. Ooh. Well. Okay. I, I, are oh, they telling you? Have yeah. they told you? Oh, Luke, I heard. I, I'm hearing nothing Minimum through my Minimum viable through my heads. product. What? Yep, they won that one. Lynx lost. Okay. Lynx has been eliminated. This is the final match of the year for Lynx. I'm going to give a good round of applause to uh, Calvin Eba and Lynx. Now, technically, Lynx is halfway in because he is still alive with Booty Brigade. Um, but uh, these chances, these invitations, they are slipping away um, with each one of these losses. So Booty Brigade is in the, the single elimination yep. portion? OK. Yeah. So that's it. Yes. One loss left. Correct. Wow. OK. Lynx uh, has been eliminated. They will not be appearing at the finals. And that really shakes up the field in November. Yeah. Wow. Wild to see it live. OK. <laughs> yeah, Luke. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, was not expecting that? No, I, uh, I, I'm not getting any radio traffic here in my, uh, my headset. So uh, yeah, Four, this is great. Three, uh, we're going to go over to cage two, one. We've got uh, Tartarus five, facing off against the Yoblins. Now, the Yoblins here are uh, this multi-bot in the blue corner. And uh, Tartarus is the robot that has yet to exit the pink corner.
It's tough to win when you can't leave the corner. Uh, yeah. But it looks like it's just starting to... All right, there go. we go. We're getting a little bit of motion here from Tartarus. Tartarus is a robot from Carnegie Mellon Combat Robotics, run by Varen there from... And you just heard a little bit of metal. That sounded like it might have been a weapon. Oh, yeah. You can see all three weapons are still attached to all three robots. Oh, you know what it was? It was the uh, it was one one of the um, the wedge plates from off of Tartarus. Okay. The Yabas ripped that off. That is a large amount of damage. That's pretty good. Wow, I saw a wheel go rolling. Yeah. It's tough to see who these all belong to. I saw another wheel go rolling. Are those Yoblin wheels? Or I it... think that Yoblin is losing its wheels. Like piece by piece almost? Yeah. It's tough fighting a multi-bot for Tartarus there. It's like uh, going after a single fish in a school. Um, and it looks like he's upended. Currently, the Yoblin's dancing around as he gets unstuck by Fluffy. Beautiful unstick there, great job. One Yoblin struggling a little bit, not really moving outside of its perimeter. The green Yoblin, though, taking it directly to Tartarus. It looks like they're losing traction rings or some sort of silicon band on their, their tires for the Yoblins. Now, with the multibot, Sam, you've got to kill both multibots, right? Just it's not <laughs> enough to get, kill one, like, is that right? More than half of the weight, the oh. total weight. Now, what if they're uh, the same weight, Sam? Well, then you got to get them both. Okay, got it. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge amount of damage, knocking out one half of your opponent's robot. Absolutely. And uh, Tartarus just really trying to capitalize here in the last 20 seconds of this fight. Trying to knock out this last Yoblin. But I'm going to give it to Chris Rubble and the Yoblins. You know, they've been showing some pretty good control yeah, in this I'm, fight. I'm really impressed with those little guys. One teeny tiny multibot left. Now, as we tick down the final seconds of this match, this one will go to the judges. All right, I'm sold on the Yoblins. I like them. I think they're cool looking. They got a little bit of old school boxiness to them. Yeah. It looks like something that you could cut in your garage. Yeah, on a, on a table saw. Yeah, yeah. A lot of really right angles. See that. Wow, all right, so we can see the Carnegie Mellon team there. They've got their, uh, their team jerseys on and everything. It's great. Now, Carnegie Mellon, it's one of the best schools in the country for robotics, and uh, it's cool to see them building combat robots. Wow. It is cool. Yeah. The, the, it's, I love seeing all the new groups getting into combat robotics and going hard in combat robotics, getting yeah. excited, spreading the love, getting their friends involved too. It, it's the best way to, to have this sport grow, word yeah. of mouth in a way, just sharing your excitement with the people around you. Now, Sam, I see a unicorn here standing cage side. Now, I think that that must mean the Tim Hebert from Brandeis University is in the box with Chubby Unicorn. Gotta love it. Chubby Unicorn facing off against Val Kinney. Now this is a um, oh, from team the Valkyrie, Valkyrie team. undercutter. Who'd have thunk it? Yeah, now uh, Team Valkyrie, they really like their undercutters and they are continuing to experiment with this uh, robot type here in 2023. Hopefully bringing a lot of these learnings back to their 250 pound battle bot. Yeah, it looks like they might be able to learn more than more from this one. It's it's a lot more similar to Valkyrie than Kablooey Tango. Yeah. Rocking the four wheel drive. Now Chubby Unicorn is an incredibly highly ranked beetle weight. Now mm -hmm. Chubby Unicorn is ranked number three of all time. And oh Ooh. big hands just roofing his opponents. Valkyrie hitting the roof twice. Now getting popped behind the house spots. 
Now, one of the things that you're looking for with Tim Hebert is just massive concussive hits. The rock, paper, scissors here does favor Chubby Unicorn if they can continue to get under that undercutter. Able to self right with the wall there. Chubby Unicorn back on its feet. Val Kitty is on its head and it's become an overhead spinner. Ooh, good gyro back onto its feet. Good job. Now, Tim Hebert has already qualified for the finals. We're going to be seeing him in November no matter what. But he would love to get some additional drive practice in, dial in his, uh, his settings to really set himself up for success uh, in a month and a half. Well, he's certainly going all around the arena, making sure to try out every square inch. 60 in seconds down in this fight, another two minutes left. Still some solid pops from Chubby Unicorn. Yeah, these are really good hits. You can see Val Kitty really spending quite a bit of time in the air. Ooh. It looks like the drive on Val Kitty is suffering here. Someone's weapon dropped a few octaves. Yeah, it sounds like uh, one of these weapons is dragging along the floor. 90 seconds left here in this fight. That's got to be Val Kitty's weapon with the way they're drifting now. Yeah, Val Kitty looks like it's just uh, translating like a hovercraft across the, uh, like an impaired hovercraft, I should say, Sam. Both robots a touch impaired. It looks like the left side drive on Chubby Unicorn is having some issues. Now here with a minute left in this fight, both of these uh, roboteers are trying to line up one more big hit. I'm sure that Chubby Unicorn would like nothing more than to get one more roofing under its belt. Now Chubby is moving so quickly that I can't really tell if the weapon is still running. Is it running, Sam? I think it Let is. Let me squint. I can't tell. Yeah. I think so, though. Because they, they're still gyroing when they turn. True, good point there. 30 seconds left here in this fight. And I can hear counting. What is the counting for, Sam? Uh, is there a, a pin happening? No. I think it has to leave its perimeter, Val Kitty, and, and so it's okay. Val Kitty being counted out. Wow, that is a knockout. I believe that your winner is Chubby Unicorn. Knockout. Not bad. See a good shot here of Ashley Beckman in the uh, unicorn onesie. Tim Hebert here in teal. Tim uh, entered this competition with an incredible 26 and 10 record across the past seven events. He is a golden dumpster winner, uh, taking home a golden dumpster in March. Now, we've seen just incredible performance upgrades from Chubby Unicorn, and uh, there is no question in my mind why he is sitting at the top of the rankings. Tim has built a very tough little tanky robot here in Chubby Unicorn. I hate to make the Lynx comparison, but it, it is very Lynx-esque. The uh, geometry is Yeah, similar. the narrowness of it. Yeah, like the length. It feels like, like the length is a little too long. All right, I can see up in the pits, Chris, Standing uh, there with Calvin yes. Eba. Yeah, guys, I'm, I'm here with Calvin Eba and Lynx. Uh, obviously, j an absolute slugfest between you and MVP. Now, I know that Lynx is relatively unchanged component-wise here in the last few years. Tell us what exactly happened in that match. What needs to get repaired on this? Tell us, tell us about the breakdown of exactly what we saw. So, I suspect, I mean, I don't see any visible damage. Uh, to Lynx or the drivetrain. Um, so I suspect that it's just this, you know, two and a half year old ESC that I've been running for ho however many fights. I think most of probably seven or eight or nine competitions now. Um, just got too tired. It seems like a FET uh, shorted out because there's some resistance in the motor. Um, I think the gearbox is fine. I think mechanically it's all fine. But uh, it was just, you know, too many, uh, too many runs, too many, too many events, too many hard hits uh, it, for CSC. And like I said, an absolute slugfest. It must have come down in the judges' eyes to a single point because MVP had like two weapons down. You were having some drive issues. So really, what do you think that the, the points fell as far as control and aggression? 
I mean, for me, I think drive is always more important than w weapon. So me having a drive side down uh, really hurt my effectiveness, uh, whereas they were still fully driving, even though both their weapons were down. Um, so it's, it's understandable, and uh, I hope to you know, continue further with Booty Brigade. Yeah, well, the day is not over. Obviously, Booty Brigade, unlike Lynx, has seen some some upgrades, at least to the rear armor package uh, that we see on the back of this thing. Uh, you know, that that looks like it could probably take a hit or two. Yeah, I mean, hopefully it never gets touched. Uh, that might, you know, lead to some legal stuff. But, uh, yeah, this is a fresh new build. I had no spare parts for it. So this is a brand new ESC, um, so hopefully it lasts a little longer um, and I can get, uh, you know, go, go far with it. Well, best of luck to you and Booty Brigade. You know, uh, still lots of night left potentially for the, for the both of you and Tommy. So good luck. I'm back to you guys. All right. A wow. tough loss for Calvin E. Ben Lynx. I, I'm still trying to process what this means for the field in November for the Beatles. Clearly, we're going to have a new Golden Dumpster winner. Is the shoe in now, Jameson Go, who's won second place um, at the finals in the Beatles in the past? Or are we going to be crowning a brand new champion, someone who we haven't seen before? You know, it's, five, it's really interesting. Four, All right, three, we're going to go here two, to our next fight. One, I believe this is fight, a cage four. fight. Sidewalk slammer and great times. Wow. Big heavy hit from Sidewalk Slammer on Great Times. Wow. Out. Look at that. One and done. Oh. Yeah, okay. Sidewalk Slammer advancing. Great Times having not so great times in that fight. Well, I'm glad we didn't blink for that one. Yeah. Sidewalk Slammer, really interesting. You could see at the, uh, the end of that match, he pulled the pin just to, to, uh, to test it. Okay. Um, really kind of going from a vert to a horizontal. It's an interesting design. And the namesake makes sense. It slammed down when it pulled that pin. Yeah, slammed right there on the sidewalk. There you go. Pretty cool. Yeah, very cool. Um, you know, like one of those big things that you're looking for is just like these heavy hits, like where the, the opponent is flipping up in the air and then just lands with a big kerplunk. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the landings, they sound different in uh, the big cages. And uh, you can really tell when it's been a big heavy hit. Oh, yeah. Um, and there's tons of things that you can just unplug uh, in one of those hits because there's a ton of uh, energy that's being dumped into your opponent. Absolutely. We're going to pop over to cage five now. Five. Uh, where we've got Book Funt and two, Happy Apple. One. Fight. Happy Apple, Robots what a great fight. name. Book Funt in the pink square. Yeah, Book Funt is this conventional finger technique eater with the orange wheels. Happy Apple. There is this interesting long, thin robot with the tiny wheels. Sam, it's almost like that thing doesn't weigh three pounds. It looks like it might be two and a half or something. Why it would they do that? It just looks minuscule. It's, yeah, that carbon fiber it's top It's like armor. a lynx that's been put on a diet. Wow. Getting pinned in the blue corner. Oh, what is the wheel situation on Happy Apple? I don't know. Is it, those I think it's missing two tires, actually. Oh, those are okay. just hubs. Wow. I mean, great mobility for being down two tires. Especially on the same side. Oops, fun. They're stuck. Well. And uh, here comes the house bot to come in and save. Thank you, Bart, for your service. Wow, one of the eyes on Bart is out. He might be in wi or, uh, wink mode. Yeah, wink mode. There you go. Now, Oops Funt here uh, is just twisting in uh, up against the rail. Happy Apple down to uh, to tires, not wheels. Tires. It's still translating fairly well here in this fight. Happy Apple run by Alex Lang from the University of Maryland Leatherbacks team. Now, uh, this robot has gone 0 and 2 Knock across uh, the past event, so this is their first, first win, win here at NHRL with this robot. That's exciting for them. Now, Alex has built three robots in the past, and uh, the thing I really like about Alex is that he names the robots after himself. So uh, they're saying, oh, here's Alex Wang loading into the box with Alex Wang. So. Uh, you know, branding is important in this sport, yeah, you know? Do you yeah. think you could ever run a robot just called Sam Hansen, you know? 
I don't know. I, I enjoy making the names for robots, and so my name's boring. I, I want to come up with something fun or menacing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I feel like, like I have lots of conversations. Like, oh, I've got to write that down. Uh, that, may, that would make a great robot name, you know? Yeah. All right. Okay. So it now, looks like we're going to take a break now um, and come back and restart the 30-pound tournament. So um, we're going to see you in a minute. Don't go anywhere. Good afternoon and welcome back to the action here at September NHRL, the final bot down. My name's Luke Stengel, this is Sam Hansen here, uh, joining me in the broadcasting booth. We have finished our qualifying rounds and we are ready to kick off the tournament for the 30 pounders. Now the tournament has been going on for the threes and the 12s so far, but this is uh, really the start of the tournament for the 30s. From this point forward, every single 30 pound fight that you see is do or die. The loser will be going home out of the competition. We're gonna check in here first with Chris, who is up in the pits. Hello, Chris. Hey guys, absolutely pandemonium. People are kind of stepping over me. Uh, absolutely crazy morning that we've had so far. We've seen some of our best bots getting knocked out. We see some of the bots that are, like we're kind of clawing their way to the world championships, uh, but you have not yet secured that spot that are still in, uh, that they're still in this. And so you can see we got an ocean of people still here. Uh, the fights are just going, going, going. It's gonna be an exciting evening. Back to you guys. All right, thanks, Chris. We are gonna start this 30-pound tournament off with QVO and Spare Parts. They're hopping into cage one, and I'm excited to see what sort of mess is left in the box after this one. Yeah, now, uh, this is a little bit of um, David and Goliath action, I would say, but it's, it's reversed in terms of size. Yeah. Uh, QVO here is this small black robot from Brazil making its way over to the pink corner. Spare Parts was, as of last night, a microwave from a thrift store. And uh, it, it got a complete makeover this morning in the pits. This is a robot that has been alive for four or five hours, Sam. Well, it's looking good, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed <laughs> and ready to experience uh, Violent disassembly. <laughs> yeah. All the fun that Brazil brings up to these fighting robot tournaments. <gasps> yeah, Kyuyo here. Uh, you can see they are absolutely, um, absolutely focused on advancing. This is run by Enrique Oliveira. Five, four, three, two. With One Team Warrior. Fight. Robots fight. Now, a good spinner from QEO. Oh, wow. Spare parts has a uh, drill that's functioning. Here right we go. <laughs> oh, my Tipping God. Tipping spare parts onto its side. <sighs> Will they hit him again, though? Please hit him again. QEO uh, needs to advance here, Sam. <laughs> now, they have uh, disabled their opponents. We're going to go in for the young stick. 
but I don't think it's going to help. Buffy has just helpfully pushed spare parts back into its starting square. If spare parts was somehow able to miraculously get back onto its feet, I'd be hyped, Sam. Yeah, I think maybe the, the real spare parts is going to come out of the microwave <laughs> and blow everyone away. Yeah, it's a compact vert <laughs> and uh, just breaks through its shell. That would be great. Now, interestingly, I was talking to the builder of spare parts and he was saying, I think I'm going to do tangential drive. And that was this morning at about 8 o'clock, you know? All right, QEO coming back in for some more carnage. Thank you very much. We love it. And it is tangential drive. It just doesn't Check look out. like there's much friction between the, the, the drive The geometry wheel. of a microwave is not good for a combat robot. <laughs> look at that tangential drive. I love it. <laughs> wow. Well. Okay. The builders here of spare parts, they are here for fun. And uh, they just went up against a very highly ranked competitive robot from Brazil. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, if you got to lose to someone, that's a cool team to lose to. Yeah. I asked the, uh, the builders of spare parts if they had taken out, like, kind of the dangerous guts of the microwave, and they said they had, you know, like the kind of part that creates radiation. So, yeah. The, you know, we've got a lot of kids in the audience. You know, you got to... Gotta be responsible. Yeah. Uh, I told them that uh, for like kind of version three of the robot, they should uh, kind of like make a um, microwave turntable that's kind of battery powered and have like maybe like a popcorn bag just going through that. You know, you're. You know what I'm yeah, I about. mean, why, why would they not? Yeah. Um, even though you just said microwaves are a bad form for a bad form factor for oh, fighting it's robots. Yeah. Is there like a something else that yeah, they yeah, could yeah. use from a thrift store? Like I don't, I don't like know. a like a mechanized coffee pot or something. Yeah, yeah. or some sort of uh, I don't know a vacuum, a Hoover oh, of some vacuum. sort. Yeah. Not not a Roomba necessarily, no. but but something a little more old school, handheld. Yeah. Yeah, something with ground game. Yeah, ground game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love the build ethos. They put themselves to a hard cost cap of $100, and the microwave was 45 bucks at the thrift store. Okay. I, is, I, don't, I haven't bought a microwave That is a ever. very bad price for a microwave. Like, I think it should be like 10 bucks. Okay. But they were like, oh, I, uh, we didn't want to go to a second thrift store and kind of shop around. And Just can pick you up haggle this at, at a thrift store? I mean, I can. Oh, you can. Yeah, I'm my mother's son, okay, you know? I can I can haggle over anything, you know? All right. Yeah. I mean, listen, the thrift store got it for free. What are you, what are you doing that's selling a, for 45 <laughs> bucks, This you is know? exactly what you'd be doing in the thrift store yeah. if they tried to charge you $45? 45, yeah. This is thing new is maybe $50, you know? <laughs> Sell sorts of food inside of this thing. It's awful. What am know? I paying for this? Residue, Right, yeah. It was funny. They were telling me that uh, they were talking to the thrift store workers, and they were like, do you think that this microwave could uh, withstand, like, a flamethrower? And they were like, what are you doing with our microwave? <laughs> <laughs> That's why it was $45. Yeah, like, right. Oh, they're like, oh, we got to jack this. up the price a little bit. Yeah. You know, this is clearly unsafe. <laughs> All right, Luke. Let's see some robot fights. All right, uh, we're going to head over to Cage 4. Now, this is, I believe, Brazilian on Brazilian action with Chibata. Now, Chibata here is in orange, facing off against Dark Chaos. Now, Chibata, of course, run by Rato, um, our streamer, YouTube content creator extraordinaire from Brazil, facing off against Dark Chaos. Now, Dark Chaos here is a team UFO combat robot. Okay. And so. uh, Dark Chaos is a four-wheel drive hub motor spinner running tangential drive. Uh, Ratto is running a Five, horizontal. Four, now, this is a do-or-die three, moment here. Two, one of these robots will one. be escaping the box. The other robots will be eliminated fight. for the season. Now, Chibata in orange. Ooh, good hit there, My Chibata. Goodness. Love that hit. Chibata up on its side. It sounds like a saw in there, like a band saw, man. Yeah. Rip it away at a log. That would be Dark Chaos upside down. Their drum is touching the floor. Ooh, and look at that. Dark Chaos tipped up against the rail, able to get itself off. Ooh, another big hit. Chibata is on its head, up against an angle. 
Giant Chaos crashing into the uh, the rail, missing that big hit. Dark Chaos is going to be doing its best to try and hit the back of Jibata. Jibata is going to be doing its best not to give him the rear. Yeah, Dark Chaos, I can see, lining itself up for a big hit. You Jibata. really have to have a lot of faith in your weapon to go weapon on weapon. Ooh, good hit there from Dark Chaos. That might have added some friction on the right side drive for Dark Chaos. You can see them uh, doing a little bit of a crab off there. Bits of the rail are in the box, and that is a hazard to avoid. You don't want to get high centered on a, on a piece of wood from the rail. I see a peeled up piece of ciabatta there. Yeah, ciabatta is suffering here. Uh oh, there's Ooh, a wheel. I can see a wheel. That's a dark chaos wheel. So he's still got three more. Yes. Yeah, that rear wheel on the right hand side. The benefit of running four wheels, you can lose a couple of them. Uh oh, oh is, is that, that another, another wheel? <laughs> uh -oh. Wow, That's it a... might be. Dark Chaos might be dying. This might be Chabada. Is it Chabada? I can see the builder of Dark Chaos. Oh. Wow, exhaling. It looks like with 55 seconds left, your winner is Rato and Chabada. Awesome. Wow. Oh, some disappointment from the UFO team, but, oh. Ooh. Oh. Dark chaos eliminated for the season. I love to see so many Brazilian teams here. I hope that dark chaos is back for 2024. A good hug there from Gabriel Bertozzi from uh, Team Black Dragon on BattleBots. But uh, that is a knockout. Chibata is your winner. Knockout. All right. You know, in uh, Dark Chaos's first fight, or its earlier fight, uh, Doug and Chibata were right there on the floor with them, helping yes. them get it going. So these, these teams, I don't know how good this feels for Rato. Uh, it is always tough to fight your friends. And it's tough to send your friends home when everyone yes. wants to qualify. Yeah. But they're hugging it out. It's love. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Cage 4 is looking haggard, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, like we've seen massive chunks being taken out of Cage 4, and uh, it is something to be concerned about if you're going into that box, you know. Uh, the rails are not uh, perfectly flush <laughs> anymore, you know, and uh, yeah, Aww. it's tough. All right, we're going to go over to Cage 3 here. Uh, we've got Noob Tube. Facing off against IDK Retro. I don't know. This is the meanest roll of wrapping paper I've ever seen. It is gorgeous. It looks like a peppermint candy stick, don't you think? <laughs> uh, is that its quarter? Nope. Nope. It's uh, attacking its opponent early, Sam. Noob Tube, not famous for driving well. Yeah, I mean, it's a little chaotic, I'd say. Now let's see if Noob Tube can make its way over to the pink square. Ooh. Oh boy. Now the mechanism for Noob Tube, the weapon and the driver are linked somehow. Yeah, so the uh, the the motors are are safely ensconced inside of the tube. And so uh, the entire robot spins. There's a titanium blade that runs along the length of the tube. And uh, that, that motion Five, uh, four, makes it move. Three, okay. Now, the nice thing is it's a very One, tough design. Five, There's no belt to snipe. Oh, good. Ooh. Fast speed from IDK Retro. Yeah, that was a box run. Holy smokes, it's a very active fight. New tube tank it, still got the spin going. Now, the big thing to do is to slow down Noob Tube. That whole body is running a massive titanium blade. But this is a street fight. Wow. IDK Retro not afraid at all of this, this tube going in and grouping oh. its opponent. They're mostly getting the broad side of Noob Tube, so I, I wouldn't be afraid either. Wow, big heavy hits. You can, you can hear Noob Tube landing. It just sounds heavy. IDK Retro staying on top of its opponent. Uh, Minibot saw the roof. Just hunting his, his prey here. IDK Retro has not looked this good in 
several competitions. Incredibly aggressive driving here. IDK Retro run by Chris Mueller from Pittsfield, Massachusetts, from Team Pandemonium. Yeah, entering this competition with a one and three record, and uh, it is going to be exiting this competition with something considerably better if they can keep up this drive quality. Yeah, but Nuketube holding its own, taking those shots pretty well, still spinning. I mean, you can't you can't ask for much more than from a mean Noob, foul roll. Yeah, Nuketube is incredibly tough. Wow, I just love the durability of this robot. It's able to take an incredible amount of punishment. I'm curious what the tube's made of. They can see this junior pint-sized driver here running the mini bot on Noob Tube. 50 seconds left here in this fight. Both teams are getting hype and smiling. I love this, Luke. This has been a knockdown drag out fight here. Incredible driving from IDK Retro. Just big cuts and hits from Noob Tube. This has been really, really fun to watch. 30 seconds left here in this fight. Wow, this violent wrapping paper tube is doing great. They're gonna take it the full three minutes here as we tick down to the final 10 seconds. They've survived and they're gonna be taking it to the judges. IDK Retro trying to show just a bit more aggression before wow. the, uh, before the the match ends here. That's so awesome. And that is the fight. Wow, incredibly good driving from IDK Retro. Yeah. It's can not see easy. Kevin Biagini there, very happy with Chris's performance. That Kevin robot was track, zippy. It was cracking. Noob Tube seems so hard, and, and he did a great job of it. Because Noob Tube is unpredictable, I'd say, at, at best. Yeah, you can see Chris there just kind of showing, you know, the uh, vibration in his hands. All right, let's take a look here at this replay. IDK Retro just showing incredible driving here. And staying on top of his opponent, showing great control, showing great aggression. And both that of these robots man. basically rolled out of here at the same condition they came in. So, scoring very little damage on both sides of the box. That just shows the toughness of these two robots. Incredible. Mm. All right, let's hop over to cage six, where, uh-oh, is that the Booty Brigade? I can see the Booty Brigade is in the box. This is another do-or-die fight here for Calvin Eba and uh, Droopy Builder. Tommy Wong. Tommy Wong, yes. And they're going up against Scab Armor. Now, Scab Armor is a uh, Team Bad Crew Fingertech Beater Bar kit bot. Bad Crew, that's the team behind Apex, is it not? Apex is their premier robot, yeah, but it's an educational program here in Norwalk. Now, there's a lot of kids here in the Norwalk area that sign up for the Bad Group program. Okay. And uh, the, one of the cool things is they allow you to drive. So I feel like they have maybe six or seven robots, and uh, Apex is the only one that's really just Roberts. Uh, ah, everyone gotcha. else gets to kind of try out Oopfant and Beefan, um, and uh, it's a really, really great program for kids here locally. Well, here's hoping Robert was able to teach them a little bit about uh, beating this loophole-style robot. Yeah, uh, it is difficult to do that. Loophole uh, is 3.1 pounds on one side of the box, uh, on one side, and 2.9 pounds on the other. And uh, just by exploiting the interesting rule set here at NHRL, they're able to run essentially two full three-pound beetle weights in there. Now, they get that because uh, one of the robots is a unconventional locomotion robot, so that's the droopy side of it. Yeah. And uh, throwing in links uh, on the other side that is running conventional Five, wheels. Four, it is three, a two, intimidating one, opponent five, for any of yeah, I'd five. say a pair of golden Brett winners up against you. 
Now, one of the challenges and the kind of interesting things about Booty Brigade is that they essentially cut off part of the playing field because uh, this is now the danger zone. You don't want to be anywhere near Droopy, so it goes from an 8x8 eight eight cage down to an 8x7 cage, an 8x6 yeah. cage. You do not want to be anywhere near Droopy. Well, this is a, a newer version of Droopy. He had to scale it down a bit to make it, make it so that he could fight right alongside Ooh, Blake. Ooh, popping scab armor behind the house spot. Yeah, this is the three pound version of Droopy that typically runs in Southern California. The five pound version of Droopy that we saw uh, earlier this year was built specifically for NHRL to exploit the weight bonus here. But look at that, Scab Armor successfully uh, popping Lynx, you know, oh. in the air. Lynx's attacks are just so fast. I, I love how snappy he gets in and just makes sure he gets all the bite. Now here comes Droopy to kill. Wow. And it looks like the power is out on Scab Armor. Tap out. Well, that is a tap out. Booty Brigade survives one more round in this competition and gets closer to qualifying. Well, Booty Brigade uh, seems legit. It seems legit. I think that the crowd is yelling, Booty, Booty. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I just love these serious robot names, Sam. <laughs> All right, let's check out this replay here. Link's really doing a lot of the work in this fight, popping scab armor in the air, and at one point, popping scab armor behind the house spot, showing incredible aggression and control. One of the big things that I'm looking for today from Calvin Eba is more conservative driving. You know, typically we see this frenetic, just absolutely just dominating, Reckless drive style, yeah. and uh, that is how he got caught on this light that fell down. And uh, we're seeing more conservative driving here. He really is not going to turn on the gas until he has qualified uh, for the finals. It certainly looked like it was on a little bit more in in this fight alongside a droopy. Yes, um, but. But in that last well, I fight... I mean, speaking of, like, driving in a box with hazards, I mean, Droopy is a massive hazard. That's a great point, yeah. yeah. Um, it doesn't matter if he's on your team. There's still friendly fire in that ring. Yeah. Um, so if you run into to your teammate, you've run into them. I know um, one of the chipmunks got melted by Alvin earlier. I know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's check in with Cage 4 here. So we've got Amphispina facing off against Doppelgator. All right, these are a couple of 12-pounders. Doppelgator run here by Brooks Silver from Melbourne, Florida, from Gator Robotics. Now, this is a college team from the University of Florida. And um, Doppelgator is running dual spinners, which is pretty interesting. Because I think Amphispina is as well. Yeah, I was going to say that. Five, Amphispina four, is also running dual three, spinners. Two, it's that Twin Beast one, effect. Five, yeah. Influence. It is a very cool uh, weapon type because you can lose one of your weapons and you can still remain in the fight. Oh, we're going to hear a four-note chord in a second. Yeah. There are a total of four, four weapons going on right now inside of this box. It's pretty cool. I think maybe the mini bot from Doppelgator is the fifth, the fifth weapon. But look at that, Doppelgator topped up, uh, pit, uh, dropped up, up against the rail. Ooh! Amphispina being so kind as to free them. Big hit from Amphispina, and it looks like the power is out on Doppelgator. <laughs> wow. Big hits here in this fight, and you are not seeing any motion at all, any movement at all from Doppelgator. This could be the last fight of the season here at NHRL for Doppelgator. Looks like that count out is happening. And it's done. Wow. Okay, Knock Amphispina out. staying alive in the competition. You can see uh, Amphispina's friend there, Lars Elliott, uh, standing there cage side helping out. Those two are grinders. You will see them at just about every competition up and down the East Coast. Uh, from up here in Norwalk, Connecticut, all the way down to North Carolina. Yeah. In the same month, sometimes the same week. I, I know they've done five weekends back to back fighting. Yeah, Amphis Bina here built and driven by Alexander Richmond from Clifton, Virginia. 
And uh, it's very cool to see the crowd that Lars is running with because it is a fresh crop of very good young builders from yeah. across the U.S. They hang out together. They uh, are friends, like, online. And they, like, hang out with their friends at these competitions. Because, you know, Virginia, um, Lars is from Maryland. Johnny Sumpas is from the Bahamas. And they converge and just, like, hang out around robots, which is really, really cool. And the more minds you put together in a room, I feel like the, the robots are going to come out better because of it. Because some people have a specialty in, in CAD, or in, and some people are really great drivers. And, yeah. and so the more people you can get together to work on these robots, the better the robots are going to be. Yeah, they're all high schoolers. Uh, I don't think a single one of them is in college yet. And they're forging these friendships and building this network that is going to really propel them in this sport. So, um, yeah, it is, it is cool that they're kind of setting those, those seeds in place yeah. here for uh, future, future champions. All right, we're going to check in here with Cage 3. I've got Hurt Caboose and Angel Vidal facing off against Flaming Wedgie. Okay, we saw Flaming Wedgie pretty handily take their first fight against, uh, I think it was Bean Supreme. That is appropriate, you know, like a Flaming Wedgie and a Bean Supreme. You know, that's pretty good. Flaming Wedgie here, run by Hunter Doherty from Chico, California, flying out here from Chico State to compete. Now, the entire Chico team up there, this is their first competition Ever. I mean, outside of Jason Vasquez, of course, their mentor and uh, ringleader. But um, yeah, these are these are people who are just getting started in the sport. And uh, Jason's managed to recruit a lot of students from Chico to build robots using uh, NHRL's college grant this year. Oh, I love it. I love when, when big builders bring five, in new people four, and, and bring them up. Three, it's, it's just awesome. Two, it's how we grow this world. Fight. Robots fight. Now, Flaming Wedgie is a custom flamethrower. Wow! No ignition trouble from Flaming Wedgie, just right off the bat. Incredible flames here from Flaming Wedgie. Now, Angel Vidal has faced a flamethrower in his past, and uh, he really knows what he has to do is just survive until the fuel is out. The geometry on Flaming Wedgie is really interesting. It's got these sloped sides so that their opponents just ride up on top of the robot. There's no belts to yeah. snipe. Like, uh, they are just going straight into the the gaping maw of hell here oh. with Fran's Flaming Wedgie. Their armor panels are all hinged as well, so they stay scraping the ground. But still got flipped up by Hurt Caboose. And now Angel they're in a much landing a great pin up against the rail. Wow, and another pin from Angel's Minibot. Sam, I love a flamethrower. Now, did you see how the flame just flickered out suddenly? I think that the, the gas might be gone from Flaming Wedgie. Yeah, I believe so, because it looks like their igniter is still lit. One of the things to look for with the flamethrower is, is the intensity of the flames. When you see these big, billowing, bright flames, that means that they are really dumping a lot of fuel out of that canister at yeah. once. When you see a really controlled, like almost blue, white hot flame, they are being really conservative and directing that flame into a specific just pinpoint. And it seems like there's a place for both as yeah. well. Because sometimes it, it, it would help you out to really smother your opponent with fire, make it so they can't see their, their drivers can't see their robot. But One of my favorite fun facts about uh, Angel Vidal and her caboose is that uh, Angel was one of the first robots to get melted into just plastic slag uh, when he faced Calvin Eva and Mixtape. And uh, you can see that he's learned something from that fight because he's covered his entire robot in aluminum foil. And that uh, protects your, your robot slightly. I'm glad people are still 3D printing their robots even though they know they're going to face flamethrowers. Yeah. It's, it's such a good process for building the robots. Now I can see uh, Herc Boost celebrating here. Flaming Wedgie is on its head and out of gas. 
Looks like the half spot's coming in here to shove Flaming Wedgie against the rail. As we enter the last 10 seconds of this match, looks like this one will be going to the judges, but the winner may Tap be... Out. Oh, it is. Here we go. Tap out from Flaming Wedgie. Your winner is Hurt Caboose. Good match. Good run for the Flaming Wedgie team. Great first showing. I, I have to imagine that this is an absolutely thrilling experience if it's your first time coming to a competition as Chico State students, just to see the best of the best. Um, like, the, I was telling them up there, like, the experience here at NHRL is, um, like, you're, you're, you're starting at the top, you know? Yeah, you can see um, the... Let's take a look here at this replay, just this absolutely gorgeous flame. Uh, coming out of Flaming Wedgie. And, uh, yeah, just not enough gas to uh, last the full three minutes. And Angel Vidal is an incredible driver, able to land these pins and, uh, and score control points. I will say that it is pretty cool that instead of taking it to the judges, uh, Flaming Wedgie decided to tap out. It's a little bit cleaner, it's a little bit faster, and uh, really acknowledging that... Um, but they were behind on the points in that, that fight. All right, we're gonna head over to cage six. I can see Prom, Prom Frida there in pink with Zack Knight facing off against AimBot. I believe that this is yet another Chico State robot in AimBot. Now AimBot is uh, going to be in the blue corner there and Zack Knight and Prom Frida in pink. Well, it looks like Zach is loading out, Sam. Uh-oh. And did this match happen already? Or is Zach running into problems with Prompt Rita? My thinking is since the opponent, the aimbot, is in the blue corner, then it has not happened yet. Okay. And so maybe he was just putting his weapon lock back in to make a minor adjustment on the fly. Ooh, the robot is coming uh -oh. out. Oh, nope, nope, nope. We can see Zach negotiating. Now, uh, when, when you run into problems down cage side, you can talk to the ref, you can talk to the cage manager, you can talk to your opponent to see what your options are. We've seen people here do like a hard reset, you know, like on their robot. Or if there's time, and there is time here at this point, uh, the cage manager will give you a small amount of, of extra time to see if you can fix something. I've heard over the radio that something is a little too tight in that, and you can discover that when you're trying to make your way over to your starting yeah, square. Yeah, that very first time you're moving. And it's just, uh, just crawling, you know? Yeah, sometimes you'll... Uh tighten a, a wheel too close to your frame or something, and that friction's enough to really impede your driving. Uh, and it, it can be a quick fix cage side. Now we have a ton of test boxes upstairs in the pits, and so if you have the time, what a lot of drivers will do is they'll drive around in the test box before they make their way downstairs. And um, sometimes stuff just happens between uh, the test box and the actual box. And we can see Zach here trying to loosen those connections and see if he can get a bit more spin on his wheels. It looks like that is good. I could hear the ESC turning back on and the doors are closing here on cage six. Looks like this fight will be happening. Good work, Zach. Now, Aimbot is run by Guillermo from, uh, from Chico State. And uh, they are, you know, really get, jumping into the deep end with uh, combat robotics, coming here with multiple robots, and uh, really led by Jason Vasquez from Team Whiplash on BattleBots. And Prom Frida, Zach's been at it three, for a while. Two, Hopefully he got that one. screwed into fight. tight fix. Robots fight. Looks uh, like he might have. Good translation across the box from Prom Frida. Pushing Aimbot back into its starting square. Aimbot looks like it is a uh, Thagomizer style robot with a big wedge on the front and this uh, attacking horizontal. Oh, one of those uh -oh. wheels is gone. That is uh, 
tough to see, but ironically, the, uh, the movement is a little bit better with just one wheel. They're able to spin menacingly here. Yeah, a Thagomizer style robot can still Thagomize with only one wheel. Yeah, but it looks like the weapon Jab went out. down on the aimbot, and Prom Frida is your winner. Zack Knight advancing. Hmm. Aimbot, its spinner looks a looks a little aluminum-y to me. It looks like just a big rectangle, you know? Like, uh, I feel like I haven't seen just a big rectangle in a while, Sam. You know? <laughs> just like, oh, I'm gonna just cut it here, and I'm gonna drill a little hole in it, and I'm gonna put it into the box. No you know? teeth, no asymmetrical, no, teeth, no yeah. fancy cutout no pattern. No interesting, like, CAD kind of balancing. Just a bar. Just, just a bar, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, that is how most people start out, you know? And uh, you'll see, like, a progression in bar shapes. They start to cut out uh, more of the inside of it so they can kind of get that bar's size yeah. out um, without uh, a lot of extra weight. All right, now we're loading into cage four. I can see Fluffy here facing off against Milk Tank. Now, Milk Tank is this big white robot in the blue corner. Fluffy is over in the pink corner. Five, four, three, two, one. Fight, robots fight. Okay. Oh, Milk Tank has some speed behind it. Surprise. Yeah. Good little start for Milk Tank. I don't think the weapon is running on Milk Tank. Fluffy here is uh, this dark colored robot that's being pinned up against the house box. Now, confusingly, we have a house bot named Fluffy, and now we have a competitor named Fluffy. It's all about that pH, though. Yeah. You want it, uh, your robot to be balanced if it has pH in it, Sam. I get it. I get it. It's a water <laughs> joke, Sam. It was uh, a pretty basic joke, though. <laughs> Yeah, now with the weapons down, and uh, you know, this is going to come down to driving. It's going to come down to inning. It's going to come down to uh, just hoping that one or both of us don't fall asleep here in the Smash thing. Luckily, someone's being noisy, and that, that helps. Um, I think that's the, maybe the face spinners on Fluffy there. Oh, the face spinners. Oh, there's spinners on the face of the robot. Oh, I saw something go flying off of Fluffy. Wow. A minute 25 left. I feel like I've been watching this match for a very long time. Milk Tank is one of our longest running 12 pounders in the competition. Cow themed robot that captured the hearts and minds of fans around the world. And uh, really just going for it. I love that. I love that build ethos from Tamara Doherty. 55 seconds left. I think that Tamara has scored a little bit of damage. I can see some, uh, some parts off of Fluffy. Both of these weapons sound like they could be down. Could be another win here for Milk Tank, improving its ranking slightly. But uh, these are very much two garage build robots. 20 seconds left here in this fight. Now we've bid a fond farewell to Sam Hansen so that we can introduce my good friend, Ricky Willems. Hello, Ricky. Why, hello, Luke. How are you doing? Ricky, I am doing great. We've had some incredible fights here. Now we have officially started the championship uh, for all three weight classes. So every single one of these fights is a do or die moment for these builders. 
definitely gets exciting pretty fast. I uh, Looks like we might have a little bit of a die situation going on here, though. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, it's the end of the match. They, they made it, but... The uh, judges here are going to be deciding who advances, and I'm going to say just flip a coin. Oh, boy. Wow. Cage three. All right. Cage three, we have Loopy. Now, this is the new and improved titanium version of Droopy. Now, uh, Tommy Wong here is trying out some new armor packages here on Droopy to make the robot even more unkillable. Facing off against Jade Komodo, which looks to be an SSP-style lifter. I am really interested to see how this goes. I mean, that's a lot of firepower there in, um, in our Droopy-like friend. Uh, and at the same time, that's a pretty potent wedge on the front, uh, especially starting in that inverted position that we can see. Uh, that is, that's really an interesting choice. I'm surprised that they're doing that. Yeah. Um, I, if it were me, and may, maybe there's something I don't know, I would want to try to be taking off that, uh, that lifting arm from the front of the top of the robot. In which right. case, running in a really, you know, the traditional normal like configuration. Like in the down position. Would, I would think would put you at a better spot for that. But, uh, you Droopy know, is, is able to ride up on that wedge and attack that arm. Yeah, yeah. Tom so we're going to have to see if that happens. We will find out. Tommy is, uh, is a clever competitor. So I don't really, uh, I don't think he's going to do it for no reason. Yeah, it looked like Droopy also started in the undercutter position as well, uh, which is an interesting choice. The thing that really just kind of like uh, delighted me so much about Loopy was mm -hmm. uh, that Droopy itself is known as an unkillable robot, and Tommy's like, I'm going to make it even more so. Like, uh, why, why mess with perfection, Tommy? You know, like, uh, this thing is, is awesome. As we pursue a more perfect perfect uh, robot, we find ourselves with progressively more Droopies. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Fight, robots, and fight. And away we go. Okay, a tentative start here for Jade Komodo, trying to figure out how they're going to kill one or both halves of this unkillable robot in Loopy. Ooh, good little exchange there. Now, to kill a horizontal, you typically run a really heavy front wedge, which can, Jade Komodo has a pretty good-looking wedge there. Yeah, I wouldn't exactly call it heavily armored, but it's solid, especially for the size of, uh, you know, the beetle waves we're talking about here. On the flip side, Loopy is a heavy robot. I mean, it is using its weight bonus to the full effect uh, possible and putting most of that weight into durability, as you mentioned earlier. So it's going to take more than just an average wedge. Yeah. to stand up to what Loopy has to bring to the table here. These are 10 inch diameter blades, and so that is spinning at, I don't know, 20 something inches of just death and destruction on Loopy. Well, it's interesting too, Loopy, Loopy runs a relatively conservative speed, well, all of the Droopy S robots do, because it needs to be able to speed up and slow down to make that walking motion happen. Now uh, that arm has dropped down to the down position, and I wonder if it's been damaged on Jade Komodo. I, I sometimes think to myself, if I was facing Droopy slash Loopy, what would, what would do? I do? Would I just go in? Would I full send it? Would I try and pin it up against the rail? What can you do? It is just destructive. It is every time you go in there, and the second you get close to it, you're going to be taking damage. It's one of these fascinating designs that's just tough to plan for. Now, Droopy is already qualified because Droopy won a golden dumpster earlier this year. Yeah. It's so interesting. Tommy Wong took a break from NHRL during the entire pandemic. He is the 2020 uh, NHRL champion in the Beatles and then took the next two years off, came back and just won a golden dumpster like it was nothing. Right off the bat. Wow. Oh, my God, Ricky. I think maybe one half of Droopy is... No. No. No, no it's not. Just when you think... Wow. 
Yeah, it looked like one half was dead, but it came right back. And Jake Komodo is counting itself out yeah. with that little arm. One, two, three. Wow. Yeah, we have seen the end of Jake Komodo just in time for a count out before they are saved by the bell. Wow, this was surgical work from Loopy. And that is the last match of the season here at NHRL for Jade Komodo. Loopy advances. Knockout. All right, taking it about two minutes and 50 seconds here against Droopy. Not bad, Jade Komodo. Really showing the durability of the SSP kit. Seth Schaefer has just sold a ton of these kits just because that robot has a tendency to survive the full three minutes up against very formidable opponents. Let's take a look here at this replay. Now, Droopy slash Loopy, you know? Total bulletproof reliability, just going the full three minutes every single time. If he loses one of those weapons, that robot doesn't move as well. If you lose both, it doesn't move it's at out. All. Yeah. Yeah, it's. it's I, I can see progressively over time, uh, you know, he's tried to dial in that weapon, and, and as I understand it, and of course, there's some secret sauce to every Droopy esque robot. But yeah. As I understand it, it's, it's a compromise between having great attack ability and also a relative amount of stability and walking ability. Uh, oh, wow, look at him go up there. Uh, but but I think he's kind of got it. That seems like a great five, compromise four, where he is three, uh, with that design two, and uh, one, five, great chance robots to, to, fight. to uh, focus on more than just mobility going forward. Wow. Look uh, right off the bat here. Now this is another loophole style robot in Eileen. Now Eileen here, now these are two three pound robots essentially. And uh, what sets Eileen apart from robots like Steel Mountain, for example, is that there are walking legs on the center of that robot. Now, Eileen is built by Toby. Uh, Toby is our truck driver from Kentucky and prolific combat robotics competitor and builder. And he seems to have solved one of the challenges from depth charge-esque, Steel Mountain-esque robots and that he's able to translate really well across the box with these tiny little walking legs and we're not seeing the same kind of chaotic hits that uh, we typically see from robots like that. Yeah, this is the kind of design evolution I'm really tickled to see in, in these robots. Uh, so, are... it's interesting because, you know, like, I guess technically you could just put a wheel in the center of a robot, but it's really just going to be going backwards and forwards. There's a little bit of translation that it's getting from the weapon as well oh, uh, yeah, this so that is, it can turn. This is, to me, a point-and-shoot robot. You're, you're using that main weapon to aim, and you simply fire by firing up the, the reverse or forward on the, uh, the walking stick. And it, they're doing this, you know, two-fold approach here. One... They're doing something different by having a single, you know, locomotive mechanism in the center. Right. Uh, so you drop half your motor, you drop half your weight there. That's great. And then it's a it's a shuffling mechanism. So you get a weight bonus on top of that. Right. Uh, and that is a really nice compromise between having no motors and using the, you know, depth charge esque movement approach, um, and having two kind of regular wheels. Uh, so it's a it's really clever the way they balance that. Uh, yeah, now, I'm delighted to see it. Now, shufflers uh, have ignited a debate about whether we should get rid of the shuffler bonus because shufflers are just as mobile as wheels now at the end of 2023. People have really reverse engineered this, uh, this locomotion type that was championed by Jameson Go and Silent Spring. And should we close the loophole on loophole-esque robots? We saw loophole really uh, kind of burst onto the scene uh, in the last competition. And now there are five loophole style robots up there in the pits. Will we see a rule change in 2024? That is something uh, that a lot of fans of NHRL are waiting on. Yeah, only time will tell, Luke. My, my general thought process on this 
is when a rule is uh, truly worth reconsidering is when it becomes exploited uh, by anyone who wants to be competitive. Right. If you don't have to take advantage of that rule, uh, if it doesn't break the rest of the competition, it's probably not a problem as long as it's not a safety or you know, other sort of thing. Right. Um, but to your point, we've gone from one loophole to five loopholes in yeah. the space of a month. Right. You know? Right. Uh, at that rate, we'll, we'll all be loopholes, Luke. Yeah. You'll be a loophole, I'll be a loophole, we'll be assimilated. Yeah. I'm going to be a loophole. A, loop, a loophole? That, that is incredibly uncomfortable, Luke. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. We're going to go over to cage four here. You can tell that it's cage four because it looks incredibly damaged, Ricky. We've had some just absolute killers in cage four. Yeah, you can see there's uh, quite a bit of automotive body filler filling those holes on the floor. Now here in the pink corner, we can see Craig. Now this is from Ethan Shipley running a Five, Crash Fest S minibus three, facing two, off against Tony one, D'Ambrosio and Darkstar. And away we go. You can see Darkstar still covered in gold protective foil. Oh, that is Craig there. Oh. Darkstar is in black. Oh, excuse me. Now, Tony D'Ambrosio, he is uh, so cool that he refuses to give up the black. I wonder even if he was facing a flamethrower, if he would go in there uh, and, and still run it as a black robot. Just because he cares so much about the aesthetics. Craig pinning Darkstar up against the rail. Tony's wheels spinning helplessly up against the rail. Wow, that is an excellent pin. And it looks like Darkstar is dying here. Yeah, I see no movement. That is not a good place to be. The wheels are spinning. I think they're... Oh, oh they were high-centered on a minibot. Wow, okay. That minibot doing exactly what it was designed to do. That is going to look great in the eyes of the judges in just a few minutes, if we make it that far. A minute 50 left here in this fight. Now the weapon on Craig, again, down. Darkstar, that sound that you hear is Darkstar's egg beater. And we can see a whole heck of a lot of minibots here in this, uh, in this competition, in this box. Craig has lost an eye. I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, I think that might be a blade of armor, though, Ricky. A blade of eyes. A, a blade of eyes is a really... Wow, another good pin from Crash Fest on Darkstar. Now, that must be frustrating to no end for Tony D'Ambrosio being pinned by a beetle weight. Yeah, and, and there is no movement here either. I mean... Wow. We'll see Tony D'Ambrosio dying here in this fight. This is the last fight of the season for Tony D'Ambrosio and Darkstar. We are going to be seeing him in November with his uh, three-pounder Blackbird. Man, but, uh, I, just the slightest twitch of movement there, but this is going to be the end for Tony. You can and see Darkstar. Tony just looking very frustrated there, cage side. Trying to get some motion out of Darkstar. I don't think it's going to happen. Tony's still dialing Knock in this 12-pounder. Your winner somehow is Craig. No dice. You can see Ethan Shipley there with uh, with Craig. I don't like that at all. Yeah, and uh, Craig, I'm, I'm gonna say it's weird to name your robot uh, like a human name. What do you think, Ricky? I, I kind of like it. I, to me, if I was gonna pull a, a human name. The names though. Craig, though. Yeah, that's the thing. Is it's a hyper normal name. Yeah. Um, but it's not like a funny normal name like Bob. Like I could see a robot named Bob. I could see a robot and I could like go the Craig other direction. Like he's like, going to sell me like an insurance or something. Obadiah or, yeah. or something. You know, that's yeah. the other direction. Right. I can get behind that any day of the week. But it, like, it's like if you named a robot like Susan, you know? Yeah. Like Susan helps you out at the bank. Susan mm -hmm. is not a killer robot. She's a delight. She makes a great casserole. Yeah. Yeah. Susan is really great about staying in touch with her friends. Right. But uh, not a super destructive 12 pounder. Right. Right. Doesn't strike fear into the hearts of anything other than like a good macaroni salad. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, we're going to check in with uh, Chris Speak upstairs in the pits. Hello, Chris. Speaking oh, of no, good Kyle. macaroni Hello, salad. Kyle. I'm not Chris. I don't even look like Chris, but I like him a lot. He's a really good guy. So listen, I'm standing by with Brandon from Team Shredded. Brandon, you have the uh, distinction, the honor, and the infamy of being the guy who knocked out Lynx from the competition today. Uh, how are you feeling after that win? How are you feeling at, at this moment, like be, having this effect on the tournament today for everybody else? Uh, extremely surprised. I went into the fight uh, talking with everyone uh, in dismay about how my first fight was against both Droopy and Lynx, followed by my second fight of the day being against Lynx. <laughs> uh, expected to be immediately knocked out with new bot, uh, and flabbergasted that I was actually able to pull out the win in judge's decision. Um, my first fight, my entire goal was, I'm going to lose this, I'm going to go to judge's decision. That's what my aim was, and I ended the fight 20 minutes before, and I went all the way this time. Amazing, absolutely amazing. So what is your plan moving forward? Who are you facing next? Uh, don't actually remember who I'm facing next. Uh, I've been spending this entire time trying to fix my drums because I came to the event with two drums and I've broken one in every fight so far. Uh, so I luckily was able to steal a magnet ring from someone else and rebuild one of mine. Nice. And that's been about all I've been able to do. So I'm still running the same chassis, same electronics, same everything else from both of the two fights. Well, Brandon, thank you for destroying everyone's bracket today. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll go right back to you guys at the desk. All right. Thank you so much, Kyle. All right, we're going to go to cage five here. We've got uh, Caldera facing off against Loophole. Now, Caldera is our top ranked beetle in the competition here today. Caldera is ranked number two of all time with an incredible 32 and 16 record. Now, this is a do or die moment in the competition for these two robots. Loophole hoping to get its uh, invitation to the finals. Caldera five, got four, its invitation three, seven two, months ago. One, five, yeah, I think it was just an automatic five. invite. It's yeah. uh, <laughs> immediately populated with that robot's name. Now, the interesting thing here is that these are friends on both sides of the box. Loophole is a Team WPI robot, and uh, Caldera and Eruption and Fireball, these are Team WPI adjacent robots. Right, right. Now, Caldera here is uh, run by Glenn Voxel, which is Brian Voxel's father. And uh, Brian brought his father into the competition so they could have something to do together um, now that Brian was out of high school. That's um, really adorable. It's really a cool story. You know, Glenn would take Brian to uh, high school robotics competitions, and they just wanted to keep it going. So uh, that's what they've done. Now, Loophole here is in black and white. And uh, you can see it's two three-pound robots. They've created the Loophole Loophole. and. Um, you can see this walker here in white and a black robot here. I think it might be Tothic, perhhaps? I don't know. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah, they can just cycle through any Team WPI robot that they want, which is kind of interesting. The reason why Loophole is kind of fascinating is that you can exploit the rock, paper, scissors and bring in that second robot if you think it's going to be a good weapon type against your opponent. Now here in this box, we see two birds facing off against a horizontal, which is the correct call here. Mm -hmm. But it looks like the second robot on loophole could be dead. That's really killing me. Uh, what uh, what robot that is, Luke? It's not Tothic. It's, um, it's, it's just escaping me. But yeah. uh, in the end, it is loophole. Yeah, well, right. It yeah. is. I guess the umbrella term is loophole. Yes. Look how much damage there is in the box. You can see Caldera's weapon is down. Brute is the other bot. That's what I've heard. Interesting. Brute is, uh, you know, a formidable robot, but it's, it's only ranked 66 um, compared to some of the other ones. And uh, I, I understand why now we didn't identify it. It's a, it's a modular robot. Uh, right. So it's running that vertical spinner configuration. Uh, it, I think it's maybe it's not its default, but it's more commonly used in a horizontal yeah. uh, configuration. So it's 
Now, the interesting thing here, Ricky, is that I think that Loophole is winning here. Now, this is great control. This is a huge pin here from Loophole. Yes, yes, They indeed. have sniped the belt off of Caldera. They have torn off one of those wheel guards from Caldera. They're going to take this to the judges. The judges are going to have their work cut out for them. Yeah, I could, I, I mean, I can see this going in a couple of ways, but uh, I definitely think the edge uh, is not in Caldera's favor. Wow. On the flip side, I mean, all of Loophole, each component, both components, lost their weapons. There were a right. few moments of pins, a few moments of non-functionality. Oh, okay. boy. Alvin and the Chipmunks, our, uh, our uh, resident uh, robot enthusiast here, Austin McCord, is uh, firing NHL up his founder, jet. Austin McCord. Oh, I, He's the father of NHRL. You know. Oh, my. Look at those bagels. Look Mine at those bagels. Mine and have put bagels on the back of their robots. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm known to enjoy. These bagels. I'm known to enjoy a good bagel. Well, here's the thing, okay? Uh, any object can ignite with enough heat. And, uh, oh, oh, no, no, sorry. These are bagels from the mini bots on yes. Alvin and the Chipmunks. Okay. This is not Mine and Plusle. No, I, mean, no I, they, I, I wish that they had bagels on mine and a plus. So everyone could have a bagel as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Now, is it safe to eat these bagels afterwards, no, Ricky? No, absolutely not. I will, but <laughs> it's not recommended by any uh, Surgeon General or um, You're FDA. You're telling me that diesel fuel is not a safe way to toast your bagels, Ricky? You know, you could actually run it with biodiesel and be 100% oh. Okay. I mean, yeah. as much as, you know, they say they say toast is cancerous anyway. But as much as any toasted item could be, yeah. if you're using peanut oil to fire up your jet turbine, which you yeah. could. Yeah. Uh, man, I'm going to have them use peanut oil next time. It's, yeah. an, it's an interesting, uh, you know, fuel type. Yeah, I remember in my younger days dumpster diving for used cooking oil at course, uh, Chinese naturally. food restaurants. Yeah. And, it, you know, amongst those circles, uh, Chinese food restaurants, that was... Um, uh, that was white gold. Yeah. Was, you right. know, th that particular yes. mixture of used frying oil was, yeah. was exactly what you wanted to use in an internal combustion engine. Good. And smelled delicious. Ricky, I have so many questions, but I, I can't ask them because we can hear the jet engine powering up here in this box. Those bagels are ready to be toasted. Austin McCord here running this, this, uh, this jet bot. I just want to take a second. Uh, if that does get too loud, we do have hearing protection available for those in the yes. audience. Uh, you can look for the, uh, at either end, there are earplugs available if it is uncomfortable Four, for you. Protect three, your ears, two, folks. One, yes. Five, it will get louder in a moment. Fight. Wow. What a beautiful noise. Oh, there's bagels everywhere, Luke. It sounds like a Learjet about to take off from an executive airport runway. Mine in and Plusle here in black and white. I'm sorry, in red and, uh, red and blue. My God, I went colorblind for a I second. I was going to say, you're that excited. <laughs> Alvin and the Chipmunks here in green and blue. And over here, this is Austin McCord with his jet bot. You can see this. Daring his opponents to come uh, over there into that corner. It's doing its best. It really wants to try to get towards its opponents. But as soon as it turns up that jet turbine, it gets wow. blowing itself backwards. There's a huge amount of force in Alvin and the Chipmunks. Oh! And they are getting closer and closer and closer to that jet engine. Oh! Wow! Look at that! Yes! Beautiful! Fire and flames from the jet bot on Alvin and the Chipmunks, which is inverted. Any moment now that uh, incredibly expensive jet engine could let loose. Yes, there's still a little bit of uh, fuel inside of the jet. Oh, there's a lot of bit of fuel inside of the jet. Wow. Minute 30 left here in this fight. We can see the house bot coming in here to try and save Alvin and the Chipmunks. Mining and Plusle here, hanging back very wisely. 
just allowing Alvin and the Chipmunks to work out its stuff. And it looks like uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks, the uh, Jetbot, will not be able to self-write. And uh, this is Mining and Fussel's game here. Can they disable these bagel bots here? You can see some concerning smoke coming out of the top of the jet box. What you're really looking for is, uh, are there consumable items, uh, components, are there wires, is there plastic inside of there that could catch fire? 40 seconds left here in this fight. Yeah, that jet is struggling. It only seems to be smoking more as time goes on. Not a great look for the judges. No, uh, but a great look for Minin Mine and, <laughs> Mine and, and Plussel, excuse me. I can see this ablative bagel here in the pink corner. Ooh, oh, it, yeah, it, it ablated pretty hard there, Luke. It looks like Minin and Plussel might be taking this to the judges and uh, this might be a win for Zoe and Minin and Plussel. Yeah, I think they've Tap got this out. in the bag. And that tap out seals the deal. I love the Jetbot as a concept. You know, this idea that I can liquefy my opponent's insides just through heat alone. Austin McCord has been interested in experimenting with jet-powered robots for over a year. He brought Hot Shot to the competition, which is a fan favorite. Mm -hmm. And uh, this jet burns so hot that if you were to put it outside, it would remelt the asphalt and uh, would could it and has. Of, yeah, this shiny sheen across the uh, the top of the asphalt. The uh, I'm gonna go out on a limb here, you know, yeah. put on my design robot hat. Okay. I really think there's an opportunity for something like Hot Shot to be combined with something like Dutch Oven. Okay. And suddenly you've got, you know, the best of both worlds. A big capturing uh, device and blasting your opponent. Exactly. Now, uh, this was where uh, Minin and Plusle really worked up the courage to go over there and, uh, and really face the fire, successfully popping the jet bot onto its head and sparking a fire inside of the robot. Indeed. It's, it's interesting. You saw that kind of smoke that started to come up just before that hit that inverted it. When you have an opponent so close to you and you're moving so much air through the arena, you start inject that jet engine starts ingesting air that's already been used for combustion. Interesting. And then it starts to run richer and that fuel doesn't start to burn and it starts to smoke more. And then eventually you get that pop of flame and the turbine right. stops and, and everything else. So if you can endure just just long enough um, to get the jet engine to kind of flame out. Yeah. Uh, instead of melting your own face, you have a really good shot. There's cool, like, physics and science going on inside a of that box. A tremendous amount of cool. All, yeah. I've said this all day, and I'll continue saying it. The fire robots that we have here is a whole new underexplored world of physics, of science, of engineering yeah. that has so much room for expansion, for experimentation, yeah. uh, and optimization. And I cannot wait to see, like, next year, two years, how that is going to develop into not only great show, but really competitive robot designs. Yeah, you can you can you can imagine a a match where I mean, like I I've heard Austin talk about like maybe anchoring himself into the floor somehow, mm -hmm. and uh, you know having his control bots push the opponent toward the jet. Um, and really just igniting everything on the inside of his opponent. You know, that jet, it just burns so incredibly hot. Yep. You have to, like, wear welding gloves when you're pulling it out because your mining and plus are, are too hot to touch with your bare hands. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's, uh, it changes the game entirely for what people are re relatively uh, used to experiencing inside yeah. the arena and, and has this huge domino effect of things that you need to reconsider. I mean, yeah. Uh, I love the fact that we have so many 3D printed robots, right? But it only takes one or two competitors with the ability to melt 3D printed parts in seconds before you say, well, okay, do, do I need a metal plate here? Do I need aluminum foil armor? Do I need, what is it? Um, and I, I love the way that that is changing uh, the dynamic as time goes on. We're gonna head up to Kyle in the pits. I think he's got a little bit of a interview for us. Tony D'Ambrosio, it seems. Kyle, what can you tell us? 
All right, guys, I am here with Anthony D'Ambrosio. Tony, you just had a really tough loss. Uh, yeah. You had some big feelings about it. Can you mm -hmm. tell us what just happened with the bot? Well, Kyle, I like you. I wish we could see each other in better circumstances every time you come up here. It's because something <laughs> catastrophic happened. Um, tough match. Um, obviously, love those guys. Uh, great, great driving against them. I thought that it went uh, our way pretty much the entire time. And unfortunately, one little solder connection came loose on the power switch and that's how it goes sometimes, so. Especially when you have a new bot, right? Like you, you're yeah. you're learning it, you're learning all the kinks, and then all those little things that you gotta battle hard and moving forward, you're kind of learning where those weak points are now. Yeah, so through all of this, we've had five fights with this robot between the last two events. We've gathered a lot of data. When we bring this back, probably next year, it's gonna be unstoppable. This robot, we know every weakness now, every little thing we could have missed, better pulleys, better little things, it's, this is a good learning experience. I feel I feel bad that I let my, my team down. Ron, Pat, my guys are unbelievable. Angel, um, G, everybody that helped me up here get this robot even functional after it exploded first match is unbelievable. So I'm thankful for those guys, but we will be back with it. I'll be back with uh, Blackbird, obviously, for finals. So I'll see you guys soon. All right, let's get another shot of Darkstar here. Darkstar done for the day. Beautiful robot. Can't wait to see it next year. Thank you, Tony. All Fantastic right. robot there. Can't wait to see it in 2024. Uh, new and improved. Now, uh, I've heard that we're going to go up to uh, the pits again with Lindsay and some Super Chats. Hello, Lindsay. Non-stop. Hello, Luke. Hello, Ricky. I have some Super Chats again uh, that we got to get to. And the first one is coming for you, Ricky. I think it's a celebratory one. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll read into its tone a little bit. <laughs> uh, I don't know what's louder, Alvin or Ricky's shirt. Uh, and that's where my girlfriend doesn't like robots. Um, podcast uh, host Matt Hedger, who also just got a Sparky tattoo. Big tattoo. Oh, oh, I saw that. Yeah, the very first NHRL tattoo. That we know of. Now, Ricky, have you ever worked on a project where someone's wanted to tattoo the logo on themselves? Yes. Really? Yeah, mammoth. What's the project? Oh, uh, you have someone got a mammoth tattoo? I don't know if it happened, but I was asked for... Uh... No, no, there's evidence of the Sparky <laughs> tattoo. Yeah. We've seen it, okay? Well, and go. whoever got the mammoth tattoo, you've got to really seriously reconsider your I life agree. choices. I agree. I don't wow. have a mammoth okay. tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> You should. I, I told I told the team I was like, listen, if we win the giant nut, I, I'll I'll do the tattoo. Okay. Good. Otherwise, all right, tattoo for 2024. There we go. Right. Uh, right. Lindsay, do we have more super chats? Oh, do we ever? All right. So the next one is from Lucas Marquez, Go Go Jubilee. And then uh, actually the one after that is also in a uh, celebration of Jubilee, uh, Vamos La Jubilee from Washington Reese. I could be saying that wrong. I'm so sorry, Brazil. I am trying. Um, the next one is, is also in Portuguese, and I'm going to let you decipher what it means. I think that they were cheering for Dark Chaos, uh, unfortunately, who we've said uh, farewell to today. But uh, awesome job to them from Flavia Faria. Um, and now we have a couple, you know, oh. little spicy ones. Yamato did not intentionally entangle. And this one is from Okami Fam. Uh, this, you know, was a big subject in the chat for quite a while. Uh, so I don't know, maybe we're going to stir the pot by bringing this up again. And then the last one here is uh, from <laughs> Ian. Yamato 3 did nothing wrong. So a lot of big feelings for Yamato. That uh, certainly does stir the pot a little bit. I didn't realize that uh, there was such a cauldron already a brewing. We're gonna go to cage two in the meantime and loop our way back. I see Chainsaw Kitty, and Chainsaw Kitty is going up against who, Luke? Do we know? Chainsaw Kitty is facing off against Temporal Terror. Mm. Now, Temporal Terror is, I believe, one of these Florida robots. Adam Smith from Gator Robotics from Melbourne, Florida is, uh, is facing off against Chainsaw Kitty. Now, Chainsaw Kitty and Kazaya Sky, uh, this is one of our top-ranked Beatles that is still searching for qualification. Kazaya, uh, Kazaya enters this uh, competition ranked number 13 of all time in the Beatles with an incredible 19-8 and record across the past five events. That is, that is a Five, uh, slim four, record for three, someone two, with that kind one, of record. I mean, that fight, ratio over five events, uh, that speaks to luck, bad luck more than anything else. 
Kaziah's rookie debut was in November of 2022. She hasn't Whoa. even done a full year here at NHRL and is doing amazingly well for a relatively new builder. That's... Kaziah wow. celebrating. Temporal Terror dead up against tap the rail. Out. This is a tap out. Chainsaw Kitty stays alive in the competition, advancing yet another round. 18 seconds, Luke. That is one of the quickest knockouts we have had in a long time. Yeah, it really shows just the absolute brutality of Chainsaw Kitty. I was standing here at Cage 3 about an hour ago when I saw Chainsaw Kitty's last match. And when you just stand cage side, uh, it is incredible how hard that robot hits. For a three pounder especially, it is a huge amount of energy, incredibly destructive robot. There are few robots in that size that consistently hit the roof with their opponent uh, more than Chainsaw Kitty. This grinding action here from Chainsaw Kitty, popping its opponent in the air. And uh, Chainsaw Kitty really hungry to qualify. Keziah has wanted to qualify this entire year. She has been here the entire, like every single competition. Yeah, she's been putting in the time, the work, and fantastic. Getting so incredibly close. Yeah. Let's check in here with, uh, with Kyle, who is standing with Ratto. Hello, Kyle. Hey, how are you guys? So listen, Rato is in the middle of working on his bot. We're gonna check in with him to see how his day is going here at NHRL for the second time. Rato, how are you? I'm fine. <laughs> are you a bunch of nervous? You look stressed. What's going on with your robot? You saw my robot uh, had a very intense battle <laughs> with the uh, with the Dark Meta, Dark Nine, and he all scratches out of the robot, you know? Wow. And I make a, rever uh, a, a revision because my opponent is so strong. Yeah. Yeah, so strong. And uh, I would like to make a better battle with him. So wow. Not my condition. <laughs> this, is a, this is a much more stressful day than the first time you were with us here at NHRL. Listen, we have tons of fans from Brazil. They're yeah. all in the chat. They're speaking in Portuguese. They all want to hear from you. So Can what I do you have to tell your fans? Can I speak in Portuguese? Please. Okay. Pessoal, estamos aqui com um monte de brasileiro. Infelizmente, para mim, a batalha contra o pessoal da UFO foi muito difícil. Eu vou falar para vocês, eu não queria ter ganhado, mas não ia deixar eles ganhar também, porque senão é, é, não é esse o esporte, entendeu? Então foi uma batalha legal, foi uma revanche também, mas essa revanche poderia ter acontecido lá em casa. Mas infelizmente não aconteceu, então vou fazer meu melhor para magoar quem tiver pela frente agora. Porque se eu conseguir passar pelo Yahoo, eu vou pegar o Sombra. E é outro brasileiro. Se eu passar. É, mas assim, se eu não passar, eu prometo que eu vou magoar ele muito. Mas muito mesmo. É isso. Um abraço aí, amo você, pessoal. Obrigado pela força. So, Rato, he's already qualified. He's fighting his heart out today. We will see him again at the championship. Rato, thank you so much. Good luck the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Norwalk. It's an excellent event. I love it. Thank you so much, Rato. All right, back to you guys at the desk. All right, Rato really bringing the energy here. Uh, he has so many fans that he's brought to NHRL, and uh, they are incredibly excited about his performance in this competition. Yeah, I know he's stressed right now, but every time he's cage side, it is just such a high level of passion and excitement uh, from him and, and from everyone around him, and it's, it's just kind of a lovely thing to get to experience. Now, uh, we're going to go over to cage four. There's another big box fight. Now, we can see loading in relatively obscure bot facing off against unreasonable. Now, relatively obscure bot, a.k.a. Rob, is an ASML team here from Wilton, Connecticut. Now, ASML is uh, one of our premium sponsors. They sponsor our VIP package. And I'm just going to say, if you're interested in sponsoring NHRL, you should do it. If you're, uh, you know, you've got deep pockets, if you're a corporate sponsor somewhere, reach out and uh, you can be cool like ASML, you know? It, yeah, and, you know, I'll, I'll say it in a, in a little bit more serious uh, kind of thing. And it's not just, uh, it's not just about money here. The, the, how do I put this? 
the level Five, of satisfaction four, that I hear some sponsors three, talk about two, on giving yeah. them, giving one. their team members, Five, giving their employees uh, something to root for and be proud of. Now, uh, overhead spinners like relatively obscure bots. The physics are kind of interesting, and they really want to stay totally parallel with the floor. And uh, unreasonable expectations as the exact geometry to make that not happen here. Look at that, tipping the ASML robot up against the rail. That is not a good spot for that robot. It is trying to get free and just completely unable to at the moment. We just Ricky, they are they are rethinking their sponsorship as we speak. <laughs> All right. Oh, what are you talking about? That was a perfect. Oh, hey, got there we itself. go. Let's go ASML. Uh, however, the wheels are not spinning at all. This is not a case of uh, a high centering. That drive system is no longer working. I think we are going to see a tap out. Tap yes, out. we are. Wow. Unfortunate. A tap out here from Relatively Obscure Robot. Your winner is Unreasonable Expectations. All right, uh, but first we're going to check in uh, in the pits with Kyle and Chainsaw Kitty. Uh, yes, I have Keziah Sky with Chainsaw Kitty and uh, Sleepy Anime Girl Robotics. Is that correct? The Sleepy Anime Girl Club. The, the, the Sleepy Anime Girl Club. <laughs> Keziah, every time we talk, you tell me how badly you're going to do with these competitions, how terrible your, ro your robot's performing. How are you feeling today? Does any of that hold true so far? Um, I have concerns about what's in store uh, later in this event, uh, but these first three have been pretty solid quick wins. Uh, I'm feeling really good about it, actually. 18 seconds was your last win. You yes. defeated them in 18 seconds. I think these have all been sub one minute so far. Now, I think. Your, uh, your robot is looking scarier than it has ever looked. What is making you nervous about the fights coming up? Um, assuming Loophole doesn't lose and I don't lose, I will have to defeat Loophole to qualify. Oh, okay. Uh, that might be the first of a Loophole bot that you have to face through the day. How are you uh, strategizing for such an occasion? I don't know. I'm kind of hoping they get taken out first. Otherwise, I got to think about it. But first, assuming Tim wins this next match, I got to fight Chubby again. Yep. So that was great the first time, but it wasn't official. So now we get to do an official one if he doesn't lose. If he doesn't lose, listen, Keziah, you're on a tear today. I'm going to let you get back to working on the bot. You are crushing it. Congratulations. I hope to see you go far. Me too. Thank you very much, guys. Back to you. Thanks, Kyle. Appreciate that. Man, the confidence um, there, I think, is starting to rise just a little bit. I know Keziah tends to be a little bit pessimistic, but... Uh, it's a, uh, it's a thing. She doesn't want to jinx herself. Yeah, yeah, but I think there is still some uh, quiet optimism permeating that particular builder at the moment. I, I hear a lot of action in the background in cage two going on right now, but we're looking at cage eight uh, getting queued up for an upcoming fight. Uh, not sure which robots were being loaded in there, but it looked like an interesting design. I think they were loading out. Oh, oh, I see. We just missed that then. All right. In cage seven, I can see loaded in Voxel in the blue corner facing off against Purple Pain in the pink corner. Now, Voxel, this is a robot from Michael Shore Sr. that has already qualified for the finals. Uh, he did incredibly well earlier in the year. Facing off against the Davis boys in Purple Pain. Now, uh, these are our friends on five, both sides of the box. Four, uh, they're both three, uh, connected two, to Team one, Shreddit. Five, Michael Shore with Voxel was on uh, Shreddit Rose Season 7 um, roster. And Drew Davis has competed with uh, Pain Train, which is the earlier version of Shredder Pro. Now, what you're looking for here for Vox is incredibly aggressive driving with this wide boy drum. And it looks like the weapon on Purple Pain could be dead right out of the gate. Uh, I don't know, Luke. I think that is still spinning. Oh, is that like a, maybe a armor yeah, piece or something? There's some sort of tape up? or something on the top of there, but that is that is not indicative of the weapon status. Okay, all right. Yeah, I thought that would may have, may have been the weapon. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure what's going on, but... 
Oh, and then we've, we've jumped over to Cage 2. We've jumped over to Cage 2. Cage 2 is minimum viable product facing off against Berserker. Now we're back to Vox with Triple Pain. Okay. Listen, if you want to get as many robot fights in in a short period of time, that Check might out not be the, the way red to zone. It. Yeah, actually, that's a great point. You can um, manually switch between these robots using the Brett Zone on the NHRL website. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to try and focus here on Purple Pain versus Voxel V1. Now we're back to Cage 7 here. Now, the really interesting thing about this uh, is that Voxel is a totally custom egg beater, and it is a wider egg beater than normal. Really gives itself a big hit uh, area. So uh, it can be aggressive because the chance of it catching its opponent on some edge uh, is higher than average. Now, Purple Pain is running almost the exact opposite, a very thin, sharp blade instead. Yep. And you can see that uh, it's, it's created interesting geometries inside of the robots. You know, Purple Pain is kind of long and thin. Voxel is short and squat. And it's totally planted to the floor. Voxel, I don't think, has been inverted yet in this fight. No, Voxel is playing it relatively safe, and they're going up, an opponent, up against an opponent that doesn't have a whole lot of ability to uh, to get around the sides or, uh, you know, invert it in any good way, unless it has a perfectly lucky shot with that vertical spinner. That vertical spinner now does appear to be down uh, on Purple Pan. 20 seconds left here in this fight. Michael Shore Sr. has done fantastic. But it looks like they're going to take this to the judges. The judges are going to be deciding who advances. Could be the last fight of the season for Purple Pain and the Davis Brothers. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that may be the way this goes. There's certainly a lot of effort that went into that. They did not give up, but I did not see a lot from Purple Pain that leads me to believe that it would take home a, uh, a judge's decision there. Okay. Now, uh, the action here is just back-to-back. -back. I can see loaded into cage three, David Small and Puka. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is one of these fights that I have been watching for. Yeah. Now, Puka went undefeated in the January New Bots event. Mm -hmm. It went seven and zero, oh, and... You know, the, the NewBots event, there's always kind of an asterisk next to it because you say there's a lot of experimental robots, there's a lot of brand new robots, yep. and sure, I went 7-0, but could I go 7-0 in November right. at, like, the most competitive uh, field possible? Right. Can, can you go against the best of the best and still have that kind of result? And, right. You know, we, we won't know, and that's why this last chance, uh, you know, this last bot down here yeah. is so critical because it's, it is that last defining moment before you are going to have nonstop grueling competition day in and day out uh, to pressure test your robot, figure out what you can do different. None of these competitors are going to be taking chances in November. Now yeah. is the only time they have to try new strategies and figure out how those are going to work. Now, Puka here is in black and gold in the uh, pink corner facing off against Liberation. Tab wow! Out. What what uh -huh. happened there? Who tapped out? Uh, was that a tap out from David Small? Fast tap out here. I think that that was a tap out from David Small. Your winner is Liberation. I believe that is correct. Yeah. Wow. wow. I wonder what happened. I would love to see a replay on that and see if we can uh, tease out what the what the failure moment was or what was what was going on there. David Small is a BattleBots captain and uh, you know has built Banshee for season seven. Yeah. And uh, we're going to check in here first with Kyle upstairs in the pits. Yeah, and then maybe we can get a little more information. All right, how are you guys doing? I am standing by with Kokoto Mane and Serial Killer. Kokoto came here today with a bot called Kill It With Fire. 
You had some frustration with that bot today. Your flamethrower wasn't able to be functional for most of the day, is that right? Yeah, unfortunately, no. Um, for some reason, even though it passed safety the first two times, something happened with this version where the lighter couldn't fail safe properly and I couldn't figure it out. So Kill of Fire just had to fight about the flamethrower. Amazingly, it's actually been doing okay. It's uh, It just won, uh, it won, so it lost its first fight. It won its redemption fight in the bracket and unfortunately won by forfeit against frustration. You never want to win like that, which is also ironic considering its name. Yep. But then I won an axle fight against an egg beater called Bean Buster. So Killer Fire is still in the bracket, believe it or not. That is amazing. And then you're also participating in our freestyle fights with your classic bot, Serial Killer. Yeah. Love that. So Serial Killer's not in the tournament today, not competing no. today. You brought it literally to compete in the freestyle events for funsies on the side, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, when I had to choose only one bot to in the main competition. It was kind of an easy choice because I love them both equally, but Seer Killer wasn't meant to win the Golden Dumpster. That was never the intention. The intention was just to uh, have fun, and this tournament seems like the best possible way to do that while also having Kill with Fire in the main tournament. Amen to that, Kakoda. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Good luck in your freestyle fights, and good luck in the rest of the tournament today. Thank you. I'm doing great. I'm, I'm happy to be back. <laughs> We're happy to have you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, back to you. All right, we're going to load into cage four here. I can see that it's Raptor X-22 facing off against Drunken Peasant. Now, Drunken Peasant is our uh, robot here from Mexico. The Builder Soul here came and competed in the early days uh, here at NHRL and uh, took much of the pandemic off. This is his triumphant return uh, to the competition. Now, I was reading in the notes, very interestingly, that Drunken Peasant has some autonomous features inside of the robot. So we're going to have to see if that is a, a factor in this fight. Five, now, Raptor X-22, run by Patrick two, Murphy one, from Brexco, fight, Ohio, and Fighter fight. Jet Robotics. These are two 12-pounders that have had limited uh, experience here at NHRL, but they have fought for the boxes. Wow, big hit there, peeling off bits of plastic. I think that that is plastic off of Drunken Peasant. Raptor X-22 coming in here to kill. But Drunken Peasant able to get off, get off of the rail with just the gyro motion of that egg beater. Wow, and it looks like Drunken Peasant is heavily impaired, but refusing to die. Soul here absolutely loves this competition, and he's been eager to get back. Now, the interesting thing about Drunken Peasant is that it has never fought in Mexico. There are not 12-pound boxes in Mexico. The only place that Drunken Peasant has fought is here at NHRL, and it is Damn getting wow. shredded. That is a tap out. I think your winner is Raptor X-22. Wow, Patrick Murphy picking up a win against a big opponent in Seoul. Drunken Peasant, our scrappy 12-pounder from Mexico. You can see Seoul there in red. He is trying to take a look at his robot. When they open up this uh, box, I'm sure he's going to take a qu uh, close look at the damage. Let's take a look here at this replay. Now, Raptor X-22 is a uh, pretty conventional kind of Drisk um, design. Powerful vert. And just eating away at pieces of drunken peasant. Yeah, there's a huge amount of debris in the box, and uh, it just looks like a hurricane came through there. Sure does, but you know, that's what we like to see sometimes. I mean, it's amazing sometimes how much damage can happen internally, and the robot still looks fine on the outside. I yeah. really like the flip side where things just got shredded. We're yeah. gonna head over to cage two now. We've got a fight coming up. Ooh, that's uh, a big high fight noon here. hoopla. Ooh. Three, and I think, is that Chubby two, Unicorn in the corner there? One, Facing off five, against Tim Hubert and Chubby five, Unicorn. It is. High Noon Hoopla is a modified SSP kit run by Cole Wilson. And uh, facing off against one of the top ranked Beatles at NHRL uh, at this moment. Wow, and going toe to toe with Chubby Unicorn. 
Let's go, Cole. Now Cole finds himself on his head. I'm sure that he'd like to uh, lift himself back into place. But I don't know if Tim is going to allow him to. You can see Cole there in red with the hat. And Cole is piloting this robot very well. It is just tough to face Tim Hebert. He is such an aggressive driver with these short, sharp, controlled motions, really looking for these angles. Yeah, the uh, the ability of that robot to just kind of line it up and strike, line it up and strike, line it up and strike, absolute key to its strategy, and it, it works almost across the board. There's very few robots uh, where that strategy is not at least somewhat feasible. Now, High Noon Hoopla has found, found itself stuck up against the rail, getting that one unsave, uh, that one unstick. Tim Hebert, just cool as a cucumber, back on the attack with 90 seconds left in this fight. I don't think there's 90 seconds left in High Noon Hoopla. I can kind of see parts of that armor being peeled up. The SSP kit is incredibly tough. You can see that it's gone, you know, two minutes in the box of a killer and chubby unicorn. And the thing that I like about uh, Tim is that he puts on a show. I mean, he is way ahead on the points and he is intent on racking up another knockout here. You can see that armor package on the top of High Noon Hoopla is peeled up. Yeah, that is uh, starting to split open like a tin can on a hot summer day. 40 seconds left here in this fight. Good pushing power from this SSP kit, wow. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, that is a uh, reliable uh, assembly of parts. Uh, despite the damage, it, it just continues to, to hang in there. Somehow, uh, you know, Cole is taking it the full three minutes, which is absolutely uh, something to say because Tim has not let his foot off the gas. He's gone full send to the full three minutes here. Even in the last seconds of this match, Tim is attacking. We're gonna go to the judges, but I think that this is a win for Chubby Unicorn. I do also agree that was pretty decisive. I can see that we've locked up the box here in cage three, and this is, yes, Chef, and Alex Pezza facing off against Dutch Oven. Now, delightfully, the uh, builders on the Dutch Oven side are dressed up as chefs. So, it's very uh, cute. you know, we've got yes, Chef on one side, we've got a Dutch Oven on the other. We've got a uh, culinary match here, Ricky. <laughs> I, uh, I'm excited. Oh, I see a little spatula situation going on. Yeah. I don't know uh, how the Dutch do their ovens differently, but, uh, you know, I know that it's a thing. You never used a Dutch oven, Luke? I've had a Dutch oven imposed on me before, oh. Ricky. Oh, I see. You know, I've got friends who are so enthusiastic about their Dutch ovens, they bring them camping. Oh, oh, I meant the other way, Ricky. Hi. Uh, don't Google it, folks. Had had no idea. I'm going to leave that lie. <laughs> um, speaking of cooking utensils, I uh, am very uh, uh, enthusiastic about almost any kind of creative um, way to prepare a meal. And uh, you could kind of call this preparing a meal. These are one robot trying to eat another. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, they like cooked food. Yeah. Everybody likes a good home-cooked meal. Now, Alex Peza is a sous chef from New Jersey, and uh, he built Yes Chef and just stormed onto the scene as a rookie, went incredibly deep in his very first competition here at NHRL, 
Dutch five, oven, relatively four, new robot three, from an experienced two, builder. One. Fight. From robot Alex Grant, fight. the captain, the, one of the co-captains of Tantrum on BattleBots. Big claim here oh. early in this match. Dutch oven is working the way it should now. Wow. Look at that flame. And folks, that is a hot, hot flame. They wow, are just billowing flames possible. out of Dutch oven. The crowd is going nuts. I'm going nuts, Luke. That is amazing. Wow, it is so hot that it, the, the, the screen is just going white here, Ricky. Yeah, I can't see anything. But I can turn to my left and see a tremendous amount of fire, and that's really all I care about. Oh, yeah. that seems like a lot of fire from inside Dutch oven now. It looks like it's maybe uncontrolled fire inside of Dutch Oven. Dutch Oven might be on fire itself. I think they'll take it if it means a little more damage for their... Oh, wow, that was quite a hit. Big hit from Alex Peza on Dutch Oven. Oh, it is trying to self-right and struggling to do so, Luke. Wow. Yeah, only one side of that self-writing muse <laughs> museum. Self-writing mechanism is working. Wow, the house bot coming in here trying to self-write Dutch Oven. And I don't think it's going to work. Dutch Oven is on its head and that arm is broken. 90 seconds here left in this fight. Big flames out of Dutch Oven. And they are asking for Alex to hit me, hit me, hit me. Can Alex yeah, come in and save? Uh, no, that is a tap out. Your winner here, Alex Peza, and yes, Chef. A well won fight. That was uh, an absolutely delightful fight to watch, Lou. It is really incredible. Uh, like, I feel like sometimes we just miss it on camera. When you can see it live, like, the colors are vibrant. It is brilliant. It is incredible to watch this live. It really, really is. Look at that amount of flame. It's all-encompassing. I mean, the moments where, where Yes Chef was in the clutches of Dutch Oven, it was completely bathed in fire. Every, every square inch of that robot was covered in flame. But ultimately, it was these big hits from Alex Peza and Yes Chef that uh, popped Dutch Oven onto its head, breaking that arm, and Dutch Oven unable to, uh, to continue. You can see these parts just kind of getting peeled off of Dutch Oven. And uh, yeah, one, one fiery way to die here in this, this fight. Alex celebrating boy, oh boy. with the audience. Incredible. Yeah, well-earned victory, well-earned celebration. We're going over to cage two now. We get another three-pound fight with... It's not just any three-pound no, fight, Ricky. This no. This is Booty Brigade. Now, uh, Booty Brigade is back in the box, facing off against Event Horizon. Now, Booty Brigade is our uh, loophole-style robot uh, with Droopy and Lynx sharing a uh, starting square here. Yeah, again, for those at home who are uh, maybe a little bit behind on the definitions, uh, the reason we call this a loophole-based uh, robot is if you fully exploit all of the weight bonuses that are allowed for a walking robot and for a multi-bot here, you can end up with two full three-pound robots fighting on one team in the three-pound class. It's a little bit of legalese in our rules, but you are allowed to do it. Someone figured that out, created a team called Loophole to take advantage of it, in which case, oh, there's some puns. Sorry, just to drop off, but it's very distracting, Luke. Um, it's a little bit of cake here in the box. Uh, did we ever figure out if that's actually a thing that that people say. YouTube Live, you know, check, uh, you know, let, 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 let us know, you know, do, do the kids still say the word cake? I don't know that they ever did, but <laughs> I'm uh, going back to things. You've never you heard have... of Dutch ovens and you've never heard of cake. This is, they're related. Maybe. I see, got it now. <laughs> um, I wish I didn't, but 
we're going to go to Kyle to mercifully save us from these particular topics of conversation. Kyle, if you are talking about cake, I'm going to come up there and strangle you. No, we're not talking about cake. I'm talking about Yash and Baby Grimm. Yash has shown up to this competition with a built-in fan base and a lot of history in this sport. So, Yash, welcome to National Havoc Robot League. We are so glad to have you. You're here with the Team ASML folks. Uh, where, what's your history in the sport? Where have you fought before? So before uh, fighting to US, I've been fighting in India. So like around two years back, I moved to US for my masters and then uh, I was studying in New York University. So this is my second time fighting at NHRL. Before that, I fought uh, in June at NHRL with Around, which is which is part of ASML group as well. So I've been in that group for a long time, but Baby Grimm has been like uh, in works for last eight months. So before everyone joining ASML, I was like working on Baby Grimm, but unfortunately, like we had multiple issues, like parts were in customs and like various things were there. Like most of the machining things were there. Yep. So finally, I could see Baby Grimm. Baby Grimm had its first fight with uh, Minan and Plusel. Uh, we lost that match because uh, I think one of my ESC burned out in my drive ESC, so that didn't go well. And the second fight was with Hooligan, so that was a good fight for me. Gotcha. All right, well, we got to get back downstairs. Let's get a shot of Baby Grim really quick. It is a bot with a superior strategy. At least that's what the chat says. Thank you so much, Yash. We appreciate you. No problem. Thank you for all, and thank you for NHR like hosting for such kind of an event. Okay. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to jump into the action here in Cage 2. Event Horizon facing off against Booty Brigade. Five, four, three, two, one. Fight, robots, And fight. away we go. Now, Event Horizon is a friction drive ring spinner. Whoa, oh, big hit on the ring spinner. Hits. Link sending the ring spinner into the lights. Again, another big roofing from Calvin, Eva, and Link. You can see that ring spinner just uh, just desperate to get back onto its feet. And it looks like perhaps the ring spinner has embedded itself into the rail. I, uh, I don't know, Luke. I think that might just be dead in the water right now. Wow, let's see if the unstick is going to happen. I, uh, yeah, that is not stuck. Oh, that is yeah. just, nope, nope, it's just dead, Ricky. Just dead. Maybe, uh, maybe the house bot could push it back to the door, because this may be a count out here. Yeah, I think any moment we will see that count out or that tap out kicking in. All right, so the count out, oh no, oh, oh no. Oh. Calvin. Can, can Calvin, you do that on kids television? on the stream. Oh no. Wow. Total domination from Calvin, Eva, and Lynx. Not afraid at all of being the heel in this, uh, this competition. No, really rubbing it in there. Wow, your winner is Booty Brigade. Let's take a look here at this replay. Big hits. Calvin, Eva just taking it straight again, uh, into uh, the face of this ring spinner, sending it into the lights. Gonna see another roofing here. Oh, wait, no, maybe here. There, there, we go. there we go. And that ring spinner was just rolling around, and uh, Calvin managed to just kill the uh, the electronics entirely. But uh, we're gonna continue the action here with Cage Four. We've got Honey Shock facing off against the Yoblins. Yoblins, uh, one of the cuter that... combos. I don't think I don't it actually see the Yoblins. I, I don't either. This isn't looking Yoblin-esque at all. No. Unless the Yoblins have been... Uh, nope, nope, it's a Brazilian team. Nope. Yeah, um, Shape-shifting Yoblins. Yeah, That's no, what nightmares there, are, are made of. there are Brazilians in this box. I do see a Team Honeycracked robot on the other side. Now, we may uh, pause the start of this match so they can fix it in uh, the, the match management software. Uh, they want to record, you know, the correct fight. Sure, sure. Yeah, they, they want that data to be 
uh, not have to be corrected later for certain. The amount of work, by the way, that goes into uh, categorizing and cataloging and collating and a whole bunch of other C words. Yeah. All of these fights and getting them available online for competitors and for spectators like you is amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. The staff that we have that does that, it's, it's fantastic. Oh, and here are the Brazilians bringing the up the spirit a little. software is linked everywhere. There's software in the box, there's software up in the pits, there's software on the stream, and, uh, you know, <laughs> you need to get the right names of all of your competitors in there because you don't want to be winning or losing a match on behalf of somebody else. And we saw the Brazilians there in the cheer section. And uh, they are very enthusiastic about uh, their little corner of the box. And yet uh, we are still, uh, this is a mysterious matchup here. Yeah. I th From this angle, it's really difficult to tell what these robots are because they're both black. Yeah, I, I can kind of suss out that it is maybe two undercutter, two-wheel drive robots. Okay. Oh, okay. A little bit better. A little bit better. I think that this is the uh, Team Honeycracked robot. I... And the Brazilians are over there in pink. Yeah, so, okay, all right. Little, a little data. Oh, oh. what uh, is happening? Oh, okay, we have updated information. This is Buzzkill from Team Honeycracked facing off against Duck. Now, uh, they're going to be switching their sides here because uh, Buzzkill is supposed to be in the pink corner and Duck is in the blue corner. Now, Duck is named after Lucky Duck. This is their mascot on Team Warrior. We've seen Lucky Duck on BattleBots with Black Dragon, and they have taken that very duck again to the U.S. as a Five, good luck four, token. Three, two, one. Fight, robots, That duck fight. has traveled more than most of the population. Of the yeah, that's true. Uh, duck also ha Lucky Duck has its own Instagram account, so uh, go and check that out. I, that doesn't surprise me. Somehow. Ooh, a big hit! Honeycracks now on its uh, on its side. Buzzkill there, getting back onto its feet. Now we can see that Duck is a big vert here, facing off against an undercutter in Buzzkill. But Buzzkill successfully getting around to the back of Duck and landing one good hit. Uh, one, one good hit. I can hear the Brazilians cheering on that side of the box. They are hoping that Duck will advance here. Two minutes left in this fight. Man, you, uh, you see such an intense amount of gyro from Duck. And that's really interesting coming from Brazilian bot. Uh, normally they are so effective in, in using that gyro to their advantage. You know, that kind of uh, dance is, can be very precise when you're used to it. Here it seems like a mobility issue. I don't know what's going on in this fight where they're, they're struggling quite a bit more than they usually do. Uh, they are having a tremendous amount of trouble bringing the attack to their opponent. Now you can see Duck just gyred itself back onto its feet, but that uh, robot is not moving. I don't think that the, uh, the wheels are moving at all. This oh, wait, is no, maybe it was high-centered or something. The drive, the drive is certainly impaired on Duck. Yes, yes. I will say, on the flip side, this is one of the better Honeycrack performing days that we've seen. Uh, uh, Min uh, Final and Bustle are doing yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Um, Buzzkill seems to be you know, lining them up and knocking them down. One of the big factors that is going to affect the trajectory of Team Honeycrack is their brand new big box test box. Now they purchased a uh, 12 and 30 pound uh, test cage and uh, they are now able to run their own tests in Maryland. Yeah, they bought that box just to improve their performance here at any A bit of high centering on Duck there for a moment. 
20 yeah. seconds left here in this fight. Yeah, and it does look like perhaps something is uh, sticking out of the bottom of Duck that is high centering itself. Now uh, the, the bottom right side of their front wedge is bent downward by the horizontal spinner of Buzzkill. Uh, that effectively makes that right side drive useless. Uh, if I were that robot, I, I think I might want to run in the inverted position, but they decided against it. Uh, we're here at the end of the match. It will be going to the judges, but frankly, I think that was pretty dominant there for Buzzkill. Don't think it's going to be a tough decision for the judges to make. Yeah, this may be our last match of the day for Duck, but uh, yeah, high cinching yourself. That is a tough way to go out. Now, Ricky, with just a little bit of time between the two fights, I do want to share with you, do you know the origin of the Lucky Duck? Uh, no, no, I don't think I do. So the very first time that Team Warrior came to, to uh, the U.S. to mm -hmm. fight, this was like 10 years ago. Right, right. Uh, the team went to a arcade to, uh, you know, blow off some steam like before the competition. Yep. And they won the, the duck inside of one of those claw games. Adorable. And uh, they ended up doing really incredibly well in that competition, convinced that the duck was somehow imparting some luck Obviously. to them. Obviously. They flew the duck back to Brazil, and they have been passing the duck down um, to teams uh, that pick up the uh, Team Warrior banner. Wow. The original winners of Duck, you know, they are now in their 30s and they <laughs> are working careers and everything. Sure, sure. But uh, yeah, passing on the Duck is part of their kind of like, um, r it's a rite of passage between uh, successive teams for, I, for that. I had no idea. That's a fantastic story. All I, yeah. I have seen the Duck traveling. I know yeah. about, you know, like buckled into seat belts <laughs> and planes, yes. trains, and automobiles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, deserves a first-class fight at this point. Of course. I, I think they should not mess with this if it works. Yeah. You know, I'm not big on superstition, yeah. but uh, they're clearly a team that has a lot of good luck. Yeah. Why mess with what works? It's like the Velveteen Rabbit. You know, it's just so well-loved now mm -hmm. at this point. And uh, it is the same duck that you saw on BattleBots, and they are just bringing it here to NHRL, and that's really, really cool. I, I love to hear it. Yeah. Love to hear it. It's... Also such a wonderful, nice, goofy, but well-natured team. It fits really perfectly. I Yeah. The antics you see are just fantastic, and, and it fits so well with their personality. I really love it. Yeah. Uh, we are going to head down to the uh, cage one, is it? Yes, cage yeah, one. Yeah, now this is Honey Shock face, facing off against the Yoblins. That makes a whole lot more sense. Now, the Yoblins here are this multi-bot in green and blue. Honey Shock here is in yellow and... Uh, Aluminum or you know, metal, bare metal. And Honey Shock just looks so good. Yeah, I, uh, like I said, they, all of Team uh, Honeycrack is just doing fantastic today. And Their robots I, I are looking gorgeous, Ricky. Have, have we, uh, have we checked for like performance enhancing substances on this team? It's such a <laughs> rapid improvement. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, Honey Shocks, they're, they're an amazingly large team up there. They're very serious about the sport, and we just haven't seen the same kind of performance out of that team that we've seen out of other teams, like Team Stamina or uh, Team Pandemonium, Team Shreddit, et cetera. But uh, I think with this new test box, that is really going to accelerate their designs. I say this as Team Honey Shock looks like, uh, you know, Honey Shock could, could be dying here. Could be. Oh, it is high centered. It does appear that it's just, yeah, it's okay. just high centered on something. That floor is rough. Um, as it goes crab walking away into the night, Ricky. Mm -hmm. You know, I, to, to emphasize this deal, having a 30 pound arena to test in. Uh, there was a time not very long ago that there was one 30-pound arena in the country to go fight in. Yes. Uh, the fact that things have grown so quickly and so dramatically in the last couple of years is enabling incredible progress. Now, you do you know the origin of the 30-pound uh, the arena that they purchased? Uh, yes, I'm trying to. I'm trying to recall though, because it was it was used from another competition on uh, West Coast. Oh, no. Originally, it was Fuzzy Maldens. It was one of Fuzzy's 30-pound boxes from the uh, the robot, robot restaurant. Ah, oh, from yes, from the um, robot bar and grill. Yeah, and then it got passed around. It got sold. Uh, it passed. It passed through several you know builders' hands. 
And uh, finally it came up for auction and uh, Zoe was able to pick it up. Very, very cool. 40 seconds left here in this fight. Now it looks like one half of the Yoblins is dead. Honey Shocked is crab walking. This other Yoblin is uh, not doing great. No, <laughs> crab I... walking as well. You know, I'm, I'm noticing quite a lot of uh, kilter, shall we say, uh, a lot of camber to the weapon on the remaining working Yoblin. I don't think that's intentional. I think that is, is a skew either from its own impact or from the impact of his opponent. Oh, this is not going to wow. be a fun one to call. This uh, one will go to the judges, and that was a street fight. A lot of damage on both sides of the box here. I will say, though, that Honey Shock was able to get to the door under its own power, which is saying something. Yeah, yeah, they uh, have a lot of experience in crab walking, for better or for worse, and uh, they were able to translate around that, that arena pretty easily, despite their mobility issues. Uh, certainly more mobility issues, I shouldn't say certainly, it appeared to have more mobility issues, but just better compensation than the, uh, the functional half yeah. of the Yoblin yeah. uh, in the arena. So it's six of one, a half dozen of the other, going to be interesting to see. I think it's going to be the control and the aggression side more than the functionality side in the judges' mind. Yeah, yeah. But absolutely. we'll see. Yeah, very exciting. I can see that we're loading into cage two. Tommy Wong is back. I, Tommy Wong Luby, is everywhere, I think. Then. Prolific. Yeah. Absolutely prolific. Now, this is actually going to be a really key fight. I hope that we can go to cage two next. This is going to be Eruption facing off against Loopy. Now, Eruption is one of our top ranked robots that is still waiting for qualification. And to get there, he's going to have to go through Droopy. Massive, massive. Really stunning for me, the fact that we can have someone uh, that good this deep in the tournament and still not be qualified for finals. But first, let's go to cage three. This is a box uh, that is locked and ready to go. Now we have Hurt Caboose over in the pink corner there in neon uh, highlighter green facing off against Jack Ketch, a bad crew uh, egg beater. Oh dear. Luke, are you on the That's Team Green? Is that a thing, Ricky? I, there, there are, a, it seems there's a fierce divide for highlighters being green or yellow. Oh, well, I don't see that well, so uh, everything <laughs> looks a little. You did say that a red and a blue robot was white and yeah. black earlier today, so. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go over to cage three here. Now, this is a chaotic and just hard-hitting start to this fight. And the uh, now, Angel Vidal wow. roofing his Huge opponent. Hit. Now, Angel Vidal is running a hub motor a drum here. And uh, you can see that already one half of the drive on Jack, Jack Ketch is impaired. Wow, a little one-two combo there from Hurt Caboose. Hurt Caboose pushing uh, Jack Ketch up against the house spot. And is this where Jack Ketch goes to die? Is this the final resting place for Jack Ketch? It sure seems like it. It is like perfectly it. on its side. And wow. Oh, it will escape, I think. It's just... Uh... Oh, the power looks like it is out on Jack Ketch. Bert coming in here for the unstick. And Angel preventing the unstick. Wow! Pulling the Tony D'Ambrosio, Ricky. I wonder how Tony feels about that. Tony should be proud of that, all right? You want to be, uh, it's like sandwiches. You want to you wanna have a sandwich named after you, okay? If you can have a rule named after you, if you can have a maneuver named after you, you're doing well in the sport. That's, you know, that's a very good point. Now here comes Bert, just trying to uh, somehow reanimate this dead body here in Jack Ketch. That robot is dead. It has passed away. It is no more. It is a former robot, Ricky. A shell of its former self. 
Hurt Caboose here winning this fight by knockout. Those were just such incredible hits from Hurt Caboose. Knockout. Uh, fantastic driving to boot, but really just each one of those what could it could have been a knockout punch. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and it was one after another, and, and his ability to keep that robot relatively stable, despite having such a strong inclination to, to gyroscopically walk around the arena. So much skill on display. I'm very, very impressed. Yeah. I can see that we're getting ready here in cage oh. two. This is going to be oh, a really baby. big kind of choke point in the bracket. Now, yes. for Eruption to advance, it has to get through the unkillable robot in Loopy. Now, Loopy is a new and upgraded, it's kind of like Droopy X, basically. Uh, it has some new materials. Tommy Wong here already has a golden dumpster in his pocket from earlier in the year. And Brian Voxel trying to win uh, this match. He has to win this match if he is going to advance to the finals, if he has any hope whatsoever. Mm. Can he kill the unkillable robot? That is the drama we see playing out before us. Uh, my money is on no. I think we're gonna see, I think we're gonna see this match go the distance. I don't think uh, Loopy is gonna die. Now, Brian Boxel is known for his aggressive driving and his box rushes, which is what you need to do with Droopy. Mm -hmm. Can you push Droopy back into that starting square? Can you just land pin after pin after pin? We're going to have to see if Brian can do it. Five, four, three, two, one. Fight. Oh, way he goes. Fast guard out of the box. Oh! Just fire right back up. This robot cannot die. Immediately up to speed and immediately up to operating speed, too. It's not like it's sitting there getting ready to hit. Uh, the weapon is down on eruption. The left side drive is struggling. That hub motor is dead on eruption. This is the last fight of the season for Brian Boxel and the eruption. Tap Loopy. Out. Staying alive in the competition, Loopy getting dangerously close to its own invitation and a possible golden dumpster. My goodness. Wow. What a showing. That is an absolutely massive hit that started off this series of exchanges. And one after another, you can see that, that Eruption almost had no chance here. I, there wasn't a better direction that they could have taken to attack Loopy. Uh, it's not a, a lack of strategy. Uh, they would have had that same issue regardless yeah. of where they hit. Maybe the only thing they possibly could have done differently uh, was attack a little better while, while Loopy was unstable. Now, and Eruption. even then, not a whole lot they could do different that would be better. Yeah, Eruption is our top-ranked Beetle to get knocked out of the uh, the competition early. Mm -hmm. Now, Eruption was ranked number five. We may see that ranking drop in 2024. Yeah, at the rate we're going, unfortunately, Eruption has had um, a little more trouble as we've gone along. I think in part because robots like Eruption are designed to be countered at this point. Um, or rather, other robot roboteers are designing their robots to counter Eruption. Now, the Brazilians are back in cage one with Chupa Cabra. Now, they are facing off against David Small and Son of Cram. David uh, is entering this competition ranked number 14 of all time in the 12s uh, with Son of Cram. David has not yet qualified for November. He needs to get through Chupa Cabra to do so. Now, uh, Ricky, when you look at Chupacabra, what battle bot does that remind you of? What Brazilian battle bot does that remind you of? Oh, all, all I can think about is uh, goat sucking cryptids. Oh, I'm completely, completely distracted. Uh, Jersey Devils and uh, yeah. Southern. Uh, no, really, it's, it's, it's Texas. But Ricky, no, that's it's a miniature black dragon. I, I know. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, it well, is I'm incredibly. To help you out, Ricky. 
No, I just want to talk about cryptids, Luke. Okay, we can do that. Chupacabras are um, incredibly interesting. Now, you, you said New Jersey chupacabras are from no, New Jersey? No, they, they're not from New Jersey. Okay. I just, right. I, like, I went to Jersey Devil. I thought the chupacabra somewhere. was like maybe like a Mexican cryptid or something. Yeah, Five, South, South Texas, northern four, Mexico. Three, right. uh, two, these one, creatures, you know, fight, roam prairies and, and suck the blood out of goats. Now here we see this miniature black dragon getting out of the box, but Son of Cram popping Chupacabra into the air, tipping it up against the rail. David Small now attacking the house box. So angry that. This is one of those moves that oh. we've seen really get developed oh, here this, this is, year this to is prevent be really the save. important. Son of Cram has lost its weapon belt. As soon as uh, Chupacabra is off that rail, Son of Cram is going to have a devil of a time keeping up. So it needs to do its best uh, to kind of interrupt this unsticking process uh, without causing a pin and take advantage of this situation. It, it may not get another shot like this. Now Chupacabra is powerful enough to gyro back onto its feet. Let's see if that happens. They are gyroing. Can they gyro enough? They're so close, Ricky. Oh, there we go. They're back on their feet. And this game has just changed uh, in the favor of Chupacabra dramatically. Chupacabra is at full power, and Son of Cram has no weapon. And, and the power is out Tampa. on Son of Cram. Chupacabra advancing in the brackets. My goodness. I did not see that happen that way. That did not play out the way I expected. Wow. Anything can happen in the arena. The miniature black dragon staying alive here in the bracket. David Small is out. He's out with both Son of Cram and with Puka. His day is done. Okay, we're going to head over to cage four. We can see Cthulhu facing off against Swagmore. Now, Cthulhu here is in the pink corner, run by... Not Owen Coakley, it's Owen's brother, Cthulhu, here. Run by, oh my gosh, this is gonna kill me, Scott. It is Scott. Five, four, three, Cthulhu is two, Corey, one. Corey fight. Coakley here. Robots fight. Facing off against Cody and Swagmore. Now, Cody is a Team Mammoth team member. That is true. Cody is an incredibly valued member of Team Mammoth. Brings so much skill, not just in um, the normal ways that you would think of robot building, but in some of the computer uh, custom code that we run on our systems. Uh, and just, you know, general spirit and uh, good nature is just wonderful. Now, Cody's landed a good 10-second pin here yep. uh, with his right green robot in Swagmore. Oh, Cthulhu, dear, that minibot. Wow, it's just a ooh, wow. big horizontal, big hits here. Swagmore absolutely incredibly precise in its hits so far. It's gone much better than you would expect. And then you can see this big slash right across the side of the uh, the armor on Swagmore. Yeah, he was cutting into that plastic body. Swagmore here is suffering. I think that part of that armor might be uh, might be high centering the robot. Swagmore unlucky landing on top of a mini bot and Cthulhu just waiting for its prey. Yes, yeah, Swagmore. These massive cuts in the side of Swagmore. Yeah, it is sliced through there like it is not there. Cthulhu is one of the best uh, dialed in horizontal spinners that we have here at NHRL. Um, they have a sharp tooth on that spinner and it can just slice an opponent. Uh, Deep and, and 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 violently, both Cthulhu and Super Scope are able to spin at incredibly high speeds. Uh, they can spin at well over 250 miles an hour, which is uh, you know it's it's not a uh, it's not a limit. We don't tell you that you can't have a specific tip speed, but uh, you do have to tell us if you're capable of going over 250 miles Three, an hour. 300. 300. Okay. Yeah. But yes, uh, once you start approaching that, and Cthulhu has in the past 
uh, spun faster than that, but it, it's a trade-off, right? You know, faster speeds aren't necessarily better. Oh, speaking of not necessarily better, Cthulhu has lost its weapon belt. Uh, this is now a pushing match. 30 seconds left here in this fight. A huge amount of damage from both of these opponents. Cthulhu losing its weapon. Swagmar being cut uh, into, its, uh, into its armor package. And uh, those cuts in the armor really affecting the control of Swagmore. Good pin here from Cthulhu. Well done, Corey. As we enter the last 10 seconds, this one will go to the judges. The judges are going to be deciding who wins this match. Good mobility from Cthulhu. If only they were... Oh, wow. Look, Cthulhu's weapon just powered up. I, uh... What? I don't know how that happened. I must have been incorrect in the particular belt that was... Uh... <laughs> wow, Cthulhu spinning up just to show the judges that it still had a weapon. Amazing. And Swagmore suffering on its way to the door. I am absolutely, <laughs> I'm absolutely impressed at the way that uh, Cthulhu Ricky? was able to slice. Yes, Ricky, I don't mean to blow up your spot, but I'm looking over your uh, your shoulder and you're reading Wikipedia on Chupacabra. What have you learned, Ricky? I have learned, Kyle, and this, Kyle, excuse me. I have learned that I don't even have room in my brain to remember your name right now. No, That's I, fine. It's it's fine. You can call Chupacabras me anything you want, are, Ricky. Yeah, any. Thanks, baby. Listen, <laughs> uh, chupacabras have been reported as far north as Maine. What? Yes. All right, here's, here's, my, here's my theory on the chupacabra. I think right. that it's just like an escaped hairless dog. Yeah, apparently that's what a lot of people The first time you've ever think. seen a hairless dog, I'm sure you've seen these before, Ricky. Yeah. Naturally. Right. Uh, you think After to yourself, I shave them. That thing is uh, not normal. No, all right? no. That's... Well, it's, it's, it's mange. It's, you know, scabies and things. They, right. they, they start chewing on there. You get, you get a weird, stinky, scaly dog. Yeah. Golden have eyes. You, have you ever seen the and dog then, that always wins, like, the ugliest dog yeah, yeah, of it's the crazy. year award? But then you see okay. one of these hairless dogs next to a chupacabra, oh. and you're like, well, obviously these are different. You, you see chupacabras <laughs> often well, up in Maryland? Just on the job. Okay. Yeah. Good. We're going to go to cage five, I think. Please, cage five, save us from the chupacabra. Cage 5, Loophole is back, facing off against Yippy. Now, Yippy is run by Chad New, who is uh, going to be fielding a brand new battle bot for Proving Grounds called Magnitude. Loophole here is hoping to qualify. Now, Loophole did not have a great first performance uh, earlier this year. This is their second outing at NHRL, and they are doing considerably Five, better. Four, facing off three, against Chad and this two, big, heavy one. drum. Fight, robots, fight. And away we go. Now, Loophole here is uh, running Clyde. That is that big red robot here. This is a big, wide capturing robot with a vert. Yeah, this is a really interesting strategy. You've got, uh, wow, so much smothering that can happen here. Oh, you've got a belt down already. I. Can't quite tell if that is a uh, belt from Yippee or uh, it can't. I don't think it could be because Yippee is still running just fine. Oh, sorry, I misspoke. It's not Clyde. It's fully defined. It's a different wide boy <laughs> a robot from Team WBI. I was it's waiting hard for the though. fire to come out of Clyde. But uh, yeah, it looks like Yippee could be dead here. Chad, what happened? Yippee. 
It is uh, dying here in the pink corner. Yeah, it is still able to move a little bit, and the weapon is still going. Oh, oh. you can see the uh, the wheels are spinning. Well, not not anymore. No, one of those wheels is gone on Yippee. Oh, I see what that belt is. That belt is a drive side belt from the side of Yippee. So we are down now to two wheels and a uh, still very functional drum spin, at least. Yeah, it's interesting that in this fight, fully defined was the uh, the Robox that uh, really dominated here. And uh, the loophole side of the robot, the slightly heavier side of the robot, is, uh, is not. I mean, I think that is uh, what some of the naysayers to the loophole loophole uh, reference is that you have this ability of the uh, the mini bot in air quotes the multi bot yeah, option right. being the real dominant force yeah and uh, the core robot the walking robot kind of becomes a you know a, a overthought it needs to be a tank but it doesn't need to it's like a last uh, last ditch efforts you know uh, if you somehow just uh, like kill the uh, the smaller half of this robot they can still come in and kill like we're seeing right here with 35 seconds left the loophole robot is coming in and trying to finish off yippee You can see here this uh, match is just barely hanging on. Yippie has enough control to be able to move around the arena uh, to avoid being counted out. Uh, but it's not going to be winning any matches with this kind of a level of, uh, level of performance. Uh, no, and that is your time. Yeah, we are going to head to the judges. I don't think there's any large mystery here. Oh, that's too bad. Chad was really proud of the way Yippie was performing and yeah. the design on that today. It is unfortunate. Um, you know, speaking of large mysteries, Kyle, you've just joined me here at the desk, and I'm incredibly excited because it means another person to talk about chupacabras with. Oh, yeah. Chupacabras are a very interesting topic. We haven't really do dove into that yet. No, have but we? we've got all night. I guess we do at this point. Yeah. Um, I think. But do we want to pronounce it in the Portuguese uh, Zupacabra? Zupacabra. Zupacabra. Yeah. Zupacabra. 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 I, think it's, I think it's like an SZ combination. All right. I, we'll have to get somebody from one of the teams to come up and actually say it for us. Yes. Yeah, I I'm, think. I, uh, I, I like the idea of a Chupacabra. Mm -hmm. There's... There's a lot of mystery behind the idea of it. Yep. Um, there was a, a rumor that one was around my elementary school when I was a kid. Yep. Steve. I know him. Um, maybe. I don't know if we named it. Oh, but okay. uh, but there was a lot of discussion about it from some of the kids from our class. Um, so, you know, there's some... Were there a lot of goats around your area? Uh, no, it was, it was clear because, Florida. Well... Thanks to the, the Chupacabra. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, if you see any, any goats, ghosts, you know, it's a sure sign there isn't a used Chupacabra. used to be goats, but yeah, yeah, apparently it was around one of the uh, the orange groves around our school. They were huh. talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Nobody saw, got a picture of it because, you know, it was back in the 90s and not everybody had phones, but. Right. A perfect explanation. Right. But, you know, it was there. Yeah, People did saw you find it. any, like, did it molt? Did you find skins? Uh, no, but there was uh, some uh, like rutting on a tree, like cuts on a tree. But okay. that was probably just from a deer. Could could be, or a chupacabra. <laughs> or, or chupacabra. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. Have you ever seen one? I mean, you've had a very interesting uh, life. You no, know, I haven't. I uh, I alluded to earlier, but I uh, I have not personally seen one of these creatures in I've, the wild. Just your history, the way that it is, I would have assumed you've ridden one off into the sunset at this point, at some point in your life. They, well, you know. No. I don't. <laughs> I, I, there, there, there are some interesting uh, stories of, um, you know, personal folklore, I might call it. Uh, you know, last time I was talking, not last time, a few times ago I was talking about that, uh, that puma that I saw walking around in Baltimore yeah. for no apparent reason. Yep. But uh, not quite the same as the, the legendary. All right, so we're going to head down to cage three right now. Three, okay. Well, three pound match. Jack move going up against, uh, let's see, Dun Drumblebee. Drumblebee, I believe. That is correct. Jack move versus Drumblebee. Great name for a bot. You got to love that. Yeah, very cute. 
Jack Move is, of course, uh, captained by Drew Davis. He's down here with literally the entire family. He brought the boys. He brought the wife. They're all here. They were actually discussing on the way up to the box. I heard them uh, talking about whether or not RuPaul was cheating. They were all debating that as a family. Um, they I, did not come to a conclusion. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's fair to debate the... Uh, the value of the loophole loophole. It, we, we have to be pretty clear. They are not cheating. They are abiding by the rules. They check ahead of time. Yeah. Um, but rules you know, that were intentionally written as they are. Like, that was that was very much so the purpose of the rule. Yeah. Uh, do you know, it reminds me, do you know the difference between uh, immoral and illegal? Oh, very much so, yes. Yeah, yeah. And immoral is something bad, and illegal is a sick bird. <laughs> It's like the difference between Five, morality and ethics four, we're discussing up here. Let's talk yeah. about robots instead, Two, shall we? Absolutely. All right. fight, <laughs> robots, fight. There we go. This fight is off to the races. Jack moved back. Uh, interestingly, having a little bit of mobility issues going up against Grumblebee. The minibot getting in the way saying, don't mess with my dad. Literally, my dad. Nice hit there from Jack. Moves. Looks like something shook loose. They got a little bit more mobility added back in. And nice hit up against the wall. Beautiful shot there. Drew Davis, an amazing driver. Just so much control. Does not give his opponents a lot of room to breathe. And then Drumblebee, it's a bot from uh, Vincent Kalia Bogana. And uh, by the way, fun fact, this bot costs less than $125 to make. I love that. I love budget, affordable uh, builds. There's no reason you have to show up here and drop hundreds or thousands of dollars. Uh, you can... You can get away with quite a lot, still have a great time, put on a great show. Make it into the tournament. Yeah. Go up against Jack Boo. Why not? I mean, yeah, it, we shouldn't undersell how impressive it is just to get here in the deck. Yeah, it's really cool. This is uh, Trouble Bees with Desi Robotics of Brandeis University. They have become a uh, standard bearer of the schools that have come here. They're, they show up at almost every competition now with a lot of bots. But uh, Drumblebee now missing one half of the guard system around the wheels. Not a great place to be. Absolutely not. Uh, it is as vulnerable as it is likely to become. That said, those wheels do absorb a lot of punishment on their own. It's pretty impressive how durable they can be in the right circumstance. Jack is just such a uh, such an intense competitor. Not someone you want to get hit by either. No, Drew always goes pretty deep in the competition, no matter which bot he seems to be competing with. Nice pin here. Drew really started in this competition as a control bot driver. And now that he's driving much more aggressive spinning robots, you can still see that history of a control bot driver there in his style. Looks like he might be stuck on his mini bot at this point, though. A little bit of friendly fire issues. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know if maybe that's intentional somehow. I don't know what the goal would be. But we are going to go to a judge's decision, and we'll see... Uh, See what the judges have to say about it. I don't think that one's going to be too terribly difficult for the judges to no, figure out. No, I, I agree with you there. We've got a series of three-pound matches that are loaded in and ready to go for you guys. Yeah, we are going to be going one after another, fight by fight by fight. You know, with your extensive knowledge of mythical creatures, I have to ask, and this is a semi-random question, oh, okay. is there any difference between a unicorn and a unicorn with wings? Or is it just a unicorn with wings? I, re I recognize that a horse with wings is a pegasus. Yeah, I, I would have... Um, yeah, I, I believe that's, you know, it's a unicorn pegasus or a pegasus with a, with a horn. Pegacorn or unisys? I, I don't think it's a pegacorn, and a unisys sounds like some sort of, um, you know, server system that you might find in, uh, <laughs> you know, a tech startup. <laughs> so, ah, fair uh, enough. Fair uh, enough. you know, this is a great question. 
I just ask because, you know, the, uh, the mascot for Chubby Unicorn, I just noticed, has wings. Uh, it could also be, you know, some sort of fairy unicorn. I like oh, that kind yeah. Of fair point, fair point. That's um, Ashley Beckman, by the way, in full winged unicorn onesie out here to support Tim Hebert and uh, Chubby Unicorn. A Seraptor. A Seraptor. A Seraptor. That's a much cooler name than I was expecting for that yeah. creature. Awesome. A Seraptor. Oh, that's yeah. great. But generally just a winged unicorn. But that is, that's the fancy term. That's a great name. Yeah, I love I, that. Someone needs to build Seraptor as a competitor here right now. You know, now. Ashley Beckman's been talking about making her own robot. There's a pile of microwaves upstairs just begging to become a Seraptor. I would love to see this happen. Now, there you see Keziah Sky with Chainsaw Kitty. It is Chainsaw Kitty versus Chubby Unicorn. Two robots looking to go deep into the tournament today. Chainsaw Kitty looking to qualify today. And standing in her way is Tim Hebert and Chubby Unicorn. She's beaten them once today, hoping to do a repeat of that same performance from this morning. Now that we're in the tournament, now, these two robots, Kyle, have very much the same style of driving and attack. They are point and shoot. Uh, line up and then strike fast. Generally speaking, Chainsaw Kitty is gonna win these exchanges one-on-one, -on -one, but Chubby Unicorn is uh, just a little more nimble and able to get around to the sides for a better lineup. So it's, it's very much one and then the other, one and then the other. Uh, it's gonna be a question of whose confidence and whose will break, uh, you know, whose nerve breaks first here. Does look like the ground game is going to Chubby Unicorn in these head-to-head -head exchanges, which is a big advantage for them. Yeah, you can see the uh, one of the two forks on Chainsaw Kitty is now bent upwards. That is gonna make it incredibly difficult. Whoa, Whoa big roof there. shot! And then a nice volley return for Chubby oh, Unicorn. This dear, fight that is, is the back belt at from fourth. Chainsaw Kitty is gone. That's not good. Their weapon is down. They are inverted. Their only way to uninvert themselves is with that weapon, or of course using their one and solitary unstick from the house robot. And they do have one unstick left with I a minute and 28 seconds. I think that is going to be the end. Any moment now, there will be a tap out, I believe. That is tap right. Out. That is crushing for wow. Kazaya Sky. That is uh, well understood frustration and, and look at the love there. Yeah, these two competitors are very fond of each other. They've both gone against each other several times now and wow. That was a hard fought match, back and forth match. Keziah was able to beat Tim earlier today, not able to beat him second go around. Chainsaw Kitty will not qualify for the December finals. Wow. Whew. Tough match. It really was a back and forth contest. But you're right, once that fork got bent up, it really all went the way of Tim Hebert and Chubby Unicorn. Boy, oh boy. I, both of those robots had some really, really impressive uh, hits in that exchange. Just, uh, you know, sometimes that's the way it goes for, yeah. uh, for a Chainsaw Kitty. Just before she lost that fight, she roofed him. I mean, like, yeah. that is how close that was. <laughs> Again, it, it was all um, nerve and luck. Yeah. And uh, sometimes, sometimes a unicorn just comes out on top. Often a unicorn will come uh, out that, on top. That is true. That's uh, true. One of my favorite undulates. <laughs> Certainly the best mythical undulate. Yeah. yeah. All right, so we are now hanging out over here in cage one. Looks five, like we've got four, Concord three, two, one, versus Pankata. Fight. Robots fight. I still think Pankata should be like a French pastry. Huh. Sounds good. Like you could have a coffee and a Pankata. I would eat you know, that. You know, like a 10.30 on a, a Sunday. Yeah, 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 that sounds great. Early afternoon, or uh, late, late morning, rather. Right now, Pankata pinning Concord up against the wall, at least the main robot section of it. The rest of the robot is uh, still trying to be on the attack, but not to much avail.
And you can see Concord has this multi bot configuration. They have one kind of short, pushy wedge, one vertical spinner, and one long Smee style Ooh. wedge robot. Listen, listen to that noise. See how it kind of rings like a bell? Yeah, it's impact? lovely. It's very delightful. That is uh, usually a reflection of how hard, like how hard. Oh, wow. Ouch. That was nasty. Very hard hits going on here. But only when they really connect. Pancada, one of the warrior bots from Brazil, captained by Pierre Graciano. Who sounds like somebody who would bake a delicious French treat, actually. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I would trust him to make my pancada. <laughs> Instead, right now, what he's making is a lot of destruction on these smaller robots on the Concord team. Concord from Team Defective. Matt Luther is the captain of this bot, but it is a multi-bot with all the team members helping along. And look at that, the lifter wedge from the, uh, that one half of the multi-bot connection is up. Yeah, they I don't crab think that is coming down. No, not that, at all. That is a terrible spot to be in if they become inverted. That is a one-way ticket to doing the thing. Now, you do have to take out the vast majority of this bot in order to get a count out, but it looks like everybody's still mobile-ish. Yeah, everyone is at least crab walking effectively. So this probably will go to a judges here, judges here at the last 25 seconds of this matchup. Pankata just choosing their shots, taking their time. Yeah, I, I think they understand that it is going to be difficult for them to, to get those heavy blows in. And, and what is going to be key for them is consistent small exchanges. Yeah. Uh, showing off that they have, uh, you know, a weapon that is more durable, that is still functioning, can still do good work without maybe uh, delivering a knockout blow all at once. All right, so it doesn't look like any of the competitors are particularly happy with their performance in that round. No, I uh, think there's some concerned citizens. Currently. Waiting to hear what the judges have to say. Seems pretty clear how that one's going to go, Vivo La Brazil. I, uh, yeah, I think you may have a point there, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> we shall see, but everybody's still able to drive to the door. That's a good sign. Yeah, both of those robots will uh, soldier on. If not in the bracket, then at least in uh, uh, at least in the uh, uh, you know freestyle fights and that sort of thing throughout the day. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they've got plenty of opportunities. There's, there's freestyles happening all over the place. Mm -hmm. it does look like we are going over into uh, one of the larger cages here relatively soon. We're moving our way slowly but surely we through are. the heavier weight classes. The problem is, is that our robots are so powerful this tournament, they keep breaking our boxes. Yes. And that has delayed things a little bit, doing those repairs and doing those fixes. Right. Uh, it turns out you can have a very good matchup when huge chunks of the floor have been ripped up and massive parts of the side rail have been chunked apart. So yeah, we, we do allow, or rather we do require robots to fight in cages that are not perfect. But at a certain point, we do try to make sure that it is still a, at least a suitable playing sir. Absolutely. Right now, though, we're heading over to cage three. Cage three, we're going to have Booty Brigade versus Happy Apple. Oh, how nice. Happy Apple. I know. It's, it's just, uh, you know, brings a little smile to the Booty Brigade, of course, one of five of the loophole-style robots here. The only difference is that this one is a loophole-style robot with two former world champions in Lynx and Droopy. They've managed to get Droopy down to actually three pounds. It is pure chaos. Absolutely. Non-stop. That is a lot of booty in that brigade. Look at that booty. I uh, I can't look away. Four, I mean, three, it's impressive. One two, of them's a lot more dimensional one, than the other. Five, You're obviously doing a bit more squats five. at the gym. Right. Oh, nasty. Wow. Friendly fire hit right there. Link's landing right on top of the house spot. 
And you can see Happy Apple wasting no time going directly in to Lynx and now being a hat on top of Alice Bot. Man, Happy Apple is such a mean looking machine. That is a stripped down race car of a robot. Uh, very aggressive, very quick. It does seem that the weapon may be down on Happy Apple. Yeah, and ooh. Lynx is just so impressive. Happy Apple oh. being captured by Alex Wang of the UMD Leatherbacks. Tire tread has been torn off of uh, one and a half of Happy Apple's four wheels. It's just such a rough place to be in. I mean, you're there. Very you much in between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. So as we see Lynx here, I would just like to point out that of our poll from the uh, from our audience, the top five predicted three pounders for winning this tournament are all out. Yeah, I uh, I want to throw out here though, uh, Lynx, the Lynx half of Booty Brigade, its weapon was down there for a substantial just a second. period of time. Yeah, just a second. Yeah, well, yeah, fair amount. Oh, nope, and it's out again. Yeah, it is struggling. I mean, they were able to bring it back up. Um, I don't think this is a situation where they're just saving it, you know? No, I think you might be right, but one of the nice parts about this particular setup is he still has a weapon in the sense that he can just direct them into the arena hazard that is Droopy. Yeah, it's uh, a redundant plan if I ever saw it. And if you're gonna have an arena hazard, I mean, what better one than former world champion Droopy? Yep. And already qualified for this year, Golden Dumpster winner, Droopy, I might add. Yeah, the, uh, although, is it Droopy on the books? Uh, yes, the, okay. the bot that qualified and is going to the finals is Droopy. Yes, but is this, the... no, this is one half of Booty Brigade. But right, Booty this, is, Brigade. this is not the same Droopy that competes. Definitely not, no, because this one's smaller. It's three, it's a full three pounds, whereas regular Droopy's closer to five pounds. Yeah, oh, I, I guess what we're getting to here is, is that if Booty Brigade were to make it through today yeah. and earn itself a qualification point, oh, yeah. Booty Brigade for, could very well have to go up against Droopy. Very likely. And one of the most interesting things is Loopy is still in the competition. So Loopy, Droopy, and Booty Brigade could all technically qualify at the end of the day today right. if things go the way we think there they might go. There could be so many butts. Yeah, there in really a are. Arena. There really are. And while Lynx is no longer going to be able to qualify, Calvin can still qualify with Booty Brigade. Yeah, yeah. So they've really just maximized their chances at this point. All right, well. Uh, so Tommy, there you see Tommy Wong with his droopy shirt. And there's Calvin. And they're hanging out next to Alex, telling him he did a great job while they ripped his robot to pieces. But genuinely supportive. I mean, you got to give it to Alex. He really did hold his own against two of the best robots in the entire world. Yeah, no, it, that was uh, a fantastic way to hold up against uh, two people I would not want to have to hold up against. No, neither of those robots are going to defeat you on any day of the week. That, right. Going up against two of them, he lasted... A really long time, handled himself very well. Impressive work from Alex. Yeah. Now, as we talk about things uh, and, and talking about whether or not certain techniques and strategies and the loophole, loophole and such are overpowered or not, as this day goes on, I'm Five, kind of more and four, more of a believer that this three, may two, not be a one, sustainable fight. way to Robots run our rules fight. In the Maybe. I mean, uh, it's just, it's interesting that people have known about this and joked about this for years at this point and the, the floodgates may have just opened. Yeah. Alright, so this is Toro Feather from uh, Brazil and they're going up against Sake Schroten Stroven? Stroven. Stroven, yeah. Stroven. And uh, looks like all the belts Literally all the belts of the whole world have just come off of Sake Stroven. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At this point, it's an entanglement hazard. They're like for Toro Feather. They're like little, uh, oh, I don't even know, hula hoops. 
Now, I, I believe, yes, those are the belts that operate the actual weapon at the end of the arm, near as I can tell. Uh, the arm itself I have not seen come into play very much today. Like, I haven't seen it used as the hammer no. that we expect. No, not today, uh, not, not single. I saw it in the test box, it, it worked once. But that was, that was hours ago. It's such an interesting design for a robot. Apparently they ran out of a lot of weight for a lot of things when they were putting it together. Yeah. Top armor, a plow of any sort. Oh, and I see more belts are becoming uh, dislodged. You know, this is a very interesting drive system. Eight-wheel drive robot, which is pretty rare. Uh, and to, to couple those wheels together is just a lot. Oh, oh wow, my. that weapon is gone. That is the entire arm off of uh, Sake Stroven. Now, Sake Stroven was very much so like a quick slap-together build. Toro is not. Toro has a long history as a dominant 30-pounder down in Brazil. It is the 30-pound version of Minotaur. Wow, feel the vibration from here, Kyle. Knock I can, the whole yeah. table is shaking, and we aren't anywhere close to that right No, now. whenever the Toros are in the box, I mean, it's one of those things where if the test box lights up, everybody kind of gathers around to hear what that sound is, what is going on. Sake Stroven brought to you by Luke Moreno, eight-wheeled asymmetrical overhead saw that can be swapped with a lifter. Very I've not seen the lifter configuration. Maybe they ran out of way for it. Could be. It's hard to say, but uh, I do like that design. I, I encourage everyone who shows up with these kind of things. Uh, they get a little nervous sometimes that it, it was slapped together, as you said, or it wasn't put more charitably, didn't have enough time. That's okay. It made it here. It did something that is infinitely more valuable than it yeah. sitting on the shelf until the next event and seeing what mistakes you made. Absolutely. Without, without and Luke was having a lot of fun up in the pits. You could yeah. tell. He was having great conversations. He was learning a lot. He was having a lot of fun testing his bot. Yep. Um, the, going out to Toro Feather mm -hmm. in the tournament, not a bad way to leave the competition. No, especially for a new bot. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. A new bot that is not a typical or even normally competitive design here. Right. It's not someone who showed up and tried to min-max and uh, play the metagame or whatever else it is. This person showed up to try something different, something new, made it deep into the bracket at this point. Yeah. Lost against a uh, absolutely fierce competitor. That's a great day. Yeah. A competitor that's won many competitions all by itself. So, yeah, totally fine. Yeah. Not a bad way to go about it. Congratulations to Junior and Toro Junior uh, for a fantastic performance there. They will be moving on in the bracket. Mm -hmm. uh, Sake Stroven will be going home in not as many pieces, or let's no, say more pieces that it came pieces, here as. More but still, you know. It's, it did okay. It had a good day. Yeah. I still think Stroven, I should buy a violin from a person named Stroven. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, apparently he picked the name out just by randomly typing keys into the keyboard, and that's what came up. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Just That's, that's how jamming. I fill out my taxes. Oh, that's effective. Yeah. Yeah. That little section at the end where it says you knowingly filled this out all correctly, you're like, yeah, I did. Yes, I, Ricky Stroven, definitely <laughs> did. <laughs> Anyway, uh, don't take your tax evasion advice from us. By the way, no, that's not a terrible, uh, not no, a great idea. Don't evade your taxes. Uh, well, I didn't say that. I just said don't take your tax evasion advice from us. <laughs> I'm gonna go with both. Both. Yeah, folks. Go with both. Uh, what a day! We are we are really getting into the part of the night where you uh, chew through matches, three pound fight after three pound fight, the, the kind of meat and potatoes uh, of 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 the competition. Uh, things are starting to shake out. We're gonna see. Who's at the top of the list? Who's not for uh, for the final? Not finals. Well, actually, for the finals as well. But for the end of the night and the um, the final few uh, rounds of the bracket for today, and we are getting closer and closer to naming new people uh, able to get to the finals in November, the championships. Look at these guys in the crowd. Save the frogs. Absolutely, STF from the Ribot team. Love these guys, and, and what a great STEM charity that those guys support. Frogs well, are one of the... Speaking of which, yeah. there is STF. Frogs are one of the few animals where... I've never met someone who's like, yeah, those darn frogs, I just hate them. 
Five, now, this is four, a weird one. Three, All right. Two, okay. Oh, my one. goodness. Okay. Fight. So, Robots fight. Save Yamato. the Frogs, STF from the Team Ribot, going up against Yomato 3, Tokyo Drift. Oh, please ignite. I just want that fire. Give I it to me. Fire. Give it to me. In and around my being. This is not a smoke-breathing robot. This is, in fact, a fire-breathing robot, if they can get this thing to ignite ever. It is a turret shuffler. STF is also a shuffler. Oh, man. The uh, the potential entanglement here uh, from STF on Yamato is... Uh, it's a high chance. Yeah. It is frightening. Oh, and the, the tank explosion we could have. Also quite a possibility. Yeah, that is a huge tank of fuel in that robot going up against a huge horizontal spinner. All you need is the right rupture and the right amount of sparks. Just a little spark is all it will take for a huge blast of flame. Oh! oh wow! Okay, Yamato STF. hanging in here with just a, a smoke machine as a weapon. Yeah, oh, that's a lot of gas pouring out of Yamato 3. Yep. That is an active light waiting approach. You know, they're really just trying to cut down on weight to move around the box a little bit faster. Maybe, yep. I, I don't know. It's not working, though. It There's is no not plans. working. I, um, I have these little hopes. It is remarkably hard to ignite uh, that much fuel. And, oh, there! It's on! Yes, it's on! Yes, we have fire! Fire is happening! Oh, turn Can the pivot the other way! Turn the, the right pivot direction. the other way! Oh, please, get it just a... I want, oh, it's out again. Yep, yep, it's like the wind from STF just blew it out. That is so much power in that weapon from STF. Oh! Wow. It's been beheaded. Ah! Oh! Oh, this is what we're talking noises. about with the 30 pound robots. These keep destroying the, uh, the arena. Oh, we've got a little oh, bit of wow. flame That's out going on. Oh, wow, that's a lot of turtle flame on, on your motto. Precision driving, folks. Ooh. Bits and pieces are being torn out of Yamato. It's going to be beheaded any moment. Oh, that armor is just being ripped through. That is steel cable. It is being cut apart like Twizzlers. <laughs> We I don't all just think learned we're gonna a lot more about how more. you eat Twizzlers, Ricky. Yamato, I think, is going to be saved by the bell, but that is a decisive, decisive match. STF tore Yamato apart. And I don't see a lot of movement coming from Yamato's base, but that uh, no. turret is still pivoting. Yeah, that robot is still running, but when you get that much damage to that, you know, kind of wiry armor, uh, you know... It's hard to move with a shuffler like that. Right, it's all bent out of place. Parts uh, are lifted into the air that shouldn't be. It's definitely not able to move around. Yeah, look at how cattywampus that thing is. Our house bot mounted fire extinguisher came into action there, showering Yamato with a, uh, a blast of CO2. It's just a good thing to have that. You don't want to have all of your fire extinguishing done by humans if you can avoid it. Right, it's the only reason I feel comfortable cooking. <laughs> The, uh, the house robot fire extinguishers that I keep around. All right, wow. so let's do a little replay of this. You can see the gas just pouring out of Yamato, trying to get that ignited, trying to get some kind of offense going, unable to really do so. And you can see STF being really careful with that defensive armor, that steel wire defensive armor, because what they don't want to do is suck that into their weapon Whoa. and get entangled. So once they kind of realized that they could chop that stuff off instead of getting it sucked into the weapon, they went much more aggressive. And that's where you see, yeah, huge hits like this. That floor is probably... Look at these just giant chunks out of the floor. Yeah. Wow. And this is why we've been delayed today. These giant robots have been absolutely destroying these arenas. Who keeps bringing these giant destructive robots to play in our cages? You know, we're really proud of our wood floors here, but I, th there might be a reason to go to 
steal at some point. It's true. Then again, you know, you go to steal and suddenly these big hits, uh, you know, are a lot harder to repair. Yeah, that's true. This is a little bit of Bondo, a little bit of sanding. Yeah, you're fine. worst you're case scenario, we can swap those floor panels. Yeah, and we do that during events sometimes. Sometimes yeah. you'll see them swapping out an entire floor panels if things get too bad, especially in those two pound or the three pound cages. Oh, here we go. We're decked down to three pound action. This is Apex versus Bean Supreme. Oh, Five, Ape four. Apex Three, is driven by Robert two, Walsh. She turned one, 15 years five, old this five, year. He's a five. freshman in high school. He is the Apex Predator, predator of Team Cybers and the Bad Crew. Ooh, big hit there. Bean Supreme knocking Apex across the room. And you can see uh, the modified SSP kit that is Bean Supreme, operated by Razi Strano, 10 years old. Man, I what I wouldn't have given to have access to this tournament at 10 years old. I finally could stop, you know, burning down my mom's kitchen and uh, direct those those fire robots somewhere productive. <laughs> I can only imagine your dining room chairs just flying across the kitchen because of rotary flippers that you were designing at the age of 14. You can oh. see Robert really having to do his best to keep to the side and back of the robot because those, uh, those forks on the front of Beat Supreme doing a great job deflecting his, uh, his beater bar upwards. Robert and Apex are the highest ranked finger tech beater bar in the competition still. This is a design meta that used to dominate this tournament. And now, really, the only highly ranked one left is Apex. Wow, nice lift Look by Bean Supreme. That. Great job, Razi. Yeah, Bean Supreme, uh, excellent showing so far. You got to keep in mind, folks, Bean Supreme's uh, front fork configuration is incredibly well suited to getting under uh, Apex's spinning drum without taking damage. I mean, that is a great counter. Uh, nice hit great there driving, from Apex. But and that's what Robert's got to do. Stay on him. Don't let him get back up. Don't let him keep moving. And once that lifter's up in the air, keep it up in the air. Otherwise, yep, there we go. Nice lift and pick again from Razi and Bean Supreme. I got to give it to Razi. He's a good driver. Yeah, this is. there's a lot of skill on display here for a driver of any age. It's all those video games the kids are playing. Oh, the, the U's and their, their computer videos? With those uh, video scope games, yeah. Razi flipping himself back over after being turned into a hat. Now he's got one of those forks down on the ground. He's not able to get himself back up. Now he's right side up, missing one fork. Still able to use the other one to an advantage, but... And that is how you want to end a fight when you are Robert Wall sending it to the judges after throwing them up against Brett the Brick and having them in the air as the bell went out. Nice work. Great support from Razi for them. Nice work all the way around. Cool fight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they kept it going the whole time. Great rock, paper, scissors, and yet still incredible driving despite the, uh, the good counter. I, I love it when you have a match that is that even between a high energy destructive robot and a control robot. Yeah. Uh, it, Razi got several really great lift and picks there in that fight. Let's go ahead and look at this replay. Here's one of those great lifts right here, right up against the corner completely controlling Apex. And then picked him up by the wheel guard, held him in the air for just a few seconds, showing off that he's got complete control, then driving back out and leaving him on top of the mini bot. This, yeah. this is a tough call for the judges to Absolutely, make. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, where do you come down on this, Kyle? 
I think ultimately just by the points, you've got to give it to Robert Walsh and Apex, but that doesn't take anything away from Razi's performance. He controlled a huge portion of this fight. He was able to get him up in the air and hold him in place several times throughout it. It's just at the beginning of the fight, it was all Robert. At the end of the fight, it was all Robert. He got several hits in between, but man, so much respect for Razi. That was a great driving match, and just sh being able to show that much control over Robert Walsh in any matchup. Oh, yeah, it, that is a, an incredible feather in your incredible cap. Incredible feather in your cap. That kid's got a good career coming if he keeps staying with this support. Yeah. And with this sport, he was phenomenal. No, I'd love Kyle, to see he peaked look. today. It's all downhill. Oh, it's all downhill yeah. from here? <laughs> I, I have seen nothing to me that suggests any of these competitors are really reaching their peak. There is no one here today or at any NHRL event I've seen so far where I'm like, that person doesn't have anywhere to go. Yeah. You know, that. um, that's one of the things that gets me so excited uh, about this hobby, about this sport, is the room for growth and improvement and everything else that we see. Uh, yeah, and, and to watch, watch the young folks ride that wave is fantastic. All right, so we are now looking at uh, Cueo from Henrique Oliveira from Team Warrior. It's a vert with a bunch of different wedge attachments. It's actually been competing since 2018. Uh, down in Brazil. First time here in the United States. They will be taking on the nigh impossible challenge that is Kablooey Tango. Uh, real quick, they just wanted to point out Apex did win five, that match over Beat Supreme. Four, Great job to both three, of those competitors. Yep, yep. Let's go ahead two, and get this fight going. One, However, fight, robots fight. Today, Alex is driving the Blue Tango. Alex and uh, Lucy do co captains of this robot. Alex, the original designer, but there have been so many changes to this robot over the last few competitions. And the entire team really contributes. You can see Bam also from the Team Valkyrie competing with them here as well, driving the minibot. Nice job there by Kablooey Tango. Kablooey Tango, a very powerful undercutter robot, trying out a lot of different configurations today. This is their new vertical configuration, what they're using to face off against uh, vertical spinners. Yeah, I, I, I'm very hopeful. I think this design, obviously, has been proven with a lot of wins against tough opponents. Um, but it's just another one where I don't see a lot of stagnation. They're still experimenting. They're still improving. The robot just seems to get more bulletproof and more um, uh, proficient event after event. So. And wow. one of the things I've got to say, you've got to respect about Alex and the team is the design of the robot has maintained its like pop art flair the entire time. Every new addition just kind of adds to the look and the design. It's beautiful. I mean, it's a piece of art as much as it is a functional combatic robot. Cueo is, of course, a... Uh, vertical spinner. It's coming at you with a lot of hard hits. It's now stuck on top of the minibot, but you can hear a lot of support from the Brazilian fans in the background. It's a big hat on a tiny head, Kyle. <laughs> hard position for Kablooey Tango to take advantage of there, but they are stuck, and now they're getting their one unstick. From Flo the house vibe. Or sorry, Fluffy the house vibe. So much gyroscopic force impacting the way Cueto's driving. And Alex really able to take advantage of that with, uh, with Kabuli Tango, getting under the wheels and under the bottom armor as it keeps coming down. Nice hit there from Kabuli Tango. Got them up against the wall. Oh, boy. You can see just the smoke coming out as that weapon is grinding against the wood. Yeah, that weapon belt is not happy right now. Um, Boy, that is a tough spot to be in. Oh, and I am shocked, Kyle. Well done. That is a lot of skill that it took them to get themselves out of that position. And just knowing their robot as well as they do, knowing what it's capable of and being able to push it to those limits without breaking anything. This very well may go the distance between these two bots. 
Wow, this yeah. one looks like it is going to go to the judges. Indeed, I, uh, boy, that was a fun fight. That was a fun fight. Really excellent driving for both teams. You can see Team Warrior there not exactly happy. Henrique not exactly happy with their performance. I no, think they were hoping to dominate a little bit more than they were able to do. I mean, it is, that is a hard matchup for them to be truly dominant. It is not a hard matchup for them to do well in, and they did do well. Uh, but Kablui Tango at this point is... Oh, it's so dialed in. It's so dialed in, and it's it's hard for anyone to just come and blindside it. And, and I mean, they qualified forever ago. They just keep coming to, right. uh, to grind out, try new things, try out new armor packages, try out new weapon packages. Literally, it's, it, at the beginning of the year, we sat down and we said, hey, you're good enough to compete with the best of the best. You're invited to the championship. And then they just kept getting better. Yeah, literally kept getting better. And it's interesting that uh, Lucy and Alex have been kind of trading off yeah. who is captain this team, who's been driving this bot. And now they're both here together today with the most diverse kind of collection of, of uh, arrangements of the bot that they've had yet. Yeah, underrated strategy, I think. Uh, we're going to hop up to uh, Lindsay in the pits. I think we got a little bit of uh, Super Chat action. Can you guide us through what the interwebs are saying? Yes, we have a ton of Super Chats that they've been holding on to. And don't worry, we're not doing this over the Chibata match. I know everyone in the chat is going to be afraid, so don't worry. Um, but yeah, I wanted to share some Super Chats that we've had. Um, and the first one is uh, a little funny. It's from Eastern, the guy who does things. Oh. Um, and he has to say, I just wanted to do Super Chat because because I'm bored. And he qu clarified he's not bored with the stream. He was just, you know, he was looking for something to do. So thank you. Well, yeah, he, oh. he did a thing. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> uh, the next one is really, really sweet. Vamo Riobots, a uh, proud girlfriend Proud girlfriend of Riobots member, Paolo Henrique. I miss you, and I'm so proud of you always. I'm here supporting you, even in distance. I love you. Have you ever seen anything sweeter? Gotta love it. Aw, thank you, Sam. Thank that was you, so Sam. Sweet. All right, we are going right into cage three. And uh, what do I see over there? It's a little crash fest action for you. I also noticed a little party hat action. Five, well, yeah, four, birthday boys three, in the house. Yeah. Um, two, one, so this is Hurt Caboose five. versus Crash Fest. Angel Vidal versus Robert Run. Two of the best drivers and robot builders in this weight class. Nice pin there from Crash Fest. Two very different design philosophies. Robert Rund, he builds his robot to look like a kid's toy. It's simple, it's boxy, it does what it's supposed to do, and it has two nigh impenetrable front plows, front, uh, front wedges that it uses to pin you up against the wall with a little sand lift, percentage of a lifter. Her caboose is a. Oh, that is a oh, lot of that's smoke suddenly from her caboose. That's a lot of smoke that that is lingering in very odd ways around the box. Yeah, that is uh, almost assuredly some motor controller smoke. Oh, I don't know. That is hard to say now. It could be both. Um, but that is the end of her caboose in this match. Wow. Uh, we're gonna need the uh, knockout. The fire bucket to be cage side and, and that to be extorted outdoors. I love it when your uh, safety team hat and your announcer hat kind of get a little cross mingled <laughs> and you're like giving them instructions on I, what to do with the Yeah, bots. I desperately want to. I trust my team, you know, they, they do a good job, but sometimes I'm here, I'm just like, okay, you're gonna do this, this, and this, right? Right? <laughs> right, now's your moment. <laughs> Save you, Rob. You got. Come on. You got. You got the space suit on. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. That's and you can see uh, angels out there getting ready to celebrate a birthday party. Unfortunately, uh, did not get the present he was hoping for, which was a win in this matchup. Robert Rund pulling out the win after a knockout and uh, hurt Caboose, kind of smoking in all of the wrong ways. Yeah. No. Uh, when you say you're on fire, that's not what you want to do. Wow, I am just, I, I apologize, Kyle. I, it looks like I'm looking at you. I'm looking by you. The holes in that last uh, match in the four, in the cage four arena all yeah. the way through the floor. Yeah, it's not Absolutely good. Absolutely incredible. It's not good. All right, we're going to go upstairs to Lindsay. Lindsay, I heard you have some more super chats for us. What's going on up there? 
You can't get rid of me that easy. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have uh, quite a few more. A lot of them are just shout outs to teams, so we can go through them pretty quick. Uh, sure. But the first one is. Um, uh, Oh, this actually is from somebody else. I didn't put the name in correctly. I'm so sorry, but it's shout out to Team Gopher. Also, Chris Cha, destroy the stream. I'll be honest, I don't know what that means, but uh, you know, shout out to Gopher nonetheless. And, and Chris Cha. Yeah, and Chris Cha. We yeah, destroyed nice the job, everybody. They're still here, so I, I'm not sure. Uh, Stream's still happening, guys. <laughs> yeah. The next one is from Razor259, RIP Lynx's title defense. Yeah. Mm. That one. <laughs> That one, that one was, hurts. Uh, that one hurts. The next one is from Bees Cheese. Team Stamina Sweep incoming. Everyone watch out. Yeah, <laughs> I can see it. I can see it happening. I do think Impact lost, though, so I'm not sure yeah, about true. the uh, staying power of that. But, Quail uh, power. Quail power from Washington Reese, who is cheering on all of the Brazilian teams in our chat. Uh, the next one here is also a little bittersweet. Force of Will Gaming, go mm. Chainsaw Kitty. Man, that one, that one stung a little bit, I'll be it honest. Did. Listen, going out to Chubby Unicorn is a fine way to oh, go yeah. out in any tournament, but yes, I think we were all hoping for a deep Chainsaw Kitty run, so I hear that. Mm. The next one uh, is, is pretty exciting. It's from Dylan TRM. I've wanted to compete for the longest time, but I've never had a robot. I was confident would do well until now. Look out, NHRL, because Scrapper S3 is coming to scrap everything in its path next year. All right, calling their shot a little bit. Yeah, that's great. I'd love to see them come here and get their butts kicked by an 11-year-old. Let's do it. Yeah, that's what it's all about. <laughs> love it. Love it. Go, Dylan. Uh, <laughs> this next one, Eel Monkey Art, is trying to get me to say something in one breath uh, that is going to be very hard. 55 burgers, 55 fries, 55 tacos, 55 pies, 55 cokes, 100 tater tots, 100 pizzas, 100 tenders, 100 meatballs, 100 coffees, 55 wings, 55 shakes, 55 pancakes, 55 pastas, 55 peppers, and 155 taters. I did take a breath. I'm so sorry. You That's did. okay. You I'm did. Very Ooh. hungry. You just described a you know a nice Saturday brunch. And uh, Eel Monkey Yard, I'd like to point out, I did buy one of your uh, one of your stuffies today. I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, I'm gonna give it to my wife. The stuffies are adorable. They're I think super cute. They are one of the one of my favorite things I've seen in these stores thus far. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little biased. They made a delightful one of me. Um, oh, Alex. Oh. This is from Pearl Gray, uh, who has competed before with Data Collector. That's correct. Alexa, order a Peter Bar kit. Oh, all right, Pearl. Yeah, do that. Order a Peter Bar kit. <laughs> Bring it on in. I want to see it. Woo. That would be awesome, man. Peter Bar kits are great. They're really cool. Yeah, hey, great, great uh, bot to compete with. All right, so this is what we're seeing ever here in uh, Cage 4. Uh, it is, this is what we were talking about. This is why we're behind schedule, guys. We got these giant bots coming in here, tearing up the floor so badly that you could see through it. Ricky was saying that the, the panel they replaced with this earlier, you could literally see straight through to the concrete below. Yeah, I mean, thankfully, there's nothing, uh, you know, risky that you could hit if the arena breaches down. That's not something we're particularly worried about. No, but, but you still like, have to fix it. Yeah, I, we don't want pieces of rope. Oh, look at that, it just pops right into place. You oh, don't so simple, yeah. yeah. No effort whatsoever. No, it's a lot easier to swap out the uh, the plywood on the uh, smaller cages because they're literally just kind of screwed up from underneath and you get underneath them and you pop them out and you mm -hmm. put new ones back in. These ones are a little bit more challenging because they fit in there so tightly. We got to keep those seams as tight as possible. Right. So it's a lot of maneuvering, it's a lot of wiggling, it's a lot of grabbing screws and kind of putting them in place so you can use them as leverage to pop the thing around. But once you get it in, it's tight. It fits well, and you need a little bit of uh, Mario jumping action to get it get it totally into place. Yeah, I hope someone takes that, puts it online, and adds some uh, Super Nintendo sound effects. Do -do 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 -do. Boing! <laughs> ba -ding, ba -ding. Yeah, exactly. Or maybe uh, there needs to be some like uh, some either either you would do like a metal song where they're jumping around, or you would do some kind of polka. <laughs> Yeah, so now this arena is going to be set up. We're already in pretty good shape over there in cage one, as you can see. Oh, man. Oh, no. I see what we're doing here. Okay. So this is Yahoo versus Chibata. 
All right, so Yahoo is an incredibly strong and powerful opponent, as Shibata said earlier when I interviewed him. Uh, this is Chad New. Yahoo is one of the most storied drum spinners in the sport. It has been around for years, and there are so many improvements that Chad has brought out, including a new horizontal configuration. He is now going to be using that new horizontal configuration against the extremely hard-hitting robot from Brazil, Chibata. I gotta say, you know, we we talk about Chibata's uh, builder, right? He, he's he's come here as a bit of celebrity. Yeah, and, absolutely. And um, he easily could have shown up with a robot that was just hot garbage. Oh, yeah, would have been fine. People still would have cheered for him. He still would have gotten he, all the love. Yeah, he, yeah. he did not do that. He came with something that was, you yeah. know, very reasonable. I'm not going to say it was, you know, the most polished robot here, but he came here with a real well, competitive. Last time he came five, here, he went toe-to-toe -to -toe four, with Kablooey three, Tango and did fine. Two, like, Kablooey won. Yeah, one, he did fine. Five, yeah, it makes you wonder what five. the guy is capable of when he does take a minute to sit down and polish his energy. Absolutely. Now, look at this. Beautiful the first interaction between the two bots. That horizontal configuration on Yahoo working perfectly against Chibata. I gotta tell you, Rado looks stressed up in the pits when I was talking to him. I can't blame him. I mean, he, he stripped this bot all the way down to the frame and reassembled it for this fight, making sure every component was working perfectly so he could do as well as humanly possible against Chad New and Yahoo. Extremely powerful opponent, as Chibata said. Yeah, there were some definite nerves in uh, the air up in the pit. Wow, nice hit there. I love how that wedge works just perfectly as a ramp to send Shibata up into the air, careening down into the plywood. Rado trying to get his bearings, get himself pointed back out there, but he is upside down right now. It is a little bit harder to drive there. Oh, and he's going into full multi brain mode. There we go, now he's facing the correct direction, but can he get the weapon? Yes, the weapon is up and spinning. He's trying to get a spin around attack on the side panels of Yahoo. Anywhere he can hit on Yahoo that's not those two front or back, the front or back wedges, both of those things are made out of extremely it, thick AR-500 steel, as I recall. Yeah, it, it is amazing. Seeing Yahoo just kind of sit there while Chibata's absolutely stunningly powerful weapon bounces off hit after hit after hit after hit. Yeah. You can cut into this steel a little bit, but you're not going to break it. I mean, it is just so thick. Man. In, in the rock, paper, scissors that is combat robotics, this is a terrible matchup for Chibata, and they are hanging in there. Absolutely. We're going into the last minute of this fight. Everybody's working. The weapons yeah. are working. The wheels are working. Oh. Oh, no. Just took a moment. Yeah, to get this far into a match uh, with basically your arch nemesis and everything still be working on your robot is uh, a stunning victory in and of itself. You got to give it to Rato as well. He's had some very interesting driving strategies. And some of them worked out very well for him in this match. Wow, big weapon to weapon exchange there. Oh man, this is still anybody's game. One good hit on either of these robots could disable a weapon, could disable a drive system. Whoa, massive hit there from Yahoo, sending Chibata screening across the arena. Rato desperately trying to get his bot under control. Last seven seconds this of this matchup coming at you right now. We'll be going to the judges. Wow. That durability in that match is stunning. Absolutely off the charts. I mean, you, this is, you gotta point this out, the first robot Rato has ever built. He just went a full three minutes with Yahoo and everything was still working at the end. Yeah. Amazing. That, that is an absolutely monumental achievement. Just so much hard work and dedication from this man, this rat. This, this rat man. This rat this man. Matt, Matt Rat. Man Rat. <laughs> and I gotta tell you, every single time I've talked to Rato, every time I've interviewed Rato, he is the sweetest guy. Just so kind, so funny, um, and just so grateful for this experience coming to NHRL, being able to compete against these top-notch people, showing his medal.
Chad and knew, rubber by the way, and electronics. And Chad knew, by the way, has had some amazing matches today. Speaking of amazing matches, let's watch this one just a little more. You can see there are some fantastic hits. The front wedge of Yahoo is absolutely the MVP in this match. It is just so effective at deflecting the blows from Chibata, uh, bouncing off uh, just so effectively, or rather, I should say, so ineffectively. Yeah. Um, it's just the right angle, too, just sending any horizontal bar that hits it, careening upwards into the air. Look at that. And, you know, we talk about wedges, and, and some people are very anti-wedge. Uh, but it's important to point out how much can go wrong with a wedge. If you get that angle a little wrong, if you select the wrong metal, it can blow apart in your face and be terrible. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into the design Five, side of it. Four, All right, so we three, are now heading on two, over into one, cage four. Fight, robots where we're going to have Chonky versus Vakatank. Chonky has been on a tear today, and Vakatank, I would say, is the most, shall we say, uh, effective robot from Team Utter Destruction. The bad folks behind Vaka Tank. And, uh, wow. What's going on? So, is their weapon still spinning? I think it is. Oh, wow! Tap out. Immediate tap out. The full force of Chonky's weapon ripping pieces, it looks like, off of. Vaka Tank there, Vaka Tank taps out. Chonky will move on in the tournament. That was vicious. So that means Chonky is going to have to face the winner of Polyester versus Jubilee. But wow, what a hard hit. There you can see Team Utter Destruction standing by, trying to figure out what happened to their bot, tapping out immediately after that hit. Hopefully they have an utter utter. <laughs> and joining me at the desk, by the way, hi, Chris, how are you? Hi, Kyle. It has been a very long time since you and I have shared the desk together. It has been a very, very long time. I am so happy to have you here. I, uh, I, we sent Ricky off to get some dinner, maybe take a nap. He's been up here for a minute, but you're here now. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, you did some really amazing interviews up in the pits earlier today. Oh, thank you. It's a, a really easy job to do when there's so many incredible people to talk to here. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. I had a, a fantastic time meeting builders that are here for the first time, uh, bots that are here for the first time. Just, it happens naturally. All right, guys, so we've got some news for you. We finally got the judge's decision. The winner of the fight between Yahoo and Rato goes to Yahoo. Rato is eliminated from the tournament, so Chibata will be going home. They have already qualified, though, at the last time they were here for the November finals, so they will be back in November to compete in the final tournament. So he's got some time to get, uh, get some configurations put together for uh, bots with big wedges like Yahoo. So we'll see how that goes. And Chad New and Yahoo just trying to get a little bit more practice in before the World Championship also That's qualified. Right. Also already qualified. Yeah, that was basically a practice match for the two of them at this point. But it was a really good match. I wouldn't be surprised if we see that matchup again in only... Yeah. What, two months? Yeah, in only two months, and probably both of them going very deep in that tournament. They're Absolutely. both incredibly talented builders. Uh, I still cannot believe this is Rato's first bot. It's, you know what I mean? It's like, got a patina on it, so that makes sense, but it's uh, the way he drives it, uh, the aggressive style, it's... It fits in so well yeah. into into the zeitgeist here. You know, I, yep. I absolutely love them. I love the spirit of the Brazilians also. Yeah. Uh, tenacious. They are here. They love it. They love it. Yeah, so much passion with those teams, you can tell. And so much support for their fellow builders, which I absolutely love. Um, but yeah, Rato eliminated. 
Thank you so much for coming today, Rato. We really appreciate you. Um, but yeah, he's going to be going home today, or at least he's going to be going to support the rest of the teams from Brazil that are here. Uh, in the meantime, though, Yahoo moves on. They will face the winner of Sombra 30 or Spicy Toucan. Okay. Yeah. I was uh, So I was around last night when Sombra 30 was firing up in the test box. That is a scary robot. That is a scary vertical, uh, I, like a tri bar. Uh, yeah, tri egg bar, egg beater, drum spinner, yeah. Wow, when that thing fired up, you felt it in your teeth. <laughs> and the tri bar design really gives them so many opportunities for engagement when they come in for hits. It is not like just putting teeth on your robot. You have just massive open spaces that you can get in and get under your opponent, catch onto lips, catch onto wedges, and just throw them across the arena. Yeah. The in weapon is so powerful. In a potential matchup, though, with a bot like Yahoo, they have the reach advantage. Yep. They're, they're similar drive styles, but, like, are they going to be more reserved going head-to-head -head with a bar that is, uh, or I'm sorry, a, a drum that's similar to, to Yahoo's. There's just a lot more weight and rigidity in there, and their weapon is a little bit more frail, you yeah. know? So I, I'm really curious to see what their drive style is going to be, because normally the Brazilians, they're go, 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 full send. Are they going to do that against Yahoo, potentially? I you think know. that first weapon engagement is going to tell the tale. If they do end up going together, remember, Sombra still got to go through that spicy toucan. That is true. <laughs> All right, so we are now moving over into cage one. And this is this is going to decide it. So we have Sombra, 30, and Spicy Toucan here in cage one. Love it. And there you see that tri bar there on Sombra, 30, and Spicy Toucan with the vert on your left. Spicy Toucan, good looking bot. Yeah. It is bird-like. I see it. So Spicy Toucan is a Carnegie Mellon robot. Carnegie Mellon has been bringing, a, has got a team here of combat robotics. This is a flywheel hammer flamethrower. It spins up a big disc, uses magnets to transfer energy into a big spike and hammer to puncture the opponent and roast them from the inside. This is a bot right after your own heart. Because uh, it's weird? Because it's weird. It's using flywheel technology to transmit energy into a hammer. It's just, it's complicated. The it's difference is their bot works. And well, <laughs> they went to combat. Well, they went to Carnegie Mellon for you know engineering and design. And, That's and true. You I've been to, to Carnegie Deli, and I love Mellon. Uh, there you go. Practically the same thing. Five, four. You ever been three, to Carnegie Mellon's campus? Two, one. I don't believe so. Five. I gotta tell you, Pittsburgh. Five. Nice town. All right, we are off to it right now. There's Maybe that the size difference from Sombra 30. Oh. oh. There from Sombra 30. We were talking about the engagement they're able to get with that weapon. Spicy Toucan able to self right though. But now, really dazed after that volley of hits, trying to get their bearings straight and get themselves faced in the right direction. Yeah. Are they going to be able to fire that weapon after that huge volley of hits? And now Sombra looks like they're stuck under the side rail, giving Spicy Toucan an excellent opportunity, but they were not able to capitalize. Oh! oh. The side of the spicy toucan. Some of the side armor package on spicy toucan just kind of shattered across Whoa. the side of page one. Sombra is just such a powerful bot with so many hard hits. Every single time Spicy Toucan gets smacked up against the wall right there, it's another opportunity to lose a connection, to have something come loose, to have a battery unplugged, to have a, a speed controller unplugged. And right now, it doesn't look like they're moving at all. Oh, here we go. Oh, oh no! Oh, no! There's the a wheel. Came off. Uh, we've got no Spicy Toucan, they are stuck up in the corner, and uh, Sombra is already doing a celebratory dance, waiting for the count out to happen. Knockout.
Wow. All right. So that means Sombra 30, the tangential drive, three tooth weapon from AGVS and Brazil is going to be moving on. It's driven today by Koan. Davi. And check out these heads. And listen, you can come here with an interesting design, a marvel of engineering, something that's just unique and different and cool, and you may win some fights with it. Yeah, follow your nose. You also might go up against an apex predator in the box, like AGBS's Sombra 30, and get absolutely decimated. And that's, that's how they leave the tournament today. All right, so that means that we will see Sombra go up against Chad New. Um, all right, so wait, right now though, we are gonna toss up to Lindsay, who is apparently upstairs with Rocco. All right, I am here with the Brazilian legend, Rato, uh, just coming off a tough fight with Yahoo. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on that fight and how you felt going into it and what your thoughts are now that it's over. Uh, to me, it's, uh, I, I just learning. Learning, learning, learning. Uh, it's a great battle fight. Uh, I destroyed two moot bots, and uh, my, my, my robot, it's okay. I just lost one screw, screw here, just in it. It's okay, wipe okay, locomotion is okay, but I lost. <laughs> I lost it, I know that's a different here. Uh, I will bring some moot bots in November, like a Hot Wheels, I will go to the market, buy a Hot Wheels, put it in Arena, and uh, I don't know what will happen, but I think that I will gain a more third person, you know, in my to protect my robot. Yeah, I, I, we really look forward to what you bring in November. I think that you have a real shot at the Golden Brett. You performed amazing today, and we can't wait to see more from you. No, it's for, for me, it's for fun, you know. Uh, let me show you my heart attack here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't like competition, as I, I'm here to to compete, and uh, for me it, it, it's it's wonderful. It's a new experience. Five, four, uh, I'm glad three. to back in November. Uh, I will bring uh, some people to my team to help me because I am alone here. You know, I I, I can uh, pilot my robot. It's a moot bot. You know. But that's okay for me. I will. I, I'm here with a lot of friends, Brazilian friends, and I, now I am chair leader. Now I'm chair leader. <laughs> we love Rato. We love Brazil. Thank you so much for being here. We can't wait for November. Thank you. All right. So we are now in cage four with a fight in progress between Julio. Jubi Lu and Polyester. Uh, Jubi Lu has been destroying the arena floors here today. Extremely powerful horizontal spinner from Brazil. Uh, Warrior team going up against Polyester. Polyester is, of course, from Team WPI and Team Ribot. David Jin and Christian with uh, larger versions of their two three pound bots. Polywog and Silk. Wow. They have really been trying to dial in this multi-bot configuration and make it work in this weight class with a lot of success. But the one thing that they are not very great up against are big, powerful horizontal spinners, which are able to throw them for a loop. And that is exactly what's happening right now. Juvie Lou is holding its own. Picking its shots. Yeah, kind of going back and forth between both bots and polyester. Polywog is not moving, just standing there taking these hits. You can see the stress on Christian Cooper and David Jin's face. They're trying to figure out what to do. I think, I think Jude Liu might be just waiting for the tap out at this point. Maybe playing a little conservatively now, getting close to the end of the bracket. 
Yeah, not coming in and going full bore like they have been all day. I mean, the, a lot of this damage that you see on the floor is because of Jubilee's earlier fights, <laughs> right? They have been going full bore all day. This is uh, some of the most haggard uh, cage four we've ever seen. It does look like they're, they're not getting the count out with the last 15 seconds. It'd be a shame if this match... Oh, there we go. We do have some movement from Esther. I am hearing a count, but that well, that's likely the end of the, the, match. End of the yeah, match. Yeah, yeah, because we're down to the last three seconds. So this one will go to the judges. I, I don't even see the point, quite frankly, of it going to the judges at this point, but really excellent showing by Arthur Lionel of Team Warrior. By the way, this pot was originally designed in 2009. It has been competing in Brazil this entire time. It's competed in Brazil, India, and now the US. And it is continuing the year of the horizontal here. I, I love that there's a bot here competing that's older than more than a handful of competitors. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> It's probably older than some of the people driving it. This was a, uh, a really dominant showing by this team and a lot more reservation in their driving style than we've seen all day from them. I think you're right. Now that they've actually shown that they can make it into the tournament, that they are very competitive for the day, they're being a little bit more reserved in how they drive this spot. They want to go deep. They want to see who they're going to face next and uh, make sure that they're in good shape for that. All right, so that was Juby Lou taking out Polyester. They're going to go up and face Chonky next, but right now we're going to go up and talk to Lindsay. Lindsay, how's it going up there? Hello. Hello, uh, Kyle. I have another super chat, and this is actually a really sweet one that I think will uh, mean a lot to all of us. Lindsay and Ricky and, and Chris and Kyle, too. Can we get a shout out for Brandon Young, who just placed third in the Ace of Dirt race in the four wheel drive racing buggy class? See you all in the finals. Of course, uh, Brandon Bennett Young, who uh, just qualified for the finals with Vorion, who uh, won the Golden Dumpster uh, in the last event. Um, and who knew? I didn't know he did four wheel drive racing buggy racing. I mean, that's. How do you have time for it all? I can barely just feed myself. <laughs> uh, Brandon Young, one of the most amazing competitors at this event and just an all around class act. Good guy. Yeah. Stop being so talented, Brandon. <laughs> Making some of us look bad. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, Brandon's going to be taking you guys' place on the podcast for the next month while you guys are all running around Asia. So that'll be fun. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't really think of a better co-host for you, Kyle. I'm really excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hey, so where are you going, by the way? You're, you're just running off to the other side of the world. But what are you guys doing over there? Where are you going? Uh, Lindsay and I are going to Seoul, Korea for a couple of weeks. Yeah. With, uh, with, with some family. And then we're going to link up with Luke and my sister Jacqueline in, in uh, Osaka, Japan for another 8, 10 days. Nice. A little bullet train to Tokyo. And then, uh, you know come back get our bearings just in time for the uh, the world championships here in november so that sounds uh exhausting i hope you guys have the best time in the entire world what's exhausting about a uh you know a, a 4 a.m flight uh in what's that i don't know nine hours sure hey we should be done by the tournament by then Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Fingers that, crossed. I'm really excited for you guys. I think that's going to be amazing. You're going to have so much good food. You're going to have so many great experiences. Um, you know, maybe go catch a Combat Robots event over there somewhere. Yeah, we. I mean, there are a few teams. We know Orbi is in Seoul, that's uh, South correct. Korea. And, you know, there there are teams in Japan. I mean, Japan. I mean, it's it's robot country. Yeah, they right? have wrestling robots there. They have those, like, uh, two, the walking robots that, like, wrestle and knock each other around and stuff. I plan on challenging at least one of them. Oh, that's going to be fun. Yeah. yeah. I want to see that. Well, that's great. All yeah. right, cool. I'm excited. Um, and yeah, I'll be running the podcast without you guys. So that means no editing, no graphics and, uh, barely any dad jokes and maybe no swears also. I don't know. We don't do that. No, we don't do that. No, we don't. We try, well, Greg Munson does that. We don't. We have to beep everything. Like literally everything. Yeah. yeah. I, I'll still be able to beep stuff. Okay, great. I can do that. 
You might have least. to do it manually, though. Yeah, no, I will just yell beep over the audio track. It'll be fine. So you're probably going to do a recap of, of this uh, wonderful event Absolutely. this upcoming week. Yeah, really excited about it. And it'll be fun to do that with Brandon, who hasn't wasn't here for this event. So he'll have a more objective eye over everything that was going on. Um, so that'll be great. He's going to have a lot of homework to watch, you know, after obviously taking third in his four-wheel drive buggy competition. He's going to have to watch this entire stream so that he is informed. You know, I uh, I had to miss the last event because of family obligations, but I did end up watching the entire live stream. But it was nice because you could break it up over days. Oh, yeah. So I, I watched it over the course of like a week, and it was actually just kind of lovely. I would wash the dishes and watch some live stream, and, you know, it was like, oh, cool. You know, you could really absorb it. Yeah, I All like right, it. So right now, though, we want to look at the 30-pound bracket, which is shaking out to be a very interesting bracket. Whoa. So as you can see, we're going to have uh, Quayo versus Toro Feather up there at the top. Save the Frogs is either going to face off against Red Storm or Dragon Queen, depending on how that fight goes. Yahoo is facing off against Sombra 30. And Jubilee is going to face off against Chonky. That is probably the hardest matchup that Jubilee is going to have at mm. this tournament. Chonky is perfectly designed to destroy a robot like that. So that is going to be a tough one. Uh, you know who I really feel bad for in that matchup, though, is the floor. <laughs> if, it, if, if Cage 4 and Cage 1 look this bad now, wait until we get two stages further in this bracket. Yeah, it's not going to be pretty, especially if STF and Jubilee keep going. This is going to be a rough day for floors everywhere. Speaking of Cage 4, we are now going to see two really powerfully driven control bots in Red Storm and Dragon Queen. Dragon Queen, the original Flamebot superstar of NHRL. Today being driven by Rachel de Guzman, and you can see the three-headed dragon on top representing the three members of her team. She, of course, is the large head in the middle. <laughs> because, you know, she's the queen. And then, Look of course, the in the opposite difference. corner, Red Storm uh, with Kevin Machuski, who is a, uh, a frequent trivia partner of Luke. Did you know this? I had no idea. Wait, yeah. what? They've been going to trivia together, usually on nights where Lindsay and I are incredibly busy, uh, but have been doing pretty well. You know, I can't say I'm surprised, actually. That's, that makes sense. But, wow, I didn't know that they did that. That's great. Yeah, it seems like whenever he's in town, he meets up with Luke, and they go trounce other people in bar trivia. Uh, that's hilarious, and I kind of love that, actually. Uh, Kevin drives these incredibly powerful lifter control bots, uh, but the real weapon on these bots is their drivetrain and Kevin's driving. Uh, he's able to do so much damage to his opponents just by getting up underneath them, body slamming them behind him, and smashing them into the walls. But uh, this is going to be fork wars in a lot of ways. Both That's of these bots have these long forks out in front that they're going to try to use to control each other. Um, I will say Red Storm is mostly metal. Yeah. So the flamethrower is going to be interesting to see. Who knows how it's actually going to work out in this particular matchup. I feel like we're going to see a, a, a full three-minute match. Oh, yeah. I hope so. I certainly hope so. It looks like they got the box locked and loaded up. All ready to go over there. Yeah, absolutely. And there's Flo, the house bot. Flo does no, uh, uh, several things. One, unsticks bots when they get stuck. Two, has a flame uh, retardant system, able to put out fires when needed. And also, has an onboard camera, so we can get some cool in-the-box shots of bots getting destroyed. Also has a, 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 an espresso machine inside of it. Didn't know really? that. Really? I yeah. did not know that about Flo. It could do, it could, well, I mean, it could also Four, do a macchiato, three, Americana. What two, do you want? Man, one, I could I could have used that information robots like an hour ago. All right, so you can see the size difference on this bot, but the smaller bot in red and silver is Red Storm Dragon Queen, the big multicolored iridescent painted with graphics on it, black robot. And there we see that powerful oh. flamethrower. 
Now, Dragon Queen has a little bit of a weight advantage on Red Storm, who has the, the multi-bot configuration, a few pounds extra going over to that multi-bot. But the forks on Dragon Queen are static. They do not lift, they do not have any type Whoa. of... Ooh, nice slam there, there from Red Storm. And look at the speed that you get out of Red Storm. I mean, this robot is just vicious the way it moves around the box. Now it's landed on top of that mini bot. And that's exactly what the mini bot's there for, to get them upside down, and then, uh, and then Dragon Queen's able to come over there and cook. Oh wait, my apologies. The mini bot is Dragon Queen's. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose the color scheme should have given it away. It's interesting then seeing the size uh, difference between Red Storm and Dragon Queen, despite the fact that Dragon Queen has what looks like a substantial mini bot. Well, you got to imagine there's a lot of room inside of Dragon Queen for gas. Oh yes, excellent point, Kyle. Because that flamethrower has been known to go the full three minutes in most of their matches when they were previously here as Dragon Princess. They grow up so fast. They certainly do. <laughs> uh, Dragon Queen, when she was Dragon Princess, was driven by Annika Yankaskis, now driven by Rachel de Guzman. They were able to purchase the robot and update it for these competitions. Uh, doing quite well today, but might be sent home. One minute left in this match. Thanks to Kevin Milcheski and Red Storm. Pretty even back and forth matchup between these two bots right now. Ooh. Nice pick onto the side, grabbing side control of Dragon Queen. Are they gonna be able to get her up into the air with the mini bot coming in behind them, creating a little bit of a, yeah, wedge, which caused the physics to back out. But thanks to their, uh, their front plow, they are able to oh. celebrate. I do that cool flip back into the fight with 20 oh, seconds was, left. That, that was, was like sick. a straight up like kung fu move like off kip the up. wall. Yeah, that was like a kung fu kip up off the wall. I loved it. And then another lift and pick there from Red Storm. Red Storm really figuring out what angles they can actually get in and lift Dragon Queen now. Oh, not able to get under them there. And that is, I believe, the end of the match. Both these bots able to make it back. There's Rachel. Both these bots able to make it back to the door. Lots of things to consider for the judges. It's one, one of the things that's difficult about a, a flame bot is really being able to demonstrate the type of damage that you're able to apply to an opponent. You yeah. know, if a, if a wire gets singed on the inside of your opponent, how on earth do the judges know? And I gotta say, the mini bot here we see on Dragon Queen putting in a lot of work. Yeah, absolutely. Several times was able to get underneath Red Storm and prevent them from really flipping Dragon Queen or moving Dragon Queen with their gri uh, gripper and lifter. You see a few times just like that, Red Storm is able to kind of land that bite on Dragon Queen, but just doesn't have the right center of gravity to get it up and over and instead inverts itself on top of Dragon Queen. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see how the judges view that because clearly they were trying to get control and they were able to get a grab. They just couldn't five, do anything with it. Four, three. All two, right, so we are now heading one, over into Cage Tech. This is Crash Fest versus fight. Impact with a K. Which makes it so much cooler because you spelled it with a K. Impact big egg beater style drum spinner, exactly the kind of weapon that Robert Run likes to go up against. Robert has these two nigh impenetrable AR 500 forks that come out the front of it. Likes to jam that into the spinning weapon mass of these egg beater style drums and yeah. then lift them, and throw them around with that sand shovel. Right now though, Impact doing a great job keeping control of the situation, keeping them bobbling up against the wall. Nice job. Ooh. 
Robert able to get control again and slam them up against the wall. Definitely takes a few more than just like a few pops to really slow Crash Fest down there. But Robert and Crash Fest are happy to go head to head with even the most punishing weapons in the weight class. Absolutely. Now, Impact is uh, captained by Lars Elliott. It's a new bot that they brought here in August. Uh, Lars is most, he's uh, usually here with a different robot. This is a new design from him. It's a cool piece. Looks great. Both of these are excellent drivers in this competition. Nice pin there from Crash Fest. And they're gonna hold that for the full 10 seconds. Absolutely, this is how they win their matches. And then lift them up over top, showing they got control with that sand shovel. I gotta love it. Oh, and these hits from Impact are amazing. Just launching them into the air. Multiple spins up in the air. Wow. Classic Lars Elliott style of driving, just relentless, staying on top of it and choosing their angles really, really well. That's what you have to do when you're going up against a top-notch driver like Robert Run. Just don't give them an opportunity yeah. to take control of the fight. Like that. You can see once Robert gets the forks under the main bot, the mini bot able to come in and help uh, get get Impact Ooh. out of the way there. Oh, Impact ends the match high centered on the side rail. Not great, not a great place to be to end that match. This one will go to the judges. I gotta say, I like Lars's new bot. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty cool. It's got some great reach on that egg beater style drum. Really suits his driving style well too. Uh, it's great to see Lars Elliott coming here with a new bot. Lars has been driving with the same machine for years now, so it's cool to see him kind of expanding his repertoire into new styles of bot um, and doing something without a hub motor too, which is interesting for him. Mm. Uh, but yeah, the kid's very talented. He's now working on a couple of different teams, working with a bunch of people, learning new skills. So uh, it was a matter of time before he built something custom, and that's a really cool first custom robot for him to build. Yeah. That's what you do, right? You move up from the kit bot into something unique and different, unless you're uh, Chris, and then you just always build something weird from day one. I had a, a tour group today, and someone asked me this great question, where's the best place for me to start, right? There's no solid answer for that, because no. it all depends on what type of person you are. Are yeah. you a, are you a, a textbook, textbook person, right? Do you, do you want to learn through a path, a kit bot, an SSP, uh, you know, a shred it? Uh, there are, like, these are bots where there's a community around it and there's guidance there to improve upon it every single step of the way. Yes. And then there's the other people that like to think outside the box. They, they, maybe they want to build an art bot. They want to kind of push a boundary. That's another great way. And then throw some trash together. Make it a microwave. Have fun with it, you know? Yeah. There's an entry point for every single type of builder out there. There is no wrong answer unless you come right out the gate with a loophole bot, and then maybe everyone will hate you. But yes. Don't start with a loophole bot. <laughs> All right, so one rule. There's one rule. Don't start with a loophole bot. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. There is a, there's been a lot of feelings that I've been gar garnering from up in the pit about the loophole bots today, uh, especially a loophole bot involving two world, former world champions. Um, that's got a lot of people feeling a lot of different ways. And when Lynx was... There's no buts about it, Kyle. No, there's a lot of buts about that one. There's so many buts about that one. Uh, when that bot was eliminated earlier today, there were some happy people. You gotta I don't say. know. That, that one particular loophole group really cracks me up. <laughs> All right. So now we are going to go back over here into cage one, I believe. We're going to look at Super Scope versus Raptor X22. First time Raptor X22 has been back here in a while. Their bot is doing incredibly well today, but they are about to be tested up against the incredibly powerful horizontal spinner from the Coakleys in Super Scope. And by the way, this is a dialed-in Super Scope that has been doing phenomenally well today. 
I am excited to see how this bot hits. And again, look at the floor, all the bondo, the scrapes, the gouges. We've seen some action here today, Kyle. So I got to say, I was checking out the uh, the pits for the Coakleys earlier today, and Owen was, you know, hanging out next to his bot, um, making sure that it was, like, you know, set up nicely so people could take pictures with it. But it was ready, and he was just chilling. His brother, however, just playing video games. Hey, whatever you got to do to clear five, your head. I four, think it's like an intimidation three, tactic. Like, you know, yeah. like, hey, we're so one, ready that five, we're just chilling over here playing video fight. games. You guys go ahead and build your bots. <laughs> Wow, listen to these bots fire up. I mean, this is just 12 pounds each. And look at Super Scope Whoa. doing that evil dance. Look at the damage to the floor right there. Just ripped wow. up chunks of the plywood. Raptor now, X with a, with a serious opportunity. Not taking it. At this late in the tournament, absolutely not. Give that bot a wide berth. Let them get their one on stick from, uh, from Fluffy the Brick. Wow, they're trying to shake themselves loose. Fluffy's coming in to try to help so gently. Such a good helper, Fluffy is. Nice work, Fluffy. And now Super Scope fully operational off the side rail, coming out there, ready to fight. And you can hear X. Oh, oh that's a belt. That's not good. That's a tap out. Look at the frame rails completely wow. bent. Raptor X22 tapping out. Super Scope says, go home. Thank you very much. Patrick Murphy bringing back Raptor X-22. Unable to continue after that huge hit. This is one of those situations where sometimes doing the right thing doesn't necessarily pay off. Yeah, right. Give them some space. Let them get their one unstick so you could possibly get them stuck up on that side rail again with a, a robot the shape of Super Scope. That's exactly what you want to do. They're big, they're wide, they're flat. They could definitely get stuck up on that side rail again. Uh, but no, no, that weapon was able to get up to full speed because there was so much room between them in the box and he ripped the entire front part of the chassis in half. I uh, cannot wait to see this replay. First of all, two amazing bots, really yeah. powerful. Look at this dance. And Patrick doing a great job picking his shot there, coming in, not taking any damage, sending Super Scope up against the wall, but now Super Scope back up to full speed, and yeah, nothing left. Just completely shreds that Oof. front end on Raptor X-22. You know, they made improvements on the bot, they made it sturdier, but I don't think anything could hold up to that assault. That was incredible. Five, four, Cage three, four action. two, one. Minor fight. threat five. Robots fight. In the pink corner. And this is Minun and Plussy. Plussel over on the Pulsel. other side, which is Pulsel? Pulsel. Pulsel. Whoa! Uh, which is some sort of Pokemon pocket monster reference that I don't understand. Uh, there's not a lot of movement coming out of Minor Threat 5 here. Mm. Oh, because they're very upside down. Okay, I see. Now they're right side up. Maybe it's an upside down type. Is that a thing? I, I, don't, I, I don't know how Pokemon work. <laughs> I really don't. My kids love the game. The, the, the video game. They play it all the time on the phone. Yeah, so does uh, my brother-in-law, Luke. Yeah, I knew he was obsessed with it. He even bought, like, the, the thing that makes it look like it's walking so he can hatch eggs or some nonsense. He explained it to me once. Now, these uh, m minus and plus. And plus, 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 plus. Uh, these are both built by Zoe Lambert. Zoe's never going upstairs again because she's down here driving robots, it seems like, all day. These are her two new robots. They are hub motor weapons. Um, identical seven and a half pound robots. There's only one place in the world these robots can compete, and that is NHRL. The rule set is only allowing them here. They can't fight anywhere else in the world. 
because of our weight bonuses and what we allow with multi-bots. It, uh, it is crazy to see just the revolving door that kind of comes through from, you know, Zoe and Team Honeycracked. Oh, it's, they're it's, always here. They send in bots into the into the cages like bonbons in I Love Lucy. They just keep coming through the door. <laughs> well, they've got an entire side of the pits now that is just theirs. Um, if you ever need help, go look for all of the yellow and black jerseys over in the uh, the Honeycrack side of the pits. Bunch of really friendly people willing to help you out with your bot, answer your questions, and uh, possibly give you a snack. One of the things that Zoe told me earlier today is that she's so happy to be competing with something new that she's just was tired of the burger bot. She loves the burger, but she was getting burnt out on the burger and wanted to try something completely different. And these two bots are adorable. Now, granted, they're not doing much against the absolutely devastating weapon on Minor Threat 5, but they've done incredibly well today. 30 seconds left in the match. Yeah, this will go to the judges. 20 seconds is a lot of time, technically. Stranger yeah, things have come happened. come on. You got to knock out both of these bots, and they're so durable. They've made it this entire time. They're doing great. They're working fine. They've been upside down for a lot of this matchup. Wow, what a great way to end the fight there for Minor Threat 5, doing a volley, launching both of its opponents up into the air. Impressive. And so that will go to the judges. And everybody's still working at the end. I mean, that is a lot of respect there to Zoe. That was a hard thing to do. So let's go ahead and talk about the 12 pound bracket. It is shaping up to be a really competitive bracket as we have seen throughout this competition. So as you see, Super Scope moved on. They'll be moving on to the next round. They're gonna be facing off against Milk Tank or Honey Shock, depending on who wins that fight. Cthulhu is going up against Amphisvena? Amphisvena? Yeah. And Zupacabra, uh, the winner of that will go on to face Zupacabra versus Craig. Timber Viper is going to go up against Unreasonable Expectations, and Buzzkill will be taking on, the winner of that match will go up against Buzzkill. Toro Jr. is going to be facing off against Pancata, and uh, we just saw that the matchup between Minor Thread 5 and Minun and Plussel. We'll Powerful. see who wins that once we hear from the judges. Mm -hmm. Five. Four, we hear the three, countdown. Two, one. Fight, robots, fight. Over in cage five. Oh, awesome. This is Monkfish. This is another Rachel de Guzman uh, robot going up against Wicked Wedge. We gotta love some Wicked Wedge action, but Monkfish is such a cool design. It is a shuffler undercutter bot with a really cute little face on it. face it looks disgruntled it just the way it shuffles and the look of panic on its face it just looks like it's desperate for a, a, a public restroom <laughs> and we've all yes been there. it has to get somewhere very quickly and it's moving its legs in a very short and inefficient way to get there but yeah i love this spot <laughs> look at this it's got wedged up it can't move it's so stuck it's a vicious looking blade on it. Not really able to use her. And now it's up to the, I mean, wow. Up to speed again. I love uh, this bot. Monkfish is so cute, so much personality. Wicked Wedge, of course, the evil giraffe wedge bot. Perfectly suited for taking on this horizontal style of spinner. Doing a great job controlling the pace of this matchup. We're starting to see a little bit of wear and tear on the front of Wicked Wedge. there.
Wow, yeah, Wicked Wedge is an incredibly durable bot, but it has lost a bunch of that lifter. Yeah, it's just kind of dangling kinda barely now. hanging on there now. Yeah, Mugfish is just grinded away at that. Uh, Wicked Wedge brought to you Tap by out. Remy, and they are tapping out. Wow! So they are out of the tournament. Remy is an automotive design engineer at Toyota North America and the reigning Merca Antweight champion with Mud Skipper. Uh, but that's Rachel, and she is extremely happy. Five, four, three. And kissing two, her, Remy. Oh, so one. cute. Extremely fight. happy with Robots Mugfish's performance. Fight. Back over here in cage one, we have Milk Tank and Honey Shock. Milk Tank from Team Utter Destruction, their first robot, and uh, it is, I, I'd call it NHRL's most improved robot over the time period that it's been here. You can hear the audience in the background, they are not booing this robot, no, no, no. They are mooing this robot. I don't know, I think, some are mooing, some are booing. I would say it's probably half and half. <laughs> yeah, you could uh, stake your claim on that one there, Chris. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice hit there from Honey Shock. Honey Shock, a robot from Team Honey Cracked. It's fast, it's nimble. It's got a pretty hard hitting vertical spinner. I'm absolutely delighted to see Milk Tank, though, deep in the bracket here. They get better every event. The team's had knockouts. They're 30-pound they're bots, even, like, really legit. Really legit. Ooh, and now you hear Honey Shock firing up. Yeah, and there's not a lot of movement coming out of Milk Tank right now. They may have done the thing or landed in some sort of way that they're not able to move. Getting a little bit of help there from Fluffy. Now, we've seen these teams join forces in the past to put on some of the more fun and spectacular, uh, uh, you know, just displays of gloriousness yes yeah, I agree. like you know just uh, just just matches to kind of help us fill in some joy in between the later matches of our tournaments we've seen uh, uh, we've seen sparkle cannons we've seen balloon fights Looks like we might be getting a knockout here, Team Honey Shock. That is a great deal for Team Honey Shock, with the exception of the fact that they will have to go on and face Super Scope in the next round. And no one wants to face Super Scope. That thing is terrifying. But they have a configuration that could lend itself to give them an advantage against such a bot, but... You know. Yeah, Zach is a really talented driver, very talented builder. He said he worked a lot on uh, powder coating for this event, wanting to make his bot look better, a little bit more cohesive, a little bit prettier. Um, but the bot's working great. He's going pretty deep in the bracket. He's going up into round three up against, uh, up against Super Scope next. We'll see how much of that powder coat is left after that match. All right, so that was uh, Honey Shock versus uh, Milk Tank. Milk Tank, unfortunately, will be going home after that, but they're still in the bracket in the 30-pound division, as I recall. Um, so we'll see them moving forward there. I'm seeing a little bit of action happening over in Cage 4. It looks like some bots are getting ready to square up. All right, looks like in the pink corner, we're gonna have Zupacabra, and then in the blue corner, we're gonna have Craig. Just, just Craig. Just Craig. Craig the robot, not the person. I did hear that upstairs. Oh yeah, I just fought Craig, the robot, not not the person. I mean, it would be hilarious if there was just a guy, Craig, standing in the corner. Hey guys. Hey guys. Just keeps getting punched. I don't know how he got in cage four. <laughs> Oh, 
I was Five, I was working in the four, gift shop. Three, two, <laughs> somehow I'm in one, Kate, guys. Fight, robots fight. All right, so Craig looks like it's a series of mini bots with a larger kind of hammerish bot. And Zupacabra is exactly what you expect from Brazil. It's a vertical spinner, it's a tangential drive, and it is fast, and it is mean, and it is going to break everything in the box, presumably. Oh. All right, nice pin there from Craig, pushing them right up against uh, Flo. <laughs> Zupacabra says, no, thank you. We're going to take these guys out. I'm done with the mini bots. I'm over it. I don't want to deal with it anymore. Wow. Listen to that hum. That is terrifying. Oh! Craig is operated by Ethan Shipley from Muncie, Indiana, and Broken Gears Robotics. And they were holding their own for a while. Oh, oh. No. Wow. wow. Okay. Crash Fest goes flying. Okay. The minibots go flying. Craig is not having the best day in the world. He wants to go back to the gift shop now, I'll tell you that. And Zupa Cabra. Zupa, have a Snickers bar. You get maniacal when you're hungry. Zupa Cabra from Team Warrior. Enrico Oliveira from Brazil. This is the vertical weapon that inspired Black Dragon. This weapon spins at 18,000 18, RPM. It was built originally in 2017. So I think we're getting a replay of uh, when Z uh, when uh, Zupa changed tactics and just decided, I'm going to attack all the little guys, take them out, get rid of the nuisance bots, and then I'm going to square up with Craig. All right, so that arena was not safe for minibots, goats, or Craigs. Uh, thanks to Zupacabra, and that was an impressive showing from that from a warrior from Brazil. All right, looks like we are now heading over into cage five, where we're going to be seeing Jack move. He's there, down there in the blue corner, and they will be taking I D K W T F I D. And uh, in tight. And that now stands for I do know W T F I'm doing. I see you didn't fill in the full acronym. No, it's a family program. I don't need to do that. Five, four, three, two, one. Fight, robots, fight. Yeah, Kevin with IDFTK. Uh, IDFTK, I should say. Just, just try to pronounce it. I don't want to. No, like, it's a good move. Jack move. Trying to square up. Minibot's doing a lot of work here. Wow. Nice work from Kevin. That Peter Bar doing a lot of damage. Jack move stuck up in the sidewall. They're gonna get their one unstick from the house bot. House bot's got some sort of sticker on their face. Looks like they lost an eye, which will happen. Nice hit again from Kevin and IDK. I mean, Kevin's driving is vicious today. Look at this. Wow. Absolutely relentless. Using that Peter Bar weapon to its full capacity, keeping Jack move up in the air for the vast majority of this fight. I don't see any movement coming out of Jack Move. We might get a knockout here. Oh, boy. 
I gotta say it, Kevin does know Knock what he's out. doing. Impressive. Very impressive. Kevin, he works at a paper mill. He's not a rocket scientist. He's not a engineer. He's a, he's a fan. Well, he, he certainly building. put the three-hole punch on Jack Move. <laughs> started building. That's his wife, Ariel. She's an architect, and they both just love this sport, got into it, and started fighting. Oh, wait. I'm delighted Kevin won that fun. Oh, I was so close. You were so close. I was so close. You were so close. That acronym, Five, we can change it to something four, awesome. We'll work three, on it. We'll work on it. Dude. One In the meantime, though, we're going to go over to Cage One. Fight. Oh! Wow. So this is Cthulhu. And in some circles, known as Cthulhu. But no circles is known as that. And then uh, it's going up against Ampus Bena. Memphis Bane comes from Alexander Richmond from uh, Clifton, Virginia. It's Angry Archery Robotics. I'm interested to learn a little bit of the flavor behind the name. This belt runs two 2.2 pound egg beaters that are run out of sync. And it's powered by two independent motors. And I have no idea where this name comes from. It's a weird name. All right, the Amphis Bena was a fabulous Libyan serpent with a head at each end of its body. Okay, I get it. Two weapons, two independent drive motors. Whoa! And now a uh, mini bot that's been shredded. And Cthulhu just kind of taking its time, chilling out. I can't make heads or tails of it. <laughs> There are no tails. It's all heads. And there we see the Coakley brothers fully supporting each other, taking some time out from their video games to come fight some robots and win some Knock matches. Out. By the way, both these boys have already qualified. They're just here for funsies. They're getting the reps in, hanging out with their friends, playing some video games. Trying to make the bracket go a little bit deeper so that we have to qualify number seven and eight if they both get all the way up into the championship bracket mm. again. But I'll take an all Coakley final. Why not? We've seen it before. We've seen it before. It was a good fight. They actually fought instead of choosing which one they wanted to win, which is cool. Got to respect that. And I'm sure, you know, having uh, both of them qualified would make a very, you know, interesting November showdown too, potentially. Well, yeah, I mean, they're definitely, they're here again. We'll see them both. Um, really cool bots, really well-designed bots. And now we're heading over into cage four, where we're gonna have unreasonable expectations, taking on Timber Viper. What makes the expectation so unreasonable? That's my question. Unreasonable expectations brought to you by Mark Liu from San Diego, California. Five, four, three, two, one. Fight, robots fight. And it has an unreasonable expectation. But I don't know what that is. Cool bot, it's tight, it's compact, it looks like it's pretty well driven. Timber Viper definitely having a hard time getting an angle on it. Nice shot from the weapon there, preventing it. Timber Viper from getting underneath it with those forks.
could see the chunks of plywood coming out of the floor over there. Oh! Wow, nice hit wow. there from a reasonable expectation. I gotta say, Mark's a very talented driver. To be able to get this much control with his slightly slower bot than uh, Timber Viper is really impressive. Nice shot there again from Unreasonable Expectations. We're about halfway through this matchup, and I gotta say, most of these engagements have definitely gone the way of Unreasonable Expectations. But Timber Viper, a very resilient, well-built bot. It's just gonna keep going. Oh yeah, incredibly fast. Once it gets a hold of you, it can do a lot of damage. It can score a lot of points, but uh, yeah. It's been a tough matchup for them so far. Another slam up against the wall there from Unreasonable Expectations, and now they're kind of bobbling Timber Viper around until Timber Viper was finally able to escape. Oh, they've got them upside down now. Timber Viper able to smash them into the wall, but then they're back on their wheels again. Tough matchup for the two of these wow. guys, especially since they both really rely on those ground scraping ports in an arena that is increasingly harder and harder to be ground scraping in. Timber Viper just not able to get under and grab control of unreasonable expectations like they need to to score those control points they yeah. need to by the end of this matchup. There we go, nice way to end the matchup, kind of getting a pin there in the last few seconds. But there's really only two volleys, I would call, going the direction of Timber Viper in that yep. matchup total. So this one will go to the judges, but I bet Mark is feeling very confident about his performance there, and perhaps those expectations were not so unreasonable after all. Perhaps they were great expectations. Could have been, could have been great expectations. All right, so we're gonna wait to see what the judges have to say about that, but the winner of that matchup will go on to face Buzzkill, the undercutter from Team Honeycracked in the next round. Uh, that'll be an interesting matchup no matter who ends up in there. Honeykill has been, or Buzzkill has been doing a phenomenal job today. Um, and just showing that undercutters in that 12 pound class are a force to be reckoned with, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So we're starting to fill out that next part of the bracket in the 12 pounds. Uh, that's got looking pretty scary. And Minor Threat 5 is still sitting there at the bottom of the bracket waiting for everybody. I am very excited to see how they're doing today. This might be the event for them. Uh, they are one of the higher ranked bots not yet qualified in the 12 pound bracket. And they very well could do that today if the bracket keeps shaking out the way that it will be for them. They will be facing off against the winner of Toro Jr. and Pancada a little bit later on today. So either way, they've got to face off with an extremely powerful Brazilian bot. Um, I'd imagine that we'll see that match relatively soon. Yeah, I sure hope so. I sure hope so. It's what's uh, supposed to be loaded into the cage next. Um, yeah, 12 pounds, it's a scary bracket. It's just a scary bracket. But meanwhile, let's go upstairs and say hi to Lindsay. Lindsay, how are you? Hey, Kyle. Uh, I have actually something really interesting to share. So obviously, before every event, we want to capture what the fans are thinking, what the builders are thinking in terms of, you know, who they predict are going to win. Uh, so we, you know, send out a poll, we capture everyone's predictions, and then we release them uh, before the event. So I wanted to share a little graphic with you about uh, how the fans predicted today would go versus where we <laughs> actually are. Oh, uh, uh, in regards to the three pound bracket. So, uh, predicted bots still in the competition. If you look at the top five, uh, zero of them, which wow. was Lynx, Chainsaw, Kinney, Caldera, Puka, and Eruption. Yeah. Zero are yeah. in the competition. 
you zoom out to the top 10, which would then six through 10 is Chubby Unicorn, Voxel V1, Crash, Crash Fest, Pomfrita, and Monkfish. We got three out of the top 10. Wow. You zoom out a little bit further, Grug, Half-Life, Apex, Beetlejuice, and Th Synthesis, only five out of the top 15 are uh, still in this competition. So uh, yeah, I, mean, it's, I was hoping for some surprises today. I think I got maybe a little bit more than I bargained for. Yeah, weird day. But weird day in the three pound division. It's just, you know, with this level of competition in the single elimination format, it is so hard to predict. And here we are, we've got a great mix of robots left in the mix, but wh whoever is gonna win is anybody's guess. Yeah, the statistic I want to know is how many loopholes are left in the competition at this point? Oh, that's a good question. Two? Two or three? Three? Yeah. Yeah. Scary. All right, well, there we go. Which we're means that we're getting dangerously close to a loophole qualifying. Could be loophole on loophole action for the uh, Golden Dumpster today. We'll find out. All right, so let's go over to cage one. It looks like we are getting ready for that Toro Jr. versus Pancata fight. Yeah, there we go. That's the Riobots team ready to go. I love it. Uh, these Both of these teams flew from the Southern Hemisphere to come fight in Norwalk, Connecticut. Sometimes you gotta fly a few thousand miles to fight your friends. <laughs> it's totally fine. Uh, Pancata being capped today by Pierre Graciano from Team Warrior. Uh, they're going up against Toro Jr. Toro Jr. is of course the uh, 30 or the 12 pound version of Minotaur. Captained by Junior Sousa today. Last time they were here was July 2022. So glad to have them back. They're trying to qualify. Five, back in July four, 2022, they three, did win a Golden Dumpster. Two, so. one. Fight, robots, fight. But that was a much different field than today and a much less scary 12-pound bracket than it is today. Surprisingly quiet. Yeah, especially for a Brazilian fight. What's going on? Toro's not... Oh, uh, never mind. We, we spoke too soon. There's the speed. I don't know what kicked in, but now we're getting there with the viciousness. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, not a lot of movement coming out of Pancada. I don't know what's going on. Tap out. Oh, okay. So there's a tap out, uh, presumably from Pancada and Team Warrior. Oh, wow. Which Rat means Toro Jr. is your winner. That's crazy. Strange. So yeah, confirm Toro Jr. is your winner. They will be going on to face Minor Threat 5 in the next round. Pancata just not able to get off the blocks there for some reason. I don't know what happened. Uh, but they tapped out before they took any damage, which is good. You know, because you don't want to drive 2,000 miles or fly 2,000 miles to fight your friends and uh, break your bot. Too much. More than necessary, I should say. Right. All right, so we're going to look over uh, very quickly here at our three-pound bracket and talk about what's going on in that division. It's just a weird place to be right now. The rest of these brackets are looking reasonably what we thought they would look like. The three-pound bracket looks completely different. 
Um, luckily, there's no cam lifters there, or our dear friend Luke Stangle would be ripping his non-existent hair out of his head. So we're good there, but there is some really interesting stories going on in that bracket. He'd be aggressively inserting hair into his head. Is that how that works? I think so. All right, so we're going to see very soon Synthesis versus just Chubby Unicorn, something that everybody here is really excited to see. But we're also going to see Voxel V1 versus Booty Brigade. That is going to be a very close matchup. Monk versus Fish versus Impact. That's going to be a scary fight. And IDK versus War Hard. This is not where we thought we'd no, be at the end of not. this bracket at all. Very strange. Great robots. We're really excited to see how this ends up, but I think everybody's bracket's been busted at this point. The only one you might have predicted could be here is Booty Brigade, and that's only if you knew what it was before the day started. And, um... Nobody knew what that was before the day started. Synthesis and Chubby Unicorn are two of the higher ranked robots in this bracket still. Uh, both of them will be fighting next, and I believe they already are loaded into the box. Synthesis is probably the most powerful vertical spinner in this division, or at least the most powerful one left. Chubby Unicorn, of course, driven by Team he uh, Hebert, and it is an incredibly well-driven four-wheel drive vertical spinner. Who has taken Chainsaw Kitty out of the bracket. Five, four, to move Three, on to face synthesis. Two, one. Fight, robots fight. Oh! Wow, a, a huge exchange right off the bat. Synthesis taking advantage, putting Chubby Unicorn into the wall. The weapon on Synthesis is just giant. Corey Nason has done a beautiful job really branding his bot and making it look cohesive. The 30 pound version and the three pound per version look identical. They're identical scaled up versions of each other. And the hits that he gets with this disc are vicious. Yeah, significant reach advantage there on, on, on the end of Synthesis. This isn't rock, paper, scissors. It's like scissors, bigger scissors, even bigger scissors. Yeah, and it really is the difference between a knockout puncher and a technical fighter. You know what I mean? Chubby Unicorn's about defense. It's about getting the angles. It's about protecting itself. Synthesis is about big hits. It's Butterbean. It's Butterbean. Yeah, it better win fast. It's going to get these big hits every single time. Chubby Unicorn's gonna have to exert a lot of control, show a lot of driving prowess, and wow. not take hits to the side like that too much, because she ain't gonna last that long. That was impressive. Oh. Wow! Into the roof you go, Chubby Unicorn. Corey Nason is a phenomenal driver in his own right, but he's got a point-and-shoot robot, and that's, oh, look at that shot there as well. Keep in mind, every single one of these hits, you risk Chubby Unicorn losing a connection between a motor, losing some sort of bearing within the robot, losing something that keeps this robot operating. And that weapon is not oh, spinning wow. now. That's not good. If Chubby Unicorn isn't able to resurrect that weapon, they're gonna have to try to use this last minute and five seconds to put Synthesis into a wall and get it to take itself out. But it looked, oh! No mercy from Corey Nason and Synthesis. Absolutely not. They know that Tim will keep on coming if they let them. Oh no! Launch them into the air again, but the Corey is, or, uh, sorry, Tim is still able to drive around while upside down, and in fact is moving quite well in that direction. Without a weapon, though, they cannot self right. There's a plume of smoke there. Probably the end of a, a speed controller. Something. Wow, no movement at all from Chubby Unicorn in the last five seconds of this matchup. Not how you want to go into a judge's decision. We are going to wait for a judge's decision on that one, but I don't even think we need to. Congratulations yeah. to Corey Nason. That was an excellent fight. His robot synthesis is just so powerful. Those hits are so hard. And the mobility in this tournament today has been phenomenal all day. Every single time Corey comes with the bot, you see more and more weakness leaving the design and fabrication.
going head to head, a tactic that had worked pretty much all day for Chubby Unicorn and historically just doesn't map out against such an incredible vert. No, and there you see that puff of smoke, the magic smoke that you really need to keep inside the robot. And after that, there was just intermittent movement. Wow. Heck yeah, celebratory banging on the glass for Corey. So proud of him. He is oh, moving on in the wow. tournament. What do we have here? Let's hype this up, Kyle. Okay, okay. All right, so we are now doing some 30-pound action. Loading into cage one, we have Yahoo versus Sombra 30. I can't even begin to explain explain to you the magnitude of this fight. Sombra, if they win, they qualify for November. If Yahoo wins, then Chonky qualifies for November because Yahoo, remember, is already qualified. And so the math works out to where Chonky actually qualifies if Yahoo wins this fight. So uh, let's go ahead and say it. Do it for Chonky. <laughs> <laughs> The gusto on your face as you delivered that, Kyle. <laughs> I felt it. Do it for Chonky would do be the... Do it for that, Chonky. If that's not a T-shirt... You can do it, Chad. Do it for Chonky. If that's not a T-shirt in the <laughs> NHRL store, I, I'm... We failed. All right, so this is going to be an interesting matchup, and I really do think that the first weapon impact is going to tell the tale. What is going to win? This incredibly dense drum that Chad New has on Yahoo, or is it going to be this tri-bar powerful hitter from Sombra 30? So you can see on the front of Yahoo, that front wedge is gone. Ideal for fighting uh, horizontal spinners, but Chad is ready to send that drum full speed into the tri bar. And Five, I think that you're right, four, Kyle. This is going to come down to those two, early exchanges. One. Fight, robots, hey, we're, fight. We're in it. All right, here we go. We got to rush across the box from Sombra, but they do not want to take that engagement if they don't have to. Everybody's going to try to look for an angle where it's not weapon to weapon, but that weapon to weapon impact does go the way of Sombra 30. Oh! And so does that one. Launching Yahoo wow. across the box. Now it looks like Sombra's got a little bit oh, more no. confidence, but are they stuck up against the side Sombra rail? Sombra is on the wall. Is Yahoo going to let the... No, they're going to get unstuck from the mini, from the house spot. Fluffy letting them go. And already they're going weapon wow. to weapon again. Sombra is now waiting around. They want weapon to weapon impact. They want to break oh, Yahoo's we got a weapon. Set, Kyle. Chad trying to get an angle, trying to get away from that weapon, find some kind of impact onto the side of Sombra, which he was able to do, but not enough engagement. Sombra gets away. Chad, phenomenal driver. Will he be able to out the Brazilian bot and not get those weapon-to-weapon -weapon impacts that he has been losing every single time? Tri-bar egg beater spinner able to get so much engagement. Launching Yahoo. Go. Oh no! Out behind Fluffy the house spot. Yahoo stuck up in the corner. They've already had one on stick. They don't get another one. They don't get another one. They're stuck there. If they're not able to get down. Get in there, Fluffy! Well, I don't know. Technically speaking, Fluffy should not be doing that. They already had one on stick from Fluffy. That was Sombra. Sombra, oh, that's right. Sombra was the one stuck up against the wall. You're right, you're right. And then, so that's it. Both robots now have had their one unstick. It's one minute and four seconds left in this matchup. Both robots are out of unsticks. It could be anybody's game at this point. If anybody gets stuck up on the sidewall or on some debris or on a chunked up piece of floor, they are done for. A little bit of movement issues there from Yahoo, and it seems like Sombra might actually have some some driving issues. They seem a little bit confused. Yeah. Oh, nasty hits there from Sombra when they get their bearings. Gotta love that. 30 seconds left in this match. Both weapons fully operational. 
Sombra might just be choosing their shots, not willing to take any more damage because they know that they'll move on as long as they're careful. Yeah, well, you're sacrificing potentially aggression points doing that, being reserved. But there is a lot to analyze in this fight. And that is exactly how Sombra wants to end that fight, showing the judges they win yet one more weapon to weapon engagement. They're extremely happy with their performance. Chad coming over to congratulate them on a job well done. There you Let's see Rato see. celebrating oh. with them. Look at these hits. Beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. Sombra with a little bit more reach advantage on that tri bar pops. Yahoo up. Every engagement going towards Sombra there. Chad is an amazing driver. He was able to find a couple of instances where he could get a side shot angle, but he wasn't able to really do enough damage to take advantage after that. He did put uh, uh, Sombra 30 up on the side rail in the first minute of that fight. That's which right. did require a house bot to step in, intervene, knock Sombra 30 off the ledge, but Yahoo found himself on the ledge. Yes, both bots ended up on the ledge. Both bots needed an unstick. But I do think the judges are going to favor Sombra in this matchup. That was just a beautiful showing from them, and those weapon-to-weapon -weapon hits went Sombra's way every single time. A little bit of uh, revenge for Rato there. Yeah, you saw him there uh, streaming to probably, I don't know, 400 million fans. In Brazil, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and that was extremely impressive. Well done from Sombra30. They will be moving on in the bracket. Uh, so I believe anyway, we got to get the confirmation, but still, that was incredibly impressive. And yes, we do have confirmation they will be moving on to face the winner of Jubilee and Chonky. But in the meantime, let's go on and look at STF versus Red Storm. Loading into the box. If Red Storm wins, Red Storm qualifies for November. If STF wins, Chonky qualifies for November. Once That's again, a guys, do it for Chonky. Five. That's four, a Chonky. Three, two, one. Fight, robots fight. STF from Team Ribot going in against Kevin Milcheski and Red Storm. Red Storm is a oh! ow. Has one strategy in this fight, and that is to take those hits from that horizontal and control the direction that STF goes. They're far more mobile. They're far faster. If they're able to control them and get them up against the wall and get them to break themselves, they will win this fight. If not, wow. it is all Team Ribot and save the frog. Uh, Red Storm built to take big hits, but STF, that walker. There's no Can't movement. Oh, that's the mini bot big was hits, Kyle. The mini bot was underneath Redstorm. They were able to get some big hits onto the back plate of Redstorm where that hoop of armor does not cover them. They're lucky to be out of there with minimal damage. Whoa! Oh, there goes the no! whole Wow! Come on, Kevin, bring some. Give me more, he says. There. Kevin wants some more. Tell an STF, bring it. Red Storm has no weapon. Red Storm is the weapon. Kevin is the weapon. Kevin is going to drive them into the wall. <laughs> Kevin is going to drive them into the side of the arena. Kevin's going to drive them into the house spot. Kevin's going to drive till the wheels fall off or the body falls apart on this thing. And it very well may going up a spinner oh. like STF. Uh -oh. oh, that dance of death could come right down on the top plate of Red Storm and cause a lot of damage. Whoa! Now they're stuck. They're stuck into the side rail. Oh, no, and they're able to shake themselves loose without the need of Fluffy to come help. Wow. Wow. I mean, just two top-notch robots in this weight class. This is a back-and-forth matchup. The weapon on Red Storm has been gone the vast majority of the fight, but I wouldn't even say they're losing. Oh. 
Kevin trying to entice STF into a, into an engagement. He's over here screaming at them. Can you even move, or are you just spinning on one side? It does look like one of those shuffler pods is out on STF. All they're able to do is lock really pivot. up. 35 seconds left in the match. Kevin going in for these hits, trying to get them off balance, trying to get them into the wall, trying to show the judges they're in control of the situation. Wow, grinding that weapon up against the plywood. Fifteen seconds to show the judges that he has control over this fight. STF, like I said, pivoting around that one drive pod. They're not getting anything out of the left side at all. But that weapon is still working, and oh. it is terrifying. Oh. Kevin incredibly happy with that performance. I believe the boys from Ribot are also incredibly pleased with that performance. Wow, that was stressful to watch. Kyle, what's the worst that can happen when an overweight uh, shuffler with a horizontal spinner on it dances very close to the Lexan sidewalls? We've already seen what happens. It's not great. It's very scary. Now listen, everybody's safe, but it's still, it's a, uh, it's a new pants moment. <laughs> Uh, we do sell NHRL pants over in the gift shop for all of those that were sitting cage side for. All right, we are now heading on over into cage two. Continuing on in our three pound bracket, we've got Voxel V1 versus Booty Brigade. If Booty Brigade wins, they qualify for November. If Voxel wins, IDK qualifies for November. Now, Voxel has been preparing for this fight for a minute now. They've known this was coming. Five, what kind of strategy four, are they going to use three, to face off against two, two world champions? Oh, Robots fight. And there we see, yes, the cornering from Droopy. Boom, big side impact on the Voxel V1. Let's oh. hope, oh no, and a big shoot and oh. miss. And then another shot and miss. Oh. And then another shot from Voxel. Voxel, a very tough bot, still looking in good shape, but a Lynx is gonna Lynx. Every single time. Michael Shore has turned out to be a phenomenal driver. He's the father of, uh, Mike Shore is the father of Michael Shore, the original builder of Voxel. Wow, nice shot there from Lynx from Booty Brigade. Wow. Wow, impressive. And that's Droopy acting as an arena hazard, a mobile arena hazard in the middle of the arena. And uh, it's another shot on Voxel as they land. I mean, that is why this is such an unfair kind of setup to so many of these competitors. You can get hit from Lynx up against the wall just to back into a Droopy. And all those shots count. It's all damage. It's all accumulating in a more broken bot as the day goes on. Now Voxel's weapon has stopped. But, oh, are they spinning up? Are they are they seized up? Are they just saving it for the last minute here? That's it. Hard I'm to curious. tell, yeah. You can see Droopy doing a phenomenal job dishing out hits, but yeah, that weapon is not mobile at all on Voxel V1 at this point. Now, I will say Droopy bars have been known to break weapons like Voxels in the past. That could have been what, oh no, massive shot. Another massive shot. This is exactly what Lynx likes to do, this volley of hits up against the wall. They do not let you get your wheels on the ground. Yeah, and now you see that front weapon on Voxel. Looks like it is uh, knocked completely out of the weapon housing and just kind of 
holding on to just one side. Michael is not happy with how this fight is going. It looks like this might be a tap out here. Tap out. Yeah, so they have tapped out. They said, no more, we are done. That means that the Booty Brigade has qualified for the November finals. We will be seeing Lynx and Droopy at the finals as the Booty Brigade. And yes, that does mean that one of the loopholes has qualified already oh for the finals. My. I somewhere in a dark closet, Luke is just eating a five pound block of cheddar. <laughs> Wow. Gotta hand it to Voxel. You're walking down a dark alley and two championship boxers just kind of step out of the shadows and you just go. They held their own through so much of that matchup, but handling Lynx by yourself is a difficult task. Handling a Lynx What's going on? Red, what, Red Sawyer is, is launching I things into the audience. He's firing t-shirts out of an 18 volt Milwaukee leaf blower. That's how we do things here. Who gave that man an 18 volt Milwaukee leaf blower? I don't well, understand. Well, it's Milwaukee, so it's probably Ed. Yeah, fair. All right, sure, just hand the professional wrestler a weapon. Like, why not? Great idea. It could, it could have been worse. It could have been a steel chair. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we are now heading over into cage one. So the winner of this matchup will qualify for the world championships in November. This is Cueo versus Toro Feather. Five. Toro Feather four, has won three, a golden dumpster two, in the past. One. Fight. Robots fight. Ooh. Some Brazil on Brazil action here. Team Riobot versus Team Warrior. Wow. Beautiful shot there from Toro Feather on a quail. Wow. The winner of this matchup will go on to face Red Storm in the next round. Assuming Red Storm can get its weapon assembly put back on the bot after that huge volley from STF. Now both of these bots have each racked up a couple of impressive hits on their opponents. Impressive driving from Junior and Toro Feather. Oh! Uh, Quayo got himself upside down, grinding across the floor, doing yet even more damage to our floor there. You can see that big strip of plywood that it's ripped up. I'm seeing some smoke now at Quayo. Can't tell if it's just maybe a, like a, a wire a motor smoking up, but oh, now it looks like maybe they're having some drive issues on their right side, Kyle. I think it's very possible that we just saw half their drive go out. You're I seeing think the you're remnants right. of it leaving its body, that soul escaping from the side of the armor. Yeah, Toro Feather seeing the weakness coming in to take their shot. Tap and that out. is a tap out. The winner is going to be Toro Feather. That means they'll be moving on to face Red Storm and Kevin Milcheski in the next round. And also Toro Feather has qualified for the November World Championships. They will be back here in November fighting for the Golden Brett. Wow.
But today, they still have a chance at the Golden Dumpster. They've got to make it through Red Storm and the winner of Sombra and whoever they end up facing in round four. But next up, we'll be looking at Jubilee versus Chunky. I that is believe. our last match in the qualifying quarterfinals for the 30-pound division. Absolutely. But first, it looks like we're going to jump into cage two. Warhart is already qualified. IDK will qualify regardless of who wins this match. Good job, Kevin. Yeah, you're qualified, buddy. You're just going for a dumpster now. That's that's all you're doing now. You qualified. You're good. You just got to get a dumpster, buddy. Yeah, he's Kevin just, just learning of that Kevin now. just figured this out. He didn't know. He did not know uh, until we just announced it. So, yeah, Kevin qualifies. Ariel on his team has already qualified earlier this year, so they're both coming. They'll be they'll be competing in that tournament together. So, yeah, that's amazing. IDK used to stand for I don't know what I'm doing, Five, by the way. And uh, three, clearly, three, that is no longer the case. Two, one, fight. Robots fight. Beautiful hit there from Kevin and IDK. That armor package on the side of Warhard is completely now just torn off. Oh, nice shot there from Warhard, taking their weapon supremacy back. But yeah, they are missing a lot of weapon, a lot of armor on that side of the bot. Jonathan Juarez already qualified with, with Warhart earlier this year. Incredibly talented driver. Really impressive builder. 100% custom bot. Amazing design, amazing performance from this bot. But this is a back and forth slugfest with Kevin and IDK. And that is a tap out. Looks like Warhard wins. Jonathan Juarez will be moving on in the tournament, but regardless, Kevin qualified for the November finals. Congratulations to both of these competitors coming out of this matchup with great information and good news. Well deserved. Well deserved, absolutely. Kevin started out as a super fan, decided he wanted to get involved built a robot where he literally named it that he didn't know what he was doing, and now qualifying for the November finals and a chance at the Golden Brett and the World Championship. Okay, oh, wow. so this is a very interesting grudge match. I've seen these two competitors talking in the pits a lot. This rather large, bizarre-looking Walker bot is called Game Over. It is a bot that was built by a uh, committee, if you will. Um, and then, of course, we see down there in the blue square, that is Chainsaw Kitty, the delightful death machine from Kizaya Sky. Game Over is a walking, I guess you could call it articulated egg beater. Overhead attacking egg beater. Controlled How? by a PS4 controller. Th just, this is what would happen if you told a bunch of like nine year olds to build a combat robot. Uh, Kyle, that's exactly what this is. <laughs> oh, oh, well then that makes perfect sense. Okay, cool. I had a chance to meet the team earlier today. Uh, brilliant 
brilliant uh, folks. And that is exactly right. They have a program uh, that is that ties together uh, both gamers uh, and helps them grow their eminence and knowledge in robotics and engineering. I absolutely love that. And a lot of the people they work with are young people. And that is exactly where this idea was born. It's a really cool robot. This is Game U Robotics class, captained by Jay Lee. From Ohio, you gotta love Ohio. They just make such great robots. Seems like every Norwalk event that we have now, there is a few busloads of Ohioans that just kind of pile in. Yeah, I hope they are getting a bus, because it would be rather silly if they all were driving separately. Five, four, three. Look at this thing move. Two, one. Fight, robots, fight. Uh, bold choice in opponents for a grudge match. Going against one of the best three pounders at the competition here today, Kazaya and Chainsaw Kitty. I guess they weren't really looking forward to bringing game over home on a flight. No, I guess not. It is rather unwieldy. Oh, they're cutting a leg off now, it looks like. This is an all-printed robot, by the way. There's, like, barely any metal in this thing except for the bearings and the weapon. Just the beater bar. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Looks like that front leg's gone. Cut apart. Jay's trying to move. Jay's hitting the tap button. Jay says, I'm done. Thank you, please. Tap out. No thank you. I'm all done. Please stop, Kezaya. <laughs> this hurts. Uh, at a certain point, Chainsaw Kitty just takes over. There is no Kazaya anymore. Yeah, you're right. It, there is a uh, like alternate personality that comes out there, and Chainsaw Kitty, it just wants blood and destruction. Oh, nasty. There's definitely some robot entrails. Ah. You can just see Chainsaw Kitty with robot guts all over it, muttering to itself, I wanted to destroy something beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> And Jay still trying to operate the robot, or what's left of it. Good job, Jay. Resilience and persistence, that's what we like to see around here. All right, so that's what's left of uh, Game Over. Game over, man. Game it's over. game over, man. It's game over. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bill Paxton. We'll, we will always appreciate that. Chainsaw Kitty mostly comes out at night. Mostly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got to love it. You got to love it. So we are going to go all the way to the judges, and there, it takes two refs. <laughs> two refs. <laughs> two refs to count this fight out. There's just so much robot mass in there that it takes two, two refs. And Jay, uh, Jay takes a bow. Thank you, Jay. We appreciate you bringing your amazing creation here and letting Kezaya and team destroy it. All right, so now we are going to get that matchup between Monkfish and Impact. Monkfish brought here by Rachel, who describes it as a gigantic shuffling abomination.
Five, there you, four, you see that face? three, two. Again, I will one, reiterate. Five, it looks like a bomb that really is trying to find the bathroom. Impact is being driven by Lars Elliott. This is its second competition. Oh it's wow! It's Lars's first custom beetle. Is, is Impact high center on? Yes, on the on the bot. Yeah. Where that was. Wow, Minibot put in a wow. lot of work and the horizontal launch impact all the way across wow. the room. Muzzvish doing some good work here, but Pretty that Minibot's really doing action. all the work. Lars trying to get some kind of control here. The weapon on impact is down. That bar has stopped. Yeah, that's not a great place to be. Oh, oh no, never it's mind. back. It's working. It's fine. What Everything's fine. Nothing's ruined except for maybe Monkfish after getting launched across the arena. Is impact stuck? Is it doing the thing? It looks like it's, it's doing, doing the thing. It's doing a little bit of the thing. That, yeah. that bar, though, is built, I think, for speed, not necessarily torque. Yeah, so it's stuck. It's stuck there doing the thing. Can their minibot get them down? They're trying. They're pushing on them. Let's see how it goes. Are they able to get themselves off? Its weapon housing is is ripped off of one side, sticking up into the air. But monkfish, that horizontal is also not Knock, spinning. Knockout. There's a count out there. Wow. With literally no time left, we had a count out. Luke, an exciting time to jump in. Now, Lars Elliott has been doing great with Impact. Now, his first uh, outing with Impact, not that successful. Going super deep, though, in this competition with an incredibly stacked field. Very cool for Lars. And uh, Monkfish, a very weird, very cool robot, Chris. I'm sorry that I think I made an analogy earlier that it, that it looks uh, like a bot that's desperate to find a public restroom. <laughs> it shuffles, it's desperate, and it's got the look of somebody who's at their wit's end. Now, uh, Chris, I can see here in cage one, Chonky there in the blue corner. Now, somehow, Chonky Five, has survived four, till the three, very end of the night. Two, one, <laughs> this is pretty fight. exciting. Robots fight. Now, Chonky is facing off against Jubilee, which is a Brazilian robot here in the pink corner. This is this is for all the marbles here. The winner of this fight is going to qualify for the World Championships. Wow, big hits here. Ripping off something there. Now, Chonky is a 45-pound walking shell spinner. It's giving me oh, gigabyte no! fives and oh, no! It's lost its little self-writing arm. It's very important that Chonky tries to keep its feet planted now for the rest of this match. But we're not seeing Zip out of Jubilee. I think typically if you see a robot like Jubilee come over and try and capitalize here and pop Chonky on its head. That is not happening here. Wow. Big hit there, shaking the entire cage. A good shower of sparks here. And Jubilee is on its head. Chonky is still a very dangerous competitor. Wow. 
Jubilee is testing that uh, huge wow. shell. Wow, I heard that. Oh, no! No! Can it? Chonky! With 90 seconds left, this is maybe how Chonky dies. Now, I don't think that it's burned up its one unstick yet. Now, its shape, though, does lend itself to potentially get reoriented with a, with a push from the house bot. Oh, they're celebrating. But here comes the house bot. Is the house bot able to save Chonky? Yes! Chonky back on its feet! And the Brazilians have no idea! Is this match still on, Chris? Yes! The timer is still going. The Brazilians were celebrating. Let's see if they can do it one more time. Chonky has burned up its last save, and that shell is stopped. 40 seconds left in this fight, and that shell is dead, Chris. What a roller coaster. Jubilee's weapon seems to be down. Chonky's weapon is down. This are, these are two. Oh, two. oh no! Chonky Whoa! coming back in the last 20 seconds here. I don't believe it! Chonky now landing a couple of late hits here, very late in this match. As we tick down the final seconds of this fight, this one will go to the judges. Incredible, Chris. Now, Chonky is a Georgia Tech team. Now, the winner of this fight is going to qualify for the finals. This is an incredibly important judge's decision. That fight had like 15 twist endings. It had chapters, Chris. My goodness, we've been on a journey. I, uh, I can feel my heart rate. It is uh, not healthy for a human to uh, feel so much uh, anxiety, to feel so much joy, to feel so much fear. Like uh, <laughs> these these robots, they, they were, the, the sound in here is incredible. Yeah. I told my cardiologist I had yogurt club tonight. <laughs> Chonky here losing that self-writing bar. Now I wonder if it could have self-writed itself with that bar. That is damage. The weapon went down uh, in the middle of the fight. Perhaps they turned it off. Perhaps it burned itself out or it had to reset. And the Brazilians celebrating early here. They had no idea that the fight was still going. Wow. wow. That was wild. Wow. Now we are eagerly awaiting the judge's decision here. Wow. Whew. I'm on the edge of my seat. The winner of that fight qualifies. I, d I don't know what to make of it. That, th like I said, there were so many ups and downs. Now, uh, Chonky is from Team Robo Jackets from uh, uh, Georgia, Georgia Tech. And uh, this is a really cool robotics college team. And it is amazing that they're seeing such success. Uh, they've brought Chonky to the competition in the past, but they've never gone this deep against this stacked of a field. They have really dialed in that robot. The, the judges have probably like so much to consider. Uh, weapons going down, uh, bots being reoriented by the house bot, things looking like they were shutting down and then coming back to life. It's, 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 it's unbelievable. I mean, uh, Chonky was mobile throughout the entire fight. It spun up its weapon at the end, so... Uh, it, it was upside down for weapon. about 30 seconds. Lost a little bit of control there, but uh, they were both quite aggressive. And uh, Chonky scoring damage by killing the weapon. The weapon is, you know, if you lose the weapon, that is uh, major points in your favor. Then again, you look at the other side of the coin, the way aggression is applied using your weapon. Is Chonky the one that is actively pursuing its opponent? Yeah. Who drove the engagements? It's tiptoeing closer and closer, okay? Just like, na, 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 na. Yeah, that's aggressive. You don't think that's aggression, Chris? 
Right. It's not like Chunky not, was, was thankfully, retreating. Thankfully, it's not my decision. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Do we have a judge's decision here for this match? I heard something on the radio. Oh. Sounds, they're still in deliberation. Oh, they're stretching it out. Oh, wow. They really love the anticipation here at NHRL, Chris. This is, uh, you know, these are people's hopes and dreams here that are on the line, judges, okay? I think the judges just are sitting at home watching the live stream, watching us just have a fit over what the that outcome was of this match great, is going to be. great fight. It, it was one of the best matches of the day, if not a contender for the best match of the day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, like, with the pace of fights, sometimes you kind of, like, get lost a little bit. But that was incredible. And the next fight is going to be incredible. And the fight after that is going to be incredible. That is why you watch NHRL Live. There's, there's a little something for everyone, depending on what part of the day you're watching. Sit. Control lets me know we're still waiting. The judges are in deep thought right now. Yeah. I would imagine that it's going to be close. These are probably split cards. Yeah, let's watch the replay one more time. Maybe this will help the judges. All right. I'm curious also to hear from our fans out there on the YouTube live stream. You know, let us know, who do you think won this match? Why do you think that they won this match? Yeah. Start an internet flame war where you violently disagree with your fellow super fans in the NHRL live chat. I think this is one of those fights where it's so close that you can't be upset if you lose. You know, you're like, I gave it my best shot and uh, that's really, really close. This is my favorite part of, the, of this match. The Brazilians convinced that they had uh, defeated Chonky and realizing they had another 60 seconds left in the fight, Chris. It's like uh, when you see those uh, football games that end or they think they're ending and everyone runs into the field, but there's right. still somebody who's running back, you know, the, for the touchdown. The, uh, the, the basketball running game pass. with the full court free throw <laughs> right. at the buzzer. Yeah. It happens. You yeah. know, sometimes you have to fight until someone literally pulls the controller out of your hands, you know? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I feel like uh, we are getting dangerously close to potentially an all-Brazilian final. I can see the Brazilians just slowly killing the Americans as they're going through this 30-pound bracket. Um, you know, like, I'm looking at the 30-pound bracket right now. They make up three-quarters of it, I believe. Yeah, I can see Toro Feather uh, advancing and Sombra 30 advancing. Now, I'm waiting for the official word from production, but the bracket has been updated. I can see a result on my side, but I don't want to uh, announce it just yet until Colby tells me the official word. And we have just three matches left in the 30s. That is pretty cool. Potentially four if they want to fight for third and fourth place. But uh, these are all brand new names, so uh, that is pretty neat. I'm on pins and needles, Chris. I can see it here in the bracket. And uh, listen, if you're if you're if you're at home, you know, go and check out the bracket. I don't know if it's right or not, but uh, it feels right-ish. Uh, the judges have confirmed that they will not reveal who won until there's a thousand dollars deposited into their Venmo. <laughs> oh, whoa. Okay. It was a split judges decision in favor of the Brazilians and Jubilee. The Brazilians are advancing and they will face Sombra 30. Incredible. Wow. That was a close, close fight. Chonky, go home tonight to Georgia with your heads held high. You picked up a judge's card here in probably one of the closest matches of this competition. Unbelievable. I'm sure it came down to the, like, a, like a single point. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Now, I am, I am waiting for like the official card, the full title screen, you know, for uh, who has officially qualified in the 30s. I think we're pretty close to calling that. Uh, but uh, it, is, it is close. Uh, there are three out of the four robots are Brazilians. So one half of the finals will absolutely be, be Brazilian. And uh, the other half, it's going to be Toro Feather facing off against Red Storm. Amazing. Uh, Toro Feather, of course, you know, it is the, uh, the robot that inspired Minotaur. It was the robot that came first. It is a punishing drum spinner. And that is a robot they're very proud of. They run at competitions up and down Brazil. Okay. Now, uh, they're telling me that we're uh, running out of time here on the YouTube live stream. You can only record for 12 hours, so we're going to pause this stream. Now, if you're here in YouTube Live, stay on this page, find our second link. We're going to be right back here in just a second. <laughs> 